Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. That is the correct answer. You have just won $104 million, six deep freeze units, a stable of polo ponies with matching saddle soap, a terry cloth robe with chocolate bars pre-melted into the pockets, and a full-size, real, honest-to-goodness dreadnought, such as is used by Uncle Sam's Navy. Oh, I'm sorry you have to call back. I'm expecting to be taking dictation from my employer very shortly. Oh, I am sorry. Your time is up. And Edna Everybody St. Welcome Vincent Markowitz, to Saturday night. gets bumped off in front of the studio audience gathered in the Dredgewood Room here in Columbia Square. Next night, don't answer your phone, stupid. Oh, Sam. Let's have no coaching, please. Oh, well, did you find the cop? Was it murder? Was it really worth, um... Well, you know, priceless and like that, and was it fun? Yes, 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 and no. And finally, are you kidding? Well, then why was it called the Vapio Cup? It's a very old Greek expression, which is what I'll be wearing as I sit in your lap dictating my report on the Vapio Cup caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, The Hard-Boiled Private Eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Remember the Romeo of yesteryear? Hair parted in the middle, all plastered down. Man, what a difference today. Today, all a guy has to do to impress a gal is use Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. If you are still using old-fashioned hair tonics or none at all, then for her sake, spruce up today with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. In bottles or the handy new tube, it's again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Blow the man down, bullies, blow the man down. Now, why do they want to blow the man down? Uh, date, uh, August 22nd, 1948, to, uh, Jethro Chiswick, Esquire. Oh, spelling, Sam. Uh, E-S-Q-U... No, Sam, I meant the name. This, um, Chisro Jethwick. I did not say Chisro Jethwick. I said Jethro Chiswick. I mean, Chisro... Uh, look, we'll check it later. Oh, Sam, it might... I have an uncle in Berkeley named Smithwick. Leave your family out of this, Eph. But he's only by marriage, Sam. It's quite a common name. Name three people named Chiswick. No, Smithwick, Sam. Now, let's see, there's Uncle George and Aunt Amelia by a previous marriage. Then there's my cousin Rupert on the Christie side. When you have finished ruminating amongst the foliage of your family tree, Miss Perrine. Well, I only mentioned it in connection All right, with that name we'll that you thought you... all over again. Tear out that page. Yes, Your Highness? No, no, please. No need to curtsy. Uh, to uh, Jethro Chiswick, no comment, please. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. <clears throat> What's that? Nothing, sir, nothing. Wrote. Subject, the Vafio Cupcaper. Dear Commodore, that's the way I like you. Meek. I had always considered myself fairly well-versed in the subject of cups, but if anybody had told me there was such a thing as a Vafio Cup, they could have knocked me over with one, which they did. Mr. Spade? Yeah? I'm Chester A. Brody. I talked with your secretary on the phone. Do you follow? Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Brody. Sit down. Rest your package. Thank you. I prefer to hold it for the time being. My card, sir. Theophilus and Brody, importers and exporters, Mm mm-hmm. Mr. Theophilus is my partner. Dimitri Theophilus. You follow? I follow. It was Mr. Theophilus who brought the Vafio Cup into the firm. I furnished the cash capital. Vafio Cup. I do not follow. Yes, indeed. The only one of these treasures to fall into private hands. One of the fabulous Vafio Cups. Those exquisite and cunningly wrought examples of the art of the ancient Grecian goldsmith. Excavated by the great Schliemann from a beehive tomb in Sparta. Hmm, beehive. Mycenaean age. Just west of the Lion Gate. Oh, the Lion Gate. Uh, pardon me, uh, Mr. Brody. Are you trying to tell me that this cup is very valuable? 
priceless. And that you have finally managed to find a buyer? Do you follow? And that you want me to deliver that package containing your priceless cup and return with your customer's cash? Accurately put. I presume you're bonded. Uncork me and see for yourself. <laughs> you are a droll fellow, to be sure. I had a light breakfast, drolls and coffee. Now, uh, what is this uh, Vafio cup? I will show it to you. You're about to see a treasure, but few eyes have looked upon in our time, Mr. Spade. The Vafio cup. Handle it carefully. It's fragile. You could crush it in your hand like so much tinfoil. Yet this golden relic of a golden age has come down through the centuries miraculously unscathed. Note the delicately wrought lines of the bas-relief. The exquisite draperies on the figure of the caryatid. The anguish on the face of the fallen hunter. The sheer brute force of the wild boar charging to the kill. Holding this golden cup in your hands, you encompass 3,000 years. Do you comprehend why there's no question of insurance here? Frankly, I don't. My dear man, an item such as this is worth only as much as a collector will pay for it. This particular collector has offered $200,000. It might never be offered again. You follow? I follow. Very well. Here's your fee, $100. I follow. And here is the address of my client in Los Angeles, Commodore Jethro Chiswick. Oh, now, wait a minute. You will take the noon train. Any questions? Yeah, why can't I go on a plane? Because I've placed an item in this afternoon's papers to the effect that the treasure is to be transported by plane. If I were a Garnoff and I read that item, I'd uh, take the train. That would be your first thought. Then you would think they're saying they're taking the plane to make me think they're taking the train. Therefore, you would take the plane after all. Oh, would you? If you were really clever, you might say they're taking the plane to make one think it's the train, so I'll take the plane after all, and therefore... Never can... mind. By this time, he's decided on the bus. The train is perfectly safe. You follow? package was light in the drawing room and the train was comfortable. Seemed like an easy way to earn a hundred bucks. I knew it wouldn't last. Never does. I was prepared for the knock on the door and I got ready for the inevitable small dark man who plays the Peter Lorre part, but this one fooled me. He was a tall, thin actor with sandy hair. Okay, Shamus, hand over the package. You won't be no trouble. Sure, there it is on the seat. Take it. Huh? It's okay. You got me covered. I won't make any move. Hey, what are you trying to pull? It's a stick-up, isn't it? Hey, maybe I got the wrong compartment. No, that's it. The cup's in there. Unwrap it and see for yourself. Oh, uh, no, you don't. I ain't picking up no booby traps. Oh, you're yellow, huh? <laughs> I know that one, too. Now, don't cut no ice for me. Suit yourself. Game of gin? Hey, you're nuts. I'm getting out of here. Hey, wait a minute, pal. I'll buy you a drink. I don't drink. Lunch? In a go. Yes, indeed, Mr. Spade. I agree. Clarence is a very comical fellow. So are you. I took the liberty of stepping into your forecastle whilst you had your bit of railway in the after companion with uh, my mate, dear Clarence. Do you mind? Uh, not at all. Well, sir, I'm afraid you're going to mind a great deal. Oh! And that's how I met you, Commodore. I was so busy sizing up the forty-five in your right hand that I didn't even notice when you left whipped out of your coat pocket with one of the largest saps I have ever felt. The next time I saw light, you were gone, the Vafio Cup was gone, and the train was pulling into San Jose. I got off, rode back to San Francisco with a truckload of chickens, and headed straight for my client's apartment. You got here quick. Yeah. Come in. Thanks. <clears throat> well? Well, what? Look, uh, we can't both play this deadpan. We'll stay no place. It's in the back room. What is? The body. You're from the police, aren't you? I'm a private dick. How dare you? Hey, what was that for? For spying on me. You and all the other cheap gumshoes my husband hires. You're Mrs. Brody? I'm Enid Theophilus. Didn't to meet... Did my husband hire you? My name is Sam Spade. I was hired by one Chester A. Brody, your husband's business partner. Well, Sam, I hope he paid you in advance, because he's the body. Chester A. Brody was just barely identifiable. Somebody had worked hard trying to persuade him to say or do something he either couldn't or wouldn't do. The only interesting clue was in the wastebasket. At first, I thought it was a flattened beer can. But it was the Vafio cup 
or a facsimile thereof. Well, how do you like it, Sam? I don't. He was my client. I wasn't hired to protect him. I didn't like him, but he was my client. How would you like me for a client? I'll give you the name of a lawyer, sister. My name is Enid. Enid? Now, let's see what I can squeeze out of you before the cops do. Brody was your husband's business partner, and you're, uh... You don't have to be subtle. He was mad about me. I'm... I'm all broken up about his death. So was he. That wasn't funny. That time I deserved it. You don't like me, do you? Can't you get it through that steel-jacketed brain of yours that you're in bad trouble, that there's a dead man in the next room beaten to death and you're not supposed to be here? Oh, I was supposed to be here. We were going to elope as soon as you brought back the money from that uh, Greek thing. Yeah, what about that Greek thing? It was an antique. It was called the Vafio Cup. Yes, I know about that. Yes, well, my husband dug it up in Greece and smuggled it into the country. Yeah? It was all he had, but it was such an important piece that he was able to persuade Chet, um, the late Chester Brody, that is, to let him in as a full partner. Then what? Well, they quarreled. My husband made some bad investments, and Chet wanted to sell the cup to save the firm. Dimitri refused. I didn't think it was fair, so I got the keys to his safety deposit box where the cup was, and Chet arranged to sell it to the Commodore. Did, uh, did you get the money from the Commodore? All I got from the Commodore was lumps. He stole the cup? Roger. You've got to get it back. I've got it. Where? Here, take a look. <gasps> It's ruined. Where did you find it? In a trash basket where it belongs. Dimitri did it. He must have suspected something and substituted a fake. That's it. He knows where the real one is. Somebody thought that your boyfriend knew. The one that killed him? That's the way it looks. Maybe that's the way it was meant to look. You know, somebody might get the idea that you palmed the genuine when you got it out of that safety deposit box. If I did, it was legal, and don't you forget it. A wife can't steal from her husband. Legally, they're one person you can't steal from yourself. That's the law. I was wrong. You don't need a lawyer. Will you help me? I may hurt you, and it'll cost you anyway. I know what's good for me. Money. Find that cup. I know what's good for me, too. So I uh, took her hundred bucks, advised her to go home, and made for my own humble lodging. They were not only humble... They were crowded. The man was small, but the gun was enormous. I said, uh, don't bother to introduce yourself. Your name is Dimitri Theopolis, and you want this package that I'm carrying. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way... Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Vafio Cup Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. He didn't answer me, so I said it again. Uh, Don't bother to introduce yourself. Your name is Dimitri Theopolis, and you want this package that I'm carrying. Of that be assured. You obtained this from my dear wife. And how did you find my darling? Not at the city pond, surprisingly enough. Oh, you know my dear wife. How soon you know my darling so well, more than I her husband. (laughs) Is it possible? I don't know, is it? I don't know either. I employ a detective. Not this one. I have need... 
my poor partner, Mr. Brody. You are interested. If you are interesting about who killed your partner, that's one thing. But if you want somebody to dig out your family secrets, that is nothing. With me, you are, shall we say, no place. But why don't I got the right to know? There'll be no trouble, no scandal, no divorcement suing. Of that be assured. Even poor Chester is dead, so... He's what one calls ancient history. While he lived, I knew nothing. I was blind. After he died... I see certain things. Yeah, well, uh, do you see that maybe your wife had a hand in Brody's death? What then? Well, if it so happens that you cannot separate my darling from that, uh, do you follow? Not quite. Ah. I'm not an old man. Well, but say my that. dear wife is but two and twenty, and a truly lovely person. Yes, she's all right. Uh, would it not be the part of husbandly wisdom to have... Uh, Shall I say, uh, a hold over her? If she's guilty, you won't need it. Good. <laughs> Please, I cannot hold the gun and handle my wallet at the same time. Please. Uh, no, thanks. You keep the gun, I'll take the wallet. Oh, you trust me. You will work for me. Yeah, I'll work for anybody. <laughs> Here, I, uh, left your cab. Oh, you. assuredly, you are so very kind. Oh, I'm not so All kind. the pockets, yes? No. The... Then I don't hesitate to suit you. Now, oh, wait a minute. Yes? This is the fake. You sure you want this? Assuredly, yes. A man has already been killed for it. Your life's a high price to pay for a fake, though fancy, tin cup. You still think that's the price? Brother, I know it. Then you know I will kill you for it. Okay, if it means that much to you, and I guess it does, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, please remain where you are. If you follow me, I will surely suit you. my front window, I watched them come out downstairs and start across the street. Then it happened. I saw the gun flash as it fired, and Theophilus slumped to the pavement. The package slid away from him into the gutter. I beat it down to him. He'd taken all three pellets in the midsection from close range. His pulse flooded once or twice and then stopped. When I went to look for the package, it wasn't there. I called homicide and waited until they took him away. When I told Lieutenant Dundee what I had in mind, he congratulated me on my brilliant scheme and told me to go ahead with it. That was his mistake. I even talked him out of assigning any of his harness men to watch my building for the next couple of hours. That was my mistake. I went upstairs, opened the bottle, and waited for your knock on my door, Commodore. Well, sir, a man would almost think you expected us. Keep a better eye on him, Clarence. Don't let him get to lured. Aye, aye, sir. Welcome aboard. No time for scuttle about Mr. Spade. We are bound for Bullilong Bali on the lookout for Maru, sailing at dawn. I want that cup. The true, the genuine, the Vafio cup. No more deceptions, no more trickery. You will hand it over without further delay. Sure. Be glad to. Oh, no, not like that. You will tell Clarence where it is stowed. And Clarence will fetch it above decks. Why, you old barnacle. Theophilus never had his mitts on a genuine Vafio cup. Bilge water, sir. When Theophilus landed in San Francisco, he didn't have a farthing. Now he owes half a million dollars. If he hadn't got the genuine cup, how could he have borrowed all that money? Because a bunch of morons like you believed he had it. Blast my binnacles, man. You sound as though you believed what you're saying. Look, uh, Commodore, you're interested in high finance. Now, how did Ivor Kruger make his millions? Why, matches... He was the match king, sir. Uh, matches had nothing to do with it, Commodore. He uh, started out with 15 million bucks worth of phony government bonds that he printed himself. Follow? They weren't even good counterfeits, but he was smart enough not to try and cash them. He just kept them in a safety deposit box and borrowed money. Theophilus uh, used his phony Vafio cup the same way. Lost my binnacles, man. You sound as though you believe what you're saying. That has a familiar ring to it. I do. And I'll tell you why. He knew that that was the fake in the package when he held me up for it. He was willing to risk his own life to get it out of circulation. Dash my timbers. Old Theophilus has left us without a shot in the locker. You steer us onto the shoals. We're on our beam ends. Hey, turn them off, Commodore. You're pumping bilge flush. We better haul our wind. Yes, indeed. I'm afraid it's getting rather warm in San Francisco. Bully long beckons. You won't make it past the potato patch. What? The cops are going to want some answers about a couple of stiffs you left behind in San Francisco. I'm glad you reminded me. Shall I plug him? No, no. We are taking him with us. Oh, that's what you think. Uh, take it easy, uh, mate. This ain't going to hurt a bit. Uh, 
A reek of chloroform filled the room and a fist pounded into my belly. It knocked my wind out and at the same time my nose collided with something wet and cold. I swung out but didn't connect. Before I could swing again, the room blurred and a ceiling light floated down to meet me. Then the lights went out altogether. At first, I couldn't figure it. It uh, sounded like what a doctor hears through a stethoscope or maybe an earthquake or maybe ship engines, which it turned out to be. When the lights came on again, I was lying on a bunk in a stateroom. I staggered across to the wash basin and splashed water in my face. Hello, you. Oh, Enid, as I hardly live and breathe. It could get worse. Yeah, where are we? Oh, not very far out. Not past the Farallone. Uh, good, I'm a stowaway and I'll put me off of the pilot. Oh, no, you're not. Your passage is paid. Mine? It is, huh? It is. Do you know who you are? Who am I? Chester Brody. Then I'm dead. They'll bury me at sea. Roger. Who are you? I'm your widow. What's the score, widow? Chester and I booked passage on this ship a week ago. It was part of the plan. Chester and the Commodore worked it all out. Yeah, the cup was to have been stolen from me on the train. Yes, but when the Commodore discovered it was a fake, everything fell to pieces. Yeah, he thought Chester was double-crossing him. Hmm? They forced Chet to talk. He told them Dimitri still had the genuine Vafio cup and had hired you for the double-cross. Maybe he really believed it. Anyway, they killed Dimitri. Yeah. Well, there's nothing on them yet. But uh, you're a material witness, sweetheart, to at least one of the killings. That's extraditable. When that dawns on them, they'll uh, scuttle you, too. It's already dawned on them. I'm, I'm desperate. Yes, I notice. For you, you're practically hysterical. We have to face facts. Yeah, well, give me a couple to face right now. Where are the Commodore and Clarence? Up on the bridge. Good. All you have to do is walk straight up to the captain. He'll put him under arrest. Well, that might be a good idea, darling. Only... Only what? Only the Commodore is the captain. That tore it. Your uh, salty talk had fooled me, Commodore. I never dreamed that you were really an old sea dog, and I do mean dog. But two can play at that game. From my own intimate knowledge of Sea Story magazines, I realized that all hands would be turned to in the cargo gear, and the crew quarters would be, therefore, empty. In more time than it takes to tell... Enid and I had fitted ourselves out in dungarees, jumpers, and watch caps, and turned to with them. Everyone's coming in! Get her out of the hell! You to hell and all! You let some fucker up behind her! You two, look alive! Stow that preventer! Oh, me? You uh, may recall, Commodore, you may recall me as the man who ran for a fire extinguisher when the bosun yelled, Stow the preventer. But experience is the best teacher, and by the time we hove to to put the pilot over the side, things were in such a state of confusion that you had retreated to your cabin with a quadruple ration of grog. Seizing that moment, I threw Enid over the side, yelled, Man overboard! And jumped in after him. Once safely aboard the pilot schooner, we revealed our true identity, and a merry laugh was enjoyed by all. It uh, dropped us at the foot of market, and we waved warm farewells to our erstwhile rescuers, then to the snug haven of my office in a friendly cup, if you'll pardon the expression, in the grateful warmth of a gas radiator. Hmm. Unhealthy. Who, me? Gas fumes. Ooh. Why don't you move into a building with steam heat? I, I like this building. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've been here for a long time. You don't make much money, do you? You don't have to rub it in. It's a living. <laughs> you happy? Mm, sure I am, I guess. Well, I guess it's all right, then. <clears throat> you know, sweetheart, uh, yeah. there's uh, something missing in you. Huh? What? Well, I don't know. And then how do you know? Forget it. Well, I guess I'll go. Do you, uh, do you mind if I don't see you to the door? Why should I? What? <laughs> hey. You are human. Yeah, they're wet. Go ahead, sweetheart. Cry all you want. It's been tough. You shouldn't have kept it bottled up this long. No, it, it, it's not what you think. Well, what is it? It's you. 
You're so nice. I'm nice. Yeah, but you're no place. You never will be. And neither will I. And that, Commodore, is the cargo. It was nice seeing you again down at the hall. They uh, tell me you and Clarence are both trying to turn state's evidence. But according to the late bulletins, Clarence was leading by a neck in the stretch. Get it? The DA was afraid the jury might not understand your salty talk. Period. End of sea chanty. Oh, Sam. Yes, what, what, what? Oh, Sam. Hmm? Oh, I just can't. I, oh, why I can't, can't you? Are, are you feeling okay, F? Oh, Sam. Hmm? You betrayed your trust. You... Effie, speak oh. to me. What is it? What is it? I betrayed my trust. What? What? Well, those criminals were on that boat. Yes. And you... You jumped overboard. You feel that I was recalcitrant? Is that it? That my actions were not true blue? Clear cut? Is that it? Oh, I'll just go type this up and I'm sure you can explain. I hope you can. I hope. Sour racket. <laughs> Question, what's the easiest and best way there is to give your hair that well-groomed look? Answer, Wild Root Cream Oil. Yes, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil with soothing lanolin gives you the advantages considered most important in a hair tonic. It grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. Call at your drug or toilet goods counter tonight or first thing tomorrow for Wild Root Cream Oil. If you've never tried it before... Get the generous new 25-cent bottle just introduced. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Oh, here it is, Sam. I hope the spelling is all right. I was so upset. You hate me, then? Oh, no. No. I suppose it's foolish going along thinking that your ideal doesn't have feet of clay. Oh, Sam, I, I, I just can't. I just can't imagine. Don't you think... Don't you think I can explain, Eph? Oh, yes, I'm sure you can explain. But you did. You deserted your post and jumped overboard like a thinking rat. That's right. Oh, Sam, that's so unlike you. It was just by chance they were apprehended. By chance, you say? Who do you think it was that got himself shot out of a torpedo tube in that submarine? You, Sam? No, you think I'm crazy? I did something few radio detectives ever do, sweetheart. I called the Harbor Patrol single-handed using only one nickel and had them picked up. Oh, Sam, I wish I'd been there. Well, it was just a small phone booth. Besides, if you'd been there, it would have been out of order or something. Oh, Sam, you came through after all. Aren't you ashamed that you ever doubted me? Yes, I am. I'm a fool. There, there, there. I forgive you. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. (laughs) The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Rene Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You say it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie, keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get wild root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. (laughs) 
The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. You know, the lives of Holmes and Watson were not always filled with action. They spent many a quiet evening at home in Baker Street, discussing the problems of the world over a glass of port. <laughs> you know, it seems that no wine is more expressive of friendship and hospitality than port. And I'm sure there's no port wine more enjoyable than Petri California port. Try a good glass of Petri port after dinner some evening, or any time you get together with your friends. You'll love the rich, ruby-red color of that Petri port. You'll love its smoothness and full body, its remarkable and wonderful flavor, a flavor that comes straight from the heart of luscious, hand-picked grapes. Serve that Petri port alone, or serve it together with cake or cookies or with fruit. Yes, and serve it proudly. You can, because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now I'm sure our old friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's tap on his study door. Come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Come over here by the fire. I was just having a cup of coffee. Would you care to join me? Thanks, that'd be nice. Uh, it'll prevent you falling asleep during my story tonight. <laughs> There's no chance of that, Doctor. From the hints you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a story. It began in a circus in Paris, you told us? Yes, my boy, the circus. A colorful world of sawdust and spangles. A world, Mr. Bartell, that I may tell you confidentially, always held an irresistible fascination for me when I was a youngster. Me too, Doctor. In fact, when I was eight years old, I fell desperately in love with a... With a lady bareback rider. A stunning creature who wore pink silk tights with gold sequins on them. Unfortunately, my mother caught me writing her proposal of marriage, and I'm afraid that, uh, well, that's another story, and one that you probably wouldn't find very interesting. <laughs> I'm sure I would, Doctor, but I think it would be safer to stick to your Sherlock Holmes yes, story. Yes, you're probably right, my boy. Well, it was a winter in the 1890s, and Holmes and I were in Paris. On our second day there... Holmes suggested we attend that night's performance of the Cirque Royale. Needless to remark, I was delighted, Mr. Bartell. And shortly after nine o'clock that night, I found myself seated beside Holmes in a box near the ringside. It was an incredibly vivid scene, even for that city of color and light. The gay costumes of the women and the gaudy trappings of the ringmasters and clowns looked like a giant kaleidoscope under the blazing glare of the arc lamps. As we sat there, a brass band nearby blared forth some popular music of the day, and yet he didn't appear to be enjoying himself. And so I leaned across and touched his arm. Hmm. What is it, Watson? Well, you're very quiet, Holmes. Aren't you having a good time? A good time, oh, I suppose. Well, chap, I was just wondering where Mr. Edwards is. Mr. Edwards? Who, who's he? An extremely distinguished client who was to meet us in this box at nine o'clock. Ah, uh, client. So oh, this little excursion was on business after all, yes. I might have known it. No worry, old fellow. In your case, I think you'll be able to combine quite a little pleasure with the business. Well, can't you be a little more explicit, Holmes? Shh, shh. Here comes the ringmaster. Mademoiselle Giselle Girondet, equestrienne incomparable. Giselle Girondet, yes, I've heard of her. She's a bareback rider, isn't she? Huh? Artist in France, old fellow. She also has quite a reputation as a femme fatale. Three duels have been fought over her. A young English officer in the Grenadier Guards committed suicide last year because of her. And a famous French banker is at present languishing in prison because her extravagances drove him to appropriate funds that did not belong to him. Yes, Watson, she's an extremely colorful personality. You know, Holmes, it's a funny thing. When I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a lady bareback rider. She wore pink silk tights with golden sequins on them, but uh, unfortunately... Yes, she is, old fellow. Yes, she is. Look at the way she's jumping from the back of one horse to the other. Sheer poetry of motion. The lady appeals to you, Watson. By George, yes, indeed she does. 
In fact, Holmes, I don't mind telling you that if I weren't a married man and a yeah, poor man... Yeah, you'd like man... to court the lady, eh? Uh, yes, I, I should excellent, indeed. Excellent, Arthur, excellent. That's the very reason for our attendance. At the well, what in heaven's name are you talking about, Holmes? Ah, there you are. Good evening, Mr. Edwards. Holmes, my dear fellow, how are you? I haven't seen you since, uh, since that little affair at Windsor Castle when Mother... Uh, excuse me, sir. I am Mr. Mycroft, and this is my friend, uh, Sir William Nigel. Sir William Nigel? Oh, of course, of course. And I am Mr. Edwards. We must uh, respect each other's incognitos, eh? How do you do, Sir William? Uh, well, I'm extremely honoured to meet you, Your, your Royal, uh, 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 Mr. Edwards. How do you like Giselle? Isn't she a stunning creature? Yes, indeed she is, sir. The four of us to have supper together after the performance tonight, I understand, Mr. Edwards. Well, unfortunately, I can't be there, Mycroft. There's some stupid affair at the embassy which I have to attend. We must postpone the dinner until tomorrow night. Oh, very well, sir. Uh, come over to my hotel a little early and we can discuss the whole business. Personally, I think a lot of fuss is being made about nothing. Now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I must go back and see Giselle for a moment and tell her that I can't keep our appointment for tonight. I'll see you tomorrow, Mycroft. Good night, sir, William. Good night. Good night, uh, good night, night sir. And maintenant, for votre plaisir, les frères Salini, les jongleurs internationales. Holmes, what's all this mystery? That wasn't Mr. Edwards, it was the Prince of... Shh, Watson, please. Discretion, old fellow. Mr. Edwards, as you know, is extremely democratic. Too much so, possibly, when one considers his position and responsibilities. He's become quite seriously involved with Mademoiselle Giselle, the lady bareback rider who has just left the ring. Oh, so that's it. The Foreign Office, quite naturally, I suppose, is deeply concerned over the matter. And I've been entrusted with the delicate mission of protecting Mr. Edwards. Oh, does Giselle Gironde know that his true identity, do you suppose? That's the first thing that we have to find out. It's possible that she is simply captivated by having a rich Englishman at her feet. If, on the other hand... Uh, she knows who Mr. Edwards is, then we may be in for a great deal of trouble. Yes, but how are you going to find that out? By tempting her with a richer Englishman, and one with a title. That, my dear fellow, is why you are Sir William Nigel. You mean that... Uh, your I... job, old what? fellow, is to do your utmost to steal Giselle Gironde from Mr. Edwards. But, uh, well, I, I don't even know the girl. We shall remedy that defect in a few minutes. As soon as the performance is over, my dear chap, I shall take you to her dressing room and arrange an introduction. I must say, Holmes, the backstage life at a circus is even more colourful than in the ring. What makes you say that, old fellow? Well, I just saw Pinhead having tea with a, a bearded lady while a sword swallower was standing behind him practising his act. Oh, hello. See that man standing talking to the girl in tights? Yeah, attractive, isn't he? Uh, the gentleman is Inspector Vernet of the French police, an old friend and a distant relative of mine. Vernet! How are you? Ah, Holmes, <clears throat> mon cher ami, comment ça no, no, va? No, 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 Vernet, please. On this occasion, my name is Mycroft, if you don't mind, and this is my friend, Sir William Nigel. How do you do, Inspector? Enchanté, Sir William. Uh, permit me to introduce Mademoiselle Yvette Marat. How do you do? How do you do, Mademoiselle? How do you do? Uh, uh, what brings you behind the scenes at the circus, may I ask, Monsieur Mycroft? Uh, my friend, Sir William, is most anxious to make the acquaintance of Mademoiselle Gironde. But of course, every man wishes to meet Giselle Gironde. Why not ask Bernay? He will present you to her. Ha! In no way. Oh, now, Yvette, chérie, do not begin that all over again. You are in love with her. You have always been in love with her. I, I, I wish you were dead. Sometimes I... Sometimes I think I could kill her myself. <laughs> On my soul, Inspector, she's a fiery little thing, isn't she? Ah, ça c'est vrai, ça, Sir William. <laughs> Many times I've told her that Giselle Gironde would never waste her time with a simple police inspector. Uh, uh, she prefers a wealthy foreigner. But Yvette ne comprend pas. She does not understand and she does not believe. Mademoiselle Marat was dressed in tights, Verne. And what is she doing in the circus? Uh, she walks the tightrope. Oh, She's yes, a queen of the high wire. Mm -hmm. A charming and a talented girl, but a most, most, most jealous one. Uh, Verne, my distinguished friend, Sir William Nigel, is most anxious to meet Giselle Gironde. Uh, will you introduce him? I should prefer not to appear on the matter at this stage. Oh, mais certainement. I, I will take you to her dressing room. Uh, please come with me, Sir William. Uh, right. I'll, I'll see you later, Holmes. I'll be waiting for you, old chap. Good luck. Oh, good luck. Hey, you're a lucky man, Sir William. Giselle has quite a penchant for the Englishmen. Oh. And when they are rich and have a title, I am sure she finds them irresistible. <laughs> you really think so? Oh, but of course. Ah, quel dommage that I'm only a poor policeman. Ah, hey, here we are. Entrez. 
Giselle Monsieur, permit me to present to you Sir William Nigel. He's a great admirer of yours. Yes, indeed, madam. Ah, Sir William Nigel. Come and sit here beside me, Sir William. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, shall leave you. Au revoir. Uh, sit closer. There. That is much more cozy, no? Oh, it's very nice of you to see me, Mademoiselle Gironde. Oh, don't be so formal, my Englishman. You may call me Giselle, and I shall call you... Let me see, I shall call you Sir William... Na Willie! I shall call you Willie! You do not mind? <laughs> Mine? I, I it's very delightful. Quite delightful, my dear. I was hoping perhaps that you would care to have a little, little supper with me tonight, Giselle. <laughs> Uh, so what about some, some oysters, a cold pheasant, and a bottle or two of Pomeranian and Greeno 72? And you get to taste rather well, don't you think? Oh, Willie, really? <laughs> I can see you are perfect oh, toast. Oh, I don't know about One that. One moment, I get my clock. Uh, well, you, you know, Giselle, it, it, it's a funny thing. What is a funny thing, Willie? Really? When I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a, a lady bareback rider at a circus. History seems to be repeating its... Here. Help you up, Pierre. Do you no longer knock when you come to my door? Who is this man? My name is Nigel, Sir William Nigel, my good man. And who may you be? I am Alfio Alfieri. I am Alfio Alfieri. And what is he? Huh. A trainer of wild animals. An imbecile. What? You must not speak to Alfio in that way. You belong to me. Send this stupid Englishman away. You found it impudent. Grossier. Belong to you. She said belong to no one. Do I have to take my whip uh, to put you? Put down that way. Put it down, you scoundrel. <laughs> That's the time it will be your face, Carl. You infernal blackguard. Holding your hand against the woman. Shocking. Mon cher Willie has knocked him down. Uh, he certainly deserved it. Oui. And you in turn deserve something, Willie. Oh, what was that? Come close, Willie. And I give it to you. A little kiss. Oh, kiss? <laughs> Thanks awfully. <laughs> So strong, so resolute, so brave. Oh, it was nothing, my dear Giselle, nothing at all. Here, pour champagne, got some more champagne. Oh, Willie! Really? Giselle? Oui, Monsieur Edwards? I have a box for the opera tomorrow night. I was hoping that perhaps... Oh, I'm sorry, Monsieur, but my time is occupied. I am showing the delights of Montmartre to mon cher Willie. Really? Mademoiselle est mieux le collier de perles à cinq rangs ou celui à trois rangs? He says, which do I prefer? The five-string color of pearls or the three-string color of pearls? What does my willy think? So that you can't hang too many pearls on a pretty neck like yours. I'll take the five-string color, my good fellow. <laughs> You're doing splendidly, Watson, splendidly. Yes, but Holmes, I felt such a blasted fool handing that jeweler fellow a check. Signed by Sir William Nigel. Are you quite sure that it'll oh, be on it? Oh, don't worry, old fellow. Remember who our client is. Money is the least important concern in this matter. On with the masquerade, old fellow. On with the masquerade. More champagne, Gasson. Really, you are such a headstrong boy. <laughs> More champagne. Citadel, you dear little thing. Oh, <laughs> Good evening, Vernet. Has Mademoiselle Gironde come into the evening performance yet? Yes, Monsieur Holmes. I escorted her to her dressing room half an hour ago. Uh, Monsieur Edwards is in there with her now. At last, it seems, she has used for a poor policeman. Last night, she found a threatening letter on her makeup table. Since then, she has been most grateful for my company. A threatening letter, eh? Any idea who might have sent it? Oh, yes, of course. I'm afraid I have, Monsieur Holmes. Uh, I told her to pay no attention. Uh, by the perfume of the note paper, I recognize the sender. A jealous tightrope walker called Yvette Marat. Oh. <laughs> poor Yvette. She would make a very inferior criminal, I'm afraid. Still... Giselle asked me to stay outside her dressing room till the performance starts. Uh, uh, you wish to see her? Uh, yes. Oh, good evening, Mr. Edwards. Evening, Mycroft. Evening, Inspector Werner. Uh, come on, Sir Edwards. Look here, Mycroft. I think this little game's gone far enough. 
Giselle has just refused another invitation of mine. Now, I know who Sir William Nigel is, and I swear I'll tell her. Uh, don't you think, sir, that the lady is hardly worth bothering about? Surely this whole incident with Sir William proves that she's a scheming little adventuress. A fictitious title and an apparently bottomless purse have shown her up in her true colors. <laughs> I could have told you the same thing without such an experiment, my friend. Well, I suppose you're right, Mycroft. I've been a fool. An idiot who lets a pretty ankle turn his head. A conceited dolt. <laughs> Let us just say, monsieur, that you have been a man. Uh, good evening, sir. Oh, good, evening. Watch, no, good evening. Good evening. Uh, just going back to see Giselle for a moment, I brought us these flowers for her. Oh, I'll be back in a jiffy. Uh, just a minute, Watson. I, uh, I hate to dampen your ardor, old chap, but uh, the masquerade is ended. Ended? What, what do you mean it's ended? It is no ended. longer necessary for you to impersonate Sir William Nigel or to pay court to Giselle. Oh, really? Oh, 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 really? Really? Well, that's, that's a great relief, sir. Great relief. I've hated the whole business. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure you have. Uh, we um, appreciate the sacrifices that you've made, don't we, Sir Edward? Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I must go back and see her once more, though. We had a rendezvous for tonight, and I must cancel it. A gentleman thing to do, you know. Um, I, I won't be a minute. <laughs> Never have I seen a man more downcast. Obviously, with him, my dear Holmes, business was a pleasure. Alfieri, where are you going? Not the Englishman. I just saw him go into Giselle's room. To whom are you referring? Uh, the man that called himself Sir William Nigel. Oh, yes. Two days ago, he strike me. I have to settle with him. No man may strike Alfieri. Do not cause any more trouble, Alfieri. From what I've been told, you thoroughly deserved what happened uh, to you. Here he come now. You English, you... Alfieri challenge you to a duel. Holmes! Holmes! What's old chap? What is it? You're as white as a ghost. It's... It's Giselle. What's wrong with her? She's dead. She's lying there in her dressing room. Strangled. Strangled. And only half an hour ago I spoke with her myself. Since then I've been standing in this corridor, guarding her door at her own request. Only two men have entered Giselle's dressing room since then. You, Monsieur Edwards, and you, Sir William Nigel. What are you suggesting, Bernay? I am suggesting nothing. I am stating that these two gentlemen are under arrest for suspicion of murder. Dr. Watson's unusual story will continue in just a few seconds. Time I'd like to take to remind you that one wine that seems to be the outstanding favorite among the ladies is Petri California Muscatel. That's probably because, like a beautiful woman, Petri Muscatel is subtle and intriguing. Petri Muscatel is the color of burnished gold. And its flavor, well, it's the flavor of big, plump Muscat grapes. Picked by hand, carefully and tenderly, and they're just full of wonderful, delicious juice. If you want to show that you really know the wine that women prefer, serve Petri Muscatel. Serve it after dinner or later in the evening. It's wonderful. And why shouldn't it be? It's a Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, so you and the mysterious uh, Mr. Edwards got yourselves arrested on suspicion of murder. Huh? Yes, Mr. Bartell. Holmes did everything in his power to persuade Inspector Vernet to release us, but it was useless. And so, while Mr. Edwards and myself were languishing in detention cells at the local Sûreté, Holmes and the French inspector were examining the dressing room of the dead woman. I'm, in sh I'm sure, Inspector Vernet, that uh, being as keen a detective as you are, you must suspect the true identity of Mr. Edwards. Of course, Monsieur Holmes. But that is the danger of incognitos. If he chooses to assume the identity of play Monsieur Edwards, then he must run the risks of play Monsieur And Edwards. you are convinced that either he or my friend strangled Mademoiselle Gironde? It is obvious. Then I'll have to prove to you that they didn't. Let me examine the body again, will you? If she had been strangled by either of my friends, why would her body be lying here under the window? It's as far away from the door by which they left this room as possible. That proves nothing. No, but it's odd. Giselle was a strong girl. Uh, there might easily have been a struggle. Uh, perhaps she tried to get away through the window. And yet there are no marks of violence on her throat. Just this piece of very fine cord that did its deadly work so cleanly. <laughs> Cut with a knife. Uh, uh, please do not remove the cord, Monsieur Holmes. The body has not yet been photographed. Pierre Vernet, you're making it very hard for me, aren't you? Uh, you notice, of course, that the window is open. Yes, but we have examined the snow outside. There were no footprints within three yards of the window. The murderer must have entered by the door that I was watching. Yes, it would be hard, even for a professional acrobat to jump in. An acrobat? Verne, your young friend, Mademoiselle Yvette Marat, is a tightrope walker. Yvette, but... Yes, she's certainly had a motive. She'd even sent a threatening letter 
I heard her express hatred and jealousy for this dead woman. It's conceivable that she could enter a room by a window without leaving footprints in the snow. Where was she at the time of the murder? I do not know. I was waiting for her in the corridor. And I suggest that we investigate her alibi at once. And after that, Inspector, I must pay a visit to the Surte. I don't want my friends to think that I've deserted them. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Holmes. I'm afraid it looks rather black. As I was telling you, Yvette Marat, the tightrope walker was able to establish a completely satisfactory alibi. Verne still suspects you or Dr. Watson. Well, that's ridiculous. May I ask you a very straightforward question, sir? Of course. I can well understand that if you had gone into the dressing room and found the woman already murdered, you might easily be tempted to conceal the fact, to avoid a scandal involving your person. Will you swear to me, sir, on your true identity, that Giselle was alive when you left her? She was, Holmes. I swear it. Thank you, sir. That's all I wanted to know. I'm glad to see you. You know, I've been thinking. All this depends on Vernet's evidence. But supposing he was the murderer? He told us that Giselle had turned him down, you know. I'd thought of that, but Mr. Edwards swears that Giselle was alive when he left the room. And yet that means that Mr. Edwards... Oh, no, 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 no. It's unthinkable. Holmes, you're not suggesting... Holmes, if I thought that that were possible, I'd confess to the murder myself. My life wouldn't matter if... I... If it had saved us cattle like that, great Scott, it'd, it'd shatter the empire. Dear old Watson, you shall not sacrifice yourself. You're as valuable a British institution as the lion himself. No, my dear fellow. We shall never sacrifice you, not while my mind is still capable of... My mind? That's it. Thank you, Watson. You've given me the answer. Holmes, what are you burbling about Be patient, now? old fellow. In half an hour, you'll be out of this cell and the real murderer will be in it. Questions, questions. Why must Alfieri answer so many questions? Because he will not yet tell the truth. You murdered Giselle Gironde. How many times I have to tell you I did not kill her? Why should I want to arm her? Because you were jealous. Because she humiliated and tormented you. But I was not in her dressing room. I have already proved that fact. Am I a magician that I can kill somebody without entering a room? Alfieri, I know how you killed Giselle Gironde without its necessitating your entering this room. Uh, and you're a smart man. Please to tell me. I don't need to tell you. With the aid of Vernet, I'll show you. Open the window, Alfieri. Uh, what game is this? Very well, then. I'll open the window myself. Put your head out. Come on. So. Huh? Who do you see? Inspector Vernet, standing three yards away, where you stood, and he's got your long training whip. No, no! Don't move! Stand there, the inspector hasn't your skill with a whip, but he wants to try a little experiment. No, leave him alone! All right, Vernet, I'm holding him! Well, Mr. Edwards, I, I mean, well, sir, this is a pleasant change from a prison cell, isn't it? It certainly is. <laughs> Holmes, I can't tell you how grateful I am. I still don't quite understand how you did it. Watson, in uh, rather a roundabout way, was responsible for giving me the clue. Oh, how was that, Holmes? Well, on more than one occasion, old chap, I've had cause to deploy a rather florid style of writing. Tonight, I was very thankful for it. Uh, when I began to speak of the capabilities of my mind... Uh, suddenly I remembered a phrase of yours in which you referred to uh, its whip-like rapidity and accuracy. That, of course, made me think of Alfieri, the animal trainer. Exactly how did he kill the poor girl? Uh, well, sir, he stood outside the window, uh, far enough away to leave no incriminating footprints. Called to Giselle, probably persuaded her to lean out, then snapped the whip around her neck, pulling it tight and strangling her. And then I suppose he cut the cord and let the body fall back into the room. Precisely, old fellow. We found a whipstock among his tackle, a whipstock from which the lash had been cut. The stub of lash left matched the cord around the dead girl's throat. Amazing business. And I don't mind telling you, fellas, I'm very thankful to be through with it. Yes, so am I, sir. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if this whole incident cures me of my love of circuses. Oh, I didn't know you had a predilection in that direction, Watson. Oh, oh, oh yes, sir. Yes, if you don't mind my saying so. Uh, uh, when he was eight years old, he fell in love with a lady bareback rider. <laughs> didn't you, Watson? <laughs> Indeed. What happened? Well, sir, I, I don't remember her name, but she wore pink silk tights with uh, 
golden sequins on them. And I wrote her a rather hot-headed letter. Unfortunately, my mother... Doctor, that was one of the most unusual stories you've ever told. And, and I might say you played a very prominent part in that case yourself. Oh, I suppose I did it. That, Mr. Bartell. Giselle was a beautiful girl. Beautiful. Boy, I sure love that nickname she gave you. Wheelie. Yes, I thought it was rather nice myself. Well, that is, <laughs> I, I, I mean... I thought... <laughs> Don't get embarrassed over a nickname, Doctor. You should hear the nickname I had. Well, when I went to school, all the girls called me Bottles. Bottles? Oh, oh I see, from Bartell. Bartell, Bartell. Oh, <laughs> Some nickname, like a prophecy. What do you mean? Well, they called me Bottles, and now that's what I like to talk about most. Bottles. Bottles of Petri wine. Oh, I should have known. <laughs> and I'd like to talk about Petri wine because, as far as I'm concerned, it's the swellest wine that ever poured from a bottle. That's because the Petri family really knows how to make good wine. Well, they ought to. They've been making good wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And since the Petri family has always personally owned and operated their business, they've been able to keep that fine art of winemaking right in the family, handing it on down from father to son, from father to son, from generation to generation. So it's no wonder whenever you want a good wine, you want a Petri wine, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us about next well, week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you of a strange adventure that Holmes and I had in the swampy fenlands of Norfolk. Concerns a gypsy encampment, a child that vanished, and a horrible death in the murky depths of a fearsome quagmire. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Three Students. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane... Followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I eased into the alley and waited. Pretty soon a side door opened and out came Helen. Just as I got to her, I heard a noise behind me. I started to turn around, but too late. A king-sized comet exploded over my right ear, and the ground came up and hit me in the face. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Gray-Eyed Blonde. Yeah, let's see. Maybe Trent for death. Yep. And then, there yeah, was that photo on the Virgin Islands, yeah, yeah, yep. I'm going. And then maybe Havana on the way back. Sloppy Joes and girls and... Well, hello. 
Michael Shane? Mm-hmm. Hello, Mike. Oh? Helen. Helen. Uh, sit down. Thanks. From the looks of all those travel folders on your desk, I'd say you were planning a trip. No, just taking a poor man's vacation. Reading travel folders? Well, probably almost as much fun as actually taking the trips. I doubt it. Is uh, something the matter? Matter? You were looking at me sort of... Oh, uh, I've never seen gray eyes like that before. Oh. Make quite a dent. Gray eyes, red lips. You uh, come to talk about trips? In a way, short ones. Oh, cigarette? Thanks. My eye of a match. Thanks. Yeah. You run errands, Mike? Errands? Friends, what kind? Well, I made a mistake quite a while ago, Mike. Big mistake. I've been paying for it ever since. Regularly. Blackmail? Mm-hmm. One more payment, the account's closed for good. So? So, I want you to make that last payment for me. Tonight. Uh, just for my own information, Helen, you're not by any chance asking me well, to... I'm not asking you to kill anyone, Mike. That's good to know. No, this is all on the up and up. Here are two envelopes. The instructions are in this one. Instructions? Yeah, where and how you're to meet the uh, man you're to meet. Uh-huh. When you do meet him, you hand him this other envelope. In return, he'll give you a small package. You bring that back to your office, I pick it up here. Uh, how would I go about getting in touch with you if anything went wrong? I don't expect anything will, but in case of emergency, try my hotel. The Dama. Uh, you know, I just remembered a charge I might have to make in this particular case. Oh, what is it? It might be for you to have dinner with me or something. Dinner or something might be arranged, Mike. You we'll take the job? Sure, why not? I'll pay you a hundred dollars. I'm sure you'll earn every penny of it. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the gray-eyed blonde. I don't know. At the time, there was something awfully compelling about them. Plus, everything else about them, from her honey colored hair to her alligator sling pumps. Plus, of course, the fact that I'd just gotten my license reinstated a couple of weeks before, and that hundred she was offering looked like a lot of good living for a change. So, when she asked me to take the job of making a blackmail payment for her, I said yes. After she left, I opened the instruction envelope and read them over carefully. They were so thorough, I knew whoever this guy was, he wanted to be awfully sure he had the right party. I arrived at the indicated corner of Barrack Street ten minutes before midnight. Ten minutes early. The street was deserted except for a little red and white peanut wagon that a small olive-skinned gent was pushing down the street toward me. When he got to me, he stopped. A peanut, senor? Uh, no, thanks. They are fresh, senor. You're working kind of late, aren't you? Si, senor. These peanuts, senor, they are the best. Uh, tell me, you, uh, seen anyone around here in the last ten minutes? A man? Oh, you are looking for someone? Yeah, in a way. Then perhaps while you wait, senor, some peanuts. Uh, no, no, not now. Thanks. He gave me a very unhappy stare and then shrugged his shoulders and died. I started walking down the deserted street. My footsteps echoed on the pavement. It was darker than I thought it would be. No streetlights in this section. I kept trying to look over my shoulder, but I couldn't see anything. I knew that somewhere in that block, somebody was supposed to tap me on the shoulder, and I was wishing he'd hurry up and get it over. I was almost at the end of the block now. Still, nothing had happened. The building ahead of me on the corner was getting some work done on it. They had the front boarded up and had a boardwalk in place of the sidewalk. The street side of the boardwalk was boarded up, too. It was like a tunnel. I took a few steps into the pitch black tunnel and stopped. Something started bothering me. For a moment, I couldn't figure out what it was, but then I got it. Somebody was in that boarded tunnel with me. Before I could do or say anything, a hand stood across my mouth, and I could feel the muzzle of an automatic against the side of my neck. Brilliant boy that I am, I got the idea that mum was a word. 
Then the hand left my mouth and slid down and started going through my pockets. Pretty soon it came with the envelope I was supposed to deliver. Patted the envelope and slipped it back into my pocket. Well, that I didn't get at all. Then the gun pressed a little harder onto my neck. I suddenly knew that his finger was tightening on the trigger. I dove for the ground, the gun went off. Red hot poker seared the top of my head and then... Blackness. After what seemed like about a month, blackness started to fade. It faded still more, started turning to white. I knew I was in a hospital. Then I spotted some bars across the windows, and I got a strong hunch it was the receiving ward of the prison hospital. I tried to open my eyes more, which was pretty hard to do, because my head at this point felt like two little men were playing ping pong with a hunk of hot lead. But I did manage to see someone bending over me. It was Police Inspector Lefebvre. Not gonna die after all, hmm? <sighs> what odds could I get? You were lucky. Just got creased. That's lucky. Looks like you had a little argument with your sidekick. Pretty one-sided argument. Look, Inspector, maybe you wouldn't mind telling me what this is all about, huh? That's funny, Shane. I was just gonna ask you that. Huh? Mr. Graber, will you step in here now, please? Yes, Inspector? Mr. Graber, I want you to take a good look at this man. He the one? I can't be sure. He might be. It might be what? Look, I'm the one that got shot in the head, if that's... Just what you... a minute, Shane. I'm going to tell you something you might possibly already know. At this point, what I know is just a drop in the bucket of what I don't know. Mr. Frank Graber here is a vice president of the South Atlantic Exporting Syndicate. Ever hear of him? Yeah, yeah, they shipped to Cuba, South America, lots of places. I did some work for them last year. Yeah, I know. What's that got to do with... Coming to that. The day before yesterday, there was an unusually large deposit to be made. So large that Mr. Graber here himself started out with it. Something like uh, 60000 wasn't it, Mr. Graber? 62 In $1,000 bills. Yeah. Well, Mr. Graber never... Suppose you tell him what happened, Graber. Well, I went out the back door of the office building, and it wasn't until I opened my car door that I saw the man sitting inside. Had his hand up to the side of his face so that I couldn't get a clear look at it. But in the other hand was a gun. He forced me to drive down near the river, made me get out of the car and go into an abandoned warehouse. There he hit me over the head with his gun and took the money. That's too bad. But outside of welcoming you to the battered heads club, I still don't see that what... That guy could have been you, Shane. What do you mean? We found one of those thousand dollar bills in an envelope. In your pocket. About then, a lot of things started making sense. Why that guy in the dark wanted to be sure the envelope was in my pocket before he tried to kill me. Yeah, it looked like somebody was very interested in having me found dead with some of that robbery going on me. Thus getting me elected as chief suspect. But I knew it was going to be a tough story to sell the inspector. He ushered Graber out of the room and then came back and stood beside the bed, slowly shaking his head. Oh, I don't get it, Shane. Not three weeks ago, you were telling everybody what a good boy you were going to be if you could just get your license back. So they give you your license back, so here you are, right in the middle of something that smells to high heaven. Look, Inspector, I'm going to give it to you straight. It was a frame. No sale, Shane. Believe me, it's the truth. A girl named Helen... Yeah. Oh, I know it sounds phony, but it happened. She gave me a song and dance about hiring me to make a blackmail payment for her. But what she really wanted, she and her boyfriend, I guess, was to have me found dead with some of this dough on me, thereby taking the heat off. Mm -hmm. I suppose you can back up your story by producing this girl. I can try. Still not buying. Look, Inspector, I've always cooperated with you. Yeah, well, that's the only reason I'm even listening to you. So now I need a break, a big one. You can give it to me. The only thing I can give you is time. Uh, not much of that. How much? Well, my next way out. Right. I know that. You're not exactly alone, though. Well, it's 7 a.m. I'll give you until 10 o'clock tonight. Huh? Tonight? Have a heart. That doesn't give me... I said 10 o'clock tonight. Make it midnight, then. 10? Okay, 10 o'clock tonight. And Shane? Yeah? That's it. One way or another. Funny thing about the inspector... He always meant just exactly what he said. 
So I had something like 15 hours to find one woman in a city as big as New Orleans. A beautiful woman with gray eyes who'd almost done a very neat job of fitting me for a coffin. I lost two of those 15 hours getting part of my strength back and talking the doctor into giving me my pants. The only thing I had to go on was what Helen had told me about reaching her at the Hotel Donna. The desk clerk there remembered her just as soon as I mentioned the gray eyes. Oh, yes, sure. Let's see. Helen Collier she was registered under. Not bad. No, not bad at all. Uh, was registered? Yes, checked out first thing this morning. About six, I guess it was. No forwarding address, huh? No, asked her, but she said none. Well, thanks anyway. Might ask one of the cab drivers out front. Yeah, I'm going to. Thanks. <laughs> It didn't take me long to find out that none of the three cab drivers in front of the Hotel Donna could have taken Helen, because none of them came on until 7. But I did get the address of the driver who worked nights there, and 10 minutes later, I was pounding on his door. Yeah, 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 clever. What do you want? Are you Joe, the cab driver? Yeah, why? You have a fare this morning about 6? You woke me up to ask me that? Beat it. Hey, hey. come on, Joe. Open up. Look at friend. I don't know who you are, and it's just the way I want to keep it. Now, suppose I'm you... I'm not just... leaving until I get an answer from you. A girl about 5'4", gray eyes at the Hotel Donna. Where'd you take her? I don't know what you're talking about now. Beat it. Get your foot out of the door. Okay, we'll go inside. Hey, 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 what the... Now, look. The more you talk, the more I'm convinced you did take her somewhere. Now, open up. I've been through too much on account of that trade. I don't know what you're talking about. If you're trying to cover for her, you're making an awful big mistake, Joe. A mistake that could put you behind bars. Uh, she paid you to keep your mouth shut, huh? Okay, here's ten to open it. Look, from a friend. Be smart. Keep out of this deal. It's too late, Joe. Here's the ten. Open up. I got more than that for promise. Look, I... I haven't got all day, and ten's all you get. Maybe that's too much. Maybe I could beat the answer out of you and save myself a ten. Uh, now, which is it going to be? Okay, okay. All right, now you picked her up at the hotel down at six this morning. Yeah. Where'd you take her? From a friend. Let me give you a tip. Don't hold your breath till you see her again. What do you mean? Where I took her was the airport. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the gray-eyed blonde. It all started when a gray-eyed blonde named Helen hired me to make a blackmail payment for her. Only I found out too late it was a frame. I got shot in the head and woke up and found myself accused of a $62,000 robbery and was given just 15 hours by police inspector Lefebvre to find Helen and clear myself. So far, all I'd found was she'd left the hotel down at 6 that morning to go to the airport. Well, I was out there now talking to all the ticket clerks. Finally, I found one who remembered her. Oh, yes, uh, surely. Uh, those eyes of hers would be hard to forget. Well, which plane did she leave on, do you remember? Let's see, I... Uh, New York? No, that wasn't it. Uh, come on, come on, try to remember. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I, I remember now. Don't tell me it's that plane that's taking off out there. No, she didn't leave at all. What? No, I bought a ticket to Havana. Midnight plane. Tonight. <laughs> Well, at least I knew she was still in New Orleans. Of course, finding her would be something else again. And then I got an idea, a long shot maybe. But right now, the welcome mat was out for anything that would pass for a starting point. I went back to the Hotel Donna and over to the desk clerk. Yes? You uh, remember me? I was in here a couple of hours ago asking about that girl with... With the gray eyes, yes. You uh, really got it bad for her, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sorry, but she hasn't come back, and I told you she didn't leave a forwarding address. I know. Look, uh, her room, has it been straightened up yet? Well, probably not. Cleaning girl's a little slow. We're thinking of letting her go at the uh, end. How about letting me in the room for a look around? Oh, now, wait a minute. Well, why not? You've got it bad for the girl, and that's tough, but we can't have you traipsing through that room looking for her forwarding address. It's, uh, <clears throat> against the policy. Whose? Mine. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll make a deal. Deal? Yeah. Now, here's a five. Let's just say I'm engaging a room for a couple of hours as is. Oh, well, now, why didn't you say so in the first place? Here, I'll get the key. My only 
chance was that Helen wouldn't feel any reason to cover her tracks too carefully, since according to her plan, I was to have been long dead by now. I practically tore the room apart. Nothing. Then I thought of the wastebasket. There were two things in it. A piece of Kleenex with the imprint of a mouth and lipstick, and a torn half of a paper match folder. There was some printing on it. All I could make out were the first two letters, R.A., and below was the word cocktails. The name of a bar. And possibly, just possibly, a hangout of Helen's where she might be passing time and keeping undercover until that midnight plane to Havana. Oh, but which bar was it? How many of them started with R.A.? My guess was quite a few. But it didn't matter how many. I had to try all of them. I went back to my office. That was a mistake. I dropped into my chair and dropped my feet up on the desk. That was a big mistake. I figured I'd just rest a few minutes before I started out. That was a bigger mistake. I closed my eyes. That was my biggest mistake. When I opened my eyes again, I... I thought something had gone wrong with him. Everything was dark. Then I looked at my watch and almost went right up through the ceiling. Ten minutes to seven. I'd slept all afternoon. I had three hours left. I started out. The nearest bar on my list was a place with a quaint name of Rat Race. When I got there, things were already in high gear. I went in and, and I knew how the place got its name. The music was tailgate and loud. And it all came from five guys in the corner. A few couples were dancing, I guess you'd call it, on the floor about three sizes larger than a phone book. And the bartender sat at the end of the bar near the musicians reading a paper. I had a tough time making myself heard. What'll it be, Mac? Uh, you happen to know the girl. What's that? I say to you, I can't hear you. A girl named Helen, gray eyes, five feet forty, you know her? Oh, yeah, lots of girls around. I don't know, I don't think so. I suppose he's been asking too much to hit the jackpot on the first nickel. Talk louder, will you? No, skip it. Threaded my way through the dances and the smoke and went out. One down, eight to go. I checked the rat race off my list, went to a place called Rady's in a pretty seamy neighborhood. It was a lot darker than the rat race here, and a lot quieter. Hospitable, too. I'd hardly gotten inside before a furnace eyed brunette sidled up. Hello. Hello. You wasn't someone? Yeah, yeah. Here I am. Uh, no, no. The girl I'm looking for is named Helen. Gray eyes. Oh, no, no, no. What's wrong with my eyes? They're brown. And eyes. Yeah, so I see. It's like a dance. Have a drink. Mm-hmm. Uh, thanks, anyway. So I crossed off Rady's and kept going. And I kept drawing blanks. Rays, Ravaccinis, radio room. When it got to be after nine, and I could practically feel the inspector's official and heavy hand on my shoulder. My head was throbbing again, and I was getting weaker by the minute. So I guess I was none too steady as I walked down the street. And then as I passed a little red and white peanut wagon parked at the curb, an olive-skinned little gent darted out in front of me. Senor. Uh, oh, you again. Senor, is something wrong? You... Uh, no, no, I'm just tired. Uh, here, senor, have some of my nice peanuts. Nice fresh peanuts. No, thanks. Now, you kind of get around town, don't you? See, si, but, senor, they're the most delicious peanuts. They will help I you. I don't want any peanuts, man. But I tell you, senor, they're fine peanuts. The best peanuts this side of Havana, senor. Can't you understand it? What about Havana? Senor, what have I done? What have I said to a friend? Please don't let me go. What'd you say about Havana? Nothing, senor, nothing, nothing. It's just a place where I was born, senor. Havana, my home, that is all, senor. You know anything about that midnight plane to Havana tonight? No, senor, I swear it. I know nothing about the midnight plane to Havana, except I would like to be on it. Okay. Okay. I let go of him and he dotted around to the other side of his wagon. I staggered on down the street. I still wasn't sure whether he'd been trying to tell me something or not. I didn't have time to figure it out. I had to keep going. Then I went to Ramon's, the next place on the list. It was a small place, no music. Only a couple of people at the bar, and the bartender was watching me very carefully. Hello. What can I do for you? You uh, happen to know a girl named Helen, gray eyes? No. Uh Uh-huh. I see. You, You happen to have a light on you? Light? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I walked back to the door and went out. I was trying hard not to tremble. Because the trail had gotten hot, very hot. That bartender had been just a little too quick to say he didn't know Helen. If I needed any more proof, he'd given it to me. The matchbook he'd used to give me a light was the same kind as the fragment I was carrying in my pocket. Yeah, 
I knew I'd finally found the place. I went around the corner, eased into the alley, and waited. Pretty soon, a side door opened, and out came Helen. Hey! Hey, wait a minute! Well, hello, Mike. You really shouldn't have, you know. Found you? Mm Mm-hmm. Better look behind you. Oh, no. That's too old a gag to... In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. I guess the business of one thing canceling out another is true. That hit on the head sort of blotted out the throbbing of the wound. And when I came to and found myself lying on the floor in a little room, my head was a lot better than I'd figured. Numb, I guess. I could hear voices... Two of them. Things to do. I told you and to suddenly they began you. registering. I couldn't help it, Helen. I had to oh. see you. Well, it's a good thing I did, too. Shane was almost ready to grab you when I hit him just now. It's all your fault, anyway. Why didn't you finish the job last night when you had him on the board? I tried to. Wait a minute. Uh, He's coming to. Yeah. Yeah, I've come to. So, trustworthy vice president, Mr. Frank Graber, is the big boy of the deal. Now, you shut up, Shane. You might get an argument as to who the brains really was, Mike, but it doesn't matter now. Pretty neat. Grable walks off with the money and tells the police a fairy tale about being robbed. Then the two of you nominate me for the fall guy. Graber's supposed to kill me, so I'll be found with some of the dough and therefore become the chief suspect. Only Grable misses. Figured it all out, didn't you, Mike? Well, Frank, I guess there's only one thing to do. Yes. And I knew what that one thing was. I knew I had to think fast and act fast to prevent that one thing from happening. If I could just divert their attention from me long enough for a dive at the window or door. And then I thought of something. Something that might possibly take their minds off me for just a second. Come on, Frank. Get it over with. I uh, I suppose you've told Graber about that plane ticket, Helen. What? Uh, to Havana on the midnight plane. What ticket? Why, he doesn't know what he's saying, No, no, Frank. no, wait. What ticket? Don't you see? He's just trying to upset you. You bought a ticket you. on the midnight plane to Havana. Frank, I didn't... You were going to run out on me. Oh, don't be You were going to take all that money and run out on That's me. That's not true. I told you I wasn't. I guess I knew all along, Helen. Only I just wouldn't face it. But I guess I knew all along. What are you talking about? I knew. All the time you were telling me you loved me. What? How we'd wait until the heat was off and then I'd retire on account of ill health and no, take just... the money and go to South America and have a wonderful time. Frank... All the time you were telling me those things, I... I knew you didn't mean them. I knew it. I wanted to believe it. I wanted You're to... all wrong. You kept I, I meant... working on me. You finally got me to do this thing. Because you were like a disease. Well, you were in my blood. Not... Now you are going to run out on me. But I won't let you. No, Frank, it's not true. It's too bad. No. You won't get to use that ticket. Helen, my darling. Frank. There was a gun in his hand. Was pointed at Helen. I could see she didn't believe it, but I did. I dove at him, and just as I hit him, the gun. Went off. Helen slowly sagged to the floor. I got hold of his wrist, but I was off balance, and he was bringing the gun slowly around toward me. And, and then, just as it got to me, I twisted as hard as I could, and we both went down. The gun went off again. <laughs> then the gun dropped out of his hand. He just sort of crumpled over and lay still. I stared hard at the widening red stain on his coat, right over his heart. Well, I got a call through to the inspector right away, and he sort of took over from there. And that was just about that. With all the loose ends tied up one way or another. Oh, yeah, except one, that plane ticket to Havana, the one Helen had bought. Nobody seemed to know quite what to do with it. Because she'd bought it with her own money instead of the robbery doll. Of course, I had an idea what to do with it, but... Well, I gave it up after a while. I I guess the little peanut vendor needed it more than I did. Of course, I didn't just give it to him. It was was strictly a business deal. Yeah, I traded him the ticket for his peanut wagon. So now, if the detective business ever gets too tough, well... I've always got a (laughs) sideline. Director Bill Rizzo.
so again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another thrilling adventure from mysterious and colorful New Orleans. Mr. Moto, Mr. I. A. Moto. NBC presents the world's greatest international secret agent, Mr. I. A. Moto, the popular Japanese character created by Pulitzer Prize winner John P. Marquand. With the straightforwardness of his American heritage and with the subtlety of his Oriental ancestors, Mr. Moto is fighting the war against communism ruthlessly and bravely. His only weapons are his brains, his courage, and his fabulous knowledge of the world from Nome to Cape Horn, from Cape Town to Murmansk. Tonight's story, The Smokescreen, starring Mr. Moto. Mr. I. A. Moto. The boy, unbelievably young, writhed on the floor of my New York apartment. His legs convulsed in the rope which tied them together. His thin adolescent wrists strained hopelessly at the handcuffs. It is impossible not to feel sympathy for a human being possessed by such a devil. He had bitten his forefinger almost through. He screamed about a white crippled cat that clawed at him. There were hollows of anguish under his eyes. His skin glistened bloodless, and his throat stretched with suffering. Mr. Moto, please, please. Tell me the truth, Sash. Melt me a cat and I will. Please, Mr. Moto, mount me some of God's medicine. I can stand it much longer than you, Zash. And I have plenty of time. I'm going crazy. Crazy! Zash, there are a hundred tons of opium somewhere on Manhattan Island. You know where. Now, tell me. I can't. They'll kill me. They won't. They will. They're devils. Please, Mr. Moto. I'm an addict. I'm hooked. Give it to me. You can break the habit, Zash. I'll help you. You can be strong again, because you are young. I can't kick it, I tell you. I'm hooked. And I'm not young. I'm old. began in several cities of the world at once. And at first, I was the only one in America who knew of its beginnings. My information came from a friend from Tokyo, a Count Takahashi, a man of immense wealth who flew from Japan to New York to have one hour's conversation with me. Immediately after my talk, I called on Captain Beresford of the Narcotic Bureau in his New York office. Captain Beresford is a quiet cultured man who seldom swears, seldom raises his voice. My story shocked him into a hard-faced, stunned silence. Mr. Moto, I... I can't believe it. I am afraid, Captain Beresford, that it is quite, quite true. Tell me about this Count Taka... whatever you said. Count Takahashi, an old Japanese family. My house once served his house with honor and self-sacrifice. He feels he owes me a debt. Do you mean to say he flew all the way from Japan just to talk to you for an hour? He did. You see, he knows what opium has done to the Orient. 
And you're sure his information is accurate? As I am that the sun will rise in the morning. He is an ex-addict himself. I see. He knows how dangerous a weapon it can be. For 700 years, this drug has debilitated, weakened, ruined. While we may think it is impossible here, the fact remains that at one time in history, 25% of the population of the Orient either smoked opium or were addicted to its morphine derivatives. Oh, but surely in the United States we're I to... wonder if we are. We are an erratic, excitable people. Opium has an enchantment that is difficult to resist. That is why it is so terribly dangerous. Yes, I know. Count Takahashi has reason to believe that four months ago, a shipment of 50 tons of raw opium was dumped on the market in Hong Kong. From there, it went to Tokyo. In Tokyo, it disappeared. How? It vanished as completely as if it had been swept into the sea. Hmm. Five days ago, an additional 200 tons did the same thing. Vanished. Disappeared from sight as completely as a, a tea bug in the heart of a poppy. 400 tons of opium, Captain Beresford, would supply the entire medical needs of the world for two years. The whole world. For two years. Well, frankly, I just can't believe that 400 tons of anything could get into this country without the customs department getting wind of it somewhere. The drug was smuggled to America aboard a submarine owned by the Chinese Communist Navy. It was taken ashore at night on Stewart Island. The San Juan Islands? Yes, hmm. in the state of Washington. From there it came across the continent in trucks as a shipment of canned salmon. And your friend believes it has... International implication? Count Takahashi assures me it is another tentacle of a communist octopus. Spread the dope habit. Devour the blood of America's young men and women. Lower the birth rate. You know, of course, that prolonged drug addiction frequently results in sterility. Certainly I know. Moto, we've got to work fast. Exactly, Captain Beresford. I have asked that this be made my personal assignment. <laughs> Two weeks later, a resolution condemning the Chinese communists for permitting an international traffic of opium was adopted by the United Nations. The next month, the Kitfofa Committee was informed that large quantities of the drug would be routed through Japan to America. Captain Beresford was getting alarmed. Moto, I'm getting stepped on from higher up. In what way? There were 26 rejections yesterday from one, one army recruiting center. Draftees claimed exemption on the grounds of dope addiction. There's been 43 cases in the last week of teachers discovering addiction in children as young as 10. 10? Isn't that sickening? Man's inhumanity to his brother. Yes, was but a lot of people are getting excited. I've been given two weeks to break this case. We've got to work through the children. I have exhausted every possible alternative. Yet for me, the children are difficult. What do you mean? For a Japanese bachelor to make friends with teenagers is more difficult than it sounds. Boys, as well as girls, are suspicious of older men who attempt casual conversation. Very that. What? I've had an idea. Jeffrey Ellington. Who's he? I read in the paper yesterday that he had recently been appointed chairman of the board of trustees of Halsey College. You know him? I knew him casually in the Orient. We were never close friends but I would have no hesitation in telephoning him. What for? He might invite me to the school to uh, lecture on Japanese culture. Well, it doesn't sound too hopeful, but we're at the end of our rope. What's he like? I should say he is one of the most charming men I have ever met. He was born in the Orient. His father, an Englishman, left him phosphate holdings in the South Pacific, which he sold to the British government for something over two million pounds sterling. He lives in New York? Yes in a vast house on Fifth Avenue. He's middle-aged now, and he gives his time to philosophy and his money to charity. He injured his leg as a boy. He has difficulty walking, and as a result, he's intensely interested in young people and youth work. Wants to see them get every opportunity for self-development. With that attitude and two million pounds, he might be very useful. I shall telephone him immediately and invite myself to luncheon. <laughs> But, Moto, I don't quite understand why you're suddenly so interested in meeting young people. Jeffrey, may I be very rude and not tell you? Oh, your work. I see. 
Well, as a matter of fact, you've chosen a good time. In what way? Oh, do you mind if we have our liqueurs at the table instead of in the drawing room? My leg's acting up a bit today. Not at all. Uh, did I mention I've just recently been elected chairman of the Board of Trustees for Halsey College? Yes, I read about it. I'm beginning to center my ambitions in the coming generation. I'd like them not to lose faith in their elders. I would like them not to lose faith in themselves. Well, then you may count on my complete cooperation. The reason I say you've chosen a good time is that tomorrow night I'm giving a sort of graduation party for all these students. be about 200 of them. Would you like to come? You can meet every single one of them if you want to. I should like that very much. <laughs> Fine. Buffet, supper, and dancing. Come any time you like after 9 o'clock. The next night, the huge house blazed with light. Two hundred young people were dancing and drinking champagne. In a way, they were representative of the young of our country. Clean, decent, honest. Watching them whirl around the big ballroom, I felt proud, yet sadly nostalgic. These are troubled times for the young. They live in the threat of war. The draft hangs over their careers and their marriages. Tonight, there is a desperate quality to their merriment, as though they were snatching one last hour of dancing before settling their bill with a piper. Well, Momo, enjoying yourself? But are we not both at the age, Jeffrey, where enjoyment to be really favored should be taken in small doses? Yes, I suppose we are. Personally, I wonder where they get the vitality. That boy, there, is getting his from a source other than the young lady's laughing eyes. Of what boy? The one dancing with the girl in the white taffeta. The big blonde boy. Have you noticed his eyes? Oh, what do you mean? The pinpoint brilliant pupils. I was introduced to him. When I shook hands with him, I was shocked. Shocked? Oh, why? His skin temperature is at least 102. See, Moto, what are you getting at? I am suggesting that the young man is a morphine addict. Moto? Yes, a rather recent addiction. Well, you're... You're joking. On the contrary, Jeffrey. I'm deadly serious. Dope addiction in adolescence is all I think about these days. I'm working on it constantly. Oh, would you care to tell me about it? Certainly, if you are interested. But come along up to my desk. It's uh, upstairs, away from the rest of the house, and the party will run quite smoothly without us. Then, by all means, you lead the way. Uh, through that door. I had a small elevator installed from the garage to the fourth floor. After you. Thanks. Go ahead. The elevator's automatic. Thank you. How wonderful to be able to afford private elevators. Uh, my leg bothers me quite a bit. Stairs are difficult for me. Moto, are you sure about this dope business? Quite sure. Now, this is my own private hideaway. In here I can be quite cut off from the rest of the house. Uh, sit down, make yourself comfortable. Thank you. Would you like a drink? Yes, thanks. Good, good. I have some very special rye whiskey. Hanfield Royal Ark. I believe it sells in the Chambord for $25 a pony. Really? And you're wasting it on me? <laughs> Not at all. I only serve it to my very special friends. Here you are. Thank you. Hmm, what superb bouquet. Oh, you'll forgive me if I don't join you. My doctor forbids it. Certainly. Now, tell me about this dreadful business. Oh, excuse me, won't you? This phone never rings unless it's something important. Hello. Oh, yes, Senator. I, uh, I'm afraid I can't tell you yet, but I can let you know by tomorrow noon. Well, yes, of course. I'll call you tomorrow, then. Oh, not at all. Good night. Forgive the interruption. Now, you were saying... I have been working without success for some time now on the problem of dope addiction among teenagers. Yes. I have reason to believe that... Jeffrey, has it suddenly gotten uh, very warm in here? 
Lord, what, what is it? Are you ill? I... I hurt me up. Quickly. Oh, what's the matter, Moto? I... I don't know. Don't you, Moto? I do. Trepal, get over here quickly. I found the source of our interference. Use the garage entrance and the elevator and hurry, will you? <laughs> oh, what a pity the Japanese haven't learned to mind their business. It's about time. I got here as soon as I could, Mr. Errington. Who's that? His name is Moto. And don't underestimate him. A uh, trip in a boat? Yes. Can you do it tonight? Sure. And get him out of here. Anybody see you come in? I drove into the garage, took the elevator. I'll pick him up and get him out of here. What did you give him? The usual. He'll be unconscious for at least three hours. Good. Okay. And he's small, isn't he? Saw rattlesnakes. You coming? Yes, go ahead. All right, don't worry, Mr. Ellington. Everything's okay. Anything to report? Yeah, Zasha's in the car. I don't want peddlers who are addicts themselves. It's dangerous. Zasha's okay. Take him to the house on Long Island tomorrow. No withdrawal. He'll kick it cold turkey. Tell Dr. Holliston to cut him off cold. That's an order. All right, Mr. Ellington. Anything else? Yeah, Nick got 40 new peddlers in the last week. Get young ones. Real young. 14, 13. The younger, the better. Okay. Will I put our friend in the back seat? Yes, he'll be out for three hours. Hello, Zosh. Hi. He's just hitched up the monkey. He's floating. I mean it, Trepov. He kicks it tomorrow. Okay, boss. Now, what about the chink? Oh, hey, listen, boss. You know I... how I react to that kind of word. It's bigoted and disgusting. He is not Chinese. He's actually an American of Japanese descent. Well, I didn't mean anything. What are you... What are you so touchy on that stuff? Someday I'll tell you. All right, take Mr. Moto out in the boat, shoot him, and dump him overboard. As far offshore as you can get and still be back by dawn. Then take Zosh out to the Long Island house and report back here to me. All right, boss. And, uh, trap off. Yes, Mr. Rankin? Tell the good Dr. Holliston that I'm quite aware of the process involved in developing morphine from opium. Tell him I expect him to do much better. I want 5,000 decks a day out of that lab. Uh-huh. Can I go now? Yes. And I'm... Sorry I struck you. Someday I'll explain why I feel so strongly about... Well... Good night, Trevor. Big meathead, who's he think he's pushing around? <clears throat> All right, get over so I should stay awake. Hi, boy. I tell you, the cat's swinging high tonight. No wave at anybody. This is Fifth Avenue. Gentlemen, hey. I am quite capable of shooting you both. What? And don't turn around, Mr. Trepoff. Just drive. My apartment, if you please. Left on 72nd. And if you don't do as I tell you, I will blow your head off. Keep quite still, Trepov. I'm warning you. Come in, Captain. I got here as soon as... Hey, what's this? This is a man named Trepov. He was commissioned by Jeffrey Errington to kill me. Errington? Incredible, isn't it? Errington tried to drug me with chloral hydrate and whiskey. 
He made a slight error, which I will explain later. I was to have been taken out of the boat. I overheard enough information to send Arrington and his gang to jail for 20 years. Take this man and book him for felonious assault, attempted murder, whatever you like. All right. What? Well, what's the matter with the boy? Hiya, copper. Having fun? That is Zush. He's riding morphine a million miles away. Okay, now come on, you. You can't make it stick, copper, never. Uh, leave me your handcuffs, will you, Captain? What are you going to do? Perform an experiment. Whatever you say. Thank you. And come back here as soon as you can. And then began the heartbreaking vigil. The boy dozed on the floor alone in a world of drugged enchantment. I tied his feet together, restrained the thin wrists with Beresford's handcuffs. By the time the captain got back, Zash was conscious. Normally defiant and belligerent. Think I'm going to spill anything to you guys? You're nuts. We've got lots of time, Zash. By five in the morning, he was white-faced and pleading. Listen, Moto. I've got two decks with me. The three of us can jump together. Come on, Captain. There's a needle in a box in my pocket. Please. No, Zash. No. By seven, he was crying. By ten, he was screaming. <laughs> By noon, he was suffering unbelievably. The hacking attic's cough racked at his frail lungs. A thousand devils tore at every whip-lashed, quivering nerve. I'm dying, I tell you. I'm dying, dying, dying! At one in the afternoon, he talked. Names, addresses, everything. Captain Beresford took it down. And then... Because we were afraid complete withdrawal might kill him, we called a doctor. The doctor gave him two grains in his right arm. As always, the results appalled me. As the morphine hit, his eyes became dewy bright. The glow of health returned to his cheeks. He went quite happily with the doctor to Bellevue. I wish every kid in America could have seen that. If they knew what it could do, they'd... Oh, it's so rotten. Yes. Well, take 20 men to the Long Island house. You will catch Dr. Holliston doing the converting. Send another detail to raid the warehouse in the Bronx. Right. Oh, and what about Arrington? Mr. Arrington I shall deal with personally. In the Fifth Avenue house? Yes. He really moves quite slowly. He injured his hip as a boy. I shall step out of the elevator with a gun in one hand and this in the other. What is it, a knife? In Japan, it is the national form of honorable suicide. Literally translated, it means belly cut. You know it better, perhaps, as harakiri. <coughs> I'm a cripple. I, I, I... Sign it. No. Now take that knife away from my eyelids. Harrington, there is no time for discussion. I have a right to, to a trial, a, a free democratic trial. Harrington, to... you have no rights at all. This morning I watched a boy suffer agonies. But what is the use of telling you? You know. In five seconds I shall go to work with this knife. <laughs> Believe me, you will not enjoy it. I, listen, now. One, I... two... You're insane, you're... Three! Four! All right, all right, I will. I will, but for heaven's sake, take that knife away from my eyelids. Sign it. Thank you. And now, before I take you to Captain Beres, but one question. Why? What is behind this monstrous inhumanity? You've no idea. Short of pathological insanity, none. I... I'm a Eurasian. You... You're what? Yes. I'm surprised you didn't guess. I really look very white, don't I? I'm gifted, educated. But I committed an unpardonable sin. My mother was a Singhalese peasant. I knew it. I knew there must be something. White Asiatics forbid my cleaning toilets... 
They also forbid me to enter their clubs or their homes. I'm neither white nor yellow nor black. I'm not a European. I'm not an Asiatic. What am I? Tell me. It is so useless to beat a tent. Useless? It's hell. I'm nothing. The wandering, hopeless, marginal man. Outside of a barefoot, savage, peasant girl, there isn't one woman in Asia who would marry me. If I marry a white woman here and take her to Singapore, what do I let her in for? Insults, heartbreak, misery. I want to live in the East. Singapore is the only civilized city in the world, but I can't, I can't, I can't join their stinking bourgeois club. But ancient democracy... Democracy! I spit at it! I hate it! I hate the world! Don't you see it? Is this... Do you know how I was crippled? A gang of melees beat my hip to a pulp in a Singapore street fight. Hate. Moto, you don't know the meaning of the world. And every grain of morphine in the veins of an American boy means one less enemy for communism. And I don't care who the boy is. You must care. I don't. Not even for Zosh. Zosh? Zosh is my son. Well, now you know. Now you can take me down to your police station and introduce me to justice. Do you know why she's pictured with a bandage over her eyes? Because if justice could see, she'd throw up. Mr. Moto, we've done it. 26 indictments and charging conspiracy to import opium. We've got every single one of them. And recovered the opium? Over 500 tons of it. Good. Then the smoke screen has lifted. But I have one of my own. But surely everything is quite, quite clear. That whiskey Arrington gave you the night of the party. Why didn't you drink it? He had to be dramatic. He told me it was Hanfield Royal Ark Special Rye. It so happened it is distilled in England. During the war, the warehouse was bombed. All but five cases of Hanfield Royal Ark were destroyed. They never manufactured that particular blend again. But Arrington is wealthy. Wasn't it possible? No, he... no, no. Of the five remaining cases, Sir Graham Hanfield gave three to King Farouk of Egypt as a wedding gift on the occasion of his first marriage. Don't tell me that the other two were... Yes. In return for a trifling service some years ago, Sir Graham gave them to me. <laughs> Moto, you're incredible. Don't you ever make a mistake? Sometimes, sometimes I wince and lash out inside. When people call me a dirty Jap. I was born in San Francisco. I am as American as you are. Oh, but surely these people are... Uh, well, they're... That is true. They are ignorant and narrow, and their number is decreasing. Yes, I think we're growing up. Slowly, maybe, but growing. I hope it is not too slowly. I hope we achieve maturity before it is too late. That is one way... Everybody can fight communism simply by growing up and out of prejudice. It is a battle in which every one of us can be a soldier. have just heard the world's greatest international secret agent, Mr. I.A. Moto, in Smokescreen. James Monk starred as Mr. Moto. The script was written and directed by Harry W. Junkin, produced by Carol Irwin. Others in the cast were Ross Martin, Bob Haig, Bernard Grant, and Edwin Bruce. The music was transcribed. This is Fred Collins speaking, and here with a preview of next week's story is Mr. I.A. Moto. The poet Sain Chua has written, A man who lives a falsehood must each day die a little. Next week, the story of truth twisted. A journey into horror made by a gracious woman and her desperate son, both caught in a sickening web of blackness. And now may sleep fall upon your eyes 
as softly as puppy petals on a placid pool. May your soul be blessed with repose, your dreams with enchantment. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. My name's Diamond. If you spotted me on the street, you'd probably figure me for an average working man. But you'd be wrong. I fit the description all right because I break my back six days a week to keep my piggy bank nice and stuffed. But my occupation puts me in a class by myself. I'm a private, honey, nothing in this world but detective. You probably say, so what? The average working man comes under the heading of a lot of different jobs. And you'd be right on that count. But there's one little thing that puts me in a class all by myself. Trouble. Mr. and Mrs. Average John Doe work six days a week to keep clear of it. I put in the same time playing footsies with it. It's a kind of silent partner with references dating all the way back to the year one. People get in trouble every second, and I count on a small percentage to come to me to get them out of it. The rest? Odds and good advertising. As an example, take the other night in a little bistro over on 48th Street. A couple of guys sitting at a back table were getting set for a special brand of trouble. The big kind that you find under the heading of murder. Oh, Bert, old boy, this is turning out to be a wonderful evening. I'm glad you're enjoying it, George. Yes. See, who's a blonde over there in the booth? Hmm? Well, I've never seen her before, but she's cute. Yeah, she's sure. Good evening, baby. Oh, George, George, yeah. take it what? easy. What? Maybe she's waiting for someone. Oh, don't be silly. Look, she's smiling. <laughs> Let's ask her over to the table. Well, huh? I still think she's waiting for someone. If you want to take the chance, go ahead. You ask her. All right, I will. Oh. said good evening. Good evening. Uh, my friend and I noticed you were sitting alone, and uh, we wondered if you'd join us. Oh, I don't believe I can. You see... Oh, please, just for a few drinks? No, really. Uh, thank you just the same. Well, if you say so, but I'll be unhappy for the rest of the evening. Hi, baby. Tony. I'm sorry I took so long, but... Hey, who's this guy? Not Tony. I said, who's the guy? Uh, if you'll excuse me. No, you wait a minute. Uh, George, come on. I think we'd better leave. This guy a friend of yours? Yes, he is. Was this guy making a pitch, man? No, he only asked me over for a drink. Oh, he did, huh? Now, wait a minute, pal. Please, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. So you made a mistake. Well, I don't like jokers that try and pick up my girl. Oh, <laughs> hey, wait a minute. You didn't have to slug him. Maybe you'd like to do something about it. Maybe I would. Oh, <laughs> Loud enough. <laughs> Well, that's the first time Tony ended up on the short end of a fight in a long time. All right, George. Yes, I think I cut my head. Yeah, you're bleeding all over the place. You better get out of here, mister. I saw the manager duck in the back room. He's probably calling the car. Here, let me give you a hand, George. Uh, uh, here, now, uh, take my hat and wear it over the cut until you get home. I'm getting out of here, too. You want me to drop you off? Uh, what about your boyfriend? He's still unconscious. He was that way when I met him. You want the lift or not? Yeah, hey, what about you, Bert? Oh, I'll be all right. Now, go on. Let her take you somewhere so you can get cleaned up. I'll grab a cab and head for my place. I'll call you in the morning. But I don't Now, want stop to... arguing. You can't afford a scandal. Uh, all right. Come on, honey. Let's go. Well, this... Very nice apartment. You better go get cleaned up. Uh, back to that room. I'll get a couple of drinks. I can sure use a drink. I won't be long. Take your time. Yes. T- 
Help me get out of here. Where is that guy? Oh, I... Get out of here. Why, you cheap little... I'll beat it out of you. Let go of me. Down. He can't off me. Take ah! your hands off her. Help. I'll kill the both of you. Help. There's a gun in the stand. A gun? All right. I'll wring your little neck. Ah. Oh. You shot him. I did? You better get out of here. Yeah, but uh, what about you? Go on, get out while you can. I'll think of something. Yes. Leave the gun. I'll throw it the river or something. Hmm? Huh? Oh, all right. Now go on, beat it. You just killed a man. Yeah, come in. Hey, Mr. Diamond. Well, Hennessy, what did you do, wreck your cab? Nah, it's down in the front. Hey, that's a warm magazine you're reading there. Yeah. Listen to what it says here about women's bathing suits. Huh? 1949 suits allow maximum exposure to sun. Note plunging neckline. <laughs> Note. Who's going to miss it? If it plunged in the lower, it'd wind up at the bends. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Mr. Diamond, would you mind shoving it in the drawer? The picture distracts me. Mm, not at all, no. I, I don't blame you, Hennessy. Thanks. Now, what's on your mind? This. A hat? Yeah. Well, I don't think I can do you much good. What did you bring it to me for? I found it in the gutter over in Flatbush. So what? Some guy loses a hat. Don't tell me you want me to find him. No, I, I just got to worrying a little, you see. I, I found this beside you. Oh, a thirty-eight. Well, let's have a look. Take a look at the hat, too. It's got blood all over the inside. Yeah. And initials on the inside. BK. Gun's been fired. You can still smell the powder in the barrel. Why didn't you take this to the police? Oh, I didn't want to get mixed up in it. You see, I got to pick up as many fares as I can. I ain't got nobody to drive my cab for me, and I didn't want to spend the day answering questions down at headquarters. You understand? Well, you'll probably have to anyway. I'll have to notify them. Yeah? Well, I, I thought maybe you could find out who owned the hat and maybe solve the case before you notify him, you see? That way I wouldn't have to spend too much time. I could just tell him I found it and beat it. Well, I can't withhold evidence. It'd take away my license. And if you did, they'd lock you up. Okay, I, I just thought Well, maybe... I can check the hat store before I get to the 5th Precinct. Yeah, well, uh, won't that be a tough job? There's a lot of hat stores, well, you this know. this hat's got a label. Besides, when someone finds a bloody hat with a thirty-eight lying next to it, I, I get interested. Particularly when there isn't a corpse to go with it. Yeah. Well, I gotta go, Mr. Diamond. Thanks a lot. You got a free ride any time you want it. I may take you up on that. So long, Hennessy. Well, there you are. What did that tell you? When you're working with trouble, something always shows up. Sometimes it's just a routine case. A guy knocks off his wife and he comes to you because he suddenly found out that he had that lonely feeling. Or maybe you get a real screwy one. A taxidermist that got tired of stuffing animals and went to work on a neighbor. Or then you get one that gives you the same feeling you get when you pick up a poker hand and the first four cards you look at are all spades. Well, I was holding two cards. A hat with blood on it, a gun that had been fired, and all I needed to fill out the hand was a body. By all rights, I should have taken the evidence right down to my friend, Lieutenant Levinson, at Homicide. But I didn't have anything to do, so I decided to see what kind of pieces I could fit into the puzzle. The label in the hat was from a store on Fifth Avenue. It wasn't far from my office, so I walked it. Yes, sir. Something I can do for you? Yeah. Stop munching your sensen and tell me if this hat is from your store. Well, let me see it. These glasses are not telescopes, you know. Yeah. Here. Well, if you're planning to return this merchandise, sir, I can assure you the store will not accept it. You've been bleeding on the sweatband. Look, Rosebud, I just want to know if the hat is from this store. It most certainly is. It's one of our custom models. Who did you sell it to? If you found this hat, we will be glad to return it to its owner. We are not supposed to give out the names of our clients. I have a small badge here that should cut this conversation down to a few words. See? Oh. Now, would you mind telling me to whom did you sell this hat? Well, just because you're a detective, I am not impressed. However, under the circumstances, I'll give you the buyer's name. You're a real sport. I suppose you wear a shoulder holster, too. Or is that bulge your tailor's fault? Psst. Come here. I really keep a midget in there. You don't say. Yeah. 
He spits through the lapel of stupid hat clerks. Oh, really? Now, come on, Bright Eyes. Who bought the hat? Well, if you'll just hold your horses. That's the new line, if I ever heard one. Come on, Bubbles. Yeah. Here it is. This hat was sold to a Mr. Bertram Kalmus. We make all his hats for him. Well, bully for you. What's his address? 430 Sutton Place. Now, will that be all, sir? Yes, that will be all, and thank you. You've been a break through the whole ugly mess. I left him watering his gardenia and headed for the residence of one Mr. Bertram Kalmus. The apartment house was about ten blocks away, and with the money I had in my pocket, all taxicabs started looking like iron claws with four wheels. I walked. Yes? How do you mean that? Yes, I don't want any. Oh, and I've got a pretty good sales talk. I never buy anything unless I have a demonstration. My middle name is Semper Paratus. Like the Coast Guard, I'm always prepared. I suppose I could top that, but I'm getting tired of trying to close the door on your foot. What is it you want? I hate to admit it, but I'm looking for Bertram Kalmus. My husband. Good for him. Is he in? No, but he will be any minute. And for the boss. This hat, I believe, is his. What blonde's apartment did it turn up in? It was found in a gutter in Flatbush. Well, Flatbush is a little out of his territory, but the gutter sounds familiar. It's that stain all over it. Blood? Does your husband bleed a lot? Not recently. We've been getting along. Are you from the police? I'm a detective. Oh. Come in. Mm, I'd hate to be selling brushes. I'd have slammed the door on your face. Oh, well, then I made an impression. Perhaps. Let's just say you're waiting for a sacrifice to move you to second base. <laughs> Won't you sit down? Thanks. What happens when I round third? And that depends on your batting average, Mr. Diamond, Mrs. Kalmus. That's it. Now, getting back to a very dull subject, does this hat belong to your husband? I don't know. It looks like one of his. Has it got any initials in the band? Mm-hmm. B.K. When did you find it? I didn't. The cab driver picked it up this morning. And it isn't my husband's blood. He left about a half an hour ago to do some shopping, and he was very bloodless. No cuts on his head? No cuts. He came in around two this morning. He'd been drinking, but he wasn't cut up. Oh, there he is now. I hope he can discuss baseball and the time. Oh, I got all the things you wanted in it. Um, Bert, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a detective. Yeah? Well, how are you? Fine, Mr. Calvin. Tell me, is this your hat? My hat? Let me see it. Why, no. No, it isn't. The hat store on Fifth Avenue says it's older to you. Well, I can't help what they say. That's not my hat. Are you sure, darling? It was found in a gutter. I don't care if they found it on a Yale man in the Harvard Club. It's not mine. Well, I guess I'll have to take your word for it. Uh, wait, wait. Isn't that blood on the hat? Mm, yeah. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Calmus. Mr. Calmus, nice meeting you both. I'll see you to the door. I can do it. I know you can, dear. Coming, Mr. Diamond? Sure. Goodbye. Come back again, Mr. Diamond. Well, goodbye, Mr. Calmus. Where? Where can I call you? What? I can't explain now. Where can I call you in about a half an hour? My office. It's in the book. You'll hear from me, but please, please don't do anything until then. Okay. Half an hour. Then I go to the police with this hat. <laughs> I couldn't say anything to you in front of my wife. That is my hat. Well, I thought so. Why did you deny it? Well, I was out with a pal last night. There was a fight over a girl. I didn't want to mention it in front of my wife. Oh, how did the blood get on the hat? My friend got hit on the head, and I loaned him my hat to cover up the wound. What was it doing in a gutter in Flatbush? I really don't know. My friend left with the girl, and I went right home. Mm. Well, who is this friend of yours? I think something may have happened to him. Well, I called him this morning, and he seemed very nervous about something, and he asked me to come over. I'm in the lobby of this hotel right now. Ah, uh, he's probably just worried about the girl he picked up. As long as the blood on the hat was from a cut on his head, I don't think there's too much to worry about. No, no, Mr. Diamond, I, I think it's more than that. He's my employer, and I know him pretty well. I do wish you'd come over. Well, all right, Mr. Calmus. What's the address? The Whitsitt Hotel on East 54th Street. I'll meet you in the lobby. Don't ask me why I started getting that lousy feeling when all I had was a bloody hat, a gun, and a pretty good explanation for one of the items. But there it was. 
that jammed up feeling in the pit of my stomach like I'd just swallowed a whole pineapple. Something was wrong, and I wanted to find out what. So I hurried over the, to the Whitsitt Hotel and met Calmus in the lobby. I'm glad you came, Mr. Diamond. I just put in a call to George's room, and someone else answered. So what? Well, the man asked a lot of questions, like who I was and why I... What did I want with George? And... Oh, I, I take it George is your friend of last night. Yes, George Watkins. He's the president of the firm I work for. Well, let's go up. When someone starts asking questions like that on the phone, it begins to sound like the police have moved in. Come on. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, hello, Walt. Rick, what are you doing here? Fair question. I'll answer yours if you'll do the same for me. I came up to see you, Mr. George Watkins. So did I. Well, what's the matter? Is George in some kind of trouble? Who's this guy? Oh, he's a friend of Watkins. Works for him. Oh, yeah? Well, come on in. George. George, what's going on here? You better let the lieutenant tell you, Bert. I can't think anymore. What's the charge, Walt? Murder. But, hmm? Murder? You got a call from a girl last night who said a man named George Watkins killed someone in her apartment. When we got over there, we found the girl dead, too. Oh, well, you must have the wrong man, Inspector George. Lieutenant. Wouldn't... And I'm sure you think George wouldn't, but he just confessed. George? Yes, Bert, I killed the man. But I, I didn't kill her. The man came in and tried to strangle her. She told me to get the gun in the drawer, and when the man wouldn't let her go, I shot him. That isn't what the girl told us. She said she took this gun home, or this guy home after he'd been in a fight, and when they got to her apartment, he made a pass just as her boyfriend came in. Then Watkins shot him and ran out. We figured he got excited, and when he had time to think about it, he went back and killed the only other witness. I didn't kill the girl. I never went back there at all. I came straight here. Uh, Walt, Mr. Kalmus here was with him up until the time he left with the girl. Is that right, Mr. Kalmus? Why, yes, sir. Now, there was a previous fight, and Watkins got that cut on his head. Mr. Kalmus loaned him his hat to cover the wound. That's right, sir. And, uh, oh, by the way, Walt, what caliber was the murder weapon? Thirty-eight. but we haven't found the gun yet. Here, check this one with ballistics. How'd you find this? Cab driver named Hennessy brought it into me this morning. Found it lying with a hat. Did you ever see this gun before, Watkins? No, I, I told you I don't own a gun. Well, what time do you figure he killed the man and the girl? The coroner fixed the time of death about one o'clock this morning. Hmm. How long were you at this girl's apartment, Mr. Watkins? Why, oh, about five minutes before her boyfriend came in. I shot him and left immediately. And you don't remember taking your hat or the gun? What are you getting at, Rick? This is an open and shut case. He admits killing one of them, but he won't admit the other killing because he knows it was premeditated. Oh, just a hunch, Walt, just a hunch. Mr. Watkins, would you mind telling me just what happened after the girl's boyfriend started choking you? Well, I grabbed a gun out of the dresser near the kitchen and I shot him. And the girl told me to get out, that she'd take care of things, so I dropped the gun and ran. Did you hear anything else? Anything unusual? No. Yes, now that you mention it, I did hear something that had slipped my mind until now. What did you hear? Well, I, I don't know whether I can describe it or not. It uh, sounded like someone had opened a bottle of flat champagne. What are you getting at, Rick? Oh, wait a minute, Walt. When did you hear this noise? Right after I shot the man. I remember wondering if someone hadn't opened a bottle in the kitchen. Is that where the noise came from? Uh, yes, I think so. Oh. All right, if I go over and case the scene, Walt? We've done that. Yeah, but you weren't looking for something. Why don't you come with me, Mr. Calmus? I'd like to talk with you. What's the address, Walt? 16 West 113th Street. Well, now, look, don't worry too much, George. I can handle the business, and in the meantime, I'll do everything to get you off. Thanks, Bert. Now, you wait a minute, Rick. If you think you know something... Walt! Yeah? Bye. Calmus and I went downstairs and took a cab over to 16 West 113th Street. It was a middle-class apartment house in Flatbush, a four-story brownstone. I let Calmus pay the fare, and we went in. I wonder what floor it's on. Well, she'll tell on the mailboxes. Yeah, here it is. Nan Phillips, 206. Well, let's go up. Oh, uh, what do you do for Mr. Watkins? I'm his vice president. That's why I took him out last night. I wanted to interest him in a new account. I just can't imagine him killing anyone, but... I guess people do funny things when they lose their heads. Oh, oh. 206. Oh, well, here it is. Yeah? Hello. Oh, no. Good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. What do you want, Diamond? Well, I want to stand out here in the hall and count the hairs in your five o'clock shadow. Now, let us in. The lieutenant said it was all right. Okay, comic. 
Yeah. Mr. DeCalmus, meet Sergeant Otis. How are you? Hello, Sergeant. Otis, make like a policeman and point out the circumstances in this killing, will you? Well, I don't know why I should, Shamus, but if the lieutenant sent you over, I guess I'll have to. Mm. Two bodies was over there by the window, lying pretty close together. Uh-huh. And the killer, that Watkins fellow, was standing about here in the center of the room. With his back to the kitchen door? Yeah. He shot them both from about here. Hey, what are you looking for? Oh, I like to get out on my hands and knees. It's cooler. Well, it won't do you no good to start looking for fancy clues. The guy already confessed. Well, 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 well. Hey, what do you got there? Just a wad. So, you got some wadding from the murder gun. You better give it here. Sure. But hang on to it, Otis, and be sure to give it to the lieutenant. Maybe you haven't noticed, but murder guns don't throw this much wadding unless you can kill someone with a blank cartridge. What? Uh, don't let it throw you. Mr. Calmus, I've got some things to do. Can I drop you somewhere? Well, no thanks. Now that Mr. Watkins can't take care of the office, I'd better go down and check over some things. But I'll keep in touch with you, Mr. Diamond. Uh, you do that. Uh, now, wait a minute, Diamond. Oh, stop trying to figure it out, Otis. You'll snap your wig. I was getting close to something. I wanted to tie the ends together before it caught up with me. I had a big fat hunch that Watkins had been framed good, and the more I found out, the more it looked like a killer was still loose. The whole setup had been screwy from the first. Why would a guy lose his hat and drop his gun in the same place? Or, if he threw them both away, why wouldn't he burn the hat and throw the gun in the river? Nobody's frightened enough to lay them side by side in the gutter. I learned a lot since this morning, and I was certain of one thing. The killer tried to make it look good. But he was an awful amateur. I knew something else, too. Amateurs can be awfully mean sometimes when you corner them. I put in a call to Walt and told him what I had, and then I asked him to give me half an hour and, and meet me at Mrs. Kalmus' flat. I grabbed another cab, and 20 minutes later, I was sitting on a long couch next to Mrs. Calmus. It's easy to get that crowded feeling, even on a long couch. You just both sit on the same cushion. Comfy? Oh, yeah. Uh, what kind of perfume is that? My sin. Past or future tense? A rounding second. Mm. What brought you back? Diamond. Oh, I, uh... I want to ask a couple of questions. Past or future tense? What time did your husband get in last night? I told you, about two o'clock. Why? Do you know if he knows a girl named Nan Phillips? I really don't know. Oh. Well, all right. Just a few more questions, and then we'll get back to that perfume. I'll think ahead. You said you'd been getting along with your husband. Would you mind explaining that? Certainly I like nice things, and lately he's been buying them for me. Oh, what's your husband's salary? About 15000 a year. Oh. Could he afford to buy you these things? Well, he told me he was getting a raise, and then he'd gotten a big advance. What's this all about? Maybe I'd better tell you. Bud, I didn't hear you. I did. What are you doing with that gun? I'm going to use it. I found Mr. Diamond making passes at my wife, and I shot him. Are you crazy? Don't ask him that. He's allowed to start thinking about it. You can't shoot me and get away with it, Calmus. What are you going to do with your wife? She won't back you up. No. No, I guess she wouldn't. All right, both of you, get up and walk downstairs to my car. Bert, what are you doing? Your husband killed two people last night, Mrs. Calmus. Now he's going to try and cover because he guessed I knew how it was done. You're not going to kill me, too. Get moving. Bert, please. Go on. As he says. Why did you kill anyone, Bert? He wanted to frame his boss. I'll bet when the company checks, they'll find out he's had his hand in the till. They won't find out, Mr. Diamond. With Mr. Watkins' book for murder, I'm next in line for president. I'll be able to fix the book so it will look like he took the money, too. Is that where you got the money for all those things you've been buying for me? You shot the man and the girl from the kitchen with a silencer, didn't you, Bertram? That's right. I knew you were onto something when you discovered that wad from the blank cartridge. I was onto something a long time before that. Yeah? All right. Come on. Over to that gray sedan, and remember, I've still got this gun in my pocket. Ah, uh, you're an amateur, Bertram. Is that right? Sure. I knew you had something to do with it when we got over to the girl's apartment. I didn't know what floor it was on, and you looked in the mailboxes. That's the best way to find an apartment, isn't it? Yeah, but not once at any time did anyone mention the dead girl's name. But you knew it and found it on the mailbox. All right, stop right here. <laughs> Open the door, Jean, and get in first. The front seat. Bert, please. Get in. All right. Now you, Mr. Diamond, you're going to drive. You know, I left my license in my other suit. Stop stalling. 
I had to do something to stall for just a second because over Bertram's shoulder I spotted a prowl car sliding up to the curb and good old Walt was climbing out. Uh, uh, Bertram, would you mind answering just one question? What is it? The gun that Watkins thought he killed the man with was loaded with blanks, wasn't it? Sure. I killed the guy from the kitchen with a silencer. The whole thing was rigged, huh? The man and the girl were supposed to stage that fight, and Watkins was supposed to shoot the guy with the dummy slug. You said one question. Now get in the car. All right, Thomas, don't move. What? Why, you... Duck, Rick! Ah! Oh. Ah! That was a close one. You're so right, Walt. Take his gun. I think you'll find it's the one that Watkins fired the branks from. How is he? On his way. Hey, Bertram. I'll go call the wagon. Bertram. Yes? You want to tie the ends together? I, I paid the girl and the man to stage the fight. I told them I wanted to frame George and blackmail him. So you framed him with a double murder instead. Why? I'd been stealing money from the company. How'd you know it was me? Well, knowing the girl's name, for one thing, and your wife told me you'd gotten in about two. Oh. You told me over the phone you went straight home after the fight in the cafe. The killing took place about one. Watkins uh... said he'd been at the girl's for five minutes. About 15 to get to her place, so that meant you all left the cafe around 12.30. It doesn't take an hour and a half to get... Hey, Bertram. John. Huh? I don't think Bert can hear you. Yeah. Well, it was a pretty dull story anyway. Well, the wagon got there, and I briefed Walt on everything that had happened. They took Mrs. Calmus home and released Watkins. It was a stinking hot afternoon, and I needed something cool to bring me down to normal, so I headed for 975 Park Avenue. A tall lemonade with a mind of its own, and a covetous redhead with the same gimmick. Yes? Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Diamond. Afternoon, Francis. Miss Asherin? Yes, sir. She's in the study, reading. Thanks, Francis. Oh, uh, how about something cool? Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Hi. Hi. Well, you look cool enough. That's a nice getup. You like it? It's the newest thing. Yeah, I uh, saw it in a magazine. What do you do if it shrinks? Oh, silly. No, no, I'm concerned. You might get raided. Don't you like it? Yes, ma'am. What do you think of me? Ah, oh, you're adorable. You're beautiful and you're cute. Too. Hey, that sounds like a song. Uh-huh. Come here. No, not now sing it. It's cute. That's too hot. I'm rather cool. Well, I was only lukewarm until I spotted that play suit. Go on. A, you're adorable. Okay, but uh, then I want to play. <laughs> Get it? Play? Play suit? <laughs> that was then. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Go on. A, you're adorable. B, you're so beautiful. C, you're a cutie full of charm. D, you're a darling. And E, you're exciting. And F, you've got feathers on your arm. Oh, own. Rick. G, you look good to me. H, you so heavenly. I, you're the one I idolize. J, we're like Jack and Jill. K, you're so kissable. L, is the love light in your eyes. Rick. M, hmm? Do you want me to finish? I love you. Oh, you're sweet. Come here. Mm-hmm. Uh, just one moment, sir. Uh, yes, Francis? I'm not going to be embarrassed again. Here's your lemonade. Uh, thank you, Francis. Oh, it's nothing, sir. A, you're adorable. B, you're so beautiful. <laughs> you have just heard Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert... Byron Kane, Lorreen Tuttle, Paul Fries, and Wally Mayer. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs>
This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. It's the Rocky Jordan Show. And I'm Rocky Jordan. We take you now to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine for a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. You ever hear of the Munda Oasis to the south of Algiers? It's surrounded by sand, miles of it in all directions. It's called the Land of Fear. And how did I know? They told me. They were tall, wore blue flowing robes and long black veils, and each had a knife sheathed to the wrist. From a little ways off, you might think they were women. They weren't. They were men on a mission of murder. The Café Tambourine. Crowded with tourists, camel drivers, women, cheats. Forgotten men down on their luck. The lonely and the lost. For this is Cairo, gateway to the ancient east, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Veiled People. A tambourine gets all sorts of people, but this kind of man was new to me. Tall, muscular, with piercing dark eyes, black silken hair and thin beard, sun-baked skin that turned light below the eyes. In spite of his size, his hands were delicate, and he might have been graceful except for the ill-fitting white robe and his complete uncertainty. I watched him as he came back to where I was wiping some glasses behind the bar. My name is Gerard. I would work for you, sir. Uh, I get all the help I need. Sorry. I need money. I will work very hard for only a few francs. You don't pay in francs around Cairo. Where are you from, anyway? If I do good work, you do not care. Well, you ought to be a good caravan driver. Look up Ali Ben down at the camel stalls. I do not want to drive camels. I would work hard for you, scrub floors, sweep. With this broom, I will show you. I stay on the other side of the bar. I said nothing doing. I clean up very good. You will see. Cut it, will you? Look out with that broom. Cheer up. Oh, oh. I am most sorry. I'll bet you are. That was expensive liquor. It'll cost you plenty. But there is no money. So now you see, I have to work for you. Is that not so, sir? Yeah. All right, get busy, Jaron. There was nothing to do but let him work it out. It was all new to him, but he was tireless. And by night he had the place as spotless as my grandmother's kitchen. The Cairo streets had him confused, so I helped direct him to an address on the Sharia El Gama. But he was back bright and early the next day, hard at work. That evening, I told him he'd worked off his debt, gave him a few piastres, and said he could stay on. Whoever he was or where he came from, he seemed like a good man to have around. He thanked me and hurried away. I figured the tambourine had had its fill of strange characters for a while, but a few minutes later, there were two more. They were tall and erect, dressed in blue robes. It wasn't just the fact that they blocked the door that sent me hurrying up front, but something else. The black veils that covered their faces. Look well over the room, Jeb. The eyes regard each person, Hogar. All right, M. She boys, the fun's over. Take the masquerade someplace else. Tell us now where he is. We'll talk when you take off the disguise. You know, your wives will be missing those veils. The insult, Hogar. So now we show him the knives, Jeb. You see? Sheathed to the wrists. Sharp for the throat of the offender. Yeah. Now... Where is the one who calls himself Gerald? Gerald? What's your interest? It is one which brings us from far across the sand. From the land of fear we come. Silence, Jeb. We talk only of the shameless one. As you say, the one who calls himself Gerald. He's not around. But he will return here. Maybe. You got quite a wait. The people of the desert are doomed to patience. We will wait outside until the shameless one returns. Police headquarters, Sergeant Greco speaking. Uh, hello, Greco. This is Rocky. Put Sam on, will you? The Captain Sabaya is not here, Mr. Jordan. And where do I find him? He is in Port Said on an extradition matter. Now, 
Kindly state your business. Uh, I want some of your men over here on the double. And why? A bunch of characters are scratching around outside, a little too anxious with knives. Indeed. Your tambourine has a way of attracting the disreputable. All right, just hurry, Gregor, before they make trouble. Proceed, please. Describe him quickly. Oh, you can't miss him. Three of them. Tall, wearing blue robes. You fear the fellahim? Well, these aren't just farmers, Greco. They're different. Oh, and get this. They all wear veils. Mr. Jolt, listen to me. You will leave them alone. Do not so much as look at them twice. Oh, cut it, Greco. They aren't women. They're men. Uh, men wearing veils, Mr. Jordan? Now, you figure it out. Now, get busy. Mr. Jordan, it appears that once again your mind is clouded from the wares of your cafe. I suggest you get some sleep. When you are awake, you may call me again if you remember anything. Until then, good night, Mr. Jordan. Oh, Greco, listen to me. Ah. That meant I had no help from the police, not with Greco on duty. As though that wasn't enough, Chris popped his head in the door just then with some news. He'd just been checking the cash in the register up front, and it was almost a hundred pounds short. In spite of all the confusion, Gerard had only been gone fifteen minutes. Chris had an idea, and so did I. That gave me one more good reason to look up Gerard. I ducked out the back way and headed east up the hill into the native quarter on my way to the Shari El Gama. I thought I'd shaken the veiled characters, but the blue robe flapping half a block behind told me different. I stepped it up and hopped into a doorway and waited. As he came by, I was out, twisting his robe at the throat. Ah, talk fast. What's it about? Why do you want Gerard? The knife will answer. He suddenly twisted away, and I couldn't hold. His hand went for the sheath on his left wrist. My punch landed right below the ribs. He doubled but had the knife. I swung again. The knife clattered away, and that's when I yanked the veil off his face. No, not the veil. No. In the struggle, I had a good look at his face. Black, silky, thin beard, pale skin below the eyes. Not the face of Gerard, but a lot like it. By then, the noise of the fight was bringing a lot of people. A smart foreigner doesn't get caught brawling in the native quarter. So I let him have one right in the button, and he went down. I stuffed his veil in my pocket and then dug for an alley, kept it up till I was sure I was safe. Then I went on to the Shari El Gama. A dim streetlight pointed out the place I was after, a hovel fronting the street. A horse-drawn gary, complete with drivers, stood in front. Before I reached it, I had one more hurdle. Another time, out of the way, Imshi. For the unfortunate blind, for the eyes that do not see. Out of your cheek, Imshi. I shook him off as I saw a frightened native girl run from the house. She dumped a bundle of clothes in the gary and was climbing in fast. Quickly now, driver. Uh, just a minute, lady. I want to talk no, to you. No, It's about Jared. I've got to see him. Where is he? Driver, whip the horse. Do not wait. Alatul. I had my hand on the gary, but it yanked away, and I went sprawling. By the time I was up again, the gary had carried the girl far down the street. Too fast to follow. Well, the door to the house was wide open, so I went in. I found a candle, lit it. After a couple of minutes looking, decided I'd find nothing there. I was right, and I was wrong. Turn around, Senor Jordan. Ma carefully, so. I turned and faced the voice. He stood in the doorway, wearing a black flop hat over a mottled face. His crooked teeth were showing, but the grin wasn't pleasant. And he held a gun. Sit down, Senor Jordan. Sit down. We will talk about her now. Ma sit down, sit down. Sure. Now, tell me all about it. I must ask you. Where did she go? I don't know. Obviously, you too have an interest in her, else why are you here? I came looking for Gerard. Now, only because he might lead you to her. Is that not so? No, no, I knew nothing about her. It happens Gerard works for me at my cafe. Yes, 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 I know. I followed him for a time from your cafe tonight, but uh, the wily one evaded me. Well, that's how you know my name. I uh, didn't get yours. Antonio Scorpio, signor. Now, how does Gerard concern you? Oh, none at all, except as an excellent bait. Now, let us forget about well, it. While you're about it, maybe you can explain a bunch of guys running around Cairo with veils over their faces. Let them return to the beds of sand where they belong. They're no fear of mine. Ah, but the girl is. Why? Senor, I'm beginning to wonder if you do know anything of this. Is it possible you do not know who she is? You got it right. Then you do not know her worth in gold or silver. I'm just waiting for you to tell me. Uh -huh. yeah, I believe I will offer you something even better, my friend. This begins to shape up like a deal. Well, perhaps it is. 
It seems that you have won the confidence of this uh, Gerard. It is possible that he places a certain uh, trust in you. You will wait here for him. Yes? Yeah. You have only to obtain the whereabouts of the girl whose name is Sheila. Bring the information to me, and you shall be well repaid. And what happens to her? And Gerard? That need never concern you. Well, senor? You think I'd go for a deal like that? Well, we who for reasons cannot return to our own country must live as best we can. <laughs> now, you answer. You tell me all of it. I'll decide then. Then you will get out of here. I will wait alone and you will get nothing. All right, have it your way, Scorpio. Si, si. Arrivederci, signora. Ma mark you. Keep your lips sealed. Your life means no more to me than those of the desert. Now get out. <laughs> The next morning I was reading the paper over some coffee when an item on page two caught my eye. Body of unidentified murder victim found in house at 1410 Sharia El Gama. Body taken to morgue. That was all. Now, but not for me. 1410 Sharia El Gama was the house I'd visited the night before. I went to headquarters to pay my last respects to Gerard. Greco was still sitting at Sam's desk. I repeat, Mr. Jordan, the captain Sabayas in Port Said. I am in command. All right, you'll do, Greco. You brought in a body from a place in Shari El Gama last night. I'd like to see it. You seem to have a special zest for the dead. Cut it. Just take me to the morgue. Do you think you can identify him? Yeah, I think so. This way, Mr. Jordan. <coughs> you seem most tired. Perhaps the affairs of the night? Yeah. Could it be that you saw more of the men with veils or perhaps the masks on their faces? That's right. You want to hear about them? I did not. Your dreams obviously confuse Cairo with Chicago. Over here. Hmm. This the one? Feast your eyes, Mr. Jordan. What? That's not... Your obvious surprise does not escape me, Mr. Jordan. Who is he? Not who I thought. Name's Antonio Scorpio. Antonio Scorpio? How'd he die? From the knife, of course. Oh. This one on the table here? Do not touch the knife, Mr. Jordan. Oh, I wouldn't think of it. You ever see a knife like that? In my time, I have seen many knives. They're all for one purpose. No, I have other matters. Are you coming, Mr. Jordan? Yeah, sure, Greco. Thanks for everything. I followed him up and went out. My thanks to Greco had been for the knife I pocketed as he turned away. It was exactly like the ones carried by the veiled men. I caught the first taxi and made it across town to the Cairo Museum. After a little waiting, got in to see the curator of the weapons division, the kindly white-topped Mr. Winters. I introduced myself and laid the knife on his desk. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not the best specimen, Mr. Jordan, but it seems authentic. Wicked-looking thing. Where did you get it? Well, let's say I found it, Mr. Winters. Who'd use a knife like that? It is the favorite weapon of the Toreg. They sheathe them to the wrist for instant use. Toreg? Yes, Toreg. Remarkable people. Nomads living in the heart of the Sahara. Called by many the land of fear. Yeah, that much checks. I'm trying to remember there's something different about the Toreg. <laughs> I should say. By some, they are known as the Desert Raiders. By others, and I think more appropriately, the people of the Vale. Of course, the Vales. They all wear veils? No, no. Not the women, Mr. Jordan. Only the men. The litham, it is called. Black cloth that hides the faces of the men day and night. I still don't get it. Well, who can say? An answer lost in antiquity. Custom gone into reverse, you might say. In fact, a mild form of matriarchy exists. Yeah, Mr. Then... Winters. Yes? Supposing one of the Tariq wanted to get away from the tribe, then lose his identity. How could he best do that? Why, well, really, I couldn't say. All he'd have to do is change to other clothes and take off the veil. His own people might not even recognize him. <laughs> but hardly likely. They consider removing the veil as shameful. But it's a thought. Is it uh, possible that you are a writer, Mr. Jordan? Uh, nobody would ever believe this story. Well, thanks, Mr. Winters. Oh, not at all, not at all. Uh, please let me know how your story turns out. Sure. If I ever find out myself... Well, I suppose I could have dropped it right there, but I was thinking about the frightened native girl I'd seen running from Jared's house. Maybe I remembered the hundred pounds Jared had snatched from my till. Anyhow, I decided to try for more, and that took me back to the native quarter. 
I found the blind man not far from where he'd been begging the night before. for the blind. Hey, we met last night, remember? Ah, the voice of the foreigner who offered no piastres. Well, I got plenty today. Allah will bless you. A native girl got into a gary here last night. There was a driver. My ears heard the sound. A whole handful of piastres for the name of the driver of that gary. If any the driver, I do not know. But on the gallery, the number is very clear for everyone to see. In English, it would be 27. Thanks. Here you are. What's a Shakira thing then? Bakshish! Bakshish! It took half an hour to locate the driver of Gary 27, and a half pound to get him to tell me where he'd taken the girl. To a little town south on the Nile called Helwan. So I invested some more money and had him take me there. Helwan turned out to be nothing more than a tiny boat stop. There were a few windowless shacks along the Nile banks. The driver pointed to one and was gone. I got to the open door of the shack and went in. I waited for my eyes to get accustomed to the dim light. So even to this sad place you choose to follow? I saw her then, standing across the room at the wall. It was the girl, Sheila. Small, oval-faced. She stood erect, but helpless. Like those of the Torag. Like the vicious Scorpio you come to torment us. I only came to find Jared. Find out what this is all about. Where is he? I would not tell. What do you know of Jared? He worked for me in my cafe. Oh. Then then you are the good Effendi Jordan of whom Jared speaks well. Yeah. And from whom he took a hundred pounds. Oh, he will repay. He took it only to help me escape. To pay the driver who came for me to get us away. But why? Scorpio was after you. What for? Who are you? I am Sheila, daughter of Sheikh Amenekal, a man of wealth and position on the Munda Oasis to the south of Algiers. You're a long way from home. Would would you hear my story, Effendi Jordan? All right, Sheila. Go ahead. Well, first you must know, Effendi, that at home I was not happy. My father had betrothed me to one I did not love. Then one night the Torah graders came and took me into the desert, holding me for ransom. You can understand my terror. I, who had been protected always from the world. They would have been cruel to me. All but Gerard. He was tender and shielded me from the others. Such is fate, but for the will of Allah that that I should come to love Gerard. And, and he loved me. He aided me in my escape. Together we went to the city and I became his wife. I dared not return to my father who would not accept Gerard as my husband. Jared removed the blue robes and the veil, hoping that the vengeful tribesmen would not find him. But it was not so easy. We went from one place to another, even to Cairo, but still they followed. Well, that's quite a story, Sheila. Well, what about Scorpio? Oh, somehow he learned of me. Perhaps for reward, perhaps for the ransom he would take me, but I am not sure. That's why Jared killed him? Oh, no. No, Effendi, Jared never returned to the house. Jared was waiting here. And I return now. Oh, Jared, no. Not it, Jared. Drop that knife. Jordan, sir. Do not harm him. He comes in peace, my husband. Only you come, Jordan, sir. That's right, Jared. Sheila's told me everything. You should have told me to begin with. No. Then you would not want me to work for you. For money to take her away. Well, you found other ways of getting it. Those of my tribe came too quickly. I will repay. The promise of the Torek is good. What's your plan now? A small passenger boat arrives at dusk. We would board it and travel far south to the interior. Where we trust they will not find us again. You would not stop us, Effendi Jordan? No. Not even if I could. We are eternally grateful. I waited there with him the rest of the afternoon. When evening came, Sheila picked up her few belongings and we went down to the small dock on the river. And well after sunset, a boat slid up to the dock's edge. A narrow gangplank came down, but the deck was strangely deserted. All we could see was the pilot up in the cabin, and his face was straight ahead. Something didn't look right. Jared, I do not understand this. Come, Sheila. We must not wait. Hold it, Jared. Who's on there? Speak up. Where's the crew? If you are coming, get aboard. Quickly. As he says. No, no. Better let me check. Wait here with Sheila. Hey, where is everybody? So, again, the offender. Gerard, get up here. I caught you, Gerard. I caught you. I was pinned from behind. He was heavy but too anxious, and I sent him sailing over my head, blue robes and all. 
As Gerard reached the deck, a second of the veiled men was mixing in. A third was scrambling down from the pilot's cabin. My foot slowed him. By then, a lot of knives were flashing, and I looked to the safety of Sheila. That's when I saw something else. A horse-drawn Gary racing down to the water's edge, loaded down with uniforms that came piling out, headed by none other than Sergeant Grego. Step it up, will you? Onto the boat, quickly! He's on the boat! How'd you get here, Grego? So, Mr. Jordan, is not the fact that I am here enough? Yeah, can't say I ever cared for your face, Grego. But I'm sure glad to see it now. Well, with Grego and the police swarming around, the veiled men gave it up before too much damage was done to anybody. About that time, the pilot of the boat, who'd been held at the wheel by the Torex knife, came scrambling down. He was glad enough to turn the boat around. And with all of us aboard, we went back down the Nile and docked at Cairo. The three veiled men got a cell apiece. Gerard and Sheila waited outside as Greco commanded me into Sam Sabaya's office. I will now complete the dossier on this case. Sit there, Mr. Jordan. Yes, sir, Greco. Oh, by the way, Sam always has coffee. It can wait. Now, first, the matter of 100 pounds stolen by Gerard from your cafe. Well, I'm not preferring charges, Greco. Gerard will pay up. Um, very well, as you wish. They've both been through enough. Gerard asked for it when he helped Sheila escape from the Torig. I can understand why they didn't go right to her father, Sheikha Menachal. Gerard's life wouldn't have been worth much. Oh, is this boring you? Oh, quite to the contrary, Mr. Jordan. Well, the Torig must have been asking a fancy ransom. Somehow, Antonio Scorpio got wind of it. He located Sheila and Gerard and followed along, figuring to cut in. When the veiled men found Scorpio at Gerard's house last night, it was their chance to get rid of him. Of course, you didn't check on Scorpio. You would be disappointed. Antonio Scorpio was a notorious criminal, last known operating in Algiers. Well, good boy, Grego. Sam's going to be real proud of you. That is my intent. You were most kind to help. Me? It is so easy to follow the Occidental mind. What are you getting at? It happens that I intended to do nothing. But the matter of the knife which disappeared from the morgue, it was so like you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, yeah. It's all yours, Greco. At that point, I invoked the command of the Captain Sabaya when he left me in charge. That should you again become involved in one of your usual escapades, that questions would prove futile. I was only to watch you and follow. It was simple for us both to take the same path. Now, how'd you find me down at Hell One? The driver of the garret take both you and Sheila to the Nile town. Could he not also take those of the police? Sure. Just one thing, Greco. No rough stuff with Gerard, huh? Sheik Amanakal will be notified immediately, Mr. Jordan. It is a duty. And what then? Do not be concerned. Their marriage seems quite legal. Her father cannot force the girl's return. The man Gerard, under surveillance, may remain with her in Egypt. Yeah, yeah, that's the way Sam and Anna. As you say, the Captain Sabaya will be most pleased with my report. This is Rocky Jordan again. Next week, I want to tell you about the trouble I had trying to figure whether something was very old or very new. I'll tell you this much now. It had to do with a bird who kept bees. Rocky Jordan, starring Jack Moyles with Jay Novello is presented each week through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. You know, there's something about me that is to trouble what molasses is to flies. I never go around looking for trouble. Trouble goes around looking for me. Now, take that afternoon a few months ago when I walked into the press room of the Hall of Justice and found, among others, Clark Ames, the young City Hall reporter for the Chronicle, expounding on his favorite subject, a deep hatred for a man named Fred Curtis, nicknamed the Alibi Master. Ames and the other newspaper men had watched Curtis win acquittals for a dozen different clients and always by the same route. Unbreakable alibis. This made the clients very happy and the district attorney very miserable. The Chronicle, a crusading newspaper, had, at the instigation of Clark Ames, been running an anti-Curtis campaign, bordering pretty close on libel. And Curtis, who was sharper than a razor's edge and harder to catch up with on the horizon, hated Ames with a wonderful passion. Curtis had won the last round, and Ames was telling me about it. So Curtis goes to Williams, my managing editor, and threatens a libel suit. Well, I had gone a little overboard, I guess. And Williams had to let me go. Temporary layoff until the heat died down. But now I'm back on the job, Rogue, and I'm solid. And you wait until that phony Curtis sees me sitting here. Wait till he finds out I'm back on the job. Huh. Now look, Ames, uh, I've been around this town for a while, and if I'm picking out a guy to buck, it won't be Fred Curtis. How come you decided to make a career of locking horns with the smartest mouthpiece in the business? How do you expect to win? Oh, don't worry about it, Rogue. I got that phony right where I want him. You wait a couple of days, that's all. Mr. Alibi Master Curtis is going to be nailed to the Chronicle's masthead. Oh, uh, hello, Ames. Did I hear you taking my name in vain? Could be. How uninteresting. What are you doing sitting around in the press room? It's reserved for the working press. Hello, Rogue. How are you? How's your trial going, Curtis? Oh, my client will have dinner at home tonight. Jury just retired. Your client is guilty as the devil, Curtis. What's his alibi this time? Now, you know he couldn't have committed the crime. I've just proved to the jury that he was in San Francisco at the time the murder was committed. How are you getting along on your unemployment insurance, Ames? <laughs> it was a pleasure getting you fired. Too bad it didn't last. Well, I'm back on the job, which means I'm right back on your trail. That's bad news for you, Curtis. Uh, do me a favor, will you, Ames? When you call in the report of the not guilty verdict the jury's about to bring in for my client... Tell your stupid managing editor I'm filing a libel action against him the first thing in the morning. Uh, look, uh, Curtis, let's go in the courtroom, will you? I'm going to be there when the jury comes in. Okay, Rogue. Oh, here, Ames, here's ten bucks. Go get a haircut, will you, kid? And have your suit pressed. And don't forget to spell my name correctly when you phone that story in. Here's your ten right in your face, Curtis. I'll see that your name is spelled right. In the biggest type in the shop, right at the top of the page, when you're tried for falsifying evidence. And that's going to happen to you awfully soon, wise guy. Here, here, here. Take it easy, Ames. Oh, let him talk. Let me give you something to kick around in that warped mind of yours, Curtis. You remember a guy named Don Thompson? Your alibi witness for Ed Harris a year ago. I'm sure you remember Thompson. What about him? Would it put a crimp in that famous poise of yours if you knew that Thompson had given the Chronicle a signed and witness statement admitting that he had perjured himself in that alibi statement for Harris? That is preposterous. Is it? Well, you'd be in quite a spot if the Chronicle happened to have a statement like that, wouldn't you, Curtis? A statement that swears that you paid Don Thompson a thousand dollars for the perjured testimony that kept Ed Harris out of the gas chamber? That'd sure stop your clock, wouldn't it? Have you been drinking, Ames? <laughs> you sound even a little more illogical than usual. Oh, that's right. You like logic, don't you? Mm -hmm. Well, figure this one out. I've been trying for some time to get convicting evidence on you. You got me fired for trying. The Chronicle was scared of a libel suit. But... All of a sudden, my managing editor, Williams, doesn't seem to be very afraid of your suing the paper. Now, what could be the reason for him giving me my job back? It could be that that statement from Thompson did it, couldn't it? All right, now, sweat it out, Curtis. You'll be seeing your picture in the Chronicle with bars in front of you and a number on your chest in about 48 hours. Not even one of your phony alibis can keep you out of this rap, big shot. I suppose I should be annoyed by such juvenile threats. But I just don't seem to be able to take you seriously, Ames. And the next time I give you my attention, you'll never work on a newspaper again. Coming with me, Rogue? Uh, no, not now, no. I think I'll stay here and use the telephone. Yes. 
You could see and feel the hate that hung in the air in that press room like a cloud of poison gas after Fred Curtis left. Clark Ames went all to pieces as soon as we were alone, paced the floor, said he'd talk too much. He was as worried as a man with a three-horse parley and two winners. Pretty soon, though, he, he left, and I used the telephone to call a couple of girls I know. They, uh, <clears throat> they weren't home. I was about to give up and go to dinner by myself when I turned around and saw Betty Callahan standing there behind me, looking like a million dollars. Which is a nice figure. Which is what she has, if you know what I mean. Betty had a funny little quizzical smile on her face. Hello, Richard. What's the matter? Aren't you having any luck? Well, honey, honey, I was just going to call you. You mean that if Alice isn't home and Liza doesn't answer, I'm next in line? Oh, now, you know better than that. You're always first on my list. Remember, Richard, I was standing here when you were phoning. Sure, sure. I was just uh, just trying to get a substitute, that's all. Uh-huh. Well, what do you want? The names of some girls and a few phone numbers? Now, don't look at me like that, Betty. The only reason I was calling those other girls was because I couldn't find you. Well, I'll forgive you if you'll take me to dinner and then to the theater to see Tallulah Banker. Oh, my goodness, you have such expensive taste. Oh, really, my dear man. I have something infinitely better... I have two passes for the shell. Well, good. I've got two passes for a drive in. Oh. Come on, I want to see if I can walk through that door without eating the jam off of it. Oh, really? I'm hungry. <laughs> so am I. That's the only reason you have a date with me tonight, Richard. Well, then come on. <laughs> All through that hamburger, I kept dividing my thoughts between how such a little girl could eat so much food and that scene in the press room at the Hall of Justice. I knew Fred Curtis for what he really was. Cold-blooded and completely ruthless. I remember that look in his eyes as he left the press room. A little puzzlement, a little fear, and a great deal of malice. Even if nobody else believed the story Ames told, I was sure that Curtis more than half believed it. And that meant trouble for somebody. Betty and I finished our dinner at last, and in spite of everything she could eat, I still had money enough to pay for it and a cab to the theater. We were just back in our seats after the second act intermission when I heard my name being paged. If Richard Rogue is in the audience, will he please report to the lobby? Mr. Richard Rogue, please report to the lobby. Isn't that a sort of obvious piece of publicity, Richard? Well, how the devil did anybody know I was here? You better go see what's so important. Would you hurry back. I'll be right back, baby. <laughs> I had a bad hunch as I walked up that aisle. Those little chills that always race up and down my spine when I'm walking into trouble were acting up. I didn't know what to expect as I walked out into the lobby. Then I saw Clark Ames standing there. His face was as white as a dove's wing, and his eyes had the strained look that is the aftermath of seeing violent death. Rogue. Yeah, what's the matter, Ames? You look like you've seen a ghost. I've seen something worse, Rogue. You gotta come down to the Chronicle with me. Now, get a hold of yourself. You're shaking like a dice cup. What's the matter? Williams, my managing editor, was just killed. Huh? Murdered in his office. <laughs> That's the beginning of our story. We'll continue in just a moment, but first, here's Jim Doyle. Romance and soft feminine glamour are back in style. Women are taking off the bandanas they donned in war plants and are again letting their hair reflect moonbeams and stardust. That's why Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo is in more demand now than ever. Because Fitch's saponified shampoo brings out the radiant beauty of your hair. Its fragrant, creamy lather cleanses so thoroughly and rinses out so completely. Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent, so no special after-rinse is needed. And best of all, you can wash your hair as often as you like with Fitch's saponified shampoo, and it will never become dry or harsh-feeling. That's because this shampoo is made from pure, natural oils that keep your hair ever soft and lustrous. Ask for Fitch's saponified shampoo the next time you're at your beauty shop, or buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. And now we return to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Well, 
I was working. The publisher of the Chronicle was paying me a grand for putting the long, cold finger on the murder of Williams, the managing editor. I was pretty sure I knew who the murderer was, so it looked like a soft buck. When Ames and I arrived at the Chronicle, Homicide was already there. My friendly enemy, Lieutenant Urban, was in charge, as usual. He walked over from where he was ex- examining the remains of the late Mr. Williams. Hey, Sam, help me with this. What are you doing here, Rogue? Now, Urban, you know whenever anything comes along you boys can't handle, they always send for me. Who's paying you? The publisher of this paper. Now, shall we go on with the third degree or shall we get the work of the murder? What do you know about it? More than you do. When was he killed? The medical examiner says he got it about two hours ago. Mm. Stabbed the death of his own copy shares, huh? Yeah. Yeah, the last edition had already gone in. No one else was in the city room when it happened. Found a motive? Well, look at the office. Every file's been emptied. The murderer was looking for something, Rogie. Yeah, I wonder if he found it. Uh, you wouldn't know what it was, would you? Mm, yeah, yeah, I might. I might at that. I heard the Chronicle had a signed confession from Don Thompson. I will go to run it tomorrow. Now, what was Thompson's confession? Come on, Rogue, you might as well give me all of it. Well, it seemed Thompson was confessing that he had been paid a, a, quite a sum of money for a job of perjury by Fred Curtis, commonly known as the alibi master. In words of one syllable, so you can understand it, Irvin, Thompson... Uh, Sold the Chronicle information, which would have put Curtis away for about ten years. Curtis, eh? Well, looks like this is going to be a simple case. Could be, yes. Hey, Ames, you know where Williams kept that Thompson confession? It was in the top drawer of this file. It's gone. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I guess that settles that, Urban. Ah, it's too easy. Curtis knows every trick in the book. Hello, Urban. May I come in? Yeah. We were just talking about you, Curtis. You're very welcome. I figured I would be. Why did you kill him, Curtis? You knew you'd be the number one on the suspect parade. Oh, that's not very smart, Rogue. If I had killed him, I would have been much more clever about it. I wasn't within a hundred miles of here when he was killed. Well, that sounds familiar. I, uh, I know I'm wasting my time asking this, Curtis, but, uh, you can prove that alibi, can't you? Of course. I was on my ranch in Antelope Valley when I heard over the radio that Williams had been killed. I suppose my friend Rogue has told you of the fantastic story a drunken reporter named Ames was shouting in the press room at the Hall of Justice today. Yeah, I told him. He knows all about it. Oh, incidentally, uh, Thompson's little composition is missing. The man who killed Williams lifted it. Very convenient for you, wasn't it, Curtis? Convenient? Oh, there never was such a confession. There couldn't have been. Because there wasn't the slightest background of truth for the wild tale Ames told today. Okay, Curtis. We'll let you know what we think of the story after we've checked your alibi. You were on your ranch in Antelope Valley when you heard the report of William's death. Yes. That's about a hundred miles from here, right? Approximately. As soon as I heard the report of the death, I knew I would be a suspect. So I started to town. I stopped in a bar in Palmdale for a drink on the way in and then came directly to the Chronicle office without stopping. My car's at the curb now in front of the building. Ryan, check those alibis. Oh, they'll check, Lieutenant. I'm sure they will. The alibi master would never slip up on his own alibi. That's right. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Rogue. Uh-huh, and, uh, I'm sorry to be disappointed, Curtis. You sure you don't know anything about this murder? You you didn't hire someone to do it for you, did you? Of course not. I had nothing against the man. Why should I want to kill him? You can go, Curtis. We'll try to break that alibi or find the boy you hired. Until we do, take it easy. Thank you, Lieutenant. Oh, you can reach me at my office if I can be of any further use to you. Oh, uh, Curtis, are you... Going back toward the Biltmore Theater? Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to get back there. I left my car there. And, oh, brother, Betty. Ooh, she'll massacre me. <laughs> I'll give you a lift. Come on, Rogue. This Curtis guy was strictly the deluxe type. His car was a long, sleek, black job a few sizes smaller than the Queen Mary. But with approximately the same amount of power. We got in... Curtis turned on the ignition, and the gas gauge swept clear across to full. Curtis had said he drove directly from the bar in Palmdale to the Chronicle office without stopping. Uh About 70 miles. Mr. Curtis's carefully planned alibi was not so carefully planned. I was enjoying a short ride with a murderer. He saw my eyes on the gasoline gauge, followed them with his own, and then put his hand in his coat pocket. I knew there was a gun in it. As we drove away from the curb, I picked up a copy of the Chronicle, which had been lying in the seat beside me. I thought perhaps if I could hide my thoughts a little better, uh, if I pretended a great nonchalance, with no part of which I felt. 
Curtis was not sure that I'd attached the proper importance to the story the gas gauge told. He, uh, he was being nonchalant, too. I, uh, had a little dough riding on prevaricator. Seventh today. When I came out. Ought to be in that paper. Final results. Where'd you get it? I bought it in Palmdale. And then? Huh. This is the Bulldog Edition. Oh. The Bulldog Edition is sold only on the streets in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm afraid I made a mistake, huh, Rowe? Yes, I'm afraid you made two of them, Curtis. This paper and that full gas tank. You didn't drive 70 miles in this gas eater without stopping and arrive here with a full tank, did you? You're very observant. Looks like you're cracking my alibi, huh? You killed Williams, didn't you? Yes, I had to. I had to get that confession of Thompson's. It would have ruined me. I owe that impetuous reporter a great debt for tipping me off to the Chronicle's plans for crucifying me. You, uh, have any plans for me? Yes. Yes, I think I have it worked out. I'm going to drive you out to the suburbs to a spot I know that's probably deserted by this time. Now, if you were found there, shot. Aren't you overlooking something? If I'm found there, shot, Urban is going to pick you up fast. <laughs> You're going to do better than that, Curtis. Well, if there were signs of a struggle and your wristwatch had been set an hour ahead and smashed to set the time of death... And I was at Lincoln Heights Jail talking to a client at the time the police would figure the murder took place. That might do it, don't you think, Rowe? No. It's no good, Curtis. You're slipping. In the first place, there's always the possibility that a shot would be heard. The district I have in mind is deserted by now, or will be, before I consummate my plan. And Urban is no fool. You'll be awfully suspicious. Might give you the paraffin test on your gun hand. You know, I, I, I don't think you're going to handle the situation that way, Curtis. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be... Kind of hard to handle, even for you. You know, Rogue, it's amazing how fascinating crime, I mean the actual act of committing a crime, can be. Have you ever killed anybody? No. Now look, Curtis, I suppose you know that you're going to get caught. I know nothing of the kind. Successful crime is nothing more than planning, careful planning. Oh, I'll grant you, Rogue, that I'm going to be suspected of your murder. But I'll never be convicted for it. I won't take any chances. You're wrong, Curtis. You talk like a sick man. You can't beat the law. If you commit a crime, you're going to pay for it. Let's go down to police headquarters and talk this thing over with Urban. What do you have to win by adding another murder to your score? Mr. Rogue, I love life too much, and I love success too much to let anything stand in the way of my life as I live it. You, you just can't understand that, can you? You think that a man of my background and position must be horrified at the thought of taking the life of another human being. Well, you're wrong, Rogue. I have my own code, my own ethics. You know and I know hundreds of reputable businessmen in this town who spend their days and nights, their lives, grasping for money, for power over the lives of more and more people. Yeah. Well, when one of them wrecks another man's life or his business, it amounts to a victory, which is celebrated by the wrecker at his club that evening. If the victim commits suicide, and he often does, they're sorry. That's all. It's just business. What are you trying to prove, Curtis? I'm explaining why I killed Williams. Why I have to make sure that you and the knowledge you have of my affairs are disposed of. It's a matter of business, Rogue. Now you're crazier than a coot. You know that, Curtis. You're not talking like a rational person. You're going to pay for this crime. Don't move. Put your hands back in your lap. I think you know that I won't hesitate to kill you here on the road if it becomes necessary. Set your watch up an hour. One hour, Mr. Rogue. Okay. You got a new plan? Yeah. We're on the outskirts of town. I'm going to stop the car when I come to an advantageous place. Then I'm going to knock you unconscious with a tire iron, smash your watch, throw you onto the road and run over you. To all appearances, your murder will be the result of a hit-and-run accident. I will have an alibi which will make it impossible for me to have been in the vicinity at the time of the accident. That, I think, is a perfect plan. Ah, oh, it's full of holes. In the first place, Urban will check the tread on your tires, and in the second, he'll never fall for that smash watch trick. You'll never get away with it, Curtis. You've been buying up juries and alibis and evidence for so long that you forgot that they're honest people. People who can't be bought. Urban's one of them. He'll stay with you until he gets you for killing me, Curtis. Now, you'll have to come up with a much cleverer scheme than what you've thought of so far. Maybe you're right, Rogue. What are you doing? What I'm going to do now, Mr. Rogue won't need any alibi. Look out, you fool. Curtis! Curtis, give me that wheel. Sit back there, Rogue. Get your foot off that accelerator. You're going to hit. Turn that wheel. Give me that wheel, Curtis. Goodbye, Mr. Rogue. Let go of that wheel. Let go or I'll shoot. We'll 
We'll continue in just a moment. But now, here's Jim Doyle. Time is a valuable thing these days, and no man wants to spend any more of it than possible on shaving. So you busy men who want to cut down on your shaving time, use Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. This swell cream gives you a close, comfortable shave in a hurry. It's an expert blend of three important shaving ingredients. These ingredients enable your razor to fairly sail along without nicking or scraping. The creamy, non-greasy texture of Fitch's No Brush saves you time, too for it won't clog your razor or the drain. And with all your speed in shaving, you'll find that Fitch's No Brush leaves your face feeling smooth and cool. You men who prefer a lather cream will find Fitch's Brush Cream also gives quick, comfortable shaves. It makes lots of rich lather that stays moist all during the shave, then rinses off easily. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush shaving creams come in generous 25 and 50 cent sizes. For shaving speed and shaving ease, Switch to Fitch. Now back to Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. When I saw what that madman Curtis was going to do, I knew I had nothing to lose. He had that big, powerful car wide open and heading straight for a stone wall. I tried to grab the wheel and turn it. He fired at me just as we crashed into the wall. I only remembered turning the wheel enough to deflect the shock a little. And then... Oh, then I was on cloud number eight. Hugo was there, waiting for me. <laughs> oh, Chief, you had a close call there. Hey, hey, Hugo, where have you been? Well, I had a little trouble with the OPA about Cloud 8, and I had to go and see them. Oh. Then I had a tough time getting a reservation back. <laughs> but I'm glad to see you, Rogi, with your usual bump on the head. Oh, am I dead? <laughs> Only the good die, young Rogi. Hey, you got company. An old friend of yours is up here. Look. Over on cloud nine. See him? Oh, Curtis. He isn't dead either, huh? Oh, no. But I sure thought I was out of a job when I saw you slamming into that wall, Rogie. You ought to take better care of yourself. For me. Yeah. Look, I gotta get out of here, you gore. How badly am I hurt? Oh, you're okay. That car was built to take it. <laughs> you won't be playing any gin rummy for a while, and you can't collect on your insurance. Give me a little boost over the side, will you, Hugo? I gotta get downstairs before Curtis does. Sure, Chief. Here you go. So long, Rogi. <laughs> Fancy meeting you here. Receiving hospital? Yeah. What have you been up to? What were you trying to do? Kill yourself? No. No, no. Is, uh... Is Curtis here? Yeah, yeah. Now, I'll ask the questions. What happened? How badly is, uh, Curtis hurt? Leg broken, that's all. He's still unconscious. Look, uh... Urban. He, uh... He killed Williams. He... He, uh, tried to kill me. Yeah. He admitted it, eh? Yeah, after I caught a couple of flaws in his alibi. You got enough dope on him to make it stick? I don't know. I don't know. It would, uh, be my word against his. But I got an idea. An idea that might sense the deal. Every once in a while, you do have a good one. Get the, get the chief surgeon over here, will you? I'm gonna need his help. Okay. Here, here, here. Lie down there. I, I don't want anything to happen to you, Rogie. I was worried about you. You're such a pest, I'd miss you like the devil. I'll get the doc. When I outlined my scheme to the chief surgeon, he looked for a minute like he might call in the head of the psychiatric ward. But with Urban's help, I finally got him to agree to play it my way. He bandaged Curtis from head to foot, 
put constricting straps across his chest and cinched him down like a saddle on an outlaw horse. Then they put him in an oxygen tent and brought him out of shock. Urban pulled out all of the stops as he stood by the side of the hospital bed and talked to the murderer. Like a father. Curtis, can you hear me? Yes. Who is it? Lieutenant Urban. Did the doctor give you the bad news yet? Yeah. Crushed chest. Nothing they can do, I guess. No. You haven't got long to live. Anything you want to tell me? Might as well go with a clear conscience. Did you kill Williams? Yeah. Yeah, I killed him. I had to do it. I killed him. I killed him. Well, that was the end of the case. Brilliant piece of work on my part, I, uh, I thought. Going through that little tableau of making Curtis believe uh, he was on his deathbed and had nothing to lose by confessing the murder. And, uh, <laughs> oh, I love that urban. He's so proud of the fact that he confined his remarks to the truth when he was talking with Curtis. All he said was, you haven't long to live. Remember? Huh? That, uh, that was true enough. Curtis was executed a few months later. Which proves that the theory about perfect crimes is as foolish as a sure way to beat roulette. And, uh, Betty. Well, I, uh, I left her in a theater when I started out on this case. It cost me about, uh, oh, just about what I made, a thousand bucks, to get her over her peeve. So, I broke about even on the deal. Oh, well, you know the old saying. A fool and his money are some party. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and D. Engelbach produced and directed. Don't forget, you've all got a date with us next Thursday night. We have a story for you about uh, the last time Rogue saw prison. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening. And now, once again, here's Jim Doyle. Be with us again at the same time next week. Oh, and be sure to see Dick Powell in his latest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. Remember, tune in next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, beauty or barber shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as... The Saint. Hello? Mr. Templer? Yes? Joe Collins. Remember me? Joe, sure I do. How are you, Chap? It's been a long time. Yeah, I know. Hey, your fight's still on for tomorrow night? 
Yeah. Uh, say, could you do me a big favor, Saint? Could you come down to the gym right away? Sure, but what is it? I'll tell you when you get here. I need to talk to somebody I can trust. I need to real bad. Ah, well, I'll phone for a cab and be there in 20 minutes. Oh, thanks, Saint. Thanks. Oh, don't thank me, Joe. After all, I've got a bet on you tomorrow night. I've got to protect my investment. You got a bet on me? Call it off, Saint. Call it off. What? So long. Yes? It's Louie, Mr. Templer. Your cab is here. Oh, come on in, Louie. I'll be with you in a minute. Uh, maybe you should better open the door right away. Well, why didn't you come in, Louie? The door was... Shh, he's asleep. Oh? Who's asleep? Mr. Templer, look down. Louie, it's a baby. You are so right. But why did you bring him here? I found him here. On your doorstep, Mr. Templer. Louie, don't you look at me that way. Who ain't opened his mouth even, Louie? Well, uh, well, uh, let's get him inside. Uh, you want to carry him? Maybe you better. Oh, all right. Uh, up we go. <laughs> oh, he's waking up, Mr. Stubbs. <laughs> he's cute. Yeah, he is. <laughs> what's your name, old fella? Oh, Donnie. Hey, he talks. Uh, what's your last name, Donnie? Donnie. Donnie, Donnie, huh? Uh, how did you get here, Donnie. Donnie. Here, let me try him, Mr. Temple. I got away with kids. Donnie, tell your Uncle Louie how you got here, huh? Hey, Donnie. The gold mine of information. <laughs> Wait a minute, look. Hey, there's a note pinned on his coat. I understand that's traditional in such cases. Hey, Donnie. Oh, just a minute, Donnie. Here. <laughs> please, please keep him for a few days and don't tell anyone. Not even the police. Sounds like trouble, Mr. Temple. Yes, it does. Well, I guess you won't be needing my cab now, huh? Oh, hey, the cab, I forgot. Louis, mm -hmm. uh, how are you as a babysitter? Huh? Who, me? Oh, no, oh, wait a minute, Mr. Temper. I'm a cab driver. You can't drive while you sit. My local's got rules. That, uh, I'll be back that, in an hour, Louis. Well, uh, just to make it official, I'll borrow your cab. Hey, 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 what are you... Well, <laughs> it looks kind of funny on you at that. Hey, look at the funny man with the hat, Donnie. Huh? Isn't that funny? No! <laughs> I'll see you later, Louis. Could use a little, little more left there. Get your shoulder into it. That's it. That's better. That's Excuse me, but uh, where could I find Joe Collins? Hold it a minute there, kid. Hold it. The champ? Yeah. Well, he's right there, my friend, on the table. We're getting the rub down. We? Yeah, Chadwick's the name. Sam Chadwick. I'm the champ's manager. Oh, I'm Simon Templer. Yeah. Joe said he wanted to see me. Well, we did, eh? Well, I don't remember us doing that. Well, let's go in. Come on, let's go in. Take a blow, kid. I'll be right back. Uh, how's Joe feeling? Oh, we're in the greatest shape of our lives. The greatest. That fish shelly hasn't got a chance tomorrow night. Don't belong in the same ring with us. Uh, two against one hardly seems fair. Two against... Huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, here we are, Mr. Templer. Hey, champ, you know this, champ? Sure. How are you, Saint? I'm good, Joe. How have you been? In the pink, the absolute rose-colored pink. I've been all right. That's enough, George. Thanks. Hey, you want to talk now, Joe? Got here as soon as I could. Talk? What about it? We got anything to talk to Mr. Templer about, Champ? Saint, uh, the fact is, well, I'm sorry I called you. It was a, a mistake. It sounded pretty serious, Joe. Well, I I guess I, I'm worked up for the fight tomorrow night with Fischel. You get, well, Jumpy, it's the training that does it. Yeah, sure, that's it. We're on edge, you know. Race a sharp condition. We always get this way right before a fight. What else is the sign? Shut up, Sam. We're... Sorry I bothered you, Saint. I... I'm sorry. And if you're sure you don't need me, I guess that's it. Yeah, sure. And look, if you want to make yourself some easy money, Mr. Templer, sock it on a champ to win tomorrow night. We won't even draw a deep breath. I've already got my money down, Mr. Chadwick. On Joe. Ah, oh, that's great. That's the greatest six bet of the entire Shut season. Shut up, Sam. Saint, call off your bet. No. I think you're a pretty good man, Joe. In the ring and out. <laughs> Morning, Louie. Hi, Mr. Templer. Came over as soon as I got your call. Mm. 
How are you? Well, not so good. A heavy responsibility being a father. Yeah, I'm getting some help, fortunately. I phoned an employment agency sent over a nurse. That's a shrewd move, Mr. Templer. Yeah. There's nobody quite has a woman's touch like a woman has. Uh, you know what I mean? Well, it's deep, but I'll figure it out. Come on in and see Donnie. Where is he? In bed. Oh, keeps pretty late hours. Yeah, you'd be tired, too, if you said Donnie 15,000 times a day. <laughs> How are you, Donnie, old man, huh? <laughs> you feel like talking this morning? Yeah. Watch me, watch me get some information out of him, Mr. Temple. You mm-hmm. just got to be firm. Yeah, well, I wish you luck, Louis. Donnie, what's your last name? Who brought you here? Where are you from? Huh? Donnie, Donnie, Donnie. Well, at any rate, he's consistent. <laughs> oh, that must be the nurse. Mr. Templer? Yes, come in. Thank you. I'm Miss Barton, Mr. Templer. The agency sent me over. Uh, right in here, Miss Barton. Miss Barton, uh, this is my friend Louie. How do you do? And your charge, Donnie. <laughs> Hello, Donnie. <laughs> well, he seems to approve of you, Miss Barton. Ah, oh, he, he's beautiful, Mr. Templer. Don't you think so? Louie and I consider him one of the most beautiful babies we have ever seen. Right, Louie? Right. Talks fluently, too, says Donnie. <laughs> Come here, darling. I'm going to have to go out for a while, Miss Barton. Miss Barton. What? Oh, oh, excuse me, Mr. Templer. I said I'll have to leave for a short while and I'll be back. We can discuss arrangements then, hmm? Arrangements? Oh, oh, uh, anything will be all right, Mr. Templer. Uh, Anything at all. Well, I'll call if I'm more than an hour. Goodbye. Goodbye, Donnie. Goodbye. Hey, tell your Uncle Louie goodbye, Donnie. Donnie. Well, better than nothing. Uh, where to, Mr. Templer? I want to go see Kid Fischel, Louie. Well, the guy that's fighting Collins tonight. Huh? Yes. I wasn't at all satisfied yesterday that Joe Collins didn't have something to tell me. Something going on there. Mr. Templer, you got Donnie. How many mysteries can you handle at one time? Well, sometimes one and one can be added together to get one, Louie. What does that mean? Just a hunch, as yet. Oh. <laughs> I thought they came out with a new multiplication table. I ain't even learned the old one yet. <laughs> Well, shall we be off, Mr. Templer? Uh, there is an obvious answer to that, Louis, which I shall spare you. Let us, by all means, be off. Yes? My name is Templer, Simon Templer. Uh, they told me down at the desk this was Kid Fischel's suite. It is. Come in. Thank you to desk school, Mr. Templer. One of the kids' sparring partners. How are you, chum? How do you do? My name is Alexander. Fritz Alexander. You manage Kid Fischel? I look after him. And very well, too, eh, Frankie? The best, Mr. Alexander. Uh, can I see the kid, Mr. Alexander? Unfortunately, right now he's sleeping. Go down to weigh in for the fight in an hour. Well, then perhaps I can talk to you about the fight, huh? It would be a pleasure. I can discuss the kid by the hour and never tire. I'm quite fond of him, you see. He's a perfect young machine. Strong, healthy, handsome. He wants the championship. He shall have it. Nothing can stop him. You sound quite confident. I am. If I didn't think he could win, I wouldn't send him into the ring tonight. I wouldn't take a chance on his being hurt. I won't have him hurt, you understand? Uh, Don't worry, Mr. Alexander. He ain't going to get hurt. Yes. You see, Mr. Templer... I can become quite emotional over the kid. Usually I'm... I'm not an emotional man. I see. And does uh, Joe Collins know that the kid is not to be hurt? He knows. You telling me that the fight is fixed? Hey, watch your mouth, chum. I'm not telling you anything, Mr. Templer. But whoever you are, whomever you represent, remember this. The kid wants the championship. And he shall have it. Because I find pleasure in giving the kid what he wants. And if anything or anyone stands in my way... No, Mr. Templer. I refuse to be worried by you. The kid will not be hurt. Good day. Mr. Alexander said good day, chum. Thank you for interpreting, Frankie. And Mr. Alexander, my money still rides on Joe Collins. In that case, Mr. Templer, 
I hope you can spare it. Good day. So long, chum. Mr. Templer! Mr. Templer! been looking for you. Oh, what is it, Louie? I called your house to check if everything was all right, like you told me, and Miss Barton said Sam Chadwick had been calling, wants you to call right away. Hey, that's Joe Collins' manager, Louie. I wonder what he wants. I don't know, but it's supposed to be urgent. Here's the number, and there's a phone booth out here by the elevator. Oh, thank you, Louie. Hello, Mr. Chadwick? Yeah, yeah, who's this? Uh, Simon Templer, Mr. Chadwick. Oh, Mr. Templer, hey, I've been trying to get you. I've been trying to get everybody that Joe knows. The champ is gone. Gone? Gone where? I don't know. There's 50000 already in the box office for the fight tonight, and he walks out. He can't do this. You mean we can't do this? You're in on it, too? Oh, skip it. Have you got any idea where Joe went to? I think he went out to get blind. The guy must be crazy. I'll find him, will you, Mr. Templer? you got to. Well, I'll do what I can. I'll pay. I'll pay anything. Anything. Within reason, that is. The fight has to go on. Well, I'll do what I can. This is one fight I wouldn't like to miss. This must be about the last bar in town, Mr. Templer. I ain't hit so many bars since the night my nephew went into the Navy. <laughs> Well, if we don't have any luck here, I'm about ready to give up, Louie. Now, come on, let's give it a try. Yeah. Mm. You see him? No, I... Yeah, yeah, I do. Down at the end of the bar. Does he look sober? I don't know. You wait here, Louie. Yeah. Hello, Joe. Huh? Oh, hello, Saint. What brings you here? Looking for you, champ. You been drowning your troubles? No, I started to, but... No. I'd forgotten I was champion, and when you're champ, there's a pride that goes with it. I'd forgotten I had that pride. Care to tell me what's wrong, Joe? I'll tell you. Sure. Maybe I should have told you yesterday, but things got very bad after I phoned you. How bad? I can't win this fight tonight, Saint. You can't beat Kid Fischel? I can't try to beat him. They won't let me. They got my son. Huh? Who's they, Joe? Alexander, I guess. He had somebody do it. I knew he was a little crazy, but I didn't think he was that crazy. I guess Marie was in on it, too. Marie? That isn't your wife. Was my wife. She left me right after the kid was born two years ago. She's no good. And if you don't let Fischel win tonight... Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? What can I do, Saint? Joe, what's the name of your son? Don... Donnie. Come on. Where? What for? I'll explain in the cab, Joe. We've got to get to my place right away. This way, Joe. Right behind you, Saint. Look, Mr. Templer, the front door is open. Donnie. Donnie boy, are you here? Donnie! Wait a minute, Joe. What? Behind that couch. That's Miss Barton. Oh, no. Marie. Marie? Yeah. Donnie's mother, Louis. Joe's wife. Marie. Marie. She hurt bad? I don't know. I... Here, now, let me help you, Joe. I... Oh, I'm afraid. No. Marie. Marie, can you hear me? Oh, Joey, I... I didn't know what they were doing until yesterday. I got Donnie and left him here where he'd be safe. This morning, I took the place of a girl who was sent over as a nurse, but I guess they followed me. Who did? Alexander? No, no, not him. He sent somebody. They took Donnie. I, I, I tried to stop them, but they... Where did they but, take him? Do you know? I, I think the training camp on the river, right above Milford. I know the one. Joey. Yes, Marie. <laughs> Isn't Donnie the most beautiful boy you ever saw? Marie. I know that this is what all mothers say, but isn't he really? He is, Marie. And Joey, when he gets old enough, will you just tell him, just tell him that his mother loved him very much? Just that. 
Not all the rest. Just that, Marie. <sighs> Marie. I'm sorry, Joe. She gave her life for Donnie. Yes, she did. Now we've got to find him. I'll find him. And if they've done anything and... In... No, Joe. If you do find him, they might. Well, look, I'll go after him. I'll go along, Mr. Templer. I don't like the guys that did this. Thanks, Louis. You better go down to the arena, Joe. And we'll let you know as soon as we can. All right. I guess it wouldn't be much use in finding Donnie. I'd probably put him in more danger. Joe, do you want me to... No. No, I'll look after Marie. She was my wife. This looks like the place. All right, Mr. Templer. You want to look through that window where the light is? All right, Louie. Come on. Sorry, twig. Oh, we'll keep down, Louie. I'm going to take a look. What did you see? Yeah, this is it. Donnie's in there and that pug Frankie that I met with Alexander. You think we can take him? I think so. He's listening to the radio. Come on, let's see if we can get in the back way. If you say so, Mr. Templer. Come on. You got that tire iron, Louie? Not only have I got it, I love it like a brother. Good. Here's the kitchen door. Is it open? Yeah, we're in luck. Come on in, Louie. Quiet. And here at ringside, we're watching the introduction of various celebrities by the ring announcer before the Collins Vigel title go. Pat Cavatney, clever young welterweight from Syracuse, has just been introduced from the ring, gets a nice hand, and now there goes... Uh, I spar with a guy two months, and the night he's to win the title, I'm playing nursemaid. <laughs> what are you laughing about? Oh, Donnie. Ah, uh, shut up. Louie, stand beside the door. I'll try to get him out here in the kitchen, and when I do... Just get him out here, Mr. Templer. I'll take it from there. Uh, here goes. Hi, Frankie. What? what? Who's that? You've got company. Who's in there? Little boy, Blue. Wise guy, are you? Well, you'll end up so full of holes that you'll look huh? like a... Oh. <laughs> Bullseye, Louis. That was for Marie, Mr. Templer. Yeah, it should keep him quiet until the police get here. Maybe I should give him another one for myself. Yeah, I know how you feel, Louis, but no. Let's get Donnie and get out of here, huh? Sure, Mr. Templer. How are you, Donnie? Glad to see you. Yeah. Say hi to your Uncle Louis, Donnie. Oh, Donnie. Can't you say hi? Hi. Hi. Hey, hey, hey. I learned him a new word. How about that, Mr. Templer? Now he can say two words. Yes, you have a way with you, Louie. Sure. Now, what do you say to Uncle Louie, Donnie? Oh, hi. That's it. And what's your name, Donnie? Oh, hi. Louie, you oh. should have given up while you were ahead. Come on. Oh, in there, that's a champ's dressing room. Nobody allowed in. Fight's not over, is it? Uh, not yet. Sixth round, but Collins has taken an awful pace, and I was just up there. Look, kid, get this straight. There isn't much time. Go up to Joe Collins's corner. Tell him Simon Templer has Donnie here safe. Have you got that? Sure, but I can't go up there and here, tell him... Here, look, does this persuade you? Yes, sir, Mr. Templer. Thank you. I'll, I'll tell him right away. Okay. All right, let's go in and sit down, Louie. Donnie's about all in. Yeah, look at him. He can't keep his eyes open. Yeah. Why couldn't we go right up to Joe's corner ourselves, Mr. Templer? Couldn't risk it with Donnie. I couldn't tell what Alexander might do. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, poor Joe. You think we got here in time? I don't know, Louis. I don't know. I must be taking a beating and can't fight back. Yeah, but he can now. If he's got anything left to fight with. Quiet up there now. Must be the end of a round. Mm. See, that crowd noise, I, I, I never heard it from down here. You know, it scares you. It should, Louis. The voice of the mob howling for blood. Same voice that howled in the Colosseum at Rome 2,000 years ago. For whose blood? The champs or for shells? Mob doesn't care, Louis. Just blood. Yeah. Scares you. What makes people go to these things, Mr. Temple? Will they ever stop? No, they, they go because this is an allegory of their own lives, Louis. They'll stop when their lives cease to be conflict and pain. And when will that be? It's hmm, a good question. Hey, fight's starting up again. Yeah, that means the champ is still on the sphere, anyway. 
Come on, Joey boy, come on, come on. Hey, uh, is, is, is it wrong to root, Mr. Temple? We're all part of the crowd, Louie, one way or another. Yeah. yeah. Oh, something is happening up there. They don't yell like that for nothing. <laughs> come on, come on, Joey. Come on, Joey. Do it. You can do it, Joey. Donnie's down here. You can fight now, Joey. Careful of that tire iron, Louie. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> come on. The straight left, Jeff. Come on, the straight left in the face, Joey, and cross with the right. Oh. What am I talking about? I can't even see him. Come on, Joe. Come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you too, Mr. Temple. Yeah, me too, Louie. Yeah. Something happened, Mr. Temple. I was too short for a round. That was a knockout. It was, Louie, but who? Yeah, yeah, who? Oh, keep everything crossed, Mr. Templer. Fingers, toes, eyes, everything. Maybe he didn't get our message, Louis. Mr. Templer, don't say that. Oh, we'll see, no. It sounds like people coming down the hall out there. Yeah, but Joey couldn't have won. Oh, boy, he had too much taken out of him. He couldn't have come back. Hey, after the... hey, oh, it was a great show. Hey, we took him, Mr. Templer. We took him. Oh. Clear everybody out of here, will you? Yeah, you hurt us, everybody out. Come on, give us a chance to get our breath, will you? Everybody out. Come on. Come on. Oh, will you, fellas? Come on. Come on. That's it. All out, champ. Hey, that was a great fight. I thought it was even better than the one we fought against Babyface. Oh, boy, am I proud of us, Joe. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, well, you can excuse me now. I got some dough to collect. <laughs> Donnie. Donnie, come on now. Wake up and say hello to your daddy. No. No, let him sleep, Saint. I'm not very pretty right now. But you should see for sure. <laughs> you clobbered him, champ. Good. He was a very surprised young man. Yeah. How about Alexander? I don't know. I didn't see him after it was over. I rushed right down here. And I'd better get the police on his trail. He might be able to get away if I don't tell them to. Alexander. Joe, did you think you could get away with it? And Joe, did you think I'd stand by and see you? That gun must be heavy, Mr. Alexander. You'd better put it down. No. The police won't like your negative attitude. What do I care? After what he did to the kid, do you think I care any more about anything? The kid will be all right. He was just knocked out. Just, just. That beautiful physical machine, blooded, battered, stretched out in the dirt. Oh. You think the kid can ever feel the same again? Do you think I can ever feel about him as I did? He had the championship. Had it. Before Collins double-crossed us. That's one way of looking at it. Why didn't you keep out, Mr. Templar? Why? Put the gun away, Alexander. You haven't a chance. Maybe I haven't. But neither have you, Collins. I warned you not to hurt the kid, but you wouldn't listen. You're a sick man, Mr. Uh, Alexander. Perhaps I am. Perhaps the world is sick and I'm well, but I know what I'm going to do. You first, Collins. You know how the kid felt. Mr. Alexander, I'm afraid you'll have to take care of me first. Stop where you are, Templar. Don't come any closer. I warn you once more, Templar, and then I'm going All to... All right, Louis. Oh! Oh, nice work. Lucky I kept this tire iron here. Yeah. You know, I think he was serious. I don't think there's much doubt about it. A very twisted man, Mr. Alexander. Hey, look, Donnie's awake. You got a smile for your old man, Donnie. Oh, Donnie, hi. Hey, he knows a new word. How about that, say? Ain't that some kid? He's another champ, Joe. I'll be a champ in something. Not in this racket, but something good. Something you can take a real pride in. He'll be proud of you, Joe. He'll be proud of his mother, too. After I tell him about her. Just a minute. Hi, Mr. Templer. Well, look who's here. Hi, Donnie. <laughs> Champ, let me take him out for a walk. Hey, you know what, Mr. Templer? I've been teaching him all sorts of words. Honestly, Louie? Mm-hmm. The smartest kid there is. Watch this now, Mr. Templer. Watch. Donnie, what's my name? Why? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Some smart kid, huh? That's not all. Now, watch this. Donnie, what's Mr. Templer's name? Louie. Uh, 
something go wrong? No, no, wait just a minute. Wait a minute. Donnie, Mr. Templer's name. Wally. All right, something else. Donnie, where do you live? Wally. Donnie, what's your daddy's name? Wally. No. Don- Wally, 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 Wally. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Templer. Goodbye, Louis, 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 Louis. You have been listening to another transcribed adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. Now here is our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, there are certain things in our daily life which we take for granted. Only when we are deprived of them do we realize what precious commodities they really are. Air may become the most vital thing in the world to the suffocating man and water to the thirsty one. In the same way, freedom, when it is missed, suddenly becomes life's greatest treasure. In this country, we possess freedom. It is part of us. It is our American heritage. This liberty which we so casually accept was created and nurtured. It didn't just materialize. And so Americans are justly proud of their heritage, and much of the world around us is fascinated by it. If we are to justify our own pride and the yearnings of those in other countries, we must make this freedom a personal thing. We must take it as it was handed to us and preserve it. Preserve it with conscious effort. That is our job as Americans as free men, for freedom is everybody's job. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure of the saint. Good night. This adventure of the saint was written by Dick Powell. In our cast, you heard Larry Dobkin as Louie and Mary Shipp as Marie. Sheldon Leonard played Sam and Bonnie Phillips Joe. Donnie was Jerry Hausner and Victor Rodman Alexander. Frank Gerstle was Frankie. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Helen Mack. Vincent Price is soon to be seen co-starring with Errol Flynn and Michael and Prell in William Marshall's production of Bloodline. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are now on all newsstands. Your announcer, Don Stanley. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Who's on the big show tonight? Well, listen, Bob Hope, Dean Martin, and Jerry Lewis, Rosalind Russell, Frankie Lane, Dorothy McGuire, Louis Armstrong, Meredith Wilson, and glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah. No wonder it's the big show. And Sunday evening also means another outstanding production by Theater Guild on the air. Tonight, it's Boomerang, starring Kirk Douglas. Remember, Bob Hope and Martin and Lewis joined the big show today on NBC. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Did you ever know a girl private detective? Perhaps not. They're pretty rare. Well, we've got one. Candy Matson is the name. And she's both pretty and rare. Figure? She picks up where Miss America leaves off. Clothes? She makes a peasant dress look like opening night at the opera. Hair? Blonde, of course. And eyes? Just the right shade of blue to match the hair. You're expecting more? All right, let's meet her. She's on the phone now. In her penthouse on Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. Hello, Candy Matson. Well, bless my ever-loving little old serial number, Candy Matson. Watch out how you go tossing your serial number around, Pally. Who is this? Candy, hope you remember me. This is Sergeant Kenley down at Fort Ord. Kenley the Galan, uh-huh. the G.I. who filled my slipper with beer and drank it. <laughs> That's me, the poor man's Diamond Jim Brady. <laughs> sure, I remember you. I met you when I was down at Fort Ord with the U.S.O. What's on your mind, Kenley? Oh, wait a minute, I'll put it this way. What's new? I like this is new. We're having a big shindig at the Senior Non-Commissioned Officers Club tomorrow night. Uh, you're elected as the girl most likely. 
Finish the sentence. Okay. That's the girl most likely to be the queen of a ball. Kenley, you mad lad. I'd adore it. But what would I do for a chaperone? A what? Don't play dull. You heard me. Oh, 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 sure. Well, why don't you bring your mother? Wonderful idea. And I know just the fellow. Roger, Kenley. I'll report to the orderly room sometime tomorrow afternoon at Fort Ord. That's the way things happen with me, so casually. I'm at home on Telegraph Hill overlooking San Francisco Bay, polishing a few old sapphires, when the phone rings. Sounds innocent, doesn't it? But uh uh-uh. I ran into two rather grisly murders in Monterey. Want some details? Listen. When I told the sergeant I knew just the fellow to be my mother, I met my old pal Rembrandt Watson. In former days, Rembrandt, an A1 photographer now that he doesn't imbibe, used to see double by noon, triple by four, and complete darkness by eight. One night, the darkness became too dense and he suddenly saw the light. That's when he threw all his bottles out the window. Of course, he was arrested for disturbing the peace, but he hasn't touched a drop since. And when I mentioned Rembrandt as my chaperone, I wasn't fooling. He's been like a mother to me many, many times. He was just back from his vacation, so I got in my car and drove over Powell and down California Street. At Grand Avenue stands Old St. Mary's, and on the bell tower just underneath the clock, there's a sign that says, Son, observe the time and fly from evil. I'd seen it before, but somehow that afternoon it had an added meaning. I parked my car and went across the street to Rembrandt's apartment. Candy. Rembrandt, you old dear, how are you? Wonderful, just wonderful. Darling, you're looking simply grand. I'll slice it thinner, Rembrandt. You've only been gone three weeks. Oh, sorry, dear. You'll come in, won't you? Mm-hmm. I'm just having some tea. Won't you join me, Candy? I'd love it. It's all ready. Oogly, bleep, 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 Bob. Wait a minute. What was that again? In case you don't know, Dove, that's Bob. Where did you ever pick up Bob? I was visiting a friend of mine last night, a professor of psychology, over at that institution across the bay. California? No, San Quentin. He's a penologist. He played some Bop records for me. Well, what do you think of Bop, Rembrandt? They say it's the latest thing. Why, girl, I can remember when they were playing Bop back in 1926. You can? Certainly. Only in those days they called it Vodo do dio vodo do dio do Here's your tea, Dove. It's warm. Thanks. What brings you by this afternoon, Candy, dear? You. I've got an invite to a ball for both of us. How delightful. I'll get my Grand Marshal's uniform out of my trunk. It's not that kind of a ball, Ducky. It's just a dance for soldiers at Fort Ord. Fort Ord? That's down in Monterey. That's right. And I want you to go along as my chaperone. Candy, I'd really love it. Good. I'll pick you up at noon tomorrow. Oh, I'm sorry. I have an appointment at two. You run along and, and I'll get the Del Monte special. Okay, and I'll pick you up at the station in Monterey. Splendid, splendid. Oh, uh... Mm. By the way, dear, I'm just a little... Uh... Oh, sure. Here, take 20. Oh, no, no, not that much, Candy. <laughs> no, 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 yourself, I insist. Oh, I'm so glad you're firm about these things. Thanks ever so much. Not at all. Thanks for the tea, Rembrandt. I'll see you in Monterey. I gave Rembrandt a little chuck under the chin. He quivered his bushy eyebrows, and I left. If I was going to be queen of a military ball, I had to get some royal raiment. I picked up a mantilla and a strapless evening gown you had to hold up by sheer concentration and deep breathing. <coughs> then I had a quiet dinner for one, please, James, and went home and climbed aboard the Dream Express quite early. When I woke up, I had the nasty feeling that I had something to do. Then I remembered. I had a date that evening with Mallard. That's Inspector Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. The nomenclature reads... 6'2", weight 190, nice features, smart guy when it comes to solving a crime, but when it comes to talking about us and the future, he freezes up completely. I got dressed and whipped down to the Hall of Justice on Kearney Street. Well, Candy, how's Telegraph Hill's greatest lady detective? (laughs) At the moment, Mellor, dear, I'm just between detectives. Kind of slow, huh? No, not slow. I just wrapped up a case. Now I want to take it easy for a few days. I've got news for you, Candy. Such as like what? Such as like I can't keep our date for tonight. Oh, Mallard, I'd been counting on it. I know, Candy. I'm sure sorry. Mm-hmm. But how did I know this guy was going to do what he did out in the Taravel district? Playing straight, I say. What did the guy do out in the Taravel district? He parlayed a sudden impulse into a seat in the gas chamber. How so? He'd done in his old lady. Mallard, don't talk like that. 
Okay. He ostracized his wife from the world of the living. With a pipe. That's better. Over the head. I get the picture. Anyway, I've got news for you, too. And yours would be? I'd have to break our date tonight anyway. Uh Uh-huh. I just knew I was going to get stood up. And tonight's the night that Tex Acuff is playing in Loves of Laredo. Candy, it's Acuff's best movie. Acuff will just have to keep his chin up. You're busy in the Terraval, and I've got to be at a dance at the NCO club at Fort Ord. Oh, that's right. I am busy tonight. So you're going to Fort Ord, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. Weren't you there a couple of times during the war? That's right. With the USO. That same sergeant still there? The same sergeant. He's the one who asked me tonight. Now, this calls for drastic action. Come here, Candy. Mallard. It was one of those rare moments. Mallard kissed me. Part of me floated out of his office. Then part of me floated back in and picked up the rest of me. Then all of me floated out again. Then I realized I'd forgotten my hat. I went back and got it. Then I saw I didn't have my purse. I went back and got that. Keep this up and you won't even get past Market Street, let alone to Fort Ord. That Mallard, he can do the sweetest things sometimes. That was one of them. I got in the car, shifted into low, and that's the last I remember until I came to in front of the rancho in Carmel. Obviously, one kiss from Mallard was better than a tank full of hundred-proof octane. I registered, got a cabana out and back, showered, changed, and drove back into town. The drive down must have been dusty because I was extremely dry. So I stopped at Griff's, a cute little place with old theatrical pictures all over the walls. Yes, miss. Would you care for something? Oh, yes, a, a martini, please. Very dry. Very dry. Righto. You're new here, aren't you? Yes, I am. I started working here about three weeks ago. I thought so. I was down about a month ago, but I don't remember seeing you. No, the fellow who was here became ill. Mr. Griffin hired me. Nice place to work. Oh, yes. It's very enjoyable. Here you are, miss. Thank you. I... I know you don't know who I am, but I'm a very good friend of Mr. Griffin's, and I came away without any money. Could you cash a check for me? Well, I don't know. I'd like to, but do you have any identification with you? Oh, yes, of course. Here, my driver's license. Matson. Candy Matson. Mm-hmm. Now I know why I thought I recognized you. Aren't you presiding over the dance tonight at Fort Ord? Well, yes. Why? I saw your picture in the paper yesterday. Yesterday? What? I only knew about it myself Yes. Oh, that Kenley, what an operator. I'll be happy to cash your check, Miss Madsen. <laughs> Good. I'm going to need it. A queen has to scatter a little gold amongst her subjects. The lad cashed my check and I left for the fort. I drove out past Seaside, then on past Ord Village and onto the reservation itself. The guard motioned me through the south gate with a wave of his hand and a... (whistles) Yep, still the same old Fort Ord. I wove my way through the streets and finally pulled up in front of the senior NCO club. As I got out, there was my pal Kenley coming down the steps in his fatigues yet. Oh, Candy, you beautiful thing, you. Don't you beautiful thing me, Sergeant Kenley. What's the matter? You know what's the matter. They printed a picture of me in the Monterey Herald yesterday. Well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong? When the paper came out yesterday, I hadn't even heard about your wing-ding tonight. Oh, don't be mad, Candy. Uh, I've never seen you say no to a worthwhile cause yet. This is a worthwhile cause? That's right. Every cent we take in, we're turning over to the community chest. Oh, well, that puts a different light on it. Oh, I knew you'd see it that way. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. You don't charge for these NCO dances. How are you getting any proceeds out of it? Oh, I didn't tell you, did I? Every half hour, we're having a raffle. The highest bidder gets a free dance. With you. Oh, that Kenley. Well, it was getting dark, and the Del Monte special with Rembrandt aboard would soon be pulling in. So I went back to Monterey... All of a sudden, I decided to play games. About a mile from town, the train stops at Del Monte itself. I thought it might be cute if I went back, got on the train there, and met Rembrandt that way. There she was, coming right in on schedule. I parked the car and went over to the little country-like station. The train wasn't in sight yet. It has to make the bend around Seaside. There it was. Now the headlight was sending its beam down the shining rails... It stood out like a beacon in the Monterey twilight. Then... 
I saw it. The glare of the locomotive's light picked up the crumpled body of a man. It was stretched across the tracks in a grotesque manner. Suddenly, my mind flashes signaled my feet, and I moved. It was a man, all right. The train was getting closer. I grabbed him by his lead-like shoulders and tugged. He wouldn't budge. I tried again, but still no luck. I looked down in desperation. That's when I saw that one of his feet was jammed between the rail and the tie. I gave a yank, and the foot came free. Then I grabbed him by the shoulders again. He must have weighed over 200, but little by little, I was getting his body over the rails and off under the shoulder. Finally, I made it, just as the Del Monte rolled by. The body had fallen over on top of me as I pulled him away from the rails. I shoved him to one side and he flopped over. As he did so, I realized my companion was very cold, very limp, and very dead. A card fell out of his pocket and I did the natural thing and picked it up. By that time, the train was pulling out. I tried to catch it, but it was too late. It was only a mile into Monterey, so I left my cold friend and drove in after the train. I got snarled in a traffic jam just before I made the right turn into the station, so Rembrandt was waiting for me as I drove up. Dove, how nice of you, right on time. Never mind the salutations. Come on, we've got work to do. Don't tell me I'm supposed to take your place at the ball tonight. No. I've discovered a body. Andy, dear, how occupational. How irritational. Come on, let's go. Where? Monterey Sheriff's Office. But you'll miss the ball, girl. Not tonight, I won't. I darn near got killed myself. Tonight I'm going to have fun. Let's go. I went over to the Sheriff's Office. They have a staff of nine men. I placed everything in their capable hands and drove Rembrandt over one of the local hotels. I went back to the rancho, climbed into my strapless queen outfit, and went back to pick him up. He came out with a bewildered look on his face. I didn't say anything. We drove along through the Ord reservation, and finally I popped the question. Okay, Rembrandt, what's wrong? Nothing, except this. What's this? A card. While I was dressing, a man knocked on me door, shoved this into me hand, and told me to tell you about it, and left. Let me see it. Here. Oh, careful, Dub, don't go off the road. The military wouldn't like that. They dislike messy forts. Wait a minute. Look through my purse, Rembrandt. Precisely for what? For a card that matches this one. Mm -hmm. Lipstick, lighter, handkerchief. Oh, here we are. You're right, Candy. It matches exactly. Does it make sense? Not yet. This is a warning, Rembrandt. A warning to keep my nose out of somebody's business. Yes, but what's this on the card? I don't understand. I thought you were studying the cello, Rembrandt, dear. Oh, I am. Then you should know what that is. That's the musical signature for F sharp. The gent who gave Rembrandt the card had obviously been following us since we left the sheriff's office. Now I knew I was in on something. But what? That body didn't crawl on the tracks all by itself. It was placed there deliberately in hopes the train would mangle all evidence. I'd have to worry about that later. I had a date to keep, and I was going to keep it. Once again, I pulled up in front of the senior non-commissioned officers club. Rembrandt helped me out, and we went in. The joint was really jumping. As we went in, dear old Sergeant Kenley was there to greet us. Oh, Candy, I'm glad you're here. I was getting worried. Ha, ha, ha. He's worried. Yes. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. I don't get it. That's all right, Sergeant. Kenley, I want you to know Rembrandt Watson, my chaperone this evening. Your, uh, your... Oh, uh, glad to know you, sir. You didn't talk down to me, Sergeant. I have campaign ribbons for just such battles as this. Okay, Kenley. When do we start the raffle? Right now. Come on, Candy. If ever a girl gave her all for the army, that was I. I danced until my insteps had insteps. Going on toward midnight, they started another raffle. A dark-looking sergeant bid six dollars, and I was to dance with him. Rembrandt was fighting the Boxer Rebellion all over again with some top kick, so I was stuck, but good. Miss Matson, that was my last six dollars. You shouldn't have done it, Sergeant. Oh, it was worth it. But if you don't mind, I'd rather not dance. Oh, Sergeant, for those kind words, I make you a lieutenant. Uh, no, thanks. I'd rather be a sergeant. <laughs> uh, but would you mind walking outside on the terrace? It's awfully stuffy in here. Sergeant, it would be a pleasure, believe me. 
We went outside. The night was strictly moderage, sparkling with stars, not warm, not cold, and a slight smell of sardines in the air. That's good. That meant the canneries were working. But speaking of the smell of fish... Uh, let's go this way, shall we? I... Why? There's a beautiful view of the entire bay from over here. Look, Sergeant, I only came down here to I dance... I said, come with me. What? You're hurting my oh, arm. My now, wait just a minute, Sergeant. No, you wait, Candy Matson. I know who you are. You had to come down here where you weren't wanted. You don't seem to understand you that I was... You had to find a body on the tracks. And you ended up with two cards that were identical, didn't you? Give me those two cards. I... I haven't got them. <gasps> don't give me that. Where are they? I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't got any cards. Okay, sister, you ask for it. <clears throat> the sky was whirling. Time was nothing. I was in China. I was in Cuba. I was nowhere. Suddenly, things came into focus. I was out in the back of the club in Rembrandt, and half a dozen GIs were standing over me. Well, there, ducky. You're going to be all right. What happened? I got slugged, that's what happened. And the rat only bid six bucks for the privilege. How do you feel, Dal? Terrible. Oh, Kenny, I feel terrible, too. I don't know how this could have happened. Hi, Kenley. Oh, my head. Oh, gee, I, 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 I just can't apologize enough. That's I... all right. I came down here to be queen of the ball. I got crowned, didn't I? I thank Sergeant Kenley for the party. It was a nice affair. After all, it was no fault of the NCO club or Fort Ord that I got wrapped over the head. So I got Rembrandt in the car and we drove back into Carmel. Rembrandt was quite concerned. He suggested that we stop and I have a touch of brandy. I didn't argue. We went into Griff's. Ah, good evening. You wish something? Yes, please. Uh, brandy for the lady. Lemon Coke for me. Uh, brandy and... Uh, what was that again? A glass of water. A glass of water, yeah. Uh, hold it. Uh, you weren't here this afternoon. No, I worked the evening shift. Frankie's here during the afternoon. Frankie? That's right. Uh, Frankie Sharp. That's when Roman candles went off and bells started to ring. Thinking back to the afternoon, the guy who cashed my check had one slight characteristic. I remembered as he handed me the money, his cufflinks were stamped musically... F sharp. I must have had a funny look on my face because Rembrandt spoke. What's the matter, dear? Doesn't the brandy agree with you? No, no, it's not that. I, I'm trying to put one and one together to make two, but it doesn't add. Uh-oh. No. Looks like we're going to have company. Pardon me, Miss Madison. I hope I'm not intruding. Not at all, Corporal. Everybody's getting into the act tonight. Sit down and make yourself comfortable. Oh, thank you. I just heard the regrettable news. You're getting slugged at the club. I, I left just before, I guess. How did it happen? He was a sergeant. He outranked me. Oh, incidentally, my name is Case. Dave Case. Fourth MP Company at the Fort. Glad to know you, Case. This is Mr. Rembrandt Watson. Oh, how do you do? How do you do, sir? Where's your accoutrement? What? But you're a billy club and pistol, your armband and so on. <laughs> I don't wear them when I'm not on duty, Mr. Watson. <laughs> you're in good hands, Candy. I've got to leave. Can't stand the place where they only serve you water. That's what you asked for, Rembrandt. I know. Yield not the temptation, I always say. I do a you, corporal case. Yeah. Good night, Candy, dear. Uh, see you in the morning. You two just stay and talk over the Battle of the Bulge, that knob on Candy's head. <laughs> Good night, Rembrandt. Does he always duck out on you like that, Miss Matson? He's a man of whims. That's why I like him. Mm. Mm, this brandy isn't doing anything for me. What I need is some air. Corporal... Do me a favor and walk me down to the beach and back, will you? Why, I'd be delighted. We left Griff's and walked down Ocean Avenue to the beach. There was a half moon shining down from the east and hitting the waves. It made the ocean look almost luminous. Feel a little better, Miss Matson? Yes. Mm, I wonder what that character hit me with. Come on, Corporal. Let's go along the beach a little way. Aren't you cold? No, this is fine. Wait. Wait a minute, Case. That... Hmm? What? Let down there. Right at the water's edge. Looks like the body of a man. 
I... I... You're right. Let's go. We ducked around a clump of brush and hightailed it down to the water. Sure enough, it was the sprawled figure of a man. Every time a wave came in, the body would change position, setting new patterns of crumpled legs and oddly shaped arms. Give me a hand, Case. Yep. Help me roll him over. Okay. There. Hey. Look at this. What, Miss Manson? Do you know who this joker is? This is the lad who flattened my skull at the dance tonight. Yeah, I'll bet he's awfully sorry he did it now. He's quite dead. The corporal and I pulled and tugged and finally got the boy high and dry up on the beach. Then we ran up to my cabin. Operator. They must have closed the switchboard for tonight. Well, you wait here, Miss Matson. I'll run up into town. There's usually a prowl car there at this hour. Okay, but hurry, Corporal. Katie slammed out the door and I was left alone. I walked over to the cabinet, got a cigarette and lit it. Thoughts were going through my head like a roulette wheel, but none of the thoughts were dropping in the right slot. Then suddenly... Did you ever get the feeling you weren't alone? That a pair of eyes was watching your every move? I wheeled around. There he was, standing over by the closet door. Good evening. My bartender friend of the afternoon. Enjoying your cigarette, Miss Madsen? Yes. Yes, I am, Mr. Sharp. Fine. Drag on it. Drag deeply. But the last drag always tastes the best. What's on your mind? You. You've been on my mind ever since you pulled that body off the tracks this evening. Was that one of your jobs? Oh, yes. Had you surmised by my musical signature? Wasn't that being rather dramatic? I don't think so. All great artists sign their work. And why shouldn't I? I came here to paint. But they only laughed at me. And jeered. So I decided to paint in a different manner. It was beginning to pay dividends, too. But you and the others, you had to spoil it. I could have been big. Do you understand? I could have owned this whole country. Oh, no, Frankie. You leave too many of your cards around. Recognition. There has to be recognition for everything done in this world. Look, here. I've got another F-sharp card, Miss Madsen. So I see. I made it especially for you. About an hour ago. Is that when you held your pal's head under the surf down there on the beach? Shortly after, yes. And now I shall have to work fast, won't I? Your corporal friend with the muscles will be returning with the police. Over there against the wall, Miss Matson. You can't get away with this, Frankie. I think I can. You see, everything I touch must either live or die. In your case, it's too late for the former. So die, you must. Corporal! Get back, Miss Matson. This guy's nuts. Looks like I'll have to add another. Oh, Corporal, you all right? Just got me on the shoulder. All right, Mac. Try this. Oh, <laughs> Hang on to his gun arm, Kate. I'll try to get him with his lamp. Never mind that. He's going to drop that gun right now. Oh. 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 Hey, Corporal, down the hall. You'd better hold it, Sharp. I'm warning you. Okay, you ask for it. F sharp was quite flat, there at the bottom of the stairs. And sharp being flat was a natural. He looked awfully good that way. All I can say is I am terribly grateful for Fordord's highly efficient MPs. Case ducked out to get the police, but halfway down the stairs he heard Sharp's voice in my room. He tiptoed back and listened just long enough outside my door. Just as Frankie had leveled his pistol at my head, Case broke through and wrestled the gun out of Sharp's hand. Oh, the rest of the facts? Well, I've got the dis and data right here. Frankie Sharp was a wise boy. He was dishonorably discharged from the Army in 1946. 
He came to the Monterey area with a complete load of army uniforms, fatigues, and general equipment. He set up a little ring of other ex-GIs with bad records, all dishonorably discharged also, all professional gamblers. On army paydays, he'd rig his mob out with GI uniforms. Then they'd gang up on the boys from the camp and take them for all their dough with marked cards and loaded dice. The gang was familiar with army routine, so it was easy for them to make like real soldiers. But Frankie Sharp was keeping too much of the loot for himself, so he decided to set up a new gang. One by one, he had his boys marked for sudden and violent death. The first was the guy I pulled off the tracks. Sharp and the fake sergeant who slugged me were parked up on the highway watching to see if Del Monte Special put on the finishing touches. When the gag misfired, they followed me, found out where Rembrandt was staying, slipped in one of their business cards as a warning for me to stay out. But the fake sergeant turned chicken. He didn't want those F-sharp notes all over the area. So he came out to the NCO club, bopped me over the head, and got them back. When he returned, Frankie knew the fat was in the fire and that the time to strike was then. So he took his pen all down to the beach, gave him a finger wave and a permanent, the kind you don't wake up from. Then he went back to my cottage to wait for me. Sharp was his own undoing. The poor guy was a megalomaniac and insisted on signing his works of art. His greatest masterpiece, though, was one he autographed. It was called Picture of a Corpse at the Bottom of a Stairway. Because when we went down to look at his body, he still had his own F-sharp card clutched in his rigid fingers. Corporal Case... Good boy. He's been studying criminology with the United States Armed Forces Institute. He was discharged about a month later and, because of his considerable amount of gray matter, was promised the first opening with the Monterey Sheriff's Office. And, oh, me, it's beautiful around Monterey and Carmel. The soft ocean, the gently rising knolls, especially the one on my head. That's the last time I'm going to be queen of a ball. <laughs> Listen again next week at this same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... For Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Heard tonight were John Grover as Sergeant Kenley, Lou Tobin as the pseudo-sergeant, Kurt Martell as Corporal David Case, and Jerry Walter as Frankie Sharp. Henry Leff? is Inspector Ray Mallard and Jack Thomas portrays the role of Rembrandt. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Eloise Rowan was at the organ and sound effects were created by Bill Brownell and Jay Randon. Corporal David C. Case is an actual person. Any resemblance to other people in tonight's play is purely coincidental. The program came to you from San Francisco. This is Dudley Manlove speaking. You are June for the Stars on NBC. Listen to Defense Attorney next on ABC. Sir Walter Riley laid down his cloak so Queen Elizabeth wouldn't muddy her royal feet. We can show the same depth of feeling for the victims of the Midwest floods. Not with the cloak, but with disaster dollars. Houses must be rebuilt and refurnished, farm machinery supplied, vocational training provided. This long-term rehabilitation will go on indefinitely, and it will require more money than the American Red Cross has in its present disaster relief fund. Send a disaster dollar to help your fellow citizens fight their way through the Midwest flood disaster of 1951. Mail your contribution to the Red Cross in your town. Ladies and gentlemen, to depend upon your judgment and to fulfill my own obligation, I submit the facts, fully aware of my responsibility to my client and to you as defense attorney. The American Broadcasting Company presents Miss Mercedes McCambridge as defense attorney. When Martha Ellis Bryant chose law as a career, she accepted the challenge of defending the defenseless. Defenseless was Grady Daniels, who went hunting, and to use his own words, 
because he wore a beard and lost a knife, wound up in jail, charged with murder. Marty, I wouldn't touch that case if I were you. Why not, Judd? Well, for one thing, the police already have the ink on the solved stamp. The victim practically identified the killer before he died. But practically isn't enough. And what else? Well, the murder weapon belonged to Daniels. Has that been proven? Yes, he admits it. Is there any doubt about it being the murder weapon? None whatsoever. It fits the wounds, and it was found nearby covered with blood. What does Daniels say? He was picked up three miles from the scene of the crime and claimed he lost the knife while he was hunting. Well, that could happen. Yes, it could. Judd, but... his wife had just left my office when I telephoned you. And she asked... Well, she said that Daniels could never kill another man. Another? Yes. She said he was overseas with the Marines for two years. He said he'd had enough killing to last him a lifetime. I want to talk to him, Judd. All right, Marty, but the dispatch covered the investigation and the whole story can be told in a half dozen lines. How? Yeah, something like this. Vet goes hunting. Farms are all posted no hunting. Vet figures he fought for the country and should be allowed to hunt in it. Argues with farmer. Stabs him. Is that what the police claim? Yes, and they've got the evidence to go with it. But it's all circumstantial. Yes, but it's all there. I don't like circumstantial evidence, Judd. Circumstance isn't above dealing a card from the bottom. This case could hurt you, Marty. Oh, how can it hurt me? Well... You're going to be on the losing side of an open and shut, small-time, unimportant case. It's a very important case to at least two people. The accused man and his wife. Marty, you've already decided to take this case, haven't you? No, I haven't. No, not yet. Wait till I've talked with Grady Daniels. Then if I think he's innocent, I'll defend him. So that's Grady Daniels. He's still wearing his beard. Sure. They're not going to let him cut off the evidence. Are you Grady Daniels? Yeah. What about it? I'm Martha Ellis Bryant, an attorney, and this is Judd Barnes of the dispatch. Hello. Did Hester send you here? She asked me to represent you. A woman lawyer. Oh, great. The bar examination is the same for women and men, Daniels. And I haven't decided to take your case yet. Would you like to tell me about it? Why not? If I tell enough people, maybe someone will believe me. I didn't kill that farmer. I didn't even see him. Suppose you start at the beginning and tell me everything that happened that day. First, did you kill him? Look, I just went hunting... Did you kill him? No. All right. Now tell me what happened. And Daniels... Yeah? Don't change or withhold anything. There... There isn't anything to withhold... I drove out to this section to hunt quail. Some friends had told me there were a lot of birds there. I parked and crawled under a fence and started hunting. Did you see any signs forbidding hunting? No, not then. Besides, I met a couple of other hunters right after I got into this field. Were they together? Yeah. Did you meet anybody else? Yeah, about a half an hour later, I met a man hunting with a trained hawk. Did you talk to any of these men? Yeah, all of them, about the hunting. Whether they had found any birds, they hadn't. And nobody told you that the land was posted? No. Well, so I went on hunting for about an hour. Then I came to a fence that had a no hunting sign on it. And then what? Well, I walked the fence line and the whole place was posted. The land that you were on? Yeah, that's right. I must have missed them when I came on from the road. Uh huh. And then what did you do? Well, I went back to my car and started to look for a place where I could hunt. Did you meet anybody while you were leaving? No. No, but I sure did right after I left. Why, what happened? Well, I'd gone about a mile when I came to this roadblock. I slowed down and stopped. I thought maybe there was an accident or something, and I got out of All right, here he is, the man with the beard. Cover him, man. Hey, hey, what's all the artillery for? Keep both hands in sight, mister. Now, come on, get out. Slow, with your hands up. Now, look, Warden, why all the guns? I've got a license. There's no open season on farmers, mister. Hold out your hands. All right, but I don't... Handcuffs. Hey, what's the idea? Shut up. All right, what's your name? Daniels, Grady Daniels. Been hunting Daniels? Yeah, but... Where? Back there, about a mile. Mm-hmm. Search his car, man. All right, boy. 
Now, look, I've got a right to know why I'm handcuffed and why those men are searching my car. You don't know, huh? You find anything, men? Oh, just this guard. All right. Leave it there. Put a guard in the car and we can have it towed to the county garage. All right, come on, Daniels. I'm going to jail. I'm not going anywhere till I find out why. Oh, you're going all right, Daniels. I'll tell you why. I found a man down the road. They told me his name was Otto Peisner. He'd been stabbed. The knife was still there. A Japanese Harry Carey knife. A knife like should be in that empty scabbard in your belt. Where's your knife, Daniels? Why, it's... It's gone. Yeah. It was there when I went hunting. I I must have lost it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you lost it, all right. But you see, Otto Peisner wasn't quite dead when I found him. He lived long enough to tell me it was the hunter with the beard. You wear a beard, your knife is gone, and the design on that scabbard matches the design on the knife that killed Peisner. You're under arrest, Daniels. You may as well come quietly because there's... And that's all they told me, Miss Bryant. Just because I wear a beard and lost a knife, I wind up in jail, charged with murder. Daniels, I'm going to take your case, because I believe you. But we haven't much time, less than a week. I wish your wife would come to me sooner. But I'll do everything that I can. Marty, honey, why did you tell that man you'd take his case? He doesn't have a case. That's why I took on the job of building one. He needs it. I'll say he needs it. But what are you going to build it on? I don't know yet, Judd. But there's something in this case that doesn't fit. Like what? If Daniels did stab Peisner and left the knife there, why did he carry the empty scabbard around with him till the warden found it on him? He carried it right into the roadblock. Well, that's easy. He didn't know the roadblock was there. Or he didn't know that the knife was gone. Ah, uh, that's going to sound pretty thin to a jury. It's just thin enough to be true. Well, I think you took on too big a load this time, Counselor. Well, none of them looks good to start, Judge. Look, honey, everything is against you. The murdered man described the killer before he died. Daniels fits that description. Two out-of-state hunters have left sworn statements to having seen Daniels on Peisner's farm, and one local hunter will be a witness. They were all clean-shaven, and none had knives. Daniels was wearing an empty scabbard that the murder weapon fits. Yeah, it sounds bad. Yes, and if that isn't enough, Daniels admits that the knife was his. The police have motive, identification, and weapon. There's one thing that the police do not have. Well, I'd like to know what it is. A conviction. Huh? And I have. I'm convinced that Grady Daniels is innocent. I don't know why. Call it intuition. Is uh, intuition an accepted legal device? Well, they didn't mention it in school. But then the teacher was a man. <laughs> All right. All right. But... Marty, did you notice that Daniels was pretty cocky for a man in his predicament? Oh, that's a front, Judson. He wears a beard to hide a scar on the outside and a chip on his shoulder to hide a scar on the inside. Okay, Counselor. Where do we start building? I think I'd like to talk with that game warden, that... What's his name? Uh, Mac, McFarland, I think. Yeah. Jim McFarland. Yeah. Why don't you let me out at the next drugstore? I'll call the Fish and Game Commission. They can tell me where he is. All right. Well, what do you expect to find out from him? Mostly the viewpoint of the man who found the body. Cabin number seven, they said. Yeah, that would be over this way. It's a funny thing. Game warden living in a tourist camp. Well, what's funny? Lots of people live in motels. Yeah, I know, but somehow I just never thought of an officer as living in one. Now, here it is, number seven. Somebody's in there. I can hear him. Yes? Hello, we're looking for Warden Jim McFarland. Hi, McFarland. I'm Martha Ellis Bryant, an attorney, and this is Judd Barnes. He's a friend. How do you do? Yeah, howdy. Uh, won't you come in? Thank you. I'm sorry I'm a little short of seating space here. You might try the bed. Might be comfortable to sit on. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, this is fine. Yeah. I suppose you're here about this Daniels case? Yes, I'm going to represent Mr. Daniels. I see. What do you want with me? Information, mostly. Well, as Daniels' attorney, you're entitled to know the facts. 
Yeah, but I'm not sure this is the time or the place for me to give them out. Of course, you're under no obligation to answer any questions concerning the case, but there are some things you could clarify and not betray any official secrets. Yeah, maybe. Like what? Like, was Otto Peisner alive when you found him? Yes. Conscious? No. Was he cut or stabbed? Both. Was he bleeding? Not much. Had he bled much? There's a lot of blood under him. It's a messy job, huh? Sort of. Do you know that Grady Daniels was an ex-Marine? No, but it figures. Well, how does it figure? Yeah, when you see enough death, uh, life gets cheap. Oh? Did Daniels have any blood on him when you arrested him? Ask me that at the trial. Yes, maybe I will. Now, look, look, Miss Bryant. I, I'm just a game warden, see? Up till now, the most serious offense I've ever come up against was some tourist lucky enough to catch too many fish. I was sent up here from my regular section to cover the opening of quail season in this county, and, well, I run head on into a murder. Now, I'll tell you what happened in my own words, but don't shoot questions at me. I, I get nervous. All right, we'll listen. Well, when I found Peisner, he was unconscious. Well, I poured some water from my canteen down his throat, and he opened his eyes after a second or two, and I asked him what had happened. Well, it took him a little while to answer, but when he did, I heard him very clearly. He said, it was the hunter with the beard. Well, that was all. I ran to my car to radio for help, and when I came back, he was dead. You didn't know who he was? No, no, I'm from the lower part of the state. Hmm. You were in charge of the roadblock that picked Daniels up, weren't you? That's right. Did you pick up anybody else? I mean, to question? Oh, yeah, yeah, several. But they were all clean-shaven. Three of them had talked to Daniels that day. Near Peisner's farm? No, on it. Peisner made them all three leave. Then he met Daniels. After that, I found him. Daniels claims he never saw Peisner. <laughs> I don't blame him. That's what I'd say. But his knife was beside Peisner. Daniels claims that he lost it. Well, he has to say something. How do you account for the fact that he was still wearing the scabbard? I don't account for anything. And I'm answering questions again, Miss Bryant. Now, I, uh, I'm sorry, but any further information from me will have to come at the trial. Well, thank you. Yeah. Peisner's farm is near that German settlement at Wesselhorst, isn't it? All right, I'll answer one more question, yes. And again, thank you. Yeah. Come on, Judd. Uh, uh, goodbye, Miss Bryant and Mr. Uh, Barnes. Huh? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, goodbye, Barnes. Uh-huh. Well... There wasn't anything world-shaking in that interview. I'm lucky to get any information out of him. Of course, he's not required to say anything to the defense counsel except from the witness stand at the trial. He didn't hurt the prosecution's case one bit. No, but I had a chance to size up the star witness before he gets on the stand. So right now, the state's entire case hinges on his testimony. So? What are you going to do now, counselor? Well, I was going to ask a newspaper man friend of mine to drive me out to Wesselhorst. I'd like to get some local slant on Paisney. Huh. You drive me to distraction, I guess I can drive you to Wesselhorst. Gee, 20 miles from town and it's just like being in Germany. Yeah. I've been out here before. Everybody in the whole town is German. Well, they have to be to pronounce that name. Wesselhorst. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a wrestling program. The gorgeous Fritz... Will Wessel Horst. Oh, Judd. Not on an empty stomach. Oh, are you hungry, too? I'm starved. Hey, over there's a cafe. Uh, Heidelberg Gardens. Good food. Shall we see if it is? Right now, if it's food, it's good. All right. Boy. Sauerkraut, pig's knuckles, maybe even beer. <laughs> there's a vacant table over there. Yeah, yeah. Hey, talk about atmosphere. Well, they've got it, haven't they? <laughs> sure have. Here comes a waiter. Look. Get that mustache. That's not a mustache. That's twin beards. Welcome to the Heidelberg Gardens. Well, thank you very much. You order, Judd. Uh, sure. Do you want... Uh... Ah, just one minute. The Heidelberg Gardens. We do not patron serve. Then it's on the tablecloth. There. Excuse it, please. We get clean one. Uh, when you come back, bring two orders of sauerbraten. Yeah, Bye. Well, what are you going to eat, Marty? Marty. Marty, what's the matter? Huh? Oh, nothing. I was, I, was, I was thinking. Oh, look, honey. Don't live your cases. Forget it for a while and enjoy yourself and me. <laughs> ah, this is better. Oh, yes, that's fine. Uh, danke schön, Freilein. The sauerbraten will be here soon. Was there something else? Yes, maybe... Did you happen to know Otto Peisner? He lived outside of town near here. Yeah. 
I knew Otto Peister. What about Otto Peister? Well, I'm Martha Ellis Bryant, an attorney. This is Mr. Barnes of the city dispatch. Attorney? Mm. You helping that man what stabbed Otto? Well, I'm going to defend him. Why? Then, Fräulein, it is better if you... Uh, uh, why? Well, who are you? Never mind who I am. I live here. We don't like people coming who snoop around trying to find ways to free someone who killed one of our farmers. We're not trying to free anybody who killed a man. We're just talking... You're that fellow Daniel's lawyer, ain't you? Yes, that's right, but we're not... Well, he killed out of... Look, fellow, that hasn't been proven yet. And in the meantime, we... proven enough for us. You're one of these people who figure because a guy is a veteran, he can't do no wrong. That's a ridiculous thing listen, to say. Listen, you. You Listen. That's a guy's figure that because the government taught them how to kill and give them permission to do it, they can keep right on after the war's over. Daniels is one of those men. Well, that's what we have courts for, to decide whether or not... Let the court decide, Dan, but you'd better get out of this town. Now. Before you get hurt. Look, Junior, where I come from... It's where you better go back to. Now, wait a minute. Judd, we'd better leave. Come on. I thought you were never going to say that. Let's go. Whew. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of feeling in Wesselhorst about this case. Yes, I wonder who's in back of it. What do you mean? Well, somebody has to start stirring up that much feeling, Judd. Yes, that veteran taught to kill can't stop idea. I know it is. It's pretty common, Marty. It's too common. And nothing could be more wrong. I'm a veteran, and I've never felt any desire to kill, even during the war. I sure hope we've got veterans on that jury. Marty, Daniels is an ex-Marine. Now, if he had stabbed Peisner... It would have been a neat job, and Peisner wouldn't have lived to talk to anyone. It's a good point, Judd. So, what do we do now? Well, will you take me to your office? I want all the newspaper reports on the case, and then we can take them to my office and go over them tonight. Sure, but look, honey, first let's go somewhere and get a steak. <laughs> I go for that. Oh, good. Uh, Marty. Yes, Judd? Just what is Sauerbraten? And that's all that I could find, Judge. Otto Peisner, age 43, bachelor. Came from Germany to the United States in 1938, settled in Wesselhorst. Bought a farm, well thought of by his neighbors. Although he didn't mingle much, he tended to his farm mostly in his business. His only known relative is a brother, Herman, who came from Germany with him. Herman Peisner now lives in Wesselhorst. Inherits the farm. Yeah. And there isn't a thing there that'll help Daniels. Yeah, but there's a flaw in this case. I can feel it. Did you ever meet anybody that you'd never, you know, you you couldn't quite get? Was well, somebody that you had seen before and you knew, and yet you couldn't remember their name? Yeah, sure. And you feel that you can almost say it, and yet it just won't come out, it just hangs there? Do you feel that way about this case, Marty? I do, I do. The answer's there. It struck me in that restaurant in Wesselhorst. I was real close to it, and then all that trouble started. Well, honey, I can't help you with that kind of a problem. Look... Would you like to be left alone for a while? Maybe you'll remember. That might help. You mind? Oh, of course not, honey. I'll be at the dispatch for a couple of hours if you need any help. Thank you, darling. Night, Marty. Good night, Judd. Herman Peisner. Brother. Of course, they'd be the same. Where is that? Here it is, sir. Survived by his brother, Herman Peisner... 401 Linden Avenue, Wesselhorst. Hello, operator. This is Martha Ellis Bryant. Will you call the parking lot? Ask them to have my car in front of my office in five minutes. Yeah, what do you want? Are you Herman Peisner? Yeah, I'm Herman Peisner. What do you want? My name is Martha Alice Bryant. Yeah, the farm is not for sale. I've got nothing for sale to the newspapers. Oh, no, Mr. Peisner, it's nothing like that. You see, uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, what? I'm a lawyer. I represent Grady Daniels. Ah, 
Oh, that <laughs> shrine. I got nothing for to say. Anyone helping him? Goodbye. No, please, Mr. Peisner, just a minute. Maybe he didn't kill your brother. And the police arrest him? If he'd not do it, why they arrest? He do it all right. And I be there if I hear him sent to prison and execute. Goodbye. Mr. Peisner, thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, uh, Red Star Delivery Service. Could I want to arrange for a pickup to be made at the Cinema Props Rental Service at 2847 Cimarron Street? That's right. Yes, it's to be delivered to Martha Ellis Bryant before 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Room 14, Hall of Justice. Yes, they'll have the order ready. How long have you worn a beard, Mr. Daniels? Since a Jap sniper put a bullet across my face in 1944. You admit that you were trespassing on the land of the deceased on the day he was stabbed to death? Yes, but Do I... you recognize this knife, Mr. Daniels? Yes, it was mine, How but How long I... have you owned this knife, Mr. Daniels? I took it from the body of the sniper that shot me in 1944. Then killing a man... Is not a new experience to you, is it? Well, I... That will be all, Mr. Daniels. Your witness, Miss Bryan. No questions. Marty, no questions? Mr. Wagner, you are a resident of the German settlement of Wesselhorst, is that right? That's right. Marty, that's the tough guy from the Heidelberg Gardens. Yes, I think you're right, John. You must have known that Mr. Peisner did not allow hunting, and yet you were afield on his land on the day he was stabbed. I know he didn't allow shooting, but I don't use a gun. I hunt with a falcon. That's a, a hawk trained to catch birds. I see. Now, Mr. Wagner, can you identify the man you met on Otto Peisner's farm that day? Yeah, I can. Is he in this courtroom? Yeah. It's right there, that man. Grady Daniels. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Wagner, that's all. Your witness, Miss Bryan. No questions. Marty, aren't you going to do anything? The DA's doing fine, Judge. I'll say he is. He's hanging your client. Just a moment, Mr. McFarland. I would like to make a short resume of your testimony up to date. After finding the wounded man and speaking with him, you radioed for assistance. When you returned to the scene of the crime, the victim was dead. Is that right? That's right. You searched the immediate area and found a murder weapon nearby, a Japanese Harry Carey knife. Later, at the roadblock where the defendant was apprehended, he admitted it was his knife, but claimed he had lost it that day, correct? Yes, sir. And he still wore the empty scabbard on his belt? Yes, sir, he did. Now, Mr. McFarlane, I am going to ask you to repeat once more the last words of the victim as he lay dying. In your arms. Well, he said it was the hunter with the beard. That's all. Thank you. Your witness, Miss Bryant. No questions. Marty, honey, at least go down swinging. But if it please the court, I should like to call a witness from the spectator's gallery. The deceased man's brother, Mr. Herman Peisner. <laughs> Mr. Peisner, you and your brother came to the United States together. In what year? In 1938. Could either of you speak any English before arriving here? None. We study here in night school. Did you study together? Uh, we studied together. We quit together. Would you say that your brother spoke English better than you? No, he did not. Would you say that you both spoke about the same? Your Honor, I object. The line of questioning is irrelevant and immaterial. The calling of this witness is a flagrant attempt on the part of the defense to confuse the jury. Your Honor, the calling of this witness in this line of questioning is vital to the correct issue of this trial. I repeat the question. Would you say that you and your brother spoke about the same? Uh That's right. All right, Mr. Pastor. Now, you see the defendant, Grady Daniels. Will you describe him for me? Do what? Will you tell me what he looks like to you? 
Yeah, well, it's about five feet eight inches tall. Weighs about 165 pounds. Uh, blue eyes. And he wears brown whiskers. He wears brown whiskers, is that right? Uh, yeah, brown whiskers. Thank you, Mr. Pisner. And now, when I remove the cover, can you tell me what is the object in this cage? Here we are. What is it? That is a beard. That is right. A hunting falcon. Thank you very much, Mr. Pisner. Now then, Mr. Wagner, will you stand, please? Mr. Wagner, you are experienced in falconry. Will you hold this bird? Thank you. And now, Mr. Pisner, which is Grady Daniels? The man with the whiskers. And which is Mr. Wagner? The man with the beard. The man with the beard. And the dying man's last words identified his killer as the hunter with the beard. Wagner! Wagner, he killed my brother! Ladies and gentlemen, the defense rests. Good morning, Martha. Good morning, Judson, darling. What's up? <laughs> Don't ask me. I just print the news. You make it. Oh, did I make news? Yeah. Wagner just confessed. He nearly had to confess. He convicted himself. Yeah. You know, that was quite a brilliant piece of legal maneuvering. <laughs> How did you get started on that bird and beard track, anyway? Well, it started because somebody was very careless in his eating habits. <laughs> what? I don't get it. Remember when I said that circumstance wasn't above dealing a card from the bottom? Yeah. That works both ways. Somebody spilled food on the tablecloth at the Heidelberg Gardens, and the waiter wouldn't serve food when there was dirt on the cloth. Only he said, dear mm -hmm. Took me a little while to figure out the connection between dirt and dirt and bird and beard. Ah. But when I did, I knew I was on the right track. Yeah, and the rest is history. And Wagner being at the Heidelberg Gardens was just a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Judge, you know something? What? I hope it was Wagner who spilled the food on that table. <laughs> Just heard Defense Attorney starring Mercedes McCambridge with Howard Culver as Judd. Tonight you heard Jan Arvan as Daniels, Bill Boucher as McFarland, Herb Butterfield as the District Attorney, and Lamont Johnson as Peisner. Music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. <laughs> Defense Attorney was written by Jack Spears. The program is directed by Dwight Hauser. Next week, another exciting adventure with Mercedes McCambridge, defense attorney. Be sure to listen. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. America is sold on ABC, the American broadcasting company. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Hello, sweetheart. It's only me. Oh, Sam. Why so modest? Women, Effie. Age cannot weather nor custom stale their infinite variety. Huh? Against their incalculable wiles, mere man is a leaf in the wind. Oh, Sam, do you really... Oh. Who was she and how windy was it? Cyclonic, Effie. We had to close every window in the house. But I... If you will just contain your natural feminine curiosity for a few moments, I'll be right down to dictate my report on the bow window caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. To every man who says, I don't use a hair tonic or I don't believe in a hair tonic, I say this. Decide for yourself. 
But don't decide until you've tried Wild Root Cream Oil, the entirely different hair tonic. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil, and it contains soothing lanolin. What's more, it grooms your hair the right way, neatly and naturally. So get the big economy-sized bottle and the handy new tube at your drug or toilet goods counter. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Dove starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Bow window. Hmm? A bow window. A uh, bow window is a bay window that you look into instead of out of. Look into instead of out. Oh. Oh, Sam. <laughs> Get your book, Panther Girl, and slink on in. Well, what was she trying to see through the, the, the bow window? Hmm? I mean, whose house was it? Her own. But if it was her own house, then why would she. Well, it just at... goes to show you, darling, what some women will stoop to. It does? Mm-hmm. There was a low window. Oh. Well, whenever you're ready, Sam. Uh, date, November 10th. Ninth. Ninth. Uh, correct. 1947. To Dr. Helmut Ries. I was right for once. Yeah. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the bow window caper. Dear Dr. Reese. I know that this report will not make pleasant reading for you, but you paid for it, so here it is. As far as I was concerned, it all started on Thursday morning when you called at my office. From your story, I gathered it had been going on for some time. You, you will say these are merely the actions of a jealous woman, Mr. Spade. But I assure you there's more to it than that. It is, it, it, it must be a carefully thought out plan to ruin my career, my... My whole life. In uh, what way, Dr. Reese? She spies on my private consultations. Insults my women patients. I can no longer even keep a nurse for more than a week at a time. Scenes, hysterics, she... Outbursts of violence. I cannot continue my work under such conditions. So why don't you give her a divorce? Why, no, no, no. This is not her desire. If it were, it would be, it would be simple. No, she wants to bring me to ruin. She wants to see me on my knees in front of the public. Why? That is what I want to find out. Why? Doctor, I think you ought to take this case to a head doctor. I have consulted a psychiatrist. The examiner. She's perfectly competent mentally. For you see, there is here already some mystery. For which one comes to a detective. Uh, how long has this been going on, Dr. Reese? Since three months only. But in this time, she has reduced me to utter desolation. Dr. Reese was a very good divorce lawyer right down the hall from my no, office. No, no, no. I discussed the matter of a divorce with her a few days back. This was her answer. Uh, you see, a receipt for the purchase of a gun and this note in her handwriting. I hope you will not force me to use this. Esther. Yes. Well, what do you think she has in mind? Murder or suicide? She refused to discuss it. But one thing I have noticed. Since she has bought this gun, a new development, a strange man watches my house. Several times I have caught him following me. Well, she might have hired a detective to check on whether you visit a lawyer. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps it is very simple, but it is all too strange to be harmless. I uh, half-heartedly agreed that it might be, Dr. Reese, and when your check for 100 bucks didn't bounce, I went to work wholeheartedly. I reached your house on Pacific Avenue just as the street lights were going on. It's a quiet neighborhood, so I could hear it before I got close enough to read the number on the door. Get out! Get out of this house! Get out! They seem to be slugging their way toward the back of the house, so I decided to risk an entrance. I found the doorbell, and I was about to punch it when I caught sight of your mystery man. He was crouched in a clump of shrubbery that grew under the bow window at the corner of the house. He was still there with his eyes glued to the window when I walked up behind him. Hey, let go of me. Let go. Come on, come on. You're going inside. Listen, I'm not just a snooper. I'm I only... didn't say you were. I'm just inviting you inside for a better look. Now, I'm warning you. If you don't let go of me, I'm... Stop squirming, will you? Oh! Yeah. 
The kick he landed on me wasn't according to the wrestling association's rules, but I let him get away with it, mainly because I couldn't move for three or four minutes, and by that time, he disappeared down the street. When I recovered my faculties and staggered back to the door, I didn't bother ringing the bell. I just walked in. The hen fight was still going on somewhere in the upper reaches of the house. Then a door burst open on the upper landing, and a girl in a nurse's uniform ran down the stairs toward me, pursued by a pale little woman with a pinched face who was brandishing a pair of brass fire tongs. You brushed past me, Dr. Reese, and headed off the pursuer. Esther, stop it! Stop it at once! Have you gone crazy? Give me those fire tongs! Give them to me! What's the matter, Helmut? Afraid I'll mar your light of love's beauty. What started it? I caught her creeping about the kitchen. kitchen. She was going to poison my food. Explain to you, Mrs. Reese. The doctor said... Oh, don't, don't, don't bother explaining, Miss Roberts. These morbid fancies of hers. Don't think I don't know what goes on in that office. That office where I'm not allowed anymore. That's only because you make the patient so nervous, Esther. I know what goes on. You and those women. That will do, Esther. Go to your room. Very well. But I won't have that woman in this house another day, Helmuth. Is that understood? Oh, go to your room, Esther. I'm going, I'm going. But remember what I said. I warned you both. I can't. There, there, Miss Swabbins. Now don't. There. I can't stand any more, Doctor. I tell you, it's making me a nervous <clears throat> wreck. I just... Uh, Dr. Reese, huh? Oh, Mr. Spade. You saw, you heard? Yeah. Uh, uh, come into my office. We'll talk. I think we'd better. Uh, doctor... There's still one more patient waiting to see you, Doctor. Well, uh, uh, have her wait a little longer. Uh, uh, this, this way, Mr. Spade. Nurse, come up much longer? Carla, the doctor way. will see you just as soon as he possibly can. Have you been feeling any better, Mrs. Uh, sit down, Mr. Spade. Thanks, but I can say what I have to say standing. Your wife's a very tragic woman, Doctor. Uh, I wish I could help her. I wish I could help you, too, but I can't. You heard her threat against Miss Robbins. Was that a joke? There's nothing funny about jealousy. Uh, but there is this man who watches the house. And the gun she bought. I collared him outside just now. Oh, well, did you get him to talk? No, but I wouldn't worry about him if I were you. And about that gun. The Constitution says every citizen shall have the right to bear arms. Even Parnell Thomas can't do uh, Mr. Spade. I've not yet told you all. If I... Oh, Doctor, I'm, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt, but this patient, she's been waiting for more than an hour. Well, who, who is she? Mrs. Cavanaugh. Cavanaugh? Cavanaugh, who? Well, has she been here before? Of course, last week. Here, here's her card. Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd better get it over. Uh, send her in. Yes, Doctor, and... And, Doctor, I'm resigning. I'll finish the day, of course, and, and then I'm through on... I'm sorry. Yes, yes, well. Very well, Miss Robbins. I, I, I can't say that I blame you. Good luck. Goodbye, Doctor. Well, I'll be going along myself now, Doctor. Uh, no, 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 no. You must hear me out, Mrs. Spade. I have not yet told all. If now, if you just wait until I have seen this patient, uh, please, Mr. Spade, please. Okay, I'll wait outside. Oh, I beg your pardon. I beg yes. your pardon. Uh, come on in, Mrs. So, uh, you're leaving the doctor's employ, uh, nurse? I am, I am. Well, Mr. Spade, how does it look from the grandstand? Messy? Mm-hmm. You don't mind if I finish cleaning out his desk? Go right ahead. Thank you. What's the matter with Esther, anyway? Oh, I could sum the whole thing up in a single five-letter word, shall I? You have. Are you going to walk out on him? Aren't you? Yes. Yes, I am. Oh, but Esther isn't jealous of your type. If you don't mind my mentioning it. I feel heartened to think that you noticed I was different. Oh, I did, Mr. Spade. I really did. You don't seem uh, particularly nursey to me, either. I'm not. My, you have a fast pulse, Mr. Spade. Uh, yes, I've uh, been feeling very weak the last few minutes. I uh, need care. Oh, you know, you don't eat enough apples, Mr. Spade. Well, I guess I've finished. Oh, there's that old contact. I wonder. Mr. Spade, will you tell the doctor I've left and thank him for me again? Aren't you going to see him before you go? No, no, I'm not. He'd only beg me to stay, and it's... Well, it's simply out of the question. Oh, the poor guy. I just don't know what I'd do if I were in his place. For you, Mr. Spade. <laughs> Oh, 
I did, and I told her. She told me I was a victim of hypertension and left me with my mouth open and no thermometer in it. Five minutes after she'd gone out to the front entrance, your wife came down the stairs looking knowingly at me and the door to the doctor's office and left by the same route. Ten minutes after that, I was halfway through a 1937 National Geographic that was the latest edition on the waiting room table, and it reached the third paragraph on the natural beauties of Winona County, Minnesota. But I never finished it. I will be back in a minute. What? The first thing I saw when I entered the room was Mrs. Cavanaugh, your patient patient. What? Why did she do it? You, doctor, were standing over her, nervously twitching off the rubber glove from your right hand. You tested her throat for pulse, then listened through a stethoscope. It was purely a formality. One of the 38 caliber slugs had entered the right temple. The other had torn through the base of the skull. How did it happen? I, I don't know. I had completed the examination and walked over there to put my instruments away. When I turned, when I turned back, she had a gun in her hand. Before I could stop her, she pulled the trigger. Suicide, of course. Why? Well, I just told her the truth, that there was nothing I or any other doctor could do for her. That she had perhaps a month, perhaps less. She had suffered great pain, of course, for some time. Uh-huh. You saw her shoot herself, you say? Yes, yes. The gun, she took it out of my desk drawer. I'd removed it from my wife's room earlier today. I see. Well, doctor, this is the neatest suicide I ever saw. No powder burns, and from the way she's lying, she must have shot herself in the direction of that window, at least ten feet away. She screamed before the shots were fired and had time to fire a second bullet into her head and throw the gun across the room before she fell. Well, Helma, at last it's happened, hasn't it? Esther, leave this room. I told Helmuth one of the husbands would catch up with him. Pretty, wasn't she? I don't remember this one. The expression on your face might have been horror or fear or both, Dr. Reese. But your wife was smiling. When my eyes left her face, I noticed a leaf clinging to the hem of her coat. It might have come from the shrub that grew up against the house. And her shoes were splotched with mud that could have and probably did come from the cultivated flower bed just outside the bow window. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. Better than four out of five users of Wild Root Cream Oil say they prefer Wild Root Cream Oil to all other hair tonics. Here is new and even more conclusive evidence that Wild Root Cream Oil is again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. So if you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked... How does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. It gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. That's like the oil of your skin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, back to the bow window caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Obviously, there were two equally good suspects in the Kavanaugh murder... Either your wife had killed her in a jealous rage, or you'd killed her with your wife's gun to frame her for the murder. I decided to let the police worry it out and went home to bed. The morning headlines were a bit of a surprise. Nurse sought in shooting a mystery woman. Item. The cops had found Celeste Robbins' fingerprints all over the murder gun. And item. Mrs. Cavanaugh, the murdered woman, had given a vacant lot as her address, and her body was lying unclaimed at the morgue. 
I decided to pay her a visit. Maxie, hey, Maxie. Oh, Sam. Sammy, my boy. Hey, it's good to look on you. How are you, Maxwell? Oh, fine, fine. What brings you here, Sam? The Kavanaugh woman. The Kavanaugh? Oh, Kavanaugh, huh? Well, uh, let's see who's with us today. Uh, Stiftle, Milton, Schwartz, Kelly. I knew him. Nice guy. Feige. Aha. Uh-huh. Kavanaugh. Rose. Hello, Rose. Hey, Sam, don't you want to look at Rose? No, I've seen her. Ah. Oh. Yeah, just checked her back in. Autopsy. Say, you do collect queer ones, Sam. Mm. Now, you take her. Why would anybody in the world knock her off? In her condition, all he needed to do was wait. A month, a couple of weeks. Bad as that, huh? Worse. Anybody claim her yet? Well, they... Hello. Something we can do for you? My name is Kavanaugh. I've come for my wife. He was standing with his back to me, and I didn't get a good look at his face until he walked over to the desk with Master. The voice tipped me even before I saw the face. It was the man I'd caught outside your office window less than half an hour before the murder. If he recognized me, he didn't let it show. I waited while he went in with Maxie. When he came out, there were tears streaming down his face. I'd been waiting for two reasons. I had had some questions to ask him, and I had wanted to pay back that jolt he'd given me the night before. I left without doing either. Oh, hello, Sam. Oh, sweetheart, any calls? Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide, yeah. uh, Dr. Reese, mm-hmm. and there's a girl waiting inside. Wouldn't give any name. So you let her wait in my private office. Well, I don't think you'll mind when you've seen her. She's by way of being a knockout. Well, uh... Thank you, Effie. That was uh, very thoughtful of you, Dad. You're welcome, Sam. Sam, please, please don't be angry with me for coming here. I, I had to talk to somebody. What you need is a good criminal lawyer, Nurse Rod. Oh, no. Oh, no. Do you think I killed that woman? How did your prince get on that gun? And don't tell me she threatened you with it and you grabbed it out of her hand. No, no, I didn't. I did nothing oh, at all. Take it easy, Nurse. Take it easy. Would you like a drink or something? No, no. Thank you anyway. I'll, I'll be all right. Well... She came in from shopping three days ago, just as nice as pie. And she came creeping around. You know how she is. And she said, I bought something today. It's lovely. And with that, she hauled this gun out of her handbag. And so, to humor her, I took it and I looked at it. That was foolish. It certainly was foolish. When Nickel played it, I deal service for fingerprints. And I remember she was wearing gloves. Struck me as peculiar at the time, but I'm, I'm so stupid. I didn't think of it until just now. Everything's a little peculiar about this caper. A woman who was dying anyway gets shot. Nobody even seems to know who she was. Doesn't make sense. No. No, it doesn't make much sense. What should I do, Sam? Give myself up? I think you should. Yes, I thought you'd say that. All right, phone the police. You got a lot of courage. Sure you don't want to drink? No. No, thank you. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Homicide. Dundee. Uh, Dundee. Sam Spade. I got the Robbins girl here in my office. She wants to check in. Oh? Uh, well, tell her to forget it, Sam. Reese's wife just made a full confession. That tore it. In my anxiety to see how you were bearing up under the shock, Doctor, I blew a buck and a half of your money on a taxi all the way out to your address on Pacific Avenue. To my astonishment, you were wearing a look of real distress. I... I don't understand it, Mr. Spade. This confessing, it's its not like her. It's all too strange to be harmless. Dr. Reeves, I'd like to talk to you alone. Do you mind, Mr. Spade? Go right ahead. I strained my ears outside your consulting room, but all I could hear was a few vague murmurs. Then, for no good reason, I decided to have a look at your wife's bedroom upstairs. The cops had been there before me, so I didn't expect to find much, and I didn't. I was tapping the woodwork for secret panels or something when I heard a heavy tread on the, on the stairway. I wheeled around, my hands inside my coat. A jolly-looking character in coveralls was standing in the doorway. Home electronics. I beg your pardon? Go hang it. Home electronics. <laughs> I come to take the equipment. What equipment? I had a dictograph. She don't need it no more. <laughs> Ask me, she hurt too much. Mrs. Reese had a dictograph installed? Yeah, her metal-type installation. 
Yeah, this here's a speaker. <laughs> yeah, my own design. Looks like a portable radio, don't it? Yeah, where's the other end? Where's the uh, microphone? It's in the doc's private office. Uh, you interested, eh? Yeah, turn it on, will you? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, we'll get it tuned in a minute there. Uh... Oh, feedback. Wait a minute, I'll fix it. Never talk, never talk. What can she tell? I don't know. But it's uncanny the way she knew Nice, huh? Together. <laughs> That's because of the dictograph. They rig, yes, huh? Shut up. This is my we cannot allow this terrible tragedy to come between us. We love each other. Nothing can change that. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, that says nice, no, ain't it? Quiet, quiet. I just know, please, please, don't. Now, now stop it, Helmut. I don't want you to. Please, don't. What is it, Celeste? What has happened to Jake? What has happened? When I'm being attacked by a mad woman and accused of murder, all in the space of 12 hours... But it's all over now. Just so, Helen. Yes, all over. Well, don't you turn it up a little more? Oh, sure, sure, turn it up. Hold it, hold it. It's over, it's over. And I'm very, very ashamed. I suppose it was my usual thing. I always get sorry for a poor, weak man and, and get involved. But this time, I'm sorry for her. So, yes, please. When I was a kid, I liked it. It used to make me feel powerful and, well, to watch them squirm. But it's no fun anymore watching another woman in the agonies of jealousy. And you, I thought you were just weak. You're a brutal, unscrupulous murderer. What, what are you saying, sir? You killed Mrs. Cavanaugh. Why, that's, that's impossible. You stood deliberately in that window and you fired two shots right at Hey, what gives you? Why weren't my fingerprints on that gun? Because you were wearing your rubber gloves. Doctor. Celeste, don't say anymore. No, no. Here, help me. Help me get his shirt off, Mr. Spain. You've been shot. Who shot him, you? <laughs> Through the window, the same man, the one who watched the house. Oh, hold this tourniquet tight, please. Uh, it's nothing. A flesh wound. His aim was bad. Yeah. Too bad. Cavanaugh, you still out there? You got nothing to worry about. He's still alive. I missed him. Give me a hand. Come on. That's it. I missed him. Well, that was lucky. You're taking the rap of your wife's murder, too, if you're a better shot. He did it. He killed my wife. I was at the window. I saw him. What I don't understand is why his wife confessed. She loves him, Mr. Cavanaugh. You should understand that. that. I guess that's what happens to love when it gets crossed up. Why didn't you tell the police what you saw? I, they'd have hung it on me. She... She was a stranger to everyone else. I'd been quarreling with her, suspicious, acting like a maniac. She never told me. She must have been going to one doctor after another, trying to find one that would give her one ray of hope. In pain all the time, too, and never letting on. Never. Even after that first visit she made to Reese's office, I didn't tumble. I, I thought she was meeting him on the sly. And I followed her both times. That last time I carried a gun. I might have killed her if what I suspected had been true. Uh, I'm very sorry, Mr. Cavanaugh. I, I didn't realize... You're pretty late with your regrets, Doctor. I don't quite figure you either. Maybe the prison psychiatrist can. Dundee homicide. Uh, Dundee, tear up Mrs. Reese's confession. Come on over and get the doctor. Dr. Reese? Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, he accidentally shot himself in the arm. Isn't that right, Doctor? What? So... Yes, yes. Accident. Why didn't she tell me? Why didn't she tell me? I don't know, Kavanaugh. Women. Sometimes they make too much sense, or we don't make enough, or maybe we're all crazy. <laughs> that, Dr. Reese, is the crop. The risk of laboring a point, there's also the mystery of why a nice girl like Celeste Robbins ever fell for a guy like you. You'll have plenty of free time to think it over between now and the trial. If you find the answer, drop me a line. Period. And a report. You know, Sam, that, that Celeste, I like her. I wish we could do something for her. Well, I've already thought of that, Abby. Oh? What are you going to do, Sam? Type that up, sweetheart, and I'll write you a happy ending. Here's how you can find out whether the hair tonic you're using today is giving you what you ought to get in good grooming. Ask yourself, does my present hair tonic groom my hair neatly and naturally, or does it leave my hair sticky or greasy? And does it relieve dryness and remove loose dandruff, too, or does it do just a halfway job? Unless you can honestly say that your present hair tonic does all that for your hair, 
you owe it to yourself to try Wild Root Cream Oil right away. Try Wild Root Cream Oil and see for yourself how it improves your appearance. Grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. It's non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin. Get the big economy size bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel and grand for the bathroom cabinet. Don't delay. Get it today. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Oh, here's the report, Sam. You want to read it over? I do not. File it under F for forget. About that poor Celeste, Sam. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I made a date with Celeste to take her dancing tomorrow night. She uh, needs cheering up, you know. Oh, what for? Well, you said she needed help. Well, that isn't exactly the kind of help I had in mind. Oh. I don't see why it's necessary Effie, to take... Effie, we must each of us give a particular kind of help each of us is particularly equipped to give. Very well. She wished to... She used to make over men just to get the other women jealous. That she did. Aren't other women silly to allow themselves to get jealous when they know just what she's up to? They're idiotic. Just idiotic. Sure thing. And go home, Effie. I'm a lousy dancer. Oh, very well. Have fun, Sam. <laughs> Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. This is Dick Joy, reminding you that next Sunday, author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanents. Mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The Seven Dead Years, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If you're crowded against a wall and you can't punch your way out alone, call on me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, for almost seven years I've been hunting a man who killed his own wife. I can't prove that he did. And all of a sudden I can't afford to spend any more time floundering around. Next week he's going to get $200,000 because I failed. And that's something that's keeping me awake nights. I've dealt with plenty of crooks in my life. Plenty of crooks in my life and didn't need anybody's help. But this is different and I don't mind admitting it. How about giving me a ring? It's signed Samuels. Samuels? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm overwhelmed, Brooksy. Why? Who's Samuels? Oh, just about the shrewdest insurance investigator in the game. But I thought he was retired off somewhere in the Florida Keys, fishing. Well, according to this letter, all he's doing is staying awake nights. Oh, seven years, huh? Mm-hmm. Now, all of a sudden, time's running out for Samuels. Why did he put it just that way, Angel? Say, what do the words seven years mean to you? Oh, seven year itch, seven lean years, the seven years it might take a salmon to make seven honeymoon trips <laughs> up the Columbia River. All right, without making funny, Brooksy. Seven years also means the legal period after which a man or woman is declared dead. It's poetically called the Enoch Arden Law. Oh, well then this this Samuels is in a race against time. Uh Uh-huh. And if he is in such a hurry, it'd be a shame if we wasted time on this end, wouldn't it? This man, McLean, killed his wife and got rid of the body. I know it. 
Well, according to all this, Marion McLean just wrote a suicide note and disappeared. And if the husband is walking around enjoying good fresh air, the police must have given him a clean bill of health. That's okay for the police, but not for me. Well, what makes you so hard to satisfy? This McLean dame gets in short for $200,000 and conveniently vanishes from the face of the earth. Besides, whenever I meet up with a crook, my belly turns over twice. And this guy, McLean, has been giving me a nervous stomach for seven years. Seven long years. Well, as I get it, Mr. Samuels, you're retired. If the insurance company is willing to pay the $200,000, I don't see It's a I... matter of pride, Miss Brooks. When I first turned into the report on the McLeans, I said it was a phony. It's the only case in my career I feel wasn't washed up right. I think I know what's bothering you, Samuels. Do you? Yeah, the body. It was never found. Yeah. The hardest thing in the world to do is to get rid of a body. And don't look so amazed, Miss Brooks. That's the truth. Oh, I wouldn't know. Well, you can't burn it. Something's always left over. Buttons, bridge work, teeth, and you can't drown it. It comes up to the surface sometime or another, and you bury it, somebody finds it when they're digging post holes. <laughs> well, Samuels, if you've been searching for the corpus delicti for seven years, I don't know what I can do. Take a look at this ad in the paper. Wanted by sculptor. Male professional model. Must be exceptionally muscular and broad-shouldered. To pose for heroic figure in important civic memorial, Frank McLean. Oh, is this the same McLean we've been talking about, Mr. Samuel? Yeah, he has a house and studio a few miles out of town in Roxbury. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. I go out there... I'll and... pay you for it out of my own pocket. It's worth it to me. And while I'm not posing, I'm supposed to go up in the attic or dig out in the garden to find a corpse. Well, it's not going to be anything as obvious as that. I've been at it seven years trying to find out what he did with his wife. He knows my face as well as his own. I can't work on this deal anymore. That's why I want you. Well, George, you do have the shoulders for it. Uh, okay, Samuels. I don't know how I'll look as Atlas holding up the world or a Spartan youth, but I'll give it a try. I take it, Mr. Valentine, you pose for other well-known sculptors? Oh, yes, of course. But back east, New York. I just got in town and saw your ad. I see. Oh, darling. Uh, yes, Nana. Is that man still there? Are we going to work anymore today? My very favorite model, Valentine. Oh? No, Nana, we won't work anymore today. Here, Valentine, you might be interested in seeing some of my work. Sure, fine. Now... Here's something in bronze I did in 1936. I call it age. Well, all I see is a little girl asleep. She's a dead little girl, which makes her older than any of us. Oh. Well, that's one way of looking at it. You'll have plenty of time to see my other stuff, but here, here's what I'm working on. Well, looks like quite a project, Mr. McLean. It's going into the town square at Porchester. To memorialize the hundredth birthday of that little hamlet. Aside from artistic merits, it has to be able to withstand the passage of time and the critical comments of migratory birds. Is this where I fit in? Yes. You'll be the figure of man in capital letters. You're reaching upward for ultimate perfection. As you see, the figures of health, love, and spiritual attainment are already finished. The statue in the middle will be eternal life, which Nana is going to pose for. Well, when do I start working? Take off your coat and your shirt. What? Oh, yeah, sure. I have a very definite conception of this man's physique. After all, to the good people of Porchester, he's supposed to symbolize all mankind. <laughs> well, that's quite a responsibility. Uh, how do I shape up? Mm. Um, turn around. Well, well, what have we got here? All of mankind, lady. Yes, and with hair on your chest. This... Is Nana. As I said, Valentine, she's going to portray eternal life. In the meantime, she abuses the privilege of being the eternal feminine. Mm, you love to make with words, darling, but you ought to know by now that you can't insult me. Certainly not till after we're married. That will be all for today, Miss Kenyon. Same time tomorrow. My, aren't we businesslike? Well, <laughs> beware of him, Mr. Valentine. He's a creature of moods. Goodbye, darling. So long, Mr. Man. Um, your fiancé is a very charming girl, Mr. McLean. Her charm is only an added attraction, and she knows it. Now you and I better get started, Valentine. Uh, stretch your arm up toward the skylight over there. Like this? Yes, and hold the pose. Say, 
How long do I have to stand like this? You're not getting tired. I haven't even finished making my rough sketch. Don't we get time out for a cigarette, McLean? What kind of people have you been posing for, anyway? We've just been working a short while. Oh, sorry, but I can't hold up my arm like this anymore. Oh, it was beginning to weigh a ton. Whom do you think you're fooling? Huh? How stupid do you think I am? Well, that's a question that invites all kinds of answers. I had to find out. You're not a professional model. If you were, you could have held your arm like that much longer without getting tired. I, I guess I wasn't very good. Samuel sent you here, didn't he? Well, you can tell that human bloodhound he's still wasting his time. Okay, I'll deliver the message, friend. But I doubt if he's going to be convinced. Would you mind turning around while I put on my shirt? You know, darling, McLean could be right about Samuels having a blind spot, an obsession. Yeah, but before I tell him what a flop I was as a model, I'd like to try something. Such as? Well, first of all, let's take it for granted that Samuels is right. It's next to impossible to get rid of a human body. Well, then, maybe there never was a body. Oh, well, in other words, Mrs. McLean is very much alive somewhere. Yeah, it could be, Angel. Waiting for seven years to pass. So McLean can collect that dough and join us somewhere in Europe, let's say. Oh, well, that's a pretty wild notion, George. Two people separating for seven years like that? Yeah, but a very profitable separation. They'll be getting roughly $30,000 a year for it. Okay. Say we even buy that. What do you propose to try? I'll take this hypothetical situation. You're my wife. Oh, must it be hypothetical? You love me very much. Oh, Jack. Love me enough to endure seven years of hiding and separation so we'll have enough to live on for the rest of our lives. All right, supposing. Then you read in public print that I have intentions toward a gorgeous model by the name of Nana Kenyon. Now, what would you do? I'd come halfway around the world and scratch your eyes out. And that wouldn't be hypothetical. <laughs> Especially with a payoff at hand, so McLean could disappear with all the moolah and the luscious nana. Well, how are you going to get this world-shaking piece of gossip into the paper? Leo Mensch in the bulletin. His column is syndicated in 650 newspapers. Nana is pretty colorful. <laughs> Some pun. Besides, Brooksy, Leo owes me a favor. <laughs> I'm a patient man, Valentine. I've waited for seven years. I can stand it a few more days. Good. But how do you know this item in Mensch's column is going to pay off? I don't know. But well, Mrs. McLean is alive and has the usual feminine instincts, it'll work. Valentine, I'm not too sold on this theory of yours. I still say McLean got rid of the body. But how, where, that's what I've got to find out. You'll be coming into that money next Tuesday. Yeah. Let me have that picture and description of Mrs. McLean. I want to get it around where it'll do the most good. Now, let's see... Five foot four, 125 pounds, brown hair, scar on left cheek. Middle finger of left hand severed at first joint. Fair complexion, brown eyes. Hey, Mr. Valentine, i got to see you over there. Huh? I think you owe me 50 bucks. Oh, George, this is one of the cab drivers I spoke to at the airport. Mike, uh... Kozlenko, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, one of the Boston Kozlenko. Did you see Mrs. McLean? Well, if it wasn't, she's got a twin. Scar on her cheek and all. Oh, when'd she show up? Where'd you take her? Well, she got off the plane early this morning. Come in on one of them DC-6s. Well, you sure took your time getting here. I had to haul a guy all the way out to the racetrack and wait for him. I tried calling you, but your line was busy. Okay, okay. Where'd you drop her off? What was the address? Well, she didn't give me no address. I took her out to Roxbury. That's where McLean lives. I let her off on the corner of Sycamore and Dean. She looked boiling mad. Come on, Brooksy. we got to move fast if we're going to keep Samuels from being right. What do you mean, George? Well, if this is Mrs. McLean, she's an uninvited guest. After all these years, I'd hate to have to go looking for her body. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about protection. Most motorists quite naturally believe that automobile engines wear out faster when they're running, but that's not true. Your car faces its biggest wear test when it's standing cold, for that's when rust caused by condensed moisture inside cylinders can start to work. And that's where RPM motor oil helps you avoid a repair bill. RPM special compounds keep a protective oil film on all engine parts all of the time. 
Whether your car is running hot or standing cold, RPM clings stubbornly to vital wear points. And consequently, rust never has a chance to get started in your car. No wonder it's the two-to-one choice of Western motorists. Next time you need oil, ask for rust-fighting RPM motor oil at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. It's something you knew all the time. After seven years without the well-known corpus delicti, a person is declared legally dead. So you're not particularly surprised when an over-conscientious insurance investigator, now retired, hires you to find the body of one Marion McLean, missing just about that long. Then, surprise, she comes waltzing back into town, big as life. If you're like George Valentine, sensitive to rude shocks like this, you pay a visit to the studio of Frank McLean, sculptor and husband of said lady. I know I'm going way out on the limb, McLean. But I was told your wife is here in Roxbury. Oh? Who told you, Valentine? Another ghost? My wife is dead. Or hasn't Samuels told you? Dead or alive, this was a frame-up from the beginning, McLean. I'm still going to prove it. Uh, The ghost you mentioned happens to be a very earthy character. A cab driver with a nice earthy name like Kozlenko. Yeah, one of the Boston Kozlenkos. He claims he picked up your wife at the airport early this morning and dropped her off here on the corner of Sycamore and Dean. Your Kozlenko boy is wasting his time driving a cab. He should be holding seances. Come Tuesday, my wife will be dead. Exactly seven years. You keep track of time very carefully, don't you? What do you do? Check off the days on the calendar? Oh, I may have an artistic temperament, but I'm practical enough to know what you can buy with $200,000. Any other question, gentlemen? The same one I've been asking all these years, McLean. Now, let's say Valentine is right. Your wife showed this morning. What'd you do with her? Cool, Samuels. How does your mind work? Now you're saying I killed Marion today. How about your theory that the hardest thing in the world to dispose of is a human body? I still say that. Well, unlike you, Samuels, I'm a reasonable man. My life is an open book. Go on. Look around any way you like. I do want you to be happy. Okay, okay. You can stop being glib, McLean. You said we have your permission to look wherever we want. That's right. What's on your mind, Valentine? Well, something that comes to you when you think about it hard enough. Like all simple things, you might walk right by it. It's so obvious. But don't look so startled, gentlemen. Mr. Valentine loves to be cryptic. You'll get to the point. Oh, I can't wait. Children know the principle very well. When you play hide-and-seek, the one place you're least likely to be discovered is where you just got through trying to hide. Uh, Well, what do you mean by that, Valentine? Samuels... I understand you had the cellar dug up when Mrs. McLean first disappeared. Yeah, and there was nothing there. Well, there may be this time. You know, kid stuff. Sorry you didn't find anything in the cellar, Valentine. You had such a fascinating theory. Yeah. Well, there's still a lot of places around here to look, McLean. Oh, to be sure. But do let me be the gracious host and mix you all a drink. Well, a party. (laughs) I'm glad you dropped in, Nana. We're playing a game. Body, body. Who's got the body? Well, aren't we a little old for parlor games? (laughs) Samuels here doesn't think so. Yeah, I'm a child at heart. You know, Mr. Valentine, I almost didn't recognize you with your shirt on. Yes, that mole on his left shoulder does something for him, doesn't it? I see you noticed that too, Miss Brooks. Oh, we've gone to the beach together many times. Here you are, everybody. Drink hearty. Thank you. Uh, Here's to you, Samuels, and uh, and a happy retirement. Thanks. I see you've done a lot of work on your masterpiece for the Porchester Town Square. It's almost finished, Valentine. We're just missing the figure of the man. I understand the figure in the middle. Eternal life is supposed to be you, Miss Kenyon. My solitary contribution to American culture. Oh, come on, Valentine. Let's get going. If I were you, Miss Kenyon, I'd sue somebody for libel. That figure is nowhere near as glamorous as you really are. Thank you for the compliment. I'm sure you didn't mean every word of it. Goodness, Frank, you certainly poured this drink with a heavy hand. I could use a little more soda. Uh, So could I. Wait, Nan, I'll join you. I didn't think these were too bad, did you, Miss Brooks? Oh, no, everything's just perfect. 
Now, if we could only get Samuel to think that. <laughs> no, that would be too much to ask. Uh-uh, not for me, Anna. All right, soulmate. If it isn't soda you want, what is it? You've been around, Anna. Yes, I've been around. I didn't think my travel scars were so prominent. Well, let's be corny and say it's something stronger than both of us. Something we can't resist. The eternal feminine and the equally eternal masculine. You handle words real nice, partner. Oh, I'm real smart. I bet I could even remember an address if I had to. 420 Mantras. If you ring the bell and there's no answer, yeah? there just might be a key under the flower pot on the back porch. <laughs> Oh, maybe this was a wild goose chase, but it's not now. Uh, uh, well, what are you doing here, Miss Brooks? Oh, well, Mr. Valentine couldn't make it, Nana. He asked me to convey his deepest regrets. And there was that key under the flower pot. Why, that's... Oh, what you were going to say. What have you got? Give me those tickets. I was just admiring them. I've always dreamt of a holiday in South America. I said, give them to me. Tickets for flight 114 next Wednesday. The day after Frank McLean collects the insurance on his wife. The tickets bought right here at the airport in Roxbury. I'm not going to ask you again. Let me have those tickets. It may not mean anything at all. But it's worth checking. Just who bought these tickets and why? Sorry, but you're not leaving here. (gasps) No fair, Nana. You didn't say put them up. I'm not finished with you yet. That's better. I like to be warned. Now I can forget I'm a lady. Will you... You remember selling these tickets, don't you, mister? Seats four and five, flight 114, Wednesday? Oh, yes, I remember it very well. Oh, good. Would you be able to identify the man if you saw him again? Ma'am? But it wasn't a man, it was a woman. Oh? That's why I do remember it so distinctly. Oh, you mean she had all the reasons why men would look at her twice? I didn't think of it quite that way, miss. I meant the little scar on her cheek. Scar? Wait a minute. Is this the woman you sold the tickets to? The one in this picture? Why, yes, that's her. Mrs. McLean bought those tickets. If Mrs. McLean bought those airplane tickets, Brooksy, that means for sure she's back here in Roxbury. And not just on the testimony of one of the Boston Kozlenkos. Well, what do you make of it, Samuels? If McLean and Nana got those tickets from her, you can bet your life you didn't just hand them over on a silver platter. No, not till her husband and his lady fair could go flying down to Rio. Hey, look, Brooksy. Yes, George. I think Nana must be a chasing spirit by now. Drop by her place again and let her out of that closet. Oh, must I? <laughs> yes, you must. And bring her out to McLean's. For one thing, she's got to answer some questions about those tickets. Now, there's a cool cookie for you, that McLean. Imagine him using the same tickets his wife bought. He probably figured that was one way no one would know his plans. Where he was going after he collected on the insurance. Well, I'd better be going. See you later, Brooksy. Now, you know something, Samuel? Now, what's that? If McLean wanted to get rid of his wife, he wouldn't necessarily plant her right there on the home ground. He wouldn't risk taking her anywhere else. Like I always say, the hardest thing in the world to get rid of. Yeah, I know, I know. But we were all over the place. I wouldn't know where else to go looking tonight. Wait. There's one place we didn't look. Uh, On the back part of that property is an old well. All overgrown with shrubbery and stuff. That's why we passed it by. Go on. I looked there seven years ago, and if your idea about hiding things where people looked before is... Okay. What's keeping us? Sure you got enough rope up there, Samuel? Plenty. This well looks deeper than we thought. Be careful. Can you use your flash? Better wait till I get farther down. Yeah, that might... Uh, Samuel! The rope! Samuel! George! George! We'll have him up here in a minute, Miss Brooks. Uh. Lucky he didn't bring the whole rope down with him when he fell. Well, you know if there's any water down there? No, I don't. Well, let me give you a hand. Now, wait till I get a hold of that Ginzo who sneaked up oh. behind him and slugged me. Oh, McLean? Who else? 
Wait. There. He's near the top, I think. Oh, oh, George. Oh, here, honey, I'll help you. Come on now, fella. Up and over. Oh, you okay, darling? Oh, with reservations. I feel as though I've been dragged not too gently through a meat grinder. Yeah, somebody walked up behind me in the dark and let me have it. Yeah, I found Samuel's lying here when I went out to look for you two. Uh-huh. Now, let's get inside and see McLean, eh, Valentine? Maybe it's time to do something about that well-groomed pan of his, like you said. You took the words right out of my mouth, friend. I've just come to a very interesting conclusion. I was wondering about that thousand-watt look in your eye. Yeah, Brooksy. To do some real profound thinking, there's nothing better than lying around on the bottom of a well. It's real nice and cozy, folks, to have everybody around like this. We might even toast marshmallows if I didn't have something more important on my mind. Mm-hmm. As a rule, I, I don't believe in petty tantrums on the part of grown men. But I owe somebody a fractured jaw. Now, look here, Valentine. What Samuel said about me sneaking up behind That's him. That's you, McLean. Step aside till the teacher gives you permission. What brought this on, George? I do believe he's going to hit somebody. Yeah. You, Samuels. Huh? Hey, what's the matter with you, Valentine? You gone nuts? Yes, you, Samuel. Oh, George. Oh. Uh, okay, Valentine, I'm coming at you and I'll ask questions later. Fine, fine. I was waiting for an excuse to do this again. Oh. Be careful. Oh, All God. right, come on. Get up, get up. Nice work, Valentine. I've never seen my studio put to better you. Shut up, you. Why, he's mad at everybody. George, what is this about Samuel? Yeah, what's the idea? What did I ever do to you? You tried to kill me. Nobody slipped you except yourself to make it look good. What do you mean, Bad George? slip of logic, Samuels. You were McLean's personal nemesis. If he were getting really desperate, he'd want to get rid of you, not me. He'd make good and sure you were dead. Oh, that's crazy. Why should I want to knock you off? I hired you. How could Samuels possibly have anything to do with Mrs. McLean's disappearance? Samuels, you know where that woman's body is, don't you? You know it tonight when you suggested I go plumbing the depths of that abandoned well because you were too fat to do it yourself. You're way off the beam, Valentine. You were afraid I'd find out too sooner or later. And you weren't going to take any chance. Now, look, with me dead, you could blackmail the real murderer for a long time to come. I see. I still remain the suspected murderer. Don't be so glib, Bub. You're exactly that. When will somebody get around to making sense here? I'm getting used to being the suspected murderer, Nana. But still I say, where is the body? You know, you've got to produce that to prove there was a murder. Samuels knows where it is, don't you? I, you uh, caught on a little quicker than I did. That's because you've been living with this case for seven years. Well, uh, I don't like being ghoulish. But do you really know where Mrs. McLean is, George? Take a look at this impressive group of statuary. My best effort yet. The statues, George? The one in the middle, particularly, Brooksy. Eternal life. You yourself said it didn't do its model, Nana, justice. And no wonder... There's only one thing Mrs. McLean has in common with Nana. They're both women of about the same size. There's no telling where that weird imagination of yours will lead you, Valentine. You don't need imagination, McLean. Just the plain observation that Samuel's had, too. You were in such a hurry to make a plastic cast with your wife's body in it that you forgot one little defect that might have been overlooked after seven years. What's that? I mean specifically the middle finger of your wife's hand. It severed at the first joint, and the plastic cast preserved it that way. No... I couldn't have forgotten that. I couldn't. Yes. Ironic as it is, McLean, there's death inside the statue of eternal life. When you shop for meat, you're confident of getting good quality because you know you're protected by health department regulations. But how can you be sure of quality when you're buying a battery for your car? The National Society of Automotive Engineers established protection for you when it established three rigid battery tests. Atlas batteries excel in all three of these tests required by the Society. Next time you look at an Atlas battery... Notice the certified capacities embossed on the back panel and the number of plates. So for a sure starting battery with greater capacity through a longer service period, make sure it's an Atlas battery. You can get one at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station. 
certified Atlas batteries and expert battery service are two reasons why independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll find George faced with a new problem expressed in a letter that has just come to his desk. Dear Mr. Valentine, I'm a freshman at Western State University. I'm majoring in botany. And I've suddenly found that flowers can smell of murder. Please give me a chance to tell you the whole story. I live in Quonset Hut Number 8, University Road. Signed, Louise Durain. Next Monday night, a new case for George Valentine. The Flowers That Smelled of Murder. Adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by David Victor, Herbert Little Jr., and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Samuels, Jay Novello as McLean, Louise Arthur as Nana. Don Diamond as the cabbie, and Bob Bruce as the clerk. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Easton. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It! This is Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The Flowers That Smelled of Murder, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If you're in on a game and you know you're going to draw the losing hand, deal me in, George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Dear Mr. Valentine, I'm a freshman at Western State University. I'm majoring in botany, and I've suddenly found out that flowers can smell of murder. My professor of botany is about to be killed. Several attempts have been made on him, but nobody takes me seriously. I'm sure I'm not imagining things. I'm not imagining things, so give me a chance to tell you the whole story. I live in Quonset Hut Number 8, University Road. The name is Louise Durain. Uh-huh. And row of Quonsets on University Road. They're all reserved for XGIs. If our freshman friend took any part in the recent unpleasantness, she's not likely to be a lightheaded character. Well... So, if she has murder on her mind... Okay, whether she's an ex whack or just plain wacky, Western State, here we come. Oh, Louise? Yes, yeah, sure she's here. Uh, darling, coming out soon? Oh, I'll be right there, Daddy Goose. I just got out of the shower. Uh, have a seat, Miss Brooks. Mr. Valentine, she won't be long. Oh, Thanks. thank you. Louise wrote me quite a letter. She said something about a murder. Oh, yes, I know. The poor child's been walking around with the idea of murder on her mind for days. Uh, which reminds me... Reminds you of what? Do you know what Socrates said about murder, Miss Brooks? I beg your pardon? He said... Nothing. Oh. 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 Even though society did murder him, you know. He just drank the hemlock and died. You see, after looking well at the world, the true philosopher decides there's nothing to say. <laughs> yeah, well, that's very interesting. But about Louise and no, this letter... I'll leave my pink sweater. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had company, Mark. It's impolite to stare, George. Can't help it, Angel. My mother decided I was going to be a boy baby. Uh, dear, this is Mr. Valentine and his assistant, Miss Brooks. Of course. How do you do? How do you do? I'm so glad you did take my letter seriously. 
I suppose I should tell you what this is all about. Well, it would help. Poor Professor Cobra is in terrible danger. I don't sleep nights thinking about it. Oh, yes. The handsome professor is a source of great concern to my wife. Your wife? Oh, yes. For the longest time. Yes. I'm very proud of how young and beautiful she keeps herself. Oh, Michael really means that. Can you wonder why I think he's such a darling? Yes, well, at the risk of not being a darling, aren't you a little too old to be a freshman? Well, as long as Michael doesn't admit it, I won't. You mean Mr. Durain is a freshman here at Western State, too? Oh, yes, we're just starting. Both of us are here on the G.I. Bill of Rights. He was in the OSS. He can speak 17 languages, including North Manchurian. <laughs> Show them, darling. Well, I'm Yeah, sure. well, uh, now about those murder hmm. attempts on Professor Cope. Oh, oh, he's my botany teacher. You see, I used to be in the WAC. But I always really wanted to be a botanist. And I'm doing very well, too. Show them, darling. Well, you'd never think it. But plants range from the lower algae to the fungi. Mosses, liverworts, ferns, and you know ferns. Isn't that terribly thrilling? Well, not as thrilling as murder, Mrs. Durain. You know that little thing you mentioned in your letter, remember? Oh, oh, yes, yes. You see, somebody has already tried to kill Professor Cobra several times. And no matter what John says, the things that happened to him weren't just accidents. No. Now, the time something went wrong with his car, and he nearly went off the cliff. Or the time somebody almost ran him down when he was crossing the corner. And other things like that. Well, is there any reason why anybody would want to get rid of the good professor? Why, don't you know? Oh. John's almost succeeded in crossbreeding a terrestrial orchid with an epiphytic one. It'll be the most beautiful flower ever grown. And for that reason, someone wants to murder him? Of course. He's almost ready to report it to the Botanical Society. It's to be called Papilio Nation's Corolla Louise. Think of it, Valentine. Louise, just a freshman majoring in botany, is going to have a flower named for her. Could a man want a greater compliment for his wife? Papilio Nation's Corolla Louise as a motive for murder? Uh, Brooksy, I think we've Oh, you're not taking me seriously either, are you? I'm afraid you're taking botany a little too seriously, Mrs. Durant. Mother, I've got to talk to you. Darling, you might at least close the door. There's a terrible draft. Is, is this your son? Who are these people? Well, your mother just happened to answer an ad, but we were going to leave anyway. Well, no, why should you? Everybody knows anyway. Knows what, Steve? All right, I'll qualify it. Everybody knows Except you, my father. Please, dear, you're talking to your father. He knows that, my darling. Uh, George, wouldn't it be better if we were... Wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't know there was going to be a double feature. How do you think I feel on the campus when everybody knows I'm a sophomore and my mother and father are freshmen? Well, that is an interesting setup. Uh, tell me, Stephen, do you do your parents' arithmetic for them? This is no kidding. Mother, everybody's saying that you and Professor Cobra are that way about each other. They see you everywhere together. No son wants to hear that kind of talk about his mother. Oh, now, wait a minute, sir. I'll have you understand your mother's a very attractive woman. Thank you, Michael. Oh, Stephen, I made some of that potato salad you like so much. It's in the refrigerator. Oh, tomorrow. it's no use talking to you two. Oh, oh, Mr. Valentine. We forgot all about Professor Coba. Did we? I thought he was very prominent in the conversation. Now, somebody is trying to kill him. Of course, Michael and Stephen won't believe it, but... But I do... Enough to want to hang around a while and see what this is all about. Miss Brooks, it's very considerate of the Phi Gamma Epsilon sorority to worry so strenuously about my husband. Well, naturally, when we girls heard about these threats on Professor Cobra's life, we just... I can just imagine what your hen parties must sound like. I hope your house mother doesn't listen in. Oh, oh! it wasn't just that, Mrs. Coper. You see, with all this talk about Mrs... Uh, oh, dear, what was I going to say? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Why should you be? It's common knowledge on the campus that Mrs. Drain's been throwing herself at my husband. And all this talk about murder attempts has been a figment of this woman's weird imagination. Oh, and that's all there is to it? My husband leads a very sheltered academic life. He happens to be engaged in some experiments with flowers. That's hardly provocation for murder. Oh, no. No, I love flowers myself. True, he's very handsome for a botany teacher, but childishly unaware of his own charms. That's no cause for murder either. Of course not. However, if the professor were aware of his shaggy masculine attraction and were doing something about it... Yes. 
That might be a very understandable cause for murder. Ha! Huh. Good day, Miss Brooks. Believe me, Mr. Valentine, uh, these accidents that have been happening to Professor Kober are, well, just that. Accidents. Yes, I know what you mean, Professor Parsworth, but I'm more interested in these experiments Kober's working on. And as head of the department, and presumably his boss, uh, you ought to be able to give me that information. Yeah, of course. Uh, but I doubt if it could uh, possibly have much interest for the layman. Uh, Professor Kober is merely trying to create a new genus of the orchid family. Uh-huh. Of course, it'll probably be win the, the valuable American horticultural prize. A paper will be written on it, and a few thousand botanists throughout the world will thrill over it. And there will be some academic glory for Professor Kober and Western State University. Obviously, you have a great deal of respect for Professor Kober. I have. He's a true genius. I'm merely the head of the botany department. Uh, my particular talent is being able to get the money from the trustees so that men like Coburg can carry on the experiments and reap the glory. I see. Uh, there's only one thing we had any conflict about, uh, Coburg and I. Oh, what's that? Uh, the name he insists on giving this flower, the Papilionaceous Corolla Louise. Oh, the Louise part bothers you, eh? Hmm. Yes, I can see that might lead to complications. <laughs> No, 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 Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine. You're, you're not intruding at all. Any friend of Mrs. Durain's is always welcome in the greenhouse. Oh, John, I just can't wait till you show them my new flower. No, I, I can't wait either. I've heard so much about it. <laughs> well, uh, this way. I hate to sound like a tourist, Professor Cobra, but this greenhouse is more elaborate than any I've ever seen. <laughs> yes, isn't it, my dear? The most modern in the world. I designed it myself. And we have different rooms for every type of flower, don't we, John? And no end of that. <laughs> Louisa's enthusiasm is a constant source of inspiration, but she is right. There is no end of gadgets. I'm afraid only Professor Bosworth and I know where they all are and what they are supposed to do. Yeah, please come in quickly so I can close the door. Well, yeah, but uh, shouldn't we put on a light? Do you Well, you see, we have no light at all in this room. I had it built especially for this experiment. Tell them why, John. It's awfully intriguing. Well, you see, light and cold are the two enemies of the papilionaceous corolla. Uh, the slightest fall in temperature would mean their death. Uh, that's why we have a thermostatic control. <laughs> Even that is well hidden in the back. But how did you get to see these beautiful specimens of yours, Professor? Well, uh, you will. In a minute, after you get used to the dark. George! I think I'm beginning to see them now. Look, can't you see them glowing? Yeah. Hey, they're really something. Mm hmm. Worth every minute of the 12 years I've spent to get that unearthly perfection and color in the petals. John says it's nature, the most beautiful and dangerous thing thrive in the darkness. Didn't you say that, John? <laughs> well, I, I didn't put it as romantically as that, Louise. But with these flowers, it does seem that way. And another thing. You have only to touch them, and that glow comes right off on your fingers. And you can't get rid of it for days. Oh, that's very interesting. Well, now I'm afraid we'll have to get to work, Louise. We got that new soil preparation this morning. Uh, let's get on out where it's light. Oh, oh dear, and I left the seed chart in my car. I'll be right back to... Don't worry, my dear. I have to bring in the flats for those seedlings. Oh, uh, Mr. Valentine, why don't you and Miss Brooks stay and see how we work? Yes, Professor, thanks. That'll be fine. On the other hand, Brooks, you stay here. I think I'll give the professor a hand. Okay, George. Here, you don't want to do that all alone. Oh, no need for you to bother Valentine. I... Hey, professor, look out. Get out of the way. Valentine! Oh, that was close. Are you all right? I... I wouldn't be if you hadn't pushed me out of the way. That boulder was coming straight at us. Yes, oh, yes. Can you stand up? I, I, I think so. Just a part of it went over my foot. George, what was that? I think you can see for yourself, Brooks. Oh, are you all right, George? Yes, yes, quite now, Louise. George, where are you going? Up this hill. See if this is another one of those accidents. Oh, I'll help you inside, George. Wait a minute, darling. Professor Coburn nearly got that boulder in the middle of his back. 
If he's bending down over his precious seedlings, a perfect target. It must have fallen from here. Yeah. But it didn't just come loose, Brooksy. Look at this. Property of Western State University. Botanical department. Yeah, the shovel somebody used to spade up the dirt from under that rock. He had to do it to be able to push it down. You mean he or she, don't you? Yeah, Brooksy. What I want to know is, was that boulder meant for the professor or for me? We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Here in the West, winter brings skiing, skating, and tobogganing to a lot of folks. But to the battery in your car, winter brings a heap of extra work. Colder mornings mean harder starting. Longer evenings mean more battery juice for lights. So why not give your battery a helping hand? Get real fast starts and extra power from it. Just pull in at an independent Chevron gas station or a standard station. Being experts at battery service, they can give it more pep than a pup in no time at all. If your battery's got one foot in the grave, they can supply you a new Atlas battery. Each Atlas battery has the number of plates and the certified capacity stamped right on the battery case. And the written warranty you get with a new Atlas battery is good at 38,000 stations seven days a week. For all your car's battery needs, rely on a standard station or an independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. A huge boulder almost pins a college professor against a tree. Why? He's only interested in developing a new type of orchid. The incident itself is exciting enough, but if you're half as curious as Claire Brooks, what you really want to know is why your boss, George Valentine, thought something like this might happen. Remembering all the strange characters in the case, you're right on George's heels as he enters the Quonset hut on University Road. Anybody here? The drain seemed to be out, George. What do you want? What are you doing here? Oh, just looking for your father and mother, Stephen. We have something to talk about. Well, go on, find them. I can. Get up. Well, that's no way to talk, Stephen. Why not? Father's out somewhere quoting Homer. My mother's... Who knows where she is? Expect to walk in and find me in the best of humor? Now, listen to me, kid. I won't and take your hands off of me. I said listen to me. Your mother was right when she said someone is trying to kill Professor Coker. We saw it happen again this afternoon. And he's not dead? What's the matter? Why'd they make such a mess out of it? Okay, it's no use talking to you. By the way, when did you get home, Stephen? I don't see why I have to answer questions like that. Not to strangers. Now, get out of here! Oh, I really must apologize for my son's manners. Oh, Mr. Drain. We didn't hear you come in. No, I came in the back way. Did I hear you say something about another accident happening to Professor Coble? Yeah, you heard right. You needn't look at me that way. I was in the Hodgkin's library all afternoon, reading Plato's Republic in the original Greek. Believe me, it wasn't easy. A cup of tea, Miss Brooks? Oh, no, I don't think so, thanks. It'd be a shame if anything happened to Professor Coble before he won that $50,000 prize. Is that how much the prize is worth? Oh, yes. Oh, I see you don't know your flowers, old man. Uh, where's Louise? So she called and said she'd be working late again at the greenhouse. Oh, now, look, Terrain, I'm as modern as the next guy, but don't you resent your wife spending so much time with another man? Oh, now, Louise happens to be fond of flowers. I am imbued with the spirit of philosophy. But get one thing straight, Valentine. We're very much in love with each other. Nothing can alter that. Thanks. That makes a lot of things clear, Terrain. It, it does? Sure, Brooksy. Now, come on, we're in a hurry. <laughs> Let's have a look in the orchid room, Brooks. I can't see a thing, George. Give yourself a chance. Remember the flowers that glow in the dark? Professor Cover? Huh? Huh? George! Something on the floor. I just tripped over. Just a minute. Who? Who is it? I don't know. I can hardly see. But I think it's the professor. I'm sure this is his top. The one he wore this afternoon? Yes. Yeah. But it's not the professor. What? It's a woman. Louise? No. 
Well, let me see. It, it's Mrs. Colvin, the professor's wife. Stabbed in the back with a pair of pruning shears. Oh, George, I can't look. I know. How about that theory of mine? Yes, dear? You don't have to worry about it anymore. This little piece of ma'am has knocked it all in a cocked hat. Well, where do we go from here? We go to the telephone and call Lieutenant Riley. Well, still running true to form, eh, Valentine? Uh, leave it to you to get murder all mixed up with the professor and flowers that glow in the dark. Oh, the trouble with you, Lieutenant, is that you think murder only happens to Mr. Average Man. Yep. I've got no imagination, Miss Brooks. Oh, I could imagine somebody trying to knock off Professor Cooper where there's a prize of 50 G's lurking in the background, but why his wife? Because she happened to be wearing his coat. You know, somehow, Lieutenant, I hate putting things off until tomorrow morning. If that's supposed to be an aspersion on the efficiency of the homicide squad, it leaves me cold. What do you expect me to do, slap the whole Durain family in the can? No, not that, but... Both the father and the son could have had a gripe against the professor. And if Mrs. Cobra wasn't killed by a mistake, either Louise or the professor could have done it. Um, George, didn't you have a sort of special theory all cooked up before we found Mrs. Cobra? Well, Brooksy, unlike the lieutenant, I wasn't hepped on the jealousy angle. Yeah. I got here as soon as I could after you called, Valentine. Oh, this is dreadful. Murder is never very wholesome. Oh, Dr. Barnsworth, this is Lieutenant Riley of Homicide. How are you? How do you do? Uh, when I talked to you before, Valentine, I was convinced that all this was uh, just so much nonsense. But now I see how wrong I've been. Uh, oh, uh, Lieutenant. Yes, Doctor. Uh, uh, how can we go about keeping this as quiet as possible? Uh, you know how squeamish uh, uh, trustees are about bad publicity. Oh, that should be easy, Doctor. Uh, just what do you propose we do? Forget somebody was killed here tonight? Oh, no, 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 of course not. I, I suppose I'll just have to issue some dignified announcement. Uh, you make it sound like a wedding, Doctor. Now, I, I'd better go and speak to the dean. It's going to be a terrible shock for him after all the years he spent with his fault. Oh, oh, Valentine, you'll call me in the morning? Yeah, sure thing. We're going to be moving along now, too. Well, what about it, Valentine? Come on, let's get moving. I'm tired. I have to be at the morgue at 8 in the morning. Let's not worry so much about a night's sleep, eh, Lieutenant? What? It's my night's sleep you're talking about. As a tough-minded, practical cop, I know you don't subscribe to the bromide so dear to the heart of mystery writers. Such bromides as? The murderer returning to the scene of the crime. Oh, no, no, not that one, Valentine. You're willing to wait it out and see? No. What do you take me for? Why, I wouldn't... Uh... You wouldn't what, Lieutenant? Uh, I wouldn't dare take a chance on leaving now. <laughs> The worst thing about waiting around in the dark is that you can't play gin rummy. Patience, Lieutenant. Yeah. Well, if no one shows, darling, the dawn's going to come up like thunder on someone's very red face. Ooh, you and your subtleties. You know, I was talking to the commissioner the other day and said, I, boss, why bother about having a homicide squad when one man like George... Hey. What's that? What's that? Sounds like it comes from the other end of the green. This is my day off of pet answers. We'd better go and see. Wait a minute. Hold it, Valentine. Hold it. There's a lot of glass on the ground here. Yeah. Yeah, and whoever indulged himself in this bit of vandalism is off in that car. But we'll never catch up with him. Okay, Valentine. Something did happen, as you said it might. But what was it? The murderer. He came back to smash this thermostat, see? Yeah? But take a chance like that on being caught, George. Just to smash the devil out of this gadget? A very important gadget, Lieutenant. It controls the temperature of the greenhouse. Of course. Professor Cobra's flower. Yes, and they're dying right now. Brooksy, you and the Lieutenant have to keep that from happening. Me? What do I know about flowers? When in doubt, just ask Brooksy. Now, come on, come on, Miss Brooks. Look, look, fun is fun, but it, it, it's cold in here. Now, Lieutenant, let me have your shirt. Uh, you already took my jacket. These flowers have to be kept warm and covered. Uh, Even if we just save one of them, it'll mean something. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't see you giving up much for the cause. Lieutenant, please. Oh, uh, for the love of Mike. Here. Take the shirt off my back. 
Oh, I just hope that Valentine knows what he's doing. We'll find out as soon as he gets back. In the meantime, we have to find something else to put around these flowers. Well, that's... No. No, please, Miss Brooks. No, no. Don't look at me that way. Please, I, I've done enough for the flower kingdom tonight. Oh, you're cute, Lieutenant. But I just happen to remember those burlap bags outside. <laughs> All right, Valentine. We sit here in the dark in the... In the orchid. The orchid. Orchid room and the murderer is going to walk in this door and say, Here I am. Take me downtown. You won't have to say a word, Lieutenant, I hope. Okay, Brooksy, send them in one by one. You can start with Stephen. Oh, Stephen, will you come in? Why do we have to go through this? Hasn't my mother caused us enough trouble? You shouldn't be so critical of your mother, son. Now go over there and sit down. Mr. Durain, next, Percy. If you will, please, Mr. Durain. Uh, isn't this kind of unusual, Valentine, all the darkness? Oh, but, of course, as the philosophers have always understood, murder and darkness go together. Sit next to Stephen, will you? I think you can find your way. Yes, sir. Mrs. Durain, next. Valentine, what are you doing? You're not even asking these people any Mr. questions. Mr. Durain, I'm so worried about Professor Kruger. He hasn't had a wink of sleep all night. Over there, Louise, please. Oh, ye oh. gods. Go right in, please, Professor Coburn. Oh, my flowers. You did manage to keep them alive. Look at them. How they glow. How did you do it, Mr. Valentine? <laughs> well, I could tell you, Pat, but I won't. Sit there, Professor Coburn. Oh, Dr. Barnsworth, I think you can come in. I believe I know who our murderer is. I certainly hope so. And I have you to thank for the answer, Doctor. Me? Yes, sir. And I want to shake your hand. Of course, but... Uh, hey, look at that guy's hands. The fingers, the way they shine. That's right. Well, what do you know? Look at his hand, John. It, it's the pollen from our flower. But, Bosworth, that couldn't be. You haven't been here for weeks. Oh, yes, he was. He had to be here when he killed Mrs. Cobra. <laughs> I never imagined Bosworth thought he'd kill the professor. Well, why else would he have said it would be such a shock to the dean? After all the years the old gentleman spent looking forward to... To the end of those experiments. <laughs> yeah, sure. With Cobra gone, Bosworth could finish his work and get all the glory. But first he had to kill those flowers. Then, using Cobra's notes, it would be easy. Mm-hmm. I noticed a faint glow on the thermostat control, even in the light. Well, I was too worried about who was getting away in that car. You see, only two men knew about those elaborate temperature controls in the greenhouse. And Cobra, the true scientist, would rather die than destroy his own brainchild. Well, that's that. But I don't know how I'll ever be able to feel the same way about a man who almost achieved immortality. Huh? What? Well, Professor Cobra was so grateful, he volunteered to call his sensational orchid the Papillionaceous Valentine. Oh, <laughs> you too. You know I'm not as beautiful as the fair, Louise. Well, now, that's great. Sorry, That's gratitude for you. It was my coat and my shirt that kept those flowers alive. No, he's right at that, George. All right, all right. From now on, between the three of us, it'll be the Papillionaceous Corolla Riley. Oh, gee. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> One of the first things a lady does when she's shopping for clothes is to touch the garment. She judges the texture by feeling it. The hand test will tell you a lot about Atlas Grip Safe tires, too. Next time you're at a standard station or an independent Chevron gas station, just press your palm on the tread of a new Atlas tire and feel how it grips your hand. Atlas tires on your car grip the road in the same way, thanks to their special non-skid tread design. That's how they give you quick, straight stops and why Atlas tires are safer on the turns. You can't buy safer driving for yourself and your family. And you can't find a better warranty than the written Atlas warranty. It's good at 38,000 stations in the 48 states and Canada, seven days a week. Why take chances in winter driving? Get Atlas Grip Safe tires tomorrow. Get them at any independent Chevron gas station or standard station where they say and mean... We'll take better care of your car.
Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll find George reading a letter from an old man who says... Dear Mr. Valentine, I wish to bestow a beautiful and precious gift upon a member of my family, the worthiest one, the rare Wittenberg Bible. You can help me. Kindly call Sunday morning when I can be sure that all of my little family will be home. Signed, Wesley Hart. Another problem for George. Next Monday night in Murder, It's a Gift. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Lorene Tuttle as Louise, Jeff Chandler as Michael, Tommy Cook as Stephen, Ted Van Els as Cobra, Bay Baker as Lenore, and Herb Rawlinson as Bosworth. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Try to sneak open the door, Pam. Look through the keyhole. That's what I did. What'd you see? An eye. A human eye? Well, I hope it was human. Because if I saw it, it, it must have seen me. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, Murder Mismanaged. <laughs> The man in the unpressed suit is still a little unsteady as he rises heavily from his bed and consults a mirror on the bedroom wall. It's almost noon. The effects of a late night spent at a neighborhood bar have lingered into the morning after, leaving him with a pair of red-rimmed eyes and a handful of shaky fingers. Sally? Sally, what time is it? Oh, you up, Arnold? Yeah, I'm up. What'd you think I was doing in here? Walking in my sleep? A cup of coffee in the house? Yes, Arnold. I'll get it for you. Make it snappy, will you? I gotta throw some water on my face, get down to the store. I'm late. Uh, maybe you better not go to the store today. I, I mean, you looking the way you do, maybe you better stay home. Sure, sure. Just take the day off. Just like that. The old man would have a fit. Arnold. Well, wouldn't he? You don't have to stick up for him because he's your father. I know what a cheapskate he is. Darling, I don't want to argue with you about father. Well, then tell him to quit saying he's supporting me. Tell him to quit saying I married you for your money. Why did you marry me, Arnold? For the same reason you married me. Because you loved me. You thought it would work out. Only you didn't know I'd never amount to anything. Honey, I still love you. And I still think it can work out. If you just stop drinking so much and try to make a first Honey, start, will you stop it? We'll... I got to get down to the store. No, wait. I got to get down there, I tell you. Arnold, please, don't go to the store today. Stay with me. You crazy? Stay with me, Arnold. You've got to. My father doesn't want you to work for him anymore. Doesn't want me... He told you that? Well, he... See, he thinks you'd be better off in another kind of job. After all, a jewelry store is not... Sure, sure. A jewelry store is risky business. With all those diamonds lying around, you've got to be careful who's working for you. He didn't say that. I don't care what he said. That's what he means. He, he doesn't trust me no more. Thinks I'm stealing from him. Arnold, listen. So what? Now, let go of my arm, will you? I'm going down that store no, and i No, please, I'm... you'll have a fight. All right, then I'll have a fight. Now, let go of Arnold, me. Arnold, you're not going down there. Let go of me, I let... said. Oh. Honey, you hurt me. All right, I'm sorry. Next time, don't get in my way. Why 
1410. Hayden's Jewelry Store? Yes, this is Mr. Hayden speaking. Oh, Mr. Hayden, uh, this is Mrs. North. I'm calling about my husband's watch. I left it with your son-in-law the other day, and he didn't seem to know when it'll be ready. Why, it's ready right now, Mrs. North. You can pick it up any time you like. Well, Mr. North and I'll be over a little later on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hayden. You're quite welcome. Yes, uh... Oh, it's you. Hello, Pop. Surprised to see me? Surprised isn't the right word, Arnold. What is? Well, I don't see any reason why we have to have an argument about it. Didn't Sally tell you I don't want you to work for me anymore? Yeah, yeah, she told me. Then why did you come down here? I want to find out what's behind it. What's the, what's the real reason you're firing me, Mr. Hayden? I want to know the truth. The truth is very simple. I can't stand the sight of you, Arnold. Never could. And when I think of what you've done to my daughter's life and mine, it, it makes me sick inside. Is that all? No, there's more. I'm going to take Sally away from you, Arnold, if it's the last thing I do. I'm going to take her away and put you where you belong, behind bars. Oh, I thought you'd be coming to that. And I thought you could be trusted. Until I realized you were a thief, a common, ordinary thief. Keep your mouth shut! You... Another crack like that and I'll forget how old you are. Slapping me won't do any good, Arnold. When I've got the proof, I'm going to the police. You're not going to do nothing of the kind. And if I catch you calling up the police... We'll, uh, we'll finish this later on, Pop. Somebody just came in the store. No. Can I help you, sir? Well, maybe you can, mister. I'm looking for a ring. For yourself or for... Uh, what are you doing? Stay where you are, Grandpa. This is a stick-up. What? You too, mister. Don't move. I've got you covered. I I'm not moving. All right, then keep your trap shut. Do like I tell you. These trays over here, get them out. Come on, come on, hurry it up. You help him, Grandpa, and keep your hands away from that burglar alarm. I'm not fooling. I, I didn't think you were. Okay, trays on the case and turn around. Turn around, I said. That's what I'm doing. Hey, you! Pop, look out! Going, Pam. The jewelry store's over here. Oh, that's right. I, I was thinking we were on 6th Avenue. Now, don't tell me you gave my watch to the wrong place. Oh, no, no. This is right, dear. I spoke to Mr. Hayden about an hour ago. Only I... Only what? For goodness sake, look at the crowd, Jerry. Hey, something must have happened inside the store. There's a policeman outside. Keep moving, please. Move right along. Oh, somebody must have been hurt. Uh, excuse me, please. Uh, excuse me. Just a minute, lady. You can't go in there. Oh, oh, but we have to. My husband has a watch in there, and uh, Mr. Hayden's a very special friend of ours. Oh, my orders... Thank you, officer. We won't be in the way. Uh, come on, Jerry. All right, dear. All right. Give me a chance. We shouldn't have come in here anyway. Mr. Hayden's been hurt. Ask the doctor what happened to him. Go ahead, Jerry. They're, they're just standing oh, there. Darling, will you stop pushing? I'll ask Mr. Hayden's son-in-law. What happened, Mr. Ranson? Huh? What happened? Oh, I, I, I didn't recognize you, Mr. North. We, we, we had a robbery in here, and I'm still kind of shaky about it. The old man was almost shot. Good heavens. How? Oh, oh he, he got rattled, tried to set off the burglar alarm, so the stick-up man hit him with a gun. Yeah, he knocked him cold. What a shame. Yeah, I, I may have to take him to the hospital. I don't think that will be necessary, Arnold. Mr. Hayden, are you all right? I am now. The doctor says I can go home if I want to. Well, uh, maybe. Maybe you better. Maybe you better get right into bed. You you, you stay here, Pop. I'll, uh, I'll get the car and we'll both go home together. No, no, I... I it won't take a minute. I'll be right back. Mr. North, don't let him take me home. I, I don't want to be alone with him. Why? What's the matter, Mr. Hayden? I'm afraid... Afraid of what he might do to me. He's tried to kill me already. What do you mean? My head, this blow I got. It wasn't from the stick-up man. It was Arnold who hit me. Hello? Hello, honey. This is me. Arnold, where are you? I've been worried about you all day. Why haven't you called me? Well, I would have, baby, only we had a little... Trouble down at the store. Trouble? With Father? No, not that kind of trouble. Uh, somebody robbed the place. Oh, no. Yeah, hold up, man. He got away with three trays. He didn't hurt anybody, did he? 
Well, your old man got pushed around a little, but he's okay now. A couple of friends of his, uh, Mr. and Mrs. North, are driving him home. And where are you? Well, I stopped off for a little drink, honey. Oh, Arnold, please, come home, darling. Oh, now, now, don't you worry about me, baby. I'm turning over a new leaf. Honey. New leaf, I tell you. For a while there, I thought your old man wasn't going to let me, but after what happened today, everything's going to be fine. Fine and dandy. I'm so glad you could drive me home, Mr. North. I I needed this chance to talk to you. Well, if you think Arnold was the one who hit you, Mr. Hayden... It's the truth, I tell you. For months now, Arnold's been stealing from the store... Substituting cheap imitations for valuable diamond rings. You're joking. He's a thief, Mrs. North. And this robbery today was a deliberate attempt to cover it up. You mean he wanted the store robbed? Wanted it and made it possible for the hold-up man to do the job. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Hayden. That's a pretty broad statement. It's not a statement, Mr. North. It's the only explanation for what happened. And if he's gone this far, he'll go the rest of the way. He'll kill me. He won't do anything if you can prove what you just told us. But I can't prove it. Now that the jewels are gone... It's my word against his. Well, we'll see what we can do, Mr. Hayden. In the meantime, just be careful. And keep away from Arnold. Hello, Pop. Hmm? Arnold. Yeah, Arnold. What took you so long to get home? You left the store before I did. Well, I had a long talk with Mr. and Mrs. North. And then I stopped off to see Sally at your apartment. What about? About you. And what happened this afternoon? That's what I thought. You're doing everything you can to turn her against me, ain't you? Am I? I don't think she needs any help from me. She knows it all now. Knows what? What you tell her? The truth about you and what happened today. I don't know what you're talking about. Now stay where you are, Arnold. I'm ready for you this time. I have a gun. I don't care what you got. You're not going to blame me for something I didn't do. But you did hit me, Arnold. And you were stealing from the store. And I can prove it. You're crazy. How could you prove a thing like that? By the man who held up the store. I have his name right here on this piece of paper. His name and his address. And I... Look out, Arnold. This gun is loaded. All right, then go ahead and use it. Go ahead. Shoot me. I will if you come any nearer. Oh, no, you won't. Arnold, drop that gun. Drop it before... Mr. Hayden. Well, come right in, Lieutenant Wigand. It's nice to see you. Oh, hello, Jerry. Been waiting for me? Almost an hour, Bill. Don't you ever come back to your office? Not when there's work to be done. Now, what's on your mind? Well, I don't suppose this is exactly your line, Bill, but you might be able to help us out. Out of what? Well, it could be murder eventually. But right now, it's only the threat of it. With whom? A man by the name of Hayden. He's a jeweler, Bill. And his son-in-law is thinking of killing him. Are you kidding? No. Why? Well, I just came from Hayden's apartment. His son-in-law shot him in the shoulder. Shot him? When was this? Oh, about three quarters of an hour ago. It was just a flesh wound. Well, that's enough, isn't it? This afternoon, he robbed Mr. Hayden's store and, and hit him over the head with a candle holder. Yes, Mr. Hayden was telling me. I... Well, you're going to do something about it, aren't you? I mean, a guy like that should be put away. He was put away, Jerry. You arrested him? No, we didn't have to. He was dead. Arnold? Mm, Mr. Hayden's son-in-law? That's right, Pam. We found his body in a dark alley about two blocks from where he lived. Somebody shot him. <laughs> way, Jerry. The policeman said we'd find Arnold's apartment at the end of the hall. Well, I don't know why we came here, dear, or what you expect to prove. I I don't expect to prove anything, dear. I'd just like to know a little bit more about Mr. Hayden's daughter. But she isn't home. The police haven't been able to find her. Well, then maybe we'll find something that'll help us find her. What? Uh, Never mind, darling. Just try the door. The policeman said they left it open. They did. Only I feel awful funny about barging in here. Why? Bill told us it was all right. I'll bet anything he'd like us to get him a good lead on this case. Then why don't we go see Mr. Hayden instead of fooling around here? After all... Wait a second. 
That's the phone, Jerry. Well, what are you going to do? Answer it, of course. Hey, Pam. Hello? Hello, Sally. Uh, yes. I got to see you right away. Who is this? Me, Manny. I've been laying low, like you told me. Only I didn't expect no double cross. What do you mean? You know what I mean. What's the idea of sending your husband around to see me? Arnold? Who else? How many husbands you got? Uh, well, I, I don't understand. In the pig's eye, you don't understand. He had my name and address on a little piece of paper. You know what he threatened to do? What? Tell the cops. He said I was in this just as much as he was. And if I made one move, he'd squad. Pam, who is it? Shh. Well, what's the idea, Sally? What are you trying to pull? Uh, nothing. Well, you've got a lot of explaining to do. You better do it fast. Look, I'll meet you over at my place in about an hour. Just as soon as I make sure it's safe. Oh, well, um, uh, where do you live? Oh, you know where I live. On the second floor over Mulroy's Bar. Now, be there. Okay, Manny, I'll be there. See you later. Yeah. Now, what did you get yourself into? Oh, well, nothing yet. But as soon as we find out where Mulroy's bar is, we're going over to Manny's place. Only we're going a little earlier than he expects us. Who in the world is Manny? Oh, I haven't the faintest idea, Jerry. But that's what we're going to find out. Jerry, we mustn't let anyone know we're here. Well, where are we? I don't see any apartments on this floor. Shh. This door right here. And if I'm not mistaken... Yes, it is. What is? Is what? Manny's place. His name's on the card. Uh, take it easy. There may be somebody in there. Well, there shouldn't be. But there is. <gasps> Who's there? Jerry, it's Mr. Hayden's daughter. What? Sally, what are you doing here? Well, uh, I, I was waiting for someone. I had a message to meet somebody here. Who? Well, uh, I don't know what his name is. Uh, but, Sally, I... I think you'd better tell us the truth. The police are looking for you. Yes, I know. I've been hiding from them. I suppose it's wrong, but there's something I've got to find out before I tell them. Tell them what? About Arnold? About everything. I've got to tell somebody. I'll go out of my mind if I don't. There's nobody I can turn to. Is it because you killed him? No. I didn't kill him. I tried to help Arnold, but everything turned out so badly. And then when I saw my father tonight, when you dropped him off in my apartment, I made a terrible mistake. In what way? I told him about Manny. The one who lives here? Yes. I, I never should have talked. If I hadn't said anything, Arnold might still be alive. But my father kept pounding at me, so hammering at me. As soon as he walked in the door, he accused Arnold of being a thief. He said he had proof that Arnold had struck him. That the whole robbery... I saw it with my own eyes, I tell you. He struck me when I reached for the burglar alarm. And what's more, he planned to do it. Planned the whole thing with that stick-up man. Father, it's not so. You're always against Arnold, no matter what he does. Oh, Sally, Sally, how can you defend this man? How can you go on protecting him when he treats you the way he does? There isn't an ounce of decency in him. I love him, Father. And he loves me. Does he? Is that why you stick to him? Well, then maybe you'd better know the truth. Maybe you'd better know what he does when he doesn't come home to you. Father. He's no good, Sally. For three weeks, I hired a private detective to follow him wherever he went. And every time he didn't come home, he was out with another woman. That's a lie. That's a matter of record, Sally. I have the names and addresses of every one of the women he went out with. And some of them he gave presents to. Expensive jewelry that he probably stole from my store. Then it's true. He doesn't even love me. Not what I call love. I'm sorry, darling. I thought I could spare sure, you this, but... father. I would have known sooner or later, and I'm glad you told me. But you're wrong about Arnold at the store today. Wrong? He might have struck you to cover up the fact that he'd been stealing. But he had nothing to do with the holdup. How do you know? I know. Because I was trying to cover up for him, too. I hired that holdup man myself. <laughs> I made. I never should have told him. I, 
Never should have given him Manny's name. Manny is the man who held up the store? Yes, I hired him because I thought it would help my husband. Well, then he might have killed Arnold. When I spoke to him on the phone, he, he said your husband had been over here. That's what I wanted to find out. If Arnold knew him, if Arnold had been to see him. See who? Manny. What's going on here, Sally? Who are your friends? We're Mr. and Mrs. North, Manny. And before you reach for that gun of yours, I might as well warn you that the police know we're here. What else do they know? Enough to want to see you down at headquarters. I think it would be a good idea if Sally had a chance to identify you. And I think it'd be a good idea that three of you took a trip to the morgue. On a stretcher. That'll make a lot of noise. Uh, it'll make a lot more noise if I give you a chance to open your mouths. Why? What have we got on you, Manny? Nothing, sister. You ain't gonna get nothing, neither. Now stand up. All of you. Face the wall. What's the idea? Face the wall, I said. Manny, please don't shoot. Who's gonna shoot? I'm gonna beat it, Sally, and I ain't ever coming back. Oh, now don't be upset, Jerry. I know you couldn't help letting Manny get away last night. I'm just glad you didn't get hurt. Well, we might have if we tried to hold him. Hey, where are you taking us, Bill? Oh, in here for a while. It's a lineup. We had the net out this morning, and it's just possible we picked up your friend Manny. He's not our friend. Well, if you see him, just let me know. All right, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Come on, you guys. Stand up straight. When you hit the light, face front. I'll tell you when you can go. Holy mackerel. Where in the world did you find these guys? No, Manny? Not yet. Try the next bunch, Sarge. Right. Come on now. Keep moving. Move along. He's a short man, Billy. Short and stocky. You see him? Not yet. Hey, wait a minute, Pam. Isn't that him, the second one from the left? I don't know, Jerry. We only saw him for a minute last night. That's him, all right. Look how he's trying to hide. Hey, you. No, 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 you. That's right. Say something. I didn't do nothing, Lieutenant. I just blew in from Cleveland. That's right, Jerry. That's him. No, it's not. That's enough, Manny. Come on on down here. But I tell you, I got... That's to... enough, I said. You think Mr. and Mrs. North are lying? I've got some other people down here to identify you. Well... Come on in, Mr. Hayden. Thank you, Lieutenant. You recognize this man? Which one? Well, this one over here, Manny. Isn't this the guy who held up your store yesterday? Why, no, I've never seen this man before in my life. He's lying, Bill. He's lying to protect his daughter. That's why she won't say anything either. But why? How can Hayden protect his daughter by saying that this Manny guy didn't rob the store? Well, that makes sense. If he denies that Manny robbed the store, it's the same as saying that somebody else robbed it. Somebody who hasn't been found yet. Somebody who will never be found and who will never be able to testify. Oh, I see. Hayden's convinced that Manny's testimony will convict his daughter. And since she had a good motive for the murder... her father's willing to commit perjury to protect her. But how is her father so sure that Sally's guilty? How does he know that Manny didn't kill Arnold? I'll tell you how he knows. He knows because he killed Arnold himself. Mr. Hayden? Well, he must have, Jerry. I, I hate to say it, but it it's the only logical answer. Hayden killed Arnold? But for what reason? Oh, for any number of reasons, Bill. Uh, because of what Arnold was doing to his daughter. Uh, because Arnold had ruined her life and, and she was still in love with him. Uh, there was no other way to get rid of him. Then Mr. Hayden wasn't protecting his daughter. When he refused to identify Manny, he was protecting himself. Was he? Only the murderer could have known that Manny wasn't guilty. And only the murderer would have refused to identify him. Oh, fine, fine. But how am I going to prove it? You know, you two are just talking in the air. No, they're not, Lieutenant. They're telling you the truth. What? Well, how careful what you say, Mr. Hayden. This can be held against you. It doesn't matter. I've written you a full confession. Why? What made you change your mind? I knew you'd have broken me down sooner or later. I'd have broken myself down. A man like me can't live with murder in his heart. I'm too old and too tired to have resisted you. I realized that as soon as I lied to you this morning. Mr. Hayden, No, no, I... no. Let me go on. I made a great mistake, and I'm willing to pay for it. That's why I'm giving myself up. You killed Arnold? Yes, I killed him. Last night, after he left my apartment, I followed him and shot him. Because his life was taking two of ours. But that wasn't my mistake, Lieutenant. My mistake was not killing him sooner. Pam! 
Oh, Pam, I've got to be at the office early this morning. What time is it? It's 8.30 in here, darling. Oh, what time is it in there? Well, that's why I asked, dear. The kitchen says 9 o'clock and the living room says 7.30. Well, that's about right. What's about right? How is it we've got seven clocks in this house and nobody can ever tell the right time? Don't say nobody, dear. I can always tell the right time. How? Well, uh, first of all, I look at my watch, (laughs) if I can find it. Mm -hmm. And if I can't, I know it stopped anyway because I must have forgotten to wind it. Then? Uh, Then I take ten minutes off the kitchen clock, uh, add ten minutes to the living room, and and average them out. uh, Unless the current's been turned off uh, because they're electric. But how do you tell the time? Well, if those two systems don't work, I have one way that never fails. What's that? I call downstairs and ask the doorman. The adventures of Mr. and Mrs. North are brought to you through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Body on the Slab, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband. But Mr. Wallace, people disappear every day in a big city like this. Such things are really no concern of mine. They're a matter for the police. But, Mr. Carter, it isn't just anybody who's disappeared. It's my husband. I'll pay you anything to find him. Well, I suppose it can do no harm to listen to the story. All right, Mr. Burnett. Where was the last place you saw him? In a sort of saloon gambling house on West Street, down by the waterfront. A two-story house. A very run down. Wait a minute, Burnett. That wouldn't be the place that's run by a one-legged soldier they call Bill. Oh, so you know it, do you? Certainly do. By reputation, at least. Here, I want you to look at this picture. You recognize it? Yes, that's the place I'm talking about. I thought so. Mrs. Wallace, I'll take the case. Oh, Mr. Carter, I knew you would. Yes, I have a score to settle with that old rat with a wooden leg. And this may be my chance to do it. All right, Mr. Bennett. Let me have all the details. Well, Vernon, that's Vernon Wallace, my friend. Vernon and I have been making a night of it. And we ended up at this Bill's place. How did you happen to go there? Well, Vernon had heard that it was a great place for a fast poker game, and he was determined to try it. I'd heard it was a pretty tough place, and I attempted to talk him out of it, but I couldn't do it. So about 1.30 or 2 o'clock this morning, we went down there. We were the only ones there. To make a long story short, Vernon and that old guy who owns the place got into a game, and no matter what the old guy did, Vernon won. I was afraid for him in a dive like that, and I tried to get him to quit and go home with me, but he refused told me to get out and leave him alone. And Vernon hasn't been home since then. And he he hasn't been seen anywhere since then. Afraid that he... that he never left that place alive. Well, I see. The place to start looking for clues is certainly the old soldier's tavern. I'm going down there tonight. I know enough tricks with cards so that I can be sure of winning. 
And maybe old Pegleg will try to treat me as he treated Vernon Wallace. Well, stranger, I gotta admit I'm lit. You broke the bank. Yes, luck's been with me ever since I sat down here. Well, it's getting late. I've got to be getting home. Uh, how about a drink before you go, stranger? You'll not refuse me that. Why, no. I'll have a drink with you. But only one. Sure, sure. One will be okay. Hey, Mike, two beers. Make it snappy. Yeah, coming up. You won all my money tonight, stranger, but I don't harbor no ill feelings. Nice of you. You won fair and square, and that's all there is to it. Here's your beer. Uh, here you are, stranger. Drink hearty. Excuse me, stranger. I'll be back before you can shake a stick. Well, that's all right. I'll enjoy my drink while you're gone. Uh, stranger, Mike and I have taken a fancy to you. We don't want no harm to come to you. Look, why don't you stay here all night? Mike's got an extra bed upstairs he'd be glad to let you have. Then tomorrow you can go home and nobody will bother you. Well... Well, if you let me pay for the use of the room and bed, I believe I will. Stay. Good, you're a smart man, but we couldn't take no money for doing you a favor. Uh, Here, Mike, show the gentleman his room. Yeah, sure. Will you follow me, Mister? Oh, uh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, I want to get to bed. I'm, I'm tired all of a sudden. Uh, give me your arm, Mister. No, 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 no. I'm all right. I, I don't need any help. Well, I'll come along just to be sociable. I don't want to be sociable. I just want to go to sleep. Well, here's your room, mister. I'll leave a candle on the table for you. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Good night. There you are, stranger. Sleep tight. Yeah. We'll see you later. Yeah, we'll see you later. Yeah, I'll see you later. Good night, good night. I gotta go to sleep. I'm off. Well, got myself into this easy enough. Hope I'll find it as easy to get out again when the time comes. Uh, no light, but a candle. One it'll do to give me a look around. Instead of this bed. Uh, it doesn't look too comfortable. But, oh, blood. Let's see. The man were lying on this bed. That blood is just about where a dagger would go through his heart. The man were drunk enough or had been drugged, you'd never know what hit him. Well, let's look around here. Yes. I wonder what's in this closet. Uh huh. Locked. Well, that won't keep me out long. Not as long as I still have my keys with me. Try this one. Nope. Ah, this one does it. Well, this is interesting. Old clothes. Here's a vest with blood on it. And here's a shirt and a jacket. Both of them bloody. Unquestionably, these came from some of the victims. Well, nothing to do now but wait for that one-legged scoundrel and his pal to make the next move. <sighs> and I guess I'll be safe if I merely sit on the edge of the bed now. Oh, yes, I won't need this candle anymore either. Now to wait for them. He's asleep, all right. I can hear him snoring. Well, with the slug I put in his bed, he'd have to be even sleeping a dead. All right. Easy does it. Is he still asleep? Yeah. He hold this light while I... Get your hands up, both of you. Well, well I'll be... And drop that knife you got in your hand, Bill. How... How can you be awake when we... Really very simple, Bill. Keep those hands up. I just poured that drink you gave me on the floor instead of down my throat. What are you going to do with us? I'm going to turn you over to the police. The evidence of the bloody clothes in the closet and what other evidence they'll undoubtedly find when they search this place, you both should have an interesting time of it. Why don't you kill us now and be done with it? Because I want some information first. Why should we tell you anything? Because if you do, I shall probably be able to get your sentence reduced somewhat. If you don't... I got you. What do you want to know? Last night, a young man won all your money. He hasn't been seen since. You mean that fellow with a little mustache? I do. You murder him the way you try to murder me? I didn't know nothing with him. 
Maybe I wanted to, but I didn't. Isn't it a fact that this chap's friend tried to get him to leave you and go home? Yeah. And when he wouldn't go, the friend finally went off without him? Oh, that's a lie. They left here together. What? You trying to tell me one of them didn't leave before the other? No, they went out together. You know where they went? How should I know? There was a taxi waiting right outside the door here. Seemed to be waiting for them to come out. Then the guy with the money gets inside and his friend sits in front with the driver. Oh, friend sat in front with the driver, huh? But you know that cab if you saw it again. Sure, it had a big dent in the back of the body. Painted with red lead. I've seen him around this part of the city before. I see. Well, Bill, as soon as I can turn you and your pal over to the law, I'll have Penny find that taxi with the dent in the back. Trail seems to lead direct to him. Nick Carter's office. Oh, hello, Patsy. Is Penny there yet? Penny? Who's Penny? Oh, I forgot, Patsy. You were away yesterday when all this happened. Scrappy got a rush assignment to cover the Balkan campaign for his paper and had to leave in a boat to let sail last night. Scrappy gone without saying goodbye to me? Well, he couldn't, Patsy. You weren't here. He asked me to do it for him. Oh, Nick, I'm going to miss Scrappy. Of course, Patsy. We'll both miss him. But while he's away, I'm having Penny Eagles work on my cases with me in Scrappy's place. Who's this Penny Eagles? I never heard of him. Oh, he's an old friend of mine. Very clever fellow. When he was younger, he was an expert forger. How did you happen to get mixed up with him? Well, he was accused of a murder he had nothing to do with. And he had me come clear. Then he got interested in law enforcement, turned over a new leaf, and has gone straight ever since. You like him, Patsy? I hope so. Well, she'll be in a minute now. As soon as he shows up, have him call me at Shermore 31222. Shermore 31222. Right. I'll wait here for his call. Right, Penny. That's the taxi we're looking for. And I know that driver. You do? Yes. John Hagen, ex-convict and confidence man. Friend of yours? Hardly. Seen him in court several times, but he's never seen me. What's he been doing since you've been watching him? Well, all afternoon in the early part of this evening, he's acted like any other cabbie. Taking whatever fares he could get. But the latter part of the evening, he's been fussy about who rides in his cab. How do you mean? Well, I've seen several parties try to take his cab. But all he's picked up in the last two hours were two drunks, and oh, were they pie-eyed. I see. I think I know what he's looking for, Penny. And I'm going to give him just the kind of a passenger I think he wants. Wish me luck. But, Nick, what are you going to do? Well, so long, old fellow. i got to be getting home now. I'll see you tomorrow, maybe, huh? Okay. So long, but don't take any wooden nickel. <laughs> okay, pal, that's fine. Don't take a wooden nickel. <laughs> I, I have to. Hey, taxi, mister? Taxi? Taxi, hey, mister? Hey, what do I want a taxi for? I got a well, car of my own. A friend of yours I... told me to come for you and take you home. Oh, a friend of mine. Yeah. Oh, and I saw it. It's okay. Where's the, where's the door? I can't find hey, what's the address, mister? Uh, the address? It's um, the, the, the corner of 2nd and 5th. And don't bother me anymore, but I got to get me some sleep. Okay. Yes, Try one, Mick. The... Now, I'll wager it won't be towards second and fifth. Wait a minute. What's that smell? Perfume? I know. That's ether. So that's the stunt. He picks up drunks who are too far gone to know what's happening, then doses them with just enough ether to put them soundly asleep. Well, it won't happen to me. If I open one of these windows a little bit, that'll keep the air clear. There. Now, Mr. Hagen, the next move is up to you. Certainly plenty deserted way out here. Wonder how much further we're going. I better get this window shut again so he won't suspect anything. So we're near the end of our journey, huh? Very well, Mr. Hagen. I'm ready for you. (laughs) Sleeping like a babe, ain't you? Well, let's see what you got in your pockets. Then I'll dump you. Make a move, Hagen, and I'll blow your brains out. What? Who the deuce are you? I'm a detective. See this? Well, what you want with me? I wanted to find out what your scheme was, and I found out. Now I want you to tell me about the man you picked up at Peg Lake Bill's Tavern down on West Street last night about 3 o'clock. 
I don't know nothing about it. Oh, no? Look, you waited for him outside of Bill's place. He rode in back. His companion rode up front with you. During the ride, you gave him ether through that devilish device you rigged up in this taxi of yours and made him unconscious. Yeah, if you, if you know all that, why do you ask me, huh? Because there are two things I don't know. And if you want to avoid further trouble, my friend, you'll tell me. Now, first, who was the man who rode up front with you? I don't know. No? No. Ah, uh, well, uh, I've done a few odd jobs for him in the past, but... Yeah, well, I don't know his name. They call him the captain. He made a deal with me early last night to be outside of Bill's place at about 2.30 this morning. Can you describe him? He's sort of an ordinary guy. About my size, maybe. Well, he's kind of good looking. If he, if he didn't have a hunk out of one ear. Burnett. Now, what did you do with the man who was in the back? After I quieted him, we took him to a friend of the captain's, other side of town. What was the address to which you took the body? Hey, there wasn't no body. He's just as alive as you or me. Now he took him to 14 Wanton Place. Left him. All right. Get back in your cab and drive me to 2nd and 5th. Then I'm through with you, unless you've lied to me. You have, keep out of my way, or you'll go to jail for life. This is where Mrs. Wallace lives, Patsy. Well, I hope she's home. But, Nick, what do you expect to find out here? I don't know, Patsy. The thing that puzzles me about this case is why Burnett wanted to do away with Wallace. The bell, will you? Mm-hmm. It wasn't the money that Wallace won that tempted Burnett. As he could have taken that while Wallace was unconscious. Now there's a stronger reason. And you hope Mrs. Wallace can throw some light on it? I hope so, Patsy. If she can only help me that way. Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. Won't you come in? Thank you, Mrs. Wallace. May I present my assistant, Patsy Bowen? How do you do, Miss Bowen? Hello, Mrs. Wallace. Please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me, Mr. Carter, have you found out anything about my husband? Well, nothing definite, I'm sorry to say. We have learned, though, that he fell into bad hands. But we don't know what happened to him after that. Oh, Arthur assured me you'd find out the truth if anyone could. Arthur? Oh, you mean Mr. Burnett? Yes. Yes, he's been so kind to me. He's done so much to cheer me up. Oh, except for his kindness, I'd have gone crazy. You've known him long, Mrs. Wallace? All my life. We were brought up together. And then, too, he and my husband have been business partners for, oh, the best of friends for years. You think a great deal of him, then? Yes, indeed. Mr. Carter, at one time before I met Vernon, I would have married him, if he'd asked me. Then I met Vernon and really fell in love with him. But even after I married Vernon, Arthur continued to be my best friend. I think very highly of him. And you're lucky to have such a friend, Mrs. Wallace. But he could never take my husband's place. You must find Vernon, Mr. Carter. If it's possible to find him, Nick will do it. Yes, Mrs. Wallace. You may rely on me for that. Well, shall we be running along now, Patsy? Where did you say you're calling from, Penny? I'm at a pay station near the house where Hagen left Wallace that night. It's owned by a queer old character they call the Weasel. He works in a crematory about a mile down the road. I see. Well, Hagen's story seems to be straight enough. A couple of guys in a saloon near here says they saw the weasel and another guy carrying a man-sized bundle into the weasel's place about daybreak a couple of mornings ago. And it hasn't come out again, as far as I can find out. Well, did you learn anything about the firm of Wallace and Burnett? Yeah, yeah, I picked up a lot of rumors, Nick, but not many facts. Here's how it goes. Burnett ruins the firm and throws the blame on Wallace. And those who know don't think that Burnett lost much money when the firm failed, but Wallace did. So I was right. What else? Well, Burnett was the one who started Wallace gambling and drinking. Wallace is a nice guy, but he seems to be the weak sister. But nobody seems to know what Burnett's got against him. By putting together what Mrs. Wallace told us and what you've learned, Penny, I think I begin to see the answer. I think that... Hold it, Nick. A guy who looks like Burnett is going into the weasel's place. Good. Don't let him get away from you, Penny. I'll meet you there as soon as I can. They did bring that casket here to the crematory. I thought they would. But I wish I could get closer and see what they did with it after they carried it inside. Look, Nick. That window over there is open a little. Huh? Maybe we could hear something from there. Good idea, Penny. Come on. But quiet. Yeah. But, Weasel, are you sure they won't be suspicious? Not a chance, Captain. That's why we're doing this tonight. The owners of the crematory are going to make a test of a new heating fixture tomorrow morning. 
And they told me to have the ovens hot by 10 o'clock. I'm just getting them hot a little ahead of time. Uh, what do you use when you make a test like that? Well, they sent me the body of a dead calf. It's over there in the closet. Yeah, but the test we're going to make tonight will be even better, eh, Captain? Yes. How does this thing work? Oh, simple. The body's laid here on this slab and strapped down the way you saw me fix this fella. In the next room, there's a lever attached to the slab. When the lever's pulled, the slab slides into the oven. The door closes behind it, and the destruction of the body begins. Do we have to to watch it burn? You can't see the slab nor the ovens from the room where the lever is. How long does it take to reduce the body to ashes? Six or eight hours. It'll be all over by daylight. Even if the body isn't... You mean uh, even if... The body ain't dead yet? Yes, that's what I mean. And Wallace is still alive. Well, it's a little unusual to cremate a live body, but it works just the same. You'll never know what happened. It'll be all over in an instant. Well, we got nothing more to do here. Might as well go in the next room and wait for the ovens to get hot enough. Uh, Then you can pull the lever and slide the body. You mean I have to pull the lever that sends him into... Sure! He's your friend, Eddie. Come on, Penny. There's no time to waste. We have to work fast. Mr. Burnett, to see you, Nick. Oh, yes. Come in, Mr. Burnett. I just want to take enough of your time to tell you that Vernon Wallace's body was found last night. Really? Where was it? Floating in the river. Mrs. Wallace has identified it by a ring and certain other articles found on the body. Must have been a terrible blow to her. She's badly broken up, naturally. But I hope to be able to console her, in part at least, for her great loss. I'm sure you will. Uh, Will this repay you for your trouble? Oh, amply, Mr. Burnett. And thank you. Good. Good day, Mr. Carter. Good day, Mr. Burnett. But if you think I'm going to drop this case now, Mr. Burnett, you're crazy. Nick, here I am, over here. I got here as soon as I could after I got your call, Penny. About my new helper, too, as you see. Yeah, so I see. Hi there, helper. Hello, Penny. I hope I'm going to be able to help you and Nick. You'll do all right on this case. Now, what's the dope, Penny? Well, a couple of hours ago, a taxi pulls up in front of Mrs. Wallace's house. Mm -hmm. The driver goes into the house. About 15 minutes later, he comes out again with Mrs. Wallace and her maid. They get in the cab, drive away. With you after him, of course. That's right. Well, they drive around and finally end up way out here. There must have been a couple of guys in the cab when the women got in. Because when they got out there, they were both gagged and their hands were tied behind them. Well, they took them in the old house. I found a phone to call you. Did they hurt them? Well, not so far as I could tell. Gee, I wish I could see what they're doing now. I hope they're all right. Millie, this is terrible. My mouth is still sore from that dirty old cloth they used for a gag. Where do you suppose we are? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Wallace. I've never been this far from town before. Could you see anything out of the window? Nothing I recognize. Oh, I should have known better than to be fooled by such a simple trick. I might have known that old Mrs. Parker couldn't be so sick she had to see us at once. Why, I saw only the day before yesterday. No, fool me, all right. I thought... I hope Uh, you're comfortable, ladies. We are not. We certainly are not. What's the idea of bringing us here? Well, I'll tell you. The chap says as how he's going to collect some big dough from you two. You mean we're being held for ransom? Yep. Well, how much money do you want? Well, the chap says he won't take less than fifty. $50,000. $50,000. Oh, Mrs. Wallace, we'll never get out of here. Nonsense. <laughs> he must be insane to expect me to pay him that amount of money. Well, he says he won't take a cent less. Well, he won't get it. Never. And he's a dangerous man. You better not get him mad at you. I'll be back at 8 o'clock tonight for your answer. Oh, he'll kill us. I know he will. Be quiet, <laughs> Millie. He won't kill us as long as he thinks there's any chance of getting the money out of us. But what if we get... A man at the window. It's Mr. Burnett. Oh, Arthur. 
Pat, I hoped you'd come. Are you... Are you safe, Louise? Have they hurt you? No, Arthur. We're both safe. But how did you ever find us? I just climbed up the porch to the roof. Then over to your window. <gasps> Have they told you why they brought you here? Yes. They want ransom. Fifty thousand dollars. And they'll kill us if you don't save us. Not while I'm here. I'll see that no harm comes to you. But what can you do? You're only one against the two of them. And they're both vicious criminals, I know. Do be careful, Arthur. Louise. If I save you from these rats, do you think that you... Ask me later, Arthur. Not now, please. Very well, if you say so. Now, tell me, what time are the men coming back again? Do you know? The man we talked to said they'd be here at 8 o'clock. That gives us just over an hour. Now, here's my plan. When they come, I'll be here... Now, you each know what you're supposed to do, don't you? Sure, Nicky, sure. You know, this ought to be fun. I haven't played cops and robbers since I was a kid. Same here. This should be good. Well, I hope you two aren't disappointed. But you can't tell about these things. So watch your step, both of you. Here they are. Leave everything to me. Well, you made up your mind to pay the ransom the cab wants? We'll pay you nothing. Not a cent. You know what that means, don't you? It means that you better get your hands up, all three of you, if you want to live. Who are you? I'm here to save these two ladies from you and your gang. Oh, yeah? Let him have it, fella. Oh, I warned you. Hey. Ah. Arthur, you've killed them all. It's their own fault. I warned them. Oh, you were wonderful, Arthur. Oh, Arthur, are you hurt? No, Louise, dear. Fortune was with me. I'm not even scratched. Oh, Mr. Burnett, I, well, I never in my whole life saw anyone so brave as you. Any man would be brave when defending the woman he loves. Please, Arthur, you promised. I'm sorry. I'll take you home now. Just let me drag these bodies out of the way and I'll... Not yet, you won't. Wait, you can't. <laughs> What's the matter with you men? What's the idea? Shut up, you. Arthur, are you hurt? Mrs. Wallace... The time has come to explain a great many things. First, let me remove this beard. There. You recognize me now, don't you? Mr. Carter! Nick Carter! Oh, Mr. Carter, what are you doing to Arthur? Mr. Burnett? I'll answer that later. First, I want you to meet my assistant, Penny Eagles. Your assistant? Sure. How are you? The other man is an old friend of yours, Mrs. Wallace. An old friend of mine? Mm -hmm. Why, well, I'm sure I don't or perhaps know... if you took off his makeup, you might recognize him. There. Do you know me now? Bernard! Oh, Vernon. Oh, Louise, my darling. But Vernon, Arthur told me that you... That I was dead? Oh, yes. Arthur Burnett told you a great many things that were not true. But Vernon, he showed me your ring, your lodge pin. He, he said he took them off of your dead body that the police found in the river. Burnett took those articles from your husband's body, right enough, Mrs. Wallace. But it was while your husband was still alive. And it's no fault of his that I'm not dead now. You don't mean that Arthur... That's Arthur... exactly what I do mean. He's been lying to you for years, Mrs. Wallace. It was he who ruined your husband's business and caused him to lose so much of his money. It was he who first induced your husband to drink and gamble. And it was he who was responsible for your husband's disappearance a few days ago. But that's a lie. Oh, no, it isn't. As a matter of fact, Louise, dear, if Mr. Carter hadn't fooled him by putting a dead calf in my place on that crematory slab, Arthur Burnett would have been my murderer. Oh, no. No, that can't be true. Uh, Furthermore, it was Burnett who arranged for your kidnapping this afternoon. Oh, but... He did it so that he could suddenly appear and rescue you from the members of the kidnap gang, who in reality men in his employ. But why should he do all these horrible things? Because he's been in love with you ever since he first met you. And ever since your marriage to Wallace, he's been insanely jealous of him. Everything Burnett's done has been to make you despise your husband and turn instead to him. That's a lie, Carter. Oh, no, it isn't, Burnett. I can easily prove it. Penny, let me have the gun with this Burnett shot us during the battle a few minutes ago. Sure, Nick. Here you are. Thanks. Now look here, Mrs. Wallace. This pistol has eight shells in it. Burnett fired five shots at us, but there are still three shells left. And here they are. Why, those are blanks. They couldn't hurt anybody. Exactly, Mrs. Wallace. And the shells and the pistols that his men were to use in the fights were blanks also. And if I were a beautiful woman in distress and a man came to my rescue with his pistol loaded with blanks, I think I should find it extremely difficult to believe that he was being on the level with me. That 
was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called The Body on the Slab, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband, another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, how about a few hints on next week's story? It's a story of a body which was washed up on the beach, tied up in a sack. And the only identifying mark on the body was one of Nick's cards. I had to solve that murder to prove I didn't do it myself. And I found that the real culprit was the killer who used a clue that pointed directly to him to prove that he couldn't have done it. And the killer tried to down both Nick and myself when the chase got too warm for comfort. But as you can easily see, he didn't succeed. So, so long until next week. So long, folks. And so long to you and Nick for now, Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious expenditure of Nick Carter entitled... The Drug Ring Murder. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Left-Handed Killer. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... The Drug Ring Murder. Or Nick Carter... And the mystery of the left-handed killer. Well, Mr. Nicholas Carter, are you going to answer your telephone, or are you going to take me out to lunch, as you promised? There's no reason why I can't do both, Patsy. Nick Carter speaking. Dick, this is Riley at headquarters. Oh, how are you, Lieutenant? There goes my It's on your mind. Right. Murder. And you're right in the middle of it, Nick. Meet me at the city morgue as quick as you can. I'm waiting here. What's the matter, Riley? Can't headquarters solve this case without me? Who said anything about your solving the case? You get yourself down to the morgue right away, and that's an order. An order, Riley? What are you talking about? The body of a man was washed up on the beach this morning, only he didn't die from drowning. It was murder. Yes? There was no identification on the body. None at all. Except one of your business cards. Nick Carter, private detective. What? I hid the card in my pocket as soon as I laid eyes on it. But there's a chance one of the reporters saw it before I did. Now, do I have to draw you a diagram? You've already done it. I'll be there in the double rally. Bye. What's up, Nick? Plenty. Look, Patsy, hold on the office until you hear from me. I'll call you within an hour. I knew you shouldn't have answered that phone. Business before pleasure, Patsy. And right now, I've got business at the city morgue. Have you got him, Riley? On a slab out here? Uh, you... He's on ice. Oh. In the box at the end of the room there. And I'm telling you one thing, Nick Carter. It's lucky for you that I was here when he was brought in. Now, look, Riley. Surely you aren't trying to pull me into this thing just because the fellow was carrying one of my cars. Uh... Well, there are probably hundreds of people I never heard of are carrying my name in their vest pockets. Well, if you'd rather be explaining to the captain how your card got on a corpse... Oh, it's... now, take it easy, Riley. Well, you take know what it means for an officer of the law to conceal evidence, Nick. How do I know one of those reporters or photographers isn't telling the captain right now that... Well, let's worry about one thing at a time. Well... You said the body was washed up on the beach on the north shore of Long Island? Yes, it was. Stuffed in a gunny sack with every bit of identification removed. Hmm. Everything was ripped out except a concealed pocket. Yes, I know. With my card in it. Yes. Uh, Here we are. Last box here. Uh, Take a good look, Nick. Yeah, did you ever see him before? Oh, yes. That's Stanley Phillips. Huh? Dr. Stanley Phillips. He's a research chemist. Sort of an eccentric. Oh, oh, balmy, huh? No, no, just strange. 
He's assisted me in a few investigations. But for the most part, he was pretty much of a hermit. Didn't like to mix with people. Yeah, that don't make sense. People who mind their own business don't get and go around getting themselves murdered. Where did he live? There's a big house on a Long Island Sound, but his laboratory was on his yacht. It was anchored about half a mile or so out from the house, if I remember correctly. Laboratory on a yacht? Mm-hmm. Oh, he was balmy. Hey, Riley, look. Here in his neck. Well, what did you expect? I told you he was strangled. The autopsy showed he was dead before he was put into the gunny sack and thrown into the water. I know, but that isn't what I mean. Here, look at the prints in his neck. Closely, look at him. Yeah, yeah, well... Lest I miss my guess, Riley, he was murdered by a left-handed killer. Say, maybe you've got something there, Nick. I'll phone the fingerprint expert... Now, wait a minute, Riley. Let me hit the phone first. got to be in my way. Hey, now, now, don't be forgetting you can't take long on this, Nick. The captain will be wanting to question you about your card being found on the body. I can't hold off more than a few hours. Give me those few hours, Riley, and I'll wrap the murderer up in wax paper. Nicholas Carter's office. Oh, hello, Patsy. I, we got work to do. Yes, Nick? I want you to go through the files and dig out all the stuff we have on Dr. Stanley Phillips. That queer duck who did some work for you once? Yeah, that's the one. Research chemist. Uh-huh. Get all the dope on him and meet me down in front of the office in ten minutes. I'll pick you up. All right, Nick. That's all. Yeah, where are you headed for, Nick? The Phillips estate in Long Island Sound. Meet me there as soon as you get the report on the fingerprints of Stanley Phillips' neck. <laughs> Apparently, neither he nor his sister ever married. After the parents died, they continued to live in the big manor house. What did you say the sister's name was? Rose Phillips. Rose. Go on. Mm, you know all about his laboratory being on his yacht. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be one of the best private laboratories in the country. Used to do a lot of research work for big companies. That's a laboratory assistant, Tom Marks, young man. And let's see what else. Um... Oh, his hobby was writing. Scientific articles they were. Usually about the effects of habit-forming drugs. He had an article in Popular Research last month entitled Morphine Exposed. So he wrote about habit-forming drugs, huh? Hmm. You know, Patsy, this case might turn out to be more than just an ordinary murder. I guess nobody's home, Nick. You're wrong about that, Betsy. Saw the curtains at the window move. Hmm. Pounding on the door isn't going to do any good either. Whoever's in there evidently doesn't want callers today. However... What are you going to do? Open the door. This little lock picker of mine. There it is. All right, come on, Betsy. We're going in. I don't see anybody. Stay behind me. Put your hands up. Over your head. She's got a gun, Nick. You're Rose Phillips, I take it, miss? Keep your hands up. I'm asking the questions. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter, and this Nick is... Nick Carter? Yes. And this is my assistant, Patsy Bone. Nick Carter, the great detective, where my brother often speaks of you. He thinks you're wonderful. Nick, she doesn't know yet. Miss Phillips, I'm sorry to have to tell you like this, but your brother is dead. Dead? Yes. <laughs> I'm afraid he was murdered. <laughs> murdered? Stanley murdered? <laughs> now, if you'll just put that gun away, Miss Phillips, we'll talk things over. Of course, Mr. Carter, I'm sorry. This is all such a shock. It was a fiendish killing. And I'm going to do all I can to bring the criminal to justice. You may be sure of that. Oh, Rose. Rose. I'm in here, Richard. Oh. Well, uh... Who are these people? I thought Stanley told you never to let strangers in the house. It's all right, Richard. This is Nick Carter, the detective, and his assistant. Oh. Well, well that's different. How do you do, Mr. Carter? I'm Richard Coles. I take it you've already heard about Dr. Phillips. Yes. Ghastly, isn't it? I can hardly believe it. The police say it was murder. For the life of me, I can't imagine who would want to murder Stanley. He was a strange man, Mr. Carter. Very strange. He had a phobia about not letting anyone in the house when he was away. You seem to manage an entrance all right, Mr. Coles. Well, I... Mr. Coles is a very old friend of the family and has always had a key to the house. He's our lawyer. Look out, and... Nick! There's someone at the window! He's got a gun! I can't get over it, Nick. You don't seem to be surprised that you were shot at back there in the house. I'm not, Patsy. 
That's why I was standing beside that suit of armor. That protected me by deflecting the bullets. Nick, your presence on the Phillips case is most annoying to someone. Too bad that window was frosted glass. Mm. Couldn't get a look at the gunman. That tiny crack the window was open. Well, now, did you find what I told you to look for in the cottage occupied by Tom Marks, the lab assistant? Yes, I found a pair of his gloves. Good. Had to go through all his desk drawers to find them, too. Let me see them. Mm Mm-hmm. All seems to be adding up. Almost too neatly. Adds up to a pair of gloves. That's all. Look, Patsy. Coles told me back there's something about the terms of Philip's will. If he lived to be 50, his estate was to go to a foundation. If he died before that, Rose was to inherit all the estate. But that makes Rose the... Oh, no, 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 no. I don't suspect Rose. Her grief seemed genuine. But there's something else I learned. Tom Marks, Philip's lab assistant, is in love with Rose. They've been wanting to get married, but Philip's opposed the marriage. Now the field is clear. With oodles of money to boot. But that still doesn't make Tom Marks... Patsy, the... I'm almost certain Phillips was strangled by a left-handed killer. These gloves of Marks you brought me show that he's left-handed. Oh. And that leads us where? Right out to the laboratory in the yacht. I've got to find Tom Marks. Nick, why in the world do you suppose Dr. Phillips had his laboratory way out here in the middle of the sound? There's no mystery to that one, Patsy. He told me why once. Well, why? So people couldn't bother him. I'd have used his technical knowledge a lot more often on cases myself if it more accessible. Well, here we are. This is the Phillips yacht. I'll tie up here. I've never climbed up a rope ladder before. And you're not going up now either. Not until I look around the boat myself. Oh, Nick, am I helping you on this case or not? You are, but I don't want you taking unnecessary chances. Nick, please. Now, quiet a minute, Patsy. Let's see if we can raise somebody from here. Hello, up there. Hello, aboard the Phillips yacht. It's funny. Tom Marks is aboard. He's keeping quiet about it. Well, we'll find out right now. You better stay here in the motorboat. And let you solve this case alone? Not a chance. Okay, okay. But stay directly behind me, remember? (laughs) Phew. Climbing this rope ladder is no cinch. I'm glad I'm not a sailor. Can you make it? Uh Uh-huh. I'm coming. What do you think you'll find, Nick? Tom Marks, I hope. Here. Let me give you a hand over the rail. All right. Oops, Daisy. Oh, thanks. Well, there's nobody to lay out the welcome rug on the deck of this floating laboratory. Well, that doesn't mean we're alone, Patsy. Come on. We're going down this companionway. Okay. I'm not mistaken. It leads to Phillips Laboratory. Mm-hmm. This is the laboratory. All right, Patsy, stay behind me. I'm going to open the door. Hey, Marks. Tom Marks, you in there? All right, Patsy. We can go in. Mm, Tom Marks seems to have vanished, but he certainly left a mess behind him. Yes. Overturned retorts. Bunsen burner knocked over. Hmm, look here on the floor. Hmm, broken bottle. Sulfuric acid spilled and eating into the floor. Yes, this is where Dr. Stanley Phillips met his death, all right. And when the killer came at him, he was sitting at this desk writing. Well, how do you figure that? That bottle of ink tipped over. Wonder if he has any papers here that'll tell us what we want to know. No. Desk's been rifled. Everything of any value has already been taken. It still all adds up to Tom Marks, doesn't it? Yep, seems to. We'll know for sure as soon as Riley gets the report from the fingerprint expert. Nick! Hmm? Nick, come here. Look what I found in the sink. What? This piece of paper. Let's see. Now, that's in Dr. Phillips' handwriting. Well, somebody tried to burn it out. Then they threw it on the drain board of the sink here. Part of it didn't burn. Let's see if I can figure it out. Like you to know, the man whom I have trusted and worked with these many years is, I have discovered, the head of a giant dope peddling ring. Been using my premises to carry on his business. This man is... Nick, the lights have gone off! Patsy. Mm -hmm. Patsy, where are you? Patsy. Nick. You all right, Patsy? Uh, My head. Somebody hit me. Stay where you are. I'll find the switch. Do you have your flashlight? Yeah, I'll find the switch in just a second. Oh, the lights won't work. Uh. It must have been turned off at the master switch in the engine room. 
And that means there's more than one person on this boat besides us. One of them turned off the lights and the other one shot at us in here. You were right when you said you felt everything wasn't okay on this yacht. You able to get up, Patsy? Oh, sure. I'm all right now. Just a big hen's egg on my head, that's all. Okay. Come on. Nick, did they take the note? It's just what I want to find out. Let's see. A flash of light down in the sink. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, but wait. What are you going to do? Clean up the sink a little. Ashes don't look well scattered around in a white sink. Carefully now. No, the... ah, there we are. Now we're ready. Ready for what? To search this yacht from stem to stern. <laughs> What in blazes has been keeping you, Nick? I've been cooling my heels on this dock for the past half hour here. I hope you'll be here, Riley. Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Patsy. Well, say, you look as if you'd seen a ghost on that yacht. I did. Somebody took a shot at us in the dock. What? Patsy got knocked down the fracas and got a nasty bump in her head. Well, say, who did it, Nick? Whoever it was made a neat getaway. Patsy and I searched the ship afterwards from end to end, but didn't find a soul. Did you see anybody coming in from the yacht, Lieutenant? Oh, nary a soul's come in off that boat since I've been here. In fact, the only two people who've been near here was two fishermen. Are you sure they were fishermen? Am I sure? Now, now, look, Nick, don't be giving me that. It was bonafide fishermen, all right. They pulled their little rowboat to shore a ways down the beach, and I saw them bring in their catch. And a nice string of fish it was. Okay, okay, Riley. So they were really fishermen. Well, what about your report, Lieutenant? Oh, oh, that. Well, Nick was right. Our fingerprint expert examined the marks on Dr. Phillips' neck and said he was undoubtedly strangled by a left-handed killer. And now all we've got to do is find a left-handed man who had a reason to murder the doctor. We found him. Uh, well, what's that? Dr. Phillips' laboratory assistant, Tom March, is left-handed. You say you sure worked fast, Nick. And it's a good thing, too. The captain found out about your card being found on the body. Hey, what kind of a scoundrel is this Tom Marks? I don't know. Haven't seen him yet. Wasn't at his cottage, and he wasn't in the lab in the yacht. Well, let's make tracks, Mr. Private Detective, and search the grounds here. Wait a minute, Maybe Riley. We... Wait a minute. There's one thing more you want to know. Huh? Whoever killed Dr. Stanley Phillips is the head of a giant dope ring. Do- Phillips was killed because he was about to expose the man. Hey, that would be the laboratory assistant. He'd have access to drugs. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter. Uh, who in tarnation is that? Richard Coles, close friend of the Phillips and also the lawyer. Oh. O'Reilly, yeah? put this envelope in your pocket. Careful of it. It's a piece of evidence I picked up in the boat. Okay, Nick. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, I've been hunting everywhere for you. Oh, Mr. Coles, this is Lieutenant Riley from headquarters. Oh, I'm glad you're here, Lieutenant. We're up against a dangerous criminal. Uh, don't worry, Mr. Coles. The law always gets its man. What do you want to see me about, Mr. Coles? Rose Phillips. She's gone. Gone? How do you know? Come up to the house with me. I'll show you. Something has happened to her, I'm sure. Hurry! Here. This is Rose's bedroom, Lieutenant. Well... Somebody was making a fast getaway, all right. Yes. Just look at the room. Clothes strewn all over. One of her suitcases is gone, and this suitcase, half-packed, was left behind. She and the laboratory assistant must have been in on this together. If she wasn't guilty, she wouldn't have run away. Oh, she must have been out of her mind. Of course, Rose was in love with Tom, and... Nick. What's the matter, Patsy? What are you frowning at? Rose Phillips didn't run away. Uh, what's it? Didn't run away? What are you saying, Patsy? No girl would run away voluntarily and leave all her makeup behind. Well, look at that dressing table. Nothing's been touched. You're right, Patsy. Say, do you suppose... Oh, no, no. What is it, Mr. Coles? Do you suppose that Tom could have forced her to leave? You mean... You mean kidnap her? Yes. Well, he won't get away with it. I'll call headquarters and have a cordon thrown around this entire district. We'll catch Tom Marks before he gets to the next town. Good idea, Riley. Do that. Well, Mr. Cole? Yes, Mr. Carter? I guess Lieutenant Riley has his case all sewed up. His men will have Tom Marks and Rose Phillips within the hour. Well, Mr. Carter, it was nice of you to take such an interest in my friend's death. Um, would you care for a cigarette? Oh, no, thanks. Uh, you, Lieutenant? Why, why, sure, sure, I don't mind if I do. Of course. Uh, light? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Well, good day, Mr. Coles. Goodbye. Sorry. Come along, Patsy. Hey, uh, where's the telephone, Mr. Coles? There's uh, one right over here on the table. Hurry up, Patsy, we got work to do. I thought you said the case was finished. Not by a long shot. I said that for their benefit. Oh. You and I are going over this estate with a fine-tooth comb. I'm not satisfied yet. <laughs> Ah. 
You see anything, Nick? Come on in. Shut the door. Do you think anyone saw us headed for this boathouse? I hope not. Oh, well, be careful here. Don't step off in the water. Nick, there's a small speedboat in the water. Don't you think they put it in dry dock so late in the season? Depends, Patsy. Look up there, mounted in the bow. A machine gun? Mm-hmm. This boat was used for business. Gee, who'd ever think a quiet little chemist like Dr. Phillips kept a mounted machine gun on a speedboat? I believe this setup down here was news to Dr. Phillips, too. Hold on to my arm. We'll look around. Oh, Nick, don't step on the fish. String of fish? Oh, dear. Nick, those fishermen Riley saw must have come in here. Patsy, this catch isn't fresh. What? Those men used the string of dead fish just to fool Riley. And those were the men who made trouble for us on the yacht. Yeah, they must have been. Well, plenty of life preservers stacked up in here. Yeah, that's strange. Here, Betsy. Hmm? Take the flashlight and play it on this one. Okay. Well, what are you doing, taking it to pieces? No, just examining it. Aha! There we have it. What? A small waterproof pocket's been sewn in here. Yes, and it extends all the way around inside this life preserver. Pretty clever. Look, Betsy. What is it? These secret compartments are filled with dope. I bet every one of these life preservers is filled with drugs. Nobody would ever think of looking in a life preserver for evidence. I think Dr. Phillips did. And that's why he was murdered. <laughs> Okay, Patsy? Yes, but I can't stop crying. Well, that's not surprising. Somebody threw a tear gas bomb through the window. Oh. That's right, friends. It was tear gas. Who's there? <laughs> Pretty clever of me using the tools of my trade that way, isn't it, Mr. Carter? But Tom Marks is always clever. So you're Tom Marks, huh? I've been waiting to set my eyes on you. It's too bad your eyes are filled with tear gas. Because now you'll never have that pleasure. Okay, Pete. Come in and get the lady. Right. I'll take care of Mr. Carter myself. Hey, hey, come on, <laughs> hey, come on, sister. Let her go along. Here, let her go along. Uh, <laughs> you got those iron weights in the bag, Pete? Sure, both of them. This guy will never be washed up on a beach like the doc was. <laughs> good. See you tied a bag good and tight. You know, I think he's passed out. He ain't moving none. I did a job on him before we put him in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen to that dame, will you? <laughs> Sounds like a hoot owl with a cold in the head. <laughs> Shut up. Oh, no. Oh, tighten the gag, Pete. Okay. <laughs> hey. That'll do it. Hey. Say, Carter ain't dead. What does it take to kill that guy? I choked him like a rat and he's still talking. All right. All right. Speak your piece, Mr. Carter, because you don't have much longer. You're not going to get away with this. <laughs> you hear what he said? I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> I doubt it, Mr. Carter. You're going straight down to Davy Jones' locker. You'll pay for this. I'll have you behind bars within 24 hours. Uh, listen to him. What do you fellas think you're going to do with Patsy Bowen? He's worrying about a dame when he's going <laughs> to lose his own neck. Go <laughs> easy with her. I'm warning you. Uh, Come on, let's get rid of him. Okay. It's dark enough now. All right. You got him? Yes. All right, All lift right. him up. That's it. I'll get you, one, fellas, for this. Two, two three. three. Uh, let her go. I came as soon as I got your flashlight signal from the shore, Nick. You think the criminals are aboard the yacht here now? You'll see in a minute. The laboratory's right down this companionway. Hey, you're dripping wet from head to foot, Nick. What happened? Well, they tried to pull the same trick on Nick that they pulled on Dr. Phillips. Ah. Only it didn't work, because Nick can expand his neck and wrist muscles. Yes, I had my hands free before I hit the water. There was no trick at all to cut my way out of the sack. And then I clung to the back of their motorboat until it reached the yacht here. I waited for the would-be killers to get aboard, untied Patsy, and here we are. Ah, you're lucky, Nick. He's smart, that's all. Quiet. This is the door. Keep your gun ready. All right. Good evening, Mr. Coles. What? Oh, Nick Carter. Well, come in, Mr. Carter. 
These two friends of mine and myself were just discussing whether you had found the criminals. I think we have, Mr. Gold. Good, good. There's just one thing more I need to make sure I have the criminals. Riley. Yeah? Give me that envelope I asked you to keep for me. Oh, sure, sure, Nick. Uh, here you are. Thanks. Now, I'll just take the piece of burned paper out of this envelope. Are well, those the pieces you gathered from the drain board? Yes, Betsy. They were from the note Stanley Phillips wrote just before he was murdered. Now, I'll just use some of these chemicals in the burned paper. Oh. You see, gentlemen, even though this piece of paper's been burned, it is possible by using the correct chemical solution to bring out the writing that was on the paper before it was burned. In this case, I expect the writing will give the name of the man Phillips designated as head of the giant drug ring. And his killer. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Yes, here it comes. The chemicals are beginning to act. The writing is beginning to show up. Good. The name is... Nick, look out! Oh, you got this one! Get out of here! Man, I got these two thugs, Nick. Knocked them out cold. Sorry I had to plug in the shoulder cold, but I had to put you out of action. Now, Riley, there's your murderer. Uh, so it was Coles who did it. You're right, Carter. I killed him. Uh, the powers be praised, Nick. I thought Tom Marks was the killer. Coles had me fooled too, Riley. Until this afternoon when he came running down from the house. And then I noticed his feet were wet, as if he'd been in waiting. Then he was one of the men on the yacht, one of the fishermen Riley saw. Right, Patsy. And another thing. The man who strangled me in the boathouse claimed to be Tom Marks. But Tom Marks is left-handed. The man who tried to strangle me used his right hand. And you knew Phillips was murdered by a left-handed man. That's right. I knew I was after a left-handed murderer. O'Reilly, huh? did you notice that when Coles lighted your cigarette for you this afternoon in Rose's room, he used his left hand? She... By golly, he did. Then, then, then he's left-handed, too. Right. When I saw him do that, I knew he was the killer. But I had to make him prove it. Oh, you did that all right. That business about making the writing stand out on a piece of paper after it's burned is a new one to me, Nick. Nick, can you actually do that? Well, it can be done under ideal conditions. But this time, I was just putting on an act for Mr. Coles' benefit. You mean you didn't actually make any writing appear on the burned paper? Not a word, Mr. Coles. And I fell for it like a sap. Nick. Hmm? What's that? Well, I'm not sure, Patsy, but I have a hunch. It's locked, Nick. Oh, Patsy, since when did a locked door ever stop Nick Carter? Quite right, Riley. When did it? This is no time for it to start. So, this one ought to do the trick. There we are. Nick Carter. Oh, thank heaven, Rose. This man with you is Tom Marks, Miss Phillips? Yes, I am. They were going to kill us, Mr. Carter. They tied us up and threw us in here. We heard them planning to throw us overboard. Have you been imprisoned in here all this time, Mr. Marks? Uh, No, not quite. I got a telephone call last night summoning me into the city to pick up some chemicals Dr. Phillips and I needed in an experiment. I was slugged as I stepped out of the car. And when I came too late this afternoon, I I was in here. And so was Rose. Uh, That cause was a smart one. Throwing suspicion on you and then trying to get rid of you in order to make it look as if you'd run away. Smart, but not smart enough for Nick. Well, Riley, you've got your murderer. I have that. And Rose, you and Tom are safe. Yes, thanks to you. And I guess that's that. Oh, no, Nick. You still have to solve my case. Well, what's that, Patsy? That luncheon date you promised me. Oh. Where are you and I going to have lunch at this hour? Why, uh... Oh, say, that's easy, Patsy. I know a swell place in town, right across from the morgue. Come on. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called The Drug Ring Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Left-Handed Killer. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, what can you tell us about next week's story? When a young man who was a very good friend of mine arrived in town to claim his bride, he suddenly became aware that she was not the girl to whom he'd become engaged. You mean she wasn't his fiancée? That was the question that started off the whole case. Yes, indeed. Because we couldn't be sure whether the girl he loved was really the girl he loved, we prevented two murders and saved a gigantic fortune from disappearing. But you didn't save me from disappearing, Nick. Oh, quite true, Patsy, but... After all, you weren't gone very long before we found you. But I'm sure glad you found me when you did, or I might not be here now. So long, folks. Get the rest of the story next week. Right. So long. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Connery. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor.
Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Substitute Bride, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Night Ferry. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. I have a little office on Broadway at 53rd Street. And if you happen to be in the neighborhood sometime, you might notice a sign on the door. It reads, Diamond Detective Agency. Yeah, that's how I make a living, such as it is. I sit at my desk behind that door and wait for someone to come in and hire me. Eventually, trouble works its way into someone's life and gives him a shove in my direction. He tells me about it, and I listen with the attitude of a father confessor. When he's done, I dry my eyes and tell him what I think. What I think really doesn't matter, because it's just a shortcut to a hundred dollars a day in expenses. Sure, you can hire a guy for less money, but when I work, it's for a price I figure I'm worth. It's got to be that way because sometimes it works a little dirty, and I have to swallow a lot of pride. I get mixed up in everything from simple divorce to muscle-bound homicide, and when trouble can't find me a client, it starts working on yours truly, and I wind up in a corner. I guess trouble figured I was just about due for a squeeze play because one night last week, two lifers in the state pen started working me into their plans. What about it, Walsh? Shut up. Wait until the guards pass. Okay. Drag out the cards like we was playing. Sure. Is it uh, set for the night? Yeah. I got the car and everything. Yeah. We'll head for Florida and get across to Cuba. Oh, I'd be glad to get out of this uh, three lousy years. Yeah, I got eight behind me. I used every minute figuring how I'm going to take care of a guy. Oh, Walsh, you're not going to start that again. Forget it. Be glad you're getting out. You knock off that guy and you'll never make it to Cuba. Now, look. I figured this whole thing out. I paid out a lot of dough just to make it come off. And when it does, I'm going to kill an ex-cop. And you're going to help me. Me? Yeah. Unless you want to rot here. Oh, you're out of your mind. If this break comes off, it'll be the neatest trick in years. And you want to louse it up by knocking off some guy on the outside? You can stay here and rot if you want to. The only way I take you along is you help me to get a guy named Diamond. Yeah, but you waste a lot of time in New York. You'll have the roads covered by then. Look, just because this Diamond guy knocked off your brother and that bank... Yeah, job, you see, you, you bust out of here, it's on my terms. I... Now make up your mind, it's getting late. Okay. Give me the layout. Yeah, what is it, Otis? We just got a call, Lieutenant. Two prisoners busted out of Sing Sing, killed two guards. Who are they? Big time. Bob Wells and Charles Walsh. Charles Walsh? Yeah, lifer. I know, I know. Diamond helped send him up before I took over this department. Otis, get Diamond on the phone. Diamond? Yeah, Diamond. Who'd you think I meant? Little Red Riding Hood? Yeah, yeah Lieutenant. Mm, oh, Diamond, Otis. Bring me my bike card, and Otis. Someday I'm going to get good and sore. What did you say? Uh, nothing. Huh? 
Ah, uh, nuts. Now, what's the matter? His office don't answer. Give me that phone. Huh? We've got to find him before Walsh does. Maybe he's over at Helen Asher's house. All right, Otis, stop standing on one foot. You can leave. Miss Asher's residence. Hello, Francis. This is Lieutenant Levinson. Is Diamond there? Why, no, sir, but Miss Asher expects him. Oh, oh wait a moment, sir. Here's Miss Asher. It's Lieutenant Levinson for Mr. Diamond, Miss Helen. Oh, thank you, Francis. Hello, Walt. How are you, Helen? I was looking for Rick. Oh, I was just talking to him. He should be here in about 20 minutes. Why? Uh, will you have him call me right away? Is something wrong? Oh, no, no. Just tell him... Tell him an old friend of his is in town and I have to talk to him about it. Oh, all right, Walt. I'll tell him. Well, thanks, Helen. It'll be at least 20 minutes. He's walking over from his office. Okay, Diamond, hold it right there. Start walking over to that sedan. Don't you know it's not polite to point? Look, laughing boy, I got a big gun in my pocket. Well, I'm proud of you. I thought it was a crossbow. Get moving. Okay. I'd never seen him before. He was a tall guy with a scar in his chin. He walked me over to the sedan and opened the door. He moved in close and shook me down. He relieved me of my thirty-eight and motioned me into the front seat. I slid in and he started to follow, so I kept one leg out in front of me and kicked him in the face. I couldn't get enough leverage to cool him, but it gave me enough time to get out the other door and start making like a miler. I looked over my shoulder and saw him climb out holding a bloody nose. I knew he wouldn't take a shot unless he got close enough to make it count. So when he started after me, I ducked into the subway. I found a dime and went through the turnstile. The train was getting ready to pull out, so I pushed my way on just as the gunnet came down the stairs. He said he wasn't happy to see me go. He didn't even wave goodbye. Wait a minute, you! Wait! Oh, nuts. No. You and your swell ideas. What's the matter? I waited for Diamond outside his office, like you said. I started to hustle him in the car, and he kicked me in the face. Oh. I think my nose is you broken. You stupid... I told you to be careful. Yeah, sure you did. You think I like getting booted in the nose? Look, if you want Diamond so much, you get him yourself. Maybe you can tell me how you're going to get to Cuba without me? Huh? Oh. Well... What do you want me to do now? I still want Diamond. Yeah, but he jumped the subway train. How am I supposed to find her? I found out he's got a dame over on Park Avenue. Pick her up, bring her over here. Pick her up? I'd give you the chair for kidnapping. I'll use her to get Diamond. Pick her up if you want to get out of the country. Yeah, but a now, snitch... Look, I it... busted you out of store. I can bust you right back in. No. Now, pick her up. Her name is Helen Asher. She lives at 975 Park. Well, what if someone else is there? What if there is? You want me to stop over making a fourth for bridge? Get him out of the way and bring the dame to me. Hello, Otis. Well, Diamond. Lieutenant's been looking all over the city for you. I bet you've been a nervous wreck. I wouldn't care if you fell off the George Washington Bridge, Shamus. Why, Otis? And after all, we've been to each other. Uh, nuts. You better go on in and see the lieutenant. Sure. Hey, uh, Sergeant. Yeah? When are you going to get some new shoes? If yours turn up anymore in front, you'll have to ski to work. Uh, Hello, Walt. Rick, we've been looking all over for you. Why don't you cops get on the job? It's getting so it isn't safe for a citizen to walk the streets at high noon. What are you yakking about? Well, I leave my office to go to see Helen and some goon tries to hold me up. Well, you're lucky you didn't get it right then. Do you know who busted out of jail last night? Go on, scare me. Charles Walsh. He swore if he ever did bust out, he'd get you. Wow. That explains something. Why, what happened? This character tries to hustle me into a car, so I shoved my foot in his face and beat it into a subway. But it wasn't Walsh. Might have been Bob Wells. He busted out with him. I can tell you in a minute, got a file on him? Sure. Otis, bring in the file on Bob Wells. By the way, Lieutenant. Oh, Walt, do you mind if I use your phone? No, go ahead. I better call Helen. Tell her I'm going to be a little late. Well, I just talked to her and asked her to have you call. Where is everybody? Yes? Francis? Oh, Mr. Diamond. Please hurry over here. Something's happened to Miss Asher. What are you talking about? Miss Asher's been kidnapped. What? Yes, sir. A 
man came in and made Miss Asher go down to his car at the point of a gun. He also hit me over the head. Was he a tall man with a scar on his chin? Yes, sir. That's right. We'll be right over. Walt, I think the guy that tried to push me around has kidnapped Helen. Oh, no. He pulled a gun on her and slugged Francis. We better get over there. Now, if Charles Walsh is loose and he's trying to get me, then snatching Helen is a sure way to get me to come around. Hey, uh, where's that file on Bob Wells? Oh, wait a minute. Otis. Yeah, Doc. Haven't you got that file on Wells yet? Yes, sir. Just bringing it in. Well, step on it. Otis is bringing it in. Here you are, Lieutenant. Let me see it. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh, shut up, Otis. This is the guy, all right. He's the one who tried to pick me up. Uh, uh, may I take one of these pictures, Walt? Sure, but what are you going to do? I'll see if I can find him. You go on over and talk to Francis. See if this is the same guy who took Helen. I'm going to go down to Skid Row and talk to a wise old owl who knows about things like this. I got out of the 5th precinct in a hurry and grabbed a cab for Skid Row. I knew an old deadbeat down there who had a line on every crook in the underworld. And there was just a chance he could tell me where Bob Wells was hiding out. His name was Wilbur Truitt, and he hung out in a shabby dive called the Parrot. Hello, Wilbur. What? Hey, God. You at the piano, strike up a chorus of my buddy, for the wandering boy has returned. Look, Wilbur... I, I would rise and bow from the waist as befits the occasion, but I fear that some sterno I accidentally came in contact with has rusted my spine, and I am forced to remain in a sitting position. I haven't got time to listen to the routine, Wilbur. I- I'm looking for someone. Here, take a look at this picture. Ever see this guy? Unless I have my morning constitutional buck... I can bring nothing into focus but a large bottle and a straw. Oh, oh waiter. Waiter, uh, give me a bottle. You have arrived in the nick of time. I get that wonderful warm glow when you ask for a whole bottle. A snap comparison would be that of a happy mother smiling blissfully at a nursing babe. Okay, well, but now tell me, uh, uh, do you know this man? One sip of strength, and I shall have the eyes of a carrot-stuffed feline. Now, now, yes, I can see the gentleman clearly. In fact, my vision has so greatly improved it begins to take on the functions of an X-ray. For instance, I can readily perceive that the man in question is addicted to false stimulants, and his low brow and squinty eyes tell me that he is indeed a person of some doubtful character. You're looking in the mirror. No, here, here's this picture. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Mr. Bobby Wells. The description is flexible. Know where I can find him? Up until yesterday, he was residing at an institution upstate. Sing Sing, I believe. It is very possible that he is hiding out in one of his old haunts on 23rd Street, but uh, I couldn't say for sure. Oh, why not? Uh, This bottle you purchased entitles you to one of my best Yes, To be absolutely accurate, I would need further inducement. It's the risk, bucko. Uh, bring me another jug, bartender. Ah, bless you. Try looking in a rooming house at 533 West 23rd Street. Now, if you don't mind, I shall forget the necessity for long conversations and begin to concentrate on the work ahead of me. Goodbye, Bucko, and stop in again. Say tomorrow morning if you wake up feeling charitable. I left Wilbur trying to figure the best way to parlay the two bottles and headed for the address he'd given me. It was a typical apartment house of the district. A four-story building with a high premium insurance policy. I asked the landlady if a Bob Wells lived there, and she told me a man answering his description had taken a room there that morning. She told me he'd gone out a few minutes before and she'd let me into his room. I told her to keep a lookout and warn me if he showed. Then I started looking. I tore the place apart, but I didn't come up with a thing. I spotted the phone and started to call Walt, and that's when I saw it. A pad lying by the base of the phone with a heavy imprint left from the writing on the top sheet. I pulled an old trick. I took a pencil and rubbed the lead lightly over the imprint... And up came one telephone number. I dialed it and waited. Weinberg's Delicatessen. Oh, uh, is Bob Wells there? Oh? Bob Wells. Never heard of him. Thanks. 
Well, it's like that. One minute you think you got a lead hot enough to melt your change purse, and the next you find yourself looking like a tree surgeon in Death Valley. But in my business, it takes a conventional three to strike you out. So I found the address of the delicatessen, and 15 minutes later, I was standing between a smoked herring and a three-foot salami talking with Mr. Weinberg. What can I do for you, sir? Oh, uh, I talked with you, oh, say, 20 minutes ago about a Mr. Bob Wells. Bob Wells? Oh, yes. Never heard of him. Uh, take a look at this picture. Maybe you know the face and not the name. It's familiar. Yes, I think I've seen him somewhere. Think hard now. This is important. Are you a policeman? Detective. Oh. Uh, how about it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So long as you're a cop, sure I remember him. He came to my store last night. I remember because I had already closed and he kept pounding on the door. Finally, I let him in. He was very rude. He bought a lot of groceries, but very rude. Have you seen him again? Sure, he came in this morning about locks and bagels. Stell Road. Hmm. Where's your phone? In the back. Has, uh, this Mr. Wells done something? He left Sing Sing without saying goodbye to the warden. Ha! Ha! Now, look, uh, I'm going in the back and use your phone. If Wells happens to come in while I'm back there, stall him and come back and tip me off. I'll do my best. But he better not be rude. Hey, Walt, I'm in a delicatessen over on 24th Street. Yeah, Rick. I traced Wells this far, found out he's been buying food here, probably for Walsh. You think Walsh is hiding somewhere in the neighborhood? Yeah, yeah, that's my guess. They probably took separate places so they could move in a hurry if one hideout got hot. I'll be over there right away. Good. Comfortable, honey, but no yelling. Or I'll have to stuff up that pretty mouth. I don't understand this. Why did you kidnap me? I've been having a hard time getting in touch with your boyfriend, Diamond. Figure if his girl's in trouble, he'll come looking. I I don't have a boyfriend. <laughs> sure, sure. Play it straight. But you watch. Tonight I call your butler and tell him we got you. If Diamond wants you alive, he comes to a spot I got picked up. And he comes along. I don't know any diamond. Ain't she cute, Bobby? Yeah, cute. Want me to fix her so she forgets how to lie? No, I don't care if she claims diamonds are uncle. <laughs> Go on down to Delicatessen and get some food. I'm getting hungry. Okay. I still think we ought to be getting out of town. In one hour, I call this dame's house. At 12 o'clock, I meet Diamond in the park. Then we get out. Why do you want to see uh, this diamond? Oh, we're old friends, baby. He sent me up for life, and he shot my kid brother full of holes. I just want to see that Diamond gets everything that's coming to him. You talk too much. You've got some bad habits yourself. Now get that food. And if you're too lazy to walk downstairs, I'll show you a shortcut. Uh, Three floors, straight down. You can jump for it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. What can Weinberg do for you? Hey, Lieutenant, that chopped liver sure looks good. Keep your fat hooks off of that, Otis. Walt. Oh, yeah, Rick. Back here. All right. The storekeeper is watching out for Wells. If he shows, he'll come back here in Tempest. I parked the squad car two blocks over. I didn't want Wells or Walsh to think something was up. Where's Otis? Otis! I'll be right with you, Lieutenant. I'm just buying something to nibble on. Hmm. His nibble would grind up a whole cow. If Wells comes in and spots a cop, he'll take off like a jackrabbit. Hold it, Walt. It's huh? my yeah. That guy coming across the street. Looks like Wells. Oh. Otis, get away from that door. Huh? I can't hear you, Lieutenant. A man's coming in the store. Get away from the door. He is? You want me to hide? No, you idiot. Just play it smart like you didn't know him. But get away from the door so he'll come in. Oh. Okay, Lieutenant. Leave it to me. Oh. Walt Duck. Good evening. What can Weinberg do for you? Uh, I'll have a couple of sandwiches. Hey, try the salami. It's great. Huh? Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, make it salami. Call slot. Uh, pickle beer. Nice pickle. night. Listen, uh, idiot. Yeah, sure. Master. Yeah, he's doing fine, uh, Walt. Relax. You live around here? Oh. Huh? No, uh, just seeing a sick friend. Yeah. Uh, maybe that salami ain't such a good idea if your friend's sick. You know, I had an uncle with ulcers. He couldn't touch the stuff. It's too much garlic. Ketchup? No. My friend's got a cold. Oh. Well, then I don't guess it'll hurt him, but... 
Uh, you know, the best thing for a cold is good mustard plaster. And uh, now you, you, you take the There's plaster. Here's your sandwiches, sir. Uh, Sixty cents. Sixty. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Hope your friend gets better. Yeah. Whew. Yeah, come on. How did I do, Lieutenant? Well, one thing is sure. He thought you were too stupid to recognize him. Can you still see him, Rick? Yeah. Yeah, he crossed the street and he's starting to walk west. I'll tell him. He knows you. Good. When you spot the place, call me here. Think I should throw a net around the neighborhood? Not till we spot the hideout. Right. Hey, Diamond. They got your girl. How you gonna get her out? They'd probably use her for a shield. That's a good point, Sergeant. Believe me, I've been thinking about it. <laughs> Here's the sandwiches. Swell. Hey, hmm. you only got two. Oh, there was a cop in the delicatessen. A cop? Yeah, a big stupid one. Listen, I, I told him I'm getting food for a sick friend, see? And he starts giving me all kinds you of remedies. You sure you weren't tailed? Tailed? No, who tailed me? The cop stayed in the delicatessen. Okay. Here, honey. Have a sandwich. I'm not hungry. Oh. Suit yourself. Here, Bobby. Oh, thanks. Hey, when are you going to put in that call to this dame's butler? Right after we eat. Then we go to the park and wait for Mr. Diamond. Yeah? I'm in a drugstore across from the building that Wells went in. It's about a block away. Nifty drug. Block west on your side of the street. I'll wait inside. We'll be right down. Come on, Otis. The lieutenant hasn't spotted. Okay. Thanks for the bagel, White Break. That's all right, officer. Come back again when you can pay for it. Come on, Otis. Move your big feet. Okay, okay. Hey, you got any brilliant ideas how we're going to get Helen out of there in one piece? No, I got to admit I'm stuck. Why don't you get that bear trap mind of yours working and make yourself a hero? Uh, well... Maybe we could start a fire in the building. It'd have to come out. Oh, swell, swell. There's nothing I'd like better than a well-done girlfriend. Well, I was trying. Yeah. Hey. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Otis, remind me to kiss you on both cheeks. Hey, what are you doing? That's a firebox. I'm turning in an alarm. There. Oh, we're going to start that fire? No, but Walsh and Wells won't know there isn't one. When the trucks come and the firemen bust in the place, they'll think it's burning down around their ears. Yeah. Maybe then they won't watch Helen too close, huh? Yeah, that's the idea. Well, here's the nifty drugstore. Yeah. Rick, I've been worrying about something. Yeah, I know. How do we get Helen out? Yeah. Well, relax. Otis came up with a solution. Otis? Yeah, I turned in a fire alarm. And when the trucks get here, you can tell them what's up and they can go in the building and make like it was on fire. Well, won't Walsh know it's a phony if he can't smell smoke? The chief can tell him it's blazing in the basement. When they hit the street, we can get enough firemen to shield Helen and then take Walsh and Weld. I'll call the precinct and have the block surrounded. We'll need lights if they make a break for it. Uh, which apartment house are they in? That one, across the street. After I call the boys, we better go over and find out which room they're in. Quietly clear the rooms on both sides in case the shooting starts before we expect it. <laughs> Garlic upsets my stomach. How about that call? Yeah, right. Well, what's your phone number, baby? It's in the book. Oh. Is she gonna be troubled, Bobby? <laughs> he wants your number. Now, come on, we ain't got all night. All right. Evergreen 54308. Oh, that's better. You ought to be more careful, Bobby. Your lips bleeding. Yeah. Hey, Walsh. What's that? Sirens. Maybe that's the cops. If somebody tailed you, you... I told you I wasn't tailed. Wait, I'll go see. That's fire trucks. They're coming down a block. I don't smell no smoke. Hey, they're pulling up in front of this building. The joint must be on fire. Let's get out of here. Uh, maybe it's the building next to us. No, oh, they're bringing the hoses right in front of the door of this joint. I'm getting out. Sit still. Maybe it ain't a big one. We can't go busting out in the street. Well, maybe it ain't a big one. But if it is, I don't want to end up like a pound of spare ribs. Ah! Why, you... Yeah. All right, now, come on. Hey, what's that? Yeah, what is it? Fire department, we're back here from the building. What are we going to do with the dame? Shove her in that closet. Just a minute, we'll be right with you. Hurry, Tom, there's a fire in the basement smearing a gas man. The whole place may go up any second. Did you hear that? Yeah, step on it. Okay. Hey, better step on it. Down these stairs. We can find our way. 
All right, there's a couple of prowl cars. Yeah. Separate. We'll meet at the other place. Okay, Walsh, that's far enough. Ah. It's the Shamus. Get him, Walsh. Don't reach for it, Walsh. I owe you something, Diamond. <laughs> you all right, Rick? Yeah, Walsh. He's a worse shot than his brother. Where's Wells? He made a break for it, but he won't get through. All right, Wells. You can't get through. Drop your gun. You won't take me, copper! Well, that's that. What about Walsh? Uh, he's pretty dead. Come on, I want to find out what happened to Helen. <laughs> Well, Walt and I went up to the room and found Helen in the closet. We took her downstairs and she cried a little on my shoulder. I like that. Makes me feel so protective. Walt cleaned things up and dropped Helen and me off at her place. An hour later, Helen got back to normal and we relaxed on the couch and forgot about Wells and Walt. <sighs> How do you feel now, baby? Daddy. Want to get Francis to fix some dinner for you? Oh, no, I'm not very hungry. But you can have some if you want. Mm, no, no. Want to play some canasta or something? But you always said it was a bad 200 game. Yeah, it is. Well, I forgot my jack. <laughs> Silly. Want a neck? Ooh, what you said. Come here. No. Helen. No, I'm mad. Mad? What for? Because those two thugs ruined a wonderful evening. What's the matter? Want me to go? Oh, you idiot, of course not. I had a big surprise planned. You did? Yes. Believe it or not, I had two wonderful seats for South Pacific, and now it's too late to go. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, well, I'm sorry, baby. I'd love to have seen it. Me, too. Well, I'm not exactly Ezio Pinza, but I'll try to make it up to you. Oh, Rick, that's a wonderful idea. All right. What'll it be? Uh, some enchanted evening. Oh, really? Me, 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 me. Hmm. A some enchanted evening You may see a stranger You may see a stranger Across a crowded room Rick! What's the matter? I was just trying to make like pizza. But honey, it's safer for you to make like diamond. Oh. And somehow you know you know, even then, that somewhere you'll see her again and again. Oh, you're not Pinza, but it's wonderful. Thanks. Some enchanted evening, someone may be laughing. You may hear her laughing. Across a crowded room oh, And night after night As strange as it seems The sound of her laughter Will sing in your dreams Rick Who can explain it who can tell you why? Ricky. Fools give you answers. Wise men never try. Oh, Rick. Oh, honey, what's the matter? I was just falling in love with myself. Come here. You never let me finish. Do you mind? Oh, well, no. And I'm sure Mr. Pinza doesn't either. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Paul Fries, and Larry Dobkin. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The 
W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, tonight you're going to meet some charming people. And you're going to run into a little bit of very fancy murder. The name of the story is Little Drops of Rain. But before we get into our story, here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company. Did you know that there are over 50 million men in the United States who shave? Yes, that's a lot of men. It was in the interest of these 50 million shavers that Fitch Company chemists and technicians went to work in their laboratories and came up with Fitch's No Brush, a shaving cream especially designed to give a solid comfort shave. You see, Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream contains not one, but three important shaving ingredients that work together to give you a smoother, faster shave. It also contains a special skin conditioner ingredient. Men appreciate this ingredient because it has a soothing effect on the skin the instant it's applied, and it keeps the skin feeling smooth and refreshed long after the shave is finished. Men also like the just-right consistency of Fitch's No Brush. It's neither too thick nor too thin. It's not greasy and won't clog the razor. If you're among those who prefer a lather cream, try Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives a rich, dense lather that wilts whiskers completely soft for a clean, fast shave. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream come in big 25 and 50 cent sizes. Try a jar. You'll find it easier on your razor and easier on you. Thank you, Jim. And now, I'd like to tell my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. still confined to my little cranked up downy couch in the hospital, but not as still as I was last week. I am now allowed to get up and totter around a little, and I use the word totter advisedly. My legs act like strangers who have different political beliefs, and my knees have suddenly developed sideway hinges. But my nurses, ah, my nurses, yes, they're beautiful and tender and resistant. And speaking of nurses, nurses are girls, and girls are my favorite pastime. And that brings me up to the girl who has done the most to confuse my life. Liza. The girl I was so sincerely in love with a couple of months ago. Liza was in to see me. She just left, and we were talking about the time when I showed up at her apartment for a date. It was raining out, and... I was sitting at the piano, doodling around a little bit. I don't want to go to a nightclub tonight, Richard. I'm too tired. Let's just go to a show, shall we? Anything you say, baby. That's the kind of guy I am. I want to see two girls and a sailor. It's playing at the Rialto. June Allison's in that, isn't she? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, that's for me, then. You think so? Definitely. You think she's prettier than I am? Well, you're, you're not in pictures, Angel. Do you think she's prettier than I am? Well, uh, well you're, a, you're a different type. Are you going to answer me? Oh, 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 oh you're jealous. <laughs> How can you be jealous of a girl I don't even know? Give me a kiss. No. No, oh, but baby, I love you. I love you like anything. Hmm. Tiff. All right, all right, all right. Pop then. I don't care. Mm, June is busting out all over, all over the meadow and the hill. Busts are busting out of bushes, and the robin river pushes every little wheel that wheels beside a mill. June is busting out all over, 
The feeling is getting so intense That the young Virginia creepers Have been hugging the bejeepers Out of all the morning glories on the fence Because it's June June, June, June You're uh, insufferable, Richard Rowe Oh, now quit potting Come on over here On the bench by me are we going to a show or not? Sure. Get your lipstick on again and we'll see what... Oh. I'll get it. No, I'll answer. It's probably George. Oh, George. Well, I'll tell him, that homewrecker. Hello. Is Mr. Rogue there? Mm, speaking. Uh, this is your call service, Mr. Rogue. We got a call for you. Oh, uh, oh. Who is it? Uh, uh, Mrs. Harvey Burgess says it's very important. Okay, put her on. Right. Oh, put her on. Who is... <laughs> Hello. Uh, Richard Rogue speaking. This is Mrs. Harvey Burgess. Yes? I must see you at once, Mr. Rogue. Oh, well, any time tomorrow, Mrs. I Burgess. I will see you tonight, immediately. It is most important. Well, can't you tell me about it over the phone? Oh, no. Could you come to my house at once? Uh, what's the address? 485 Hillcrest. You'll be well paid for your time. Please hurry. I'll be right out, Mrs. Burgess. Wait for me. I'll be right back, honey. Go on. Go on out to see Mrs. Burgess. Don't mind me, Dick Tracy. Well, what could I do? Mrs. Harvey Burgess was the wife of a tycoon with a dollar for every Democrat in Georgia. I tried to explain to Eliza, but I was talking to myself and I left for the Burgess residence. <laughs> I left Liza burning like Mrs. O'Leary's barn. The Burgess Mansion was a huge colonial affair. George Washington could have slept there every night. He was at Valley Forge and never seen the same room twice. A butler who talked like he was choking to death on an olive pit conducted me into the library and uh, into the presence of Mrs. Harvey Burgess. Oh, my. What a presence. She was sitting in front of the open fire filling out a hostess gown that didn't straighten out any of the curves she featured. I pulled my eyes back into my head and tried not to look too interested. Sit down, Mr. Rogue. Oh, uh, thank you. I, I'm i in a bit of a hurry tonight, Mrs. Burgess. As a matter of fact, I... Mr. Rogue, I... my husband is making a fool of himself. Yes? He's lost his mind completely over a secretary in his office. His secretary. A girl by the name of Helen Stark. You, you mean that... Yes, I mean he prefers her company to mine. Well, that doesn't sound reasonable, if you'll pardon me for saying so. What do you want me to do? Somebody has to bring Harvey back to his senses, Mr. Rogue. Well, I'm afraid you've called on the wrong man. I'm not very good at long fatherly talks. Oh, Mr. I... Rogue, please, I'm so alone. Hey, hey, now, wait a minute. Good grief. You mean to tell me that Harvey is neglecting you? What you need to straighten Harvey out is a psychiatrist, not a detective. Harvey is definitely off his trolley. Please help me, Mr. Rowe. No, 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 Mrs. Burgess. I, I... He's with the right this minute. How do you know? When he left the house tonight, I followed him. He went to the home of his best friend, Clarence Roman. I parked across the street. I was going in and faced them, but I saw Mr. Roman leave, and I lost my nerve. That's when I called you. Oh, Mr. Rogue, I want you to go out there and talk to Harvey. Tell him I know all about him and that Stark girl. And I'm suing him for divorce. Well, that's not my kind of work, Mrs. Burgess. I I'm Please, sorry, but that... I don't want to divorce Harvey. But I do want him back. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that if you will do as I say, he'll come back. You must do it for me, Mr. Rogue. Here, oh, where is it? I have $500 here in an envelope. You did? Oh, wait a minute here. Let me see. Uh, oh, oh. Is this it? Yes. That's your fee. Hmm. For going out there with me, Mr. Rogan. Trying to bring Harvey back to his senses. You'll do it for me, won't you, Mr. Rogue? Well, I, uh... You'll do it for me, won't you, Mr. Rogue? Okay. Come along. <laughs> All right. Well, 
it seems there's nobody home. There's my husband's convertible out in front, right where he left it tonight when I followed him out here. How did the girl arrive? In her car. Oh. Her car isn't here. It was right behind Harvey's. Looks like we got here too late, doesn't it? Try the door. I know Harvey's still here. All right. You're an old friend of Roman's, I suppose. Yes. Why? Uh, I just want to know before I try to open the door. You see, there are laws against that sort of thing. Hmm. Door's unlocked. Do we go in? Yes. Okay. After you. You know the house better than I do. Go ahead. All right. The living room is over here. Ah, nobody home. Look, Mrs. Burgess, we better get out of here. No. I know Harvey's in this house someplace, and I'm going to find him. I can't... What are you sniffing for? Wait a minute. That smell in the air. You get it? What? Oh. I don't smell anything. You don't? I smell chloroform. Chloroform? Yeah. You take a look upstairs. I'm going to shake down the first floor. That smell of chloroform can mean trouble, you know. Mr. Roke, what do you mean? You're frightening me. Mrs. Burgess was very fetching when she was frightened. But I calmed her down a little bit. Now, this may sound fantastic, but I've got a little bell in my head that rings an alarm every time I really get around serious trouble. And it was playing a tune that sounded too much like a death march right that minute. I had to get her out of the way. She finally went upstairs and I went to work. I took the living room first and looked behind all the couches and in all the dark corners. I was bending over, looking under a huge Italian carved table when I thought I heard a stealthy footstep behind me. Ah. Don't move. Oh! My ears were still full of that ringing scream Mrs. Burgess had let out as I caught that sock behind the ear and drifted gently through space toward cloud number eight and my alter ego, Hugo. I was hoping he wouldn't be there, but he was. Sitting there with that silly smirk on his face with his little short legs pulled up under his chin and his funny little arms around him and his long white beard waving the cosmic breeze. Oh, shut up. <laughs> That's a fine attitude. You go prowling around a strange house and get caught at it and knocked out. Then you come up here and take it out on me. <laughs> get out of here, you ingrate. Oh, stop acting like a landlord, Hugo. What happened to me? <laughs> Are you kidding? Tell me, why did Mrs. Burgess scream? Answer me, Hugo. Do you know why she screamed? Sure. You wanted to tell me? <laughs> no. Find out for yourself. <laughs> You're a detective. Oh, someday I'm going to get rid of you, you little pest. <laughs> Why don't you get back to work? You got a date with Liza, you know. She's still waiting. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, here goes. <laughs> Come on, Rogue. Please, come on. You didn't have to hit him so hard, Clarence. <coughs> oh, who hit me? I'm Clarence Roman, Rogue. I came home. I found the front door unlocked. I walked in. I saw a strange man prowling around my parlor. A woman screamed, and I hit you with my cane. Oh, well, what do you carry for a cane? A ball bat? Why did you scream, Mrs. Burgess? I found my husband. Upstairs. He's dead. Murdered. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But now I'd like to say something to the ladies. Do you ever feel like hanging your head in shame because your hair isn't, well, looking as nice as it should? Perhaps you get discouraged because every time you shampoo your hair, it seems dry and difficult to set. Then for your next shampoo, why not try Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo? This clear golden liquid shampoo is made from mild coconut and vegetable oil. These pure natural oils keep your hair from becoming dry and brittle. 
When you use Fitch's Saponified Shampoo, you can have a shampoo as often as you like, and after each one, your hair will be soft and lustrous, easy to set into your favorite hairstyle. You'll love the glorious quantities of fragrant lather this shampoo makes. It cleanses thoroughly and then rinses out completely without a special after-rinse. You see, Fitch's Saponified Shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. All you do is rinse with plain water, and the rinsing agent contained in the shampoo ensures the removal of all particles from your hair, making it sparkle with cleanliness. Ask for Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo at your drug counter, barber, or beauty shop. Look for the bottle with the bright yellow label. Now back to Rogue's Gallery. Richard Rogue is telling our story. Well, I had accepted a case for Mrs. Harvey Burgess, a suspicious wife. Yes, that's the Mrs. Harvey Burgess of the Burgess Millions. She suspected her husband of having a rendezvous with Helen Stark, his secretary, at the home of Clarence Roman, Burgess's best friend, and we went out there together. Nobody answered the door, so we went in. My suspicions were aroused when I smelled the unmistakable odor of chloroform. Mrs. Burgess was looking around upstairs while I searched the downstairs. Suddenly, I heard Mrs. Burgess scream. Ah! My husband! Upstairs, he's dead! Murdered! Well, that snapped me out of it. I got to my feet and ran up the stairs. Mrs. Burgess and Roma were right behind me, and she directed me into the library, which was just off the main hall. And there he was, as dead as last summer's romance, with a neat little blue hole right below the part in his hair. He was a nice-looking old guy, about 50, which made him a good 25 years older than his wife. And his widow was really taking his death big, which was natural. A woman doesn't have a husband murdered every day. Poor Harvey, this is horrible. Has anything in this room been moved or touched? Well, I just arrived home, when I When I looked wouldn't... in here and saw Harvey, I knew he was dead. I screamed. Yes, yes, I heard you. Then you ran right downstairs. Yes, huh? uh, I saw Mr. Roman hit you, and I ran down to tell him who you were. And... That's a little late. Okay. Just don't touch anything. Stay right there in the door, both of you. Just who are you to be giving us orders? You'll find out. You ever see this gun before? Yes. Where? It was Harvey's. He kept it in his desk at the office. Oh, you recognized it mighty quickly. How? It has his initials on it. I can see them from here, inset in the butt of the gun. Oh. His gun, huh? Yeah. Well, it wasn't suicide. Not with the gun clear over here on the opposite side of the room. This is murder. <laughs> hey. What's the matter? Well, this ought to do it. What is it? Well, it's a handkerchief. <laughs> a very nice linen handkerchief with initials in the corner. And blood on it. What initials? H.S. Helen Stark, that's her handkerchief. She killed Harvey. She killed my Harvey. Is there a phone upstairs here? Yes, you'll find an extension in the hall. Thanks. Come on out of this room. I don't want anything touched or moved. Oh, no. Dear... Please. You two wait for me downstairs. I'll be down just a minute. As soon as I call the police. Homicide, Urban speaking. Hello, Urban. Richard Rogue. Yeah, who's dead? Harvey Burgess, wise guy. Hmm? You mean it? You mixed up in another murder, Rogie? Sure. You'd never find a body if it wasn't for me. Where are you? At the residence of Clarence Roman on Cypress Avenue, 2120. Better get the boys and get out here. Be right there. Got any leads on the killer? Uh, a couple of vague ideas. Stay there until I get there, Rogue. Hello? Oh, uh, hello, Liza, darling. This is Rogie. Oh. You know what time it is. Oh, sure, honey, I'll give you I... ten minutes to get back here and take me to that show. What? Oh. Uh, look, Roman. Roman, the cops will be here in a minute. 
Tell Urban, that's Lieutenant Urban. He'll be in charge for the police that I'll be right back, will you? Tell him I went out to get a murderess for him. Of course. And I hope you manage to catch a rogue. Good evening. Is uh, Helen Stark at home? I, I I beg your pardon. I'm I'm a bit deaf. I I, I couldn't hear you. Oh, uh, I said, is Helen Stark at home? Oh, oh, Helen. Uh, no, no, she isn't home this evening. Has she been home? I say, has she been home in the last hour? Uh, no, no, she hasn't. I I don't know what time to expect her either. But I imagine she'll be home soon, though. You know where she is. Uh, well, she didn't come home from the office tonight. She's she's working late. Oh. She called you and told you she wouldn't be home? Uh, yes, yes. She said she was going to work with Mr. Burgess. That's her boss, you know, the, the millionaire. Yes, sir. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, could I, uh, could I tell her who called? No, no, no. That, uh, that won't be necessary. Thanks. Uh, hmm? Thanks very much, Mr. Stark. I, uh, oh, uh... You and Helen live here all alone? Uh, Yes, yes, since her mother died several years ago. Uh, Are you an old friend of Helen's? No, a very recent acquaintance. Oh. I'm sorry I bothered you, Mr. Stark. Good night. Good evening. Nice out after the rain, isn't it? Yeah, sure is. Good night. Good night. Oh, that nice little old guy. It was going to be tough for him to realize that his daughter was a killer. I hated the world as I walked down the steps from that porch and started for my car. I, uh... Oh, I don't like murder. It upsets so many people who aren't involved in the act, or the reasons for it. Yeah, I guess I'm a chicken-hearted Patsy. But if I am, I'm glad. Anyway, I was walking down the walk... uh, when that little bell rang in my massive intellect again. I noticed something, something peculiar. There were tire tracks running into the stock garage. It had only stopped raining about 45 minutes before, and if that car had been driven into the garage while it was still raining, there would be no tracks. They would have been washed away. Now, very peculiar. I ran up the driveway and opened the overhead garage door... Then I jumped back. The garage was full of carbon monoxide. I wet my handkerchief in a puddle of rainwater, held it over my nose, and ran into the garage. I wrestled the door of the small coop open and saw a young girl, unconscious, slumped over the steering wheel. I pulled her out of there. She was dead weight and carried her into the house. Oh, Helen. Helen. I'm afraid it's a little late for that, Mr. Stark. Where's your telephone? In the hall. Right in the hall. Thanks. I'll get a pole motor squad out here right away. Fire department. Get a pole motor squad to 640 Inglewood Drive. Attempted suicide. Bad shape. Rush it. Right. Ramsey, Redding, Roman. Roman, Clarence. Hello? Hello, Lieutenant Urban, please. This is Richard Rogan. It's important. This is Urban speaking, Rogue. I thought I told you to stay here. Look, never mind the arguments. Get out here to 640 Inglewood Drive. I've got Helen Stark for you. You have? Nice work. I want to talk to that young lady. Well, you missed the boat. I think she's dead. Suicide. Carbon monoxide poisoning. Step on it. Okay, Rogie, I'll be there in ten minutes. Don't go away. I gave Helen Stark my own interpretation of artificial respiration until the pulled motor squad got there. 
Urban arrived on the heels of the fire department, and we went out and looked around in the garage. Made some fascinating discoveries, too. The car had run out of gas and stopped turning over, for one thing. And one thing led to another, to coin a phrase. Anyway, Urban and I made a little deal. I went back to the Roman residence, and while he and his boys were being scientific, I sat in the parlor and talked with Mrs. Burgess and Clarence Roman. Mrs. Burgess had recovered her poise to some extent. They were both very anxious to know all about my daring capture of the Stark girl. I'm glad she's dead. I couldn't stand a trial. I'm glad she committed suicide. Yes, I I guess it seemed like the only way out. She wasn't very smart about murder, leaving clues all over the place the way she did. <laughs> Even the cops would have had her in 24 hours. How well did you know the Stark girl, Roman? Rather well. I'd see her on the office a great deal. Harvey was, well, not very discreet about the fact that he was fond of her. Please, Clarence. Harvey's dead. We should forget those things. He was a good husband. I I don't know what life's going to be like without him. I just have an idea that it's going to be pretty simple, Mrs. Burgess. And possibly rather short. What do you mean? I mean that the police suspect that you and Mr. Roman murdered your husband and Miss Stark. That's a serious accusation, Rude. Your husband was suing you for divorce, wasn't he, Mrs. Burgess? He knew you were going to be there with Mr. Roman, his best friend tonight. So he came and surprised you with Helen Stark for a witness, didn't he? And you, Mr. Roman, you killed him and then you had to kill Helen Stark to shut her up. This is preposterous. Ah, sit down, Roman. You were right, Rogie. We found Roman's fingerprints on the steering wheel of Helen Stark's car. One of the boys just got back with a report that Roman's shoe is a perfect fit in that shoe print outside Stark's garage. I had nothing to do with it. Clarence killed Harvey, and then he chloroformed that Stark girl, and then... You're in this as far as I am. Shut up! I've got more news for you, Roman. Helen Stark isn't dead. The car ran out of gas just in time. She'll be there to appear against you when you're tried for murder. <laughs> Liza, honey. I'm... I don't want to talk to you, Richard Rogue. I'm busy. Oh, now, honey. The lady says she's busy. Yeah? Who are you? His name is George. Good night, chump. <laughs> ah, little drops of rain. The stuff we're getting so much of out here in California right now saved Helen Stark's life. Because if I hadn't noticed those tire tracks, she would have stayed in the garage until it was too late for the pole motor squad to save her. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Little drops of rain put the curse on what was almost a perfect double murder. With the help of my massive intellect, there's only one thing I can't understand. How come a guy as smart as I am gets hit on the head so often? Answer me that, will you? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. How did you like our little story tonight? Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Oh, uh, don't forget to tune in next Thursday night. We're going to present a strange story of a house where everybody was scared. We call it the House of Fear. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and good night, all. Now here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug counter, Barber, or Beauty Shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Folks, when we see a wounded veteran, we can thank him with our eyes and with a smile. We can also thank him in more material ways, like helping make sure he gets all the benefits of the G.I. Bill of Rights. That takes money. The money we lend when we buy victory bonds. Buy victory bonds.
Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as... The Saint. Come in. Hi, Mr. Temple. Oh, hello, Louie. Where are you? I'm in my room. I'll be ready oh. in a minute. Hey, wait till you see my cat. I gave it a bat for Christmas. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Look, I don't want to rush you, but if you don't hurry, Christmas Eve is going to be already Christmas morning. And what will all them tots think? Oh, them tots will be singularly fortunate. However, all I have to do now is get my whiskers on. Huh? There. <laughs> How do I look? Mr. Templer, if I didn't know you was Mr. Templer, yeah. I wouldn't know who you were. Hmm. Louis, don't I look like Santa Claus? This may come as a surprise to you, Mr. Templer. Santa Claus is fat. Oh. You're not fat. Oh. Well, hand me that cushion from the couch, huh? Okay. Here. Yeah, thank you. Now then. Mm. How's that? Now say ho, ho, ho. What for? Santa Claus is always say ho, ho, ho. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, ho, ho, ho. Well, anyway, you look like Santa Claus. Hey, Mr. Templer, whose idea was this? Uh, Mrs. Winterbottom's. Oh, the dame who annoys tots on Christmas Eve. Mrs. Huh? Winterbottom is a very well-known philanthropist. And every Christmas Eve, she collects hundreds of small children and feeds them. Yeah, and... yeah, yeah. Who feeds them the rest of the year? Don't be bitter, Louie. Sorry. At least I ought to give the little tots a, a laugh. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose there is something to be said for Mrs. Winterbottom. Well, don't say it now. Don't worry. There's something to be said for Santa Claus, too. He does go around filling stockings. <laughs> yeah, I know a blonde. Shouldn't say that either, huh? No. Mm, someone at the door. Louis, would you mind? No. Uh, it's probably one of them tots. Correction, it's a tot 20 years later. Get in. Yeah, I'm already in. Back up. I'm backing up. Thanks. Now reach, gents. You know, that gun in her hand looks loaded. Now that you mention Reach. It. For what? Uh, the, the chandelier. You can't. Why not? No chandelier. Oh, a wise guy, huh? If you're going to shoot me, I insist on knowing your name. Uh, uh, just call me Sally. Sally. And uh, your last name? Never mind that. How would you like to get plugged in the... In the... Bread basket? Where? Oh, well, let's pass lightly over that. I wouldn't like to get plugged anywhere. And shut up. All right. Where is it? Uh, right down the hall. Are you it? trying to be smart? Not especially. So it's going to be like that, huh? Like what? Now, you listen to me, Fats Boylan. Huh? You shut up, too. I didn't say anything. Well, shut up anyway. I'm shutting up. Uh, uh, what was I saying? You just finished calling me Fats Boylan. Uh, that's right. That's wrong. I'm not Fats Boylan. Ha. Huh. Well, it helps keep the conversation Look, going. Look, Fats, but... are you going to stop stalling and hand over the stuff, or will I have to shoot? Uh, since I am not Fats Boylan, and since I have no stuff to hand over, I'm afraid you'll have to shoot. Mr. Templer, that could be fatal. You keep quiet, punk. Who's a punk? You're a punk. Mr. Templer, am I a punk? Well, Sally is just a little confused this evening, Louie. Confused Louis. or not, she shouldn't call oh, me a... shut up! Oh. You, know, you don't have to start bawling. I am not... Calling. I, I, uh... You were just about to shoot me. Well, I know, but then you'd bleed. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can't stand the sight of blood. Why don't you strangle him? Louie, don't be unkind. Oh, it seems to be the doorbell again. No, wait. Oh, it's very impolite to keep people waiting. But I, I must have been followed here. Sally, look, stop illustrating a point with that gun. It might go off. I don't care. But then I'd bleed. But where can I go? I've got to hide. Well, try the kitchen. All right. 
Well, come on in. It's open house tonight. Well, well, my old pal, Fat I am not. Boylan. Although I'm beginning to waver. Perhaps I am. <laughs> Simon, the split personality. Who are you? Well, Joe Hudson. You remember your old pal, Hudson. Hudson. Hmm. Well, I must admit you look like a hornet, but your lines aren't as nice. Look, if I'm your old pal, why don't I know you? Oh, that's easy. We never met personally. Well, how else can you meet? Ignore that. But if we haven't met personally or otherwise, how can I be your pal? Oh, I, I was just being friendly. <laughs> Besides... Hey, you got something for me. I have? Uh, oh, great little kidder, ain't you, Fats? <laughs> ain't he, pal? Now I feel better. I'm a pal, too. Look, I wish I deserved your delighted choice. Uh, look, but... just leave me have the stuff, and this then I'll get... Stuff again. What stuff? Am I going to have trouble with you? Uh, the door behind you is open. Why don't you use it, huh? In that way, nobody will have any trouble. I'll use it. I'll use it after. After what? Sounds like that, huh? Ever see one of these before? I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you, but the answer is yes, I have. Good, good. Then you know how it works. It shoots bullets at guys. Guys who get bullet shot at them have a habit of dying. Really? Well, then perhaps you'd better not shoot that gun at me. I won't. So give me. So I ain't got. Well, that is I. That is you ain't got. Uh, thanks, Louis. Basic, I ain't a patient man. Hand the stuff over or I... I don't have any stuff. Or you get shot. I bleed. Who cares? I do. <laughs> I hoped you might. However... This could be a stall. This could be trouble, so you... You can't shoot him. Why not? It's against the law. I read it in the papers. It's against the law. Yeah, yeah, I believe you. Oh, so that's okay. Yeah, but I like doing things against the law. Oh, well, you you, you could go to jail. I already been there. Well, for shooting somebody, they'll hang you or something. If somebody told them. Well, I would. You would, huh? Uh, I would. So maybe I'd better shoot you first. Well, I, you know, I wouldn't want to deprive Mr. Templer of the privilege. I, well, I, Fats, it's your last chance. Oh, not that phrase. Also, I still don't so know... So it looks like I'm going to break a law. Hey, who did that? You did, you dope. I did not. This here is a plan. But you won't get away with it. <sighs> Goodbye, Mr. Hudson. Mr. Templer, who made with the artillery? It must have been Sally. She's in the kitchen. She can stay there. She saved our lives, Louis. Yeah, but maybe by now she's found out she likes to shoot guns. Well, let's hope not. Uh, hello. It was nice of you to frighten Mr. Hudson off. I did? You did. I, I didn't hit anybody? No. Oh, I'm so glad. Hey, hey I, I, I've got her. She's out cold. <laughs> Come on, I'll put her on the couch. Yeah. Come on. Up. It's a little late, but somebody ought to mention she is not a bad-looking dish. You've mentioned it. Hmm. Looking for smelling salts in her bag? No. Identification. Huh. Here's a driver's license. Her name is Sally Walters. Address, 49 Arden Drive. Huh. Social security card. She's the secretary. That's what I need. Oh, oh, take it back. She's coming, too. Better put the bag back. Yeah, but keep the gun, though. There's still some bullets in it. No. We don't want her to know we went through her bag. We're ashamed of ourselves? We're going to pay her a visit. She ain't home. But she will be after she leaves here, and then perhaps we can find out what keeps the uh, home fires burning. Sally was in kind of a hurry leaving us. So she was. Mr. Templer, don't look right Santa Claus chasing a blonde. Uh, I'm not chasing her. Technicalities will get you no place. Hey, this must be it. 49. <whistles> what is she a secretary of? The treasury? Mm, I suspect this is where she works, Louie. She works overtime, huh? Yeah, and probably sleeps in. Come on. Yeah. I hope that nobody is peeking because they'll think Santa Claus is off schedule. I think perhaps I can manage without the whiskers. Yeah. Ouch! Now you look like an imposter. Yeah. Would you ring, Louie? Okay. You know, this is the type house. I got a feeling Santa Claus would have to use the servant center. Uh, <clears throat> yes. I'm Simon Templer. You are? I am. There's nothing I can do about it. Mm, Mr. Templer, all butlers are like him? I doubt it. I think he's been practicing. Haw. Haw. Well, good night, then. I think not. 
Would you mind removing your shoe from the door? I would. You might at least have shined it. Humphrey, whoever is it at this time of night? No one, madam. Oh, but such an interesting looking no one. Santa Claus, you've lost your whiskers. <laughs> I haven't there, uh, right here in my pocket. Oh, how nice. Actually, my name is Simon Templer. I'm Carla Worth. Uh, this is Louis. Hi. Oh, I, I mean... Hi. Uh, be kind to the peasant's type. Uh, did you want to see me? Uh, now that I've seen you, uh, yes. Well, come in there. Thank you. But, madam... Humphrey, go away. Yes, madam. Humphrey's such a problem sometimes. Shall we? Hmm. Nice? Mmm, yeah. Fire in the fireplace, books on the bookshelves, port in that decanter. Yes, would you like some? Uh, no, thank you. I just wanted to be sure the accessories were all correct. Someday, maybe I'll find some other wine besides port in a decanter. I dream. Simon, are you the one who found them? It's beginning again. Found what? My jewels, of course. Have they been lost? Simon, they were stolen. You know that, don't you? Should I? I've heard of the saint, Simon. I didn't know he was also a Santa Claus. Oh, it's a fleeting impulse. Uh, when were your jewels stolen? This afternoon. You see, Claude, my husband, that is, oh. bought me them for Christmas. Yes, <laughs> Santa Claude. Louis. Sorry. We decided to have the party this afternoon. We thought it'd be nice to have a quiet eve, so we did. The jewels were in quite a large box. There were quite a lot of them. And? Claude had hired a Santa Claus, but before the party was over, Santa Claus had disappeared. So had the jewels. Well, there must have been some precautions. Oh, there were several detectives. Oh. But the Santa Claus said he was going out to get some air while the party was on. He never came back. But he didn't have the jewels on him. The box was locked, and it was too large for the detectives not to have noticed. I see. The name of the man hired to play Santa Claus was, of course, uh... Fats Morland. And who may you be? Claude, this is Simon Templer. I and know. Louis. I know neither of them. Snoops, obviously. Get rid of them. Claude likes to behave as though he were an emperor on occasion. The box wasn't found anywhere in the house? The jewel box, no. The jewels were insured? Naturally. It was none of your affair. I shall speak severely to Humphrey. He should never have let you in. I let them in, darling. So now he's going to speak severely to her? Uh, we'll go quietly, except... Uh, Mr. Worth, what is Fats Boylan's address? I have no idea. Good night. Good night, Simon, and I'm sorry. So am I. I'll show you out. Thank you. Whoa, 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 whoa. Pronounced Carla Worth. Yeah. What do we do now, Santa Claus? Eh, we get into your nice, clean cab and... Hey, wait a minute, Louie. Now we're going to find out what became of Sally. Simon. Well, good evening, Sally. I overheard. Fat's address is 17 Beale Street. 17 Beale. Yes, I've got to get right back to the house before anybody notices. Goodbye. An awful short visit. A bit long enough. Now we're going to visit Mr. Boyle? I think so. I hope he ain't so handy with a gun as the rest of these characters. He may be. He may not be. Now I'm all cheered up. Mm, but there's one thing I'm sure he isn't. What's that? Fat. Quite a change from the Waits dump. Now this is a dump. Yeah, and Mr. Boylan would seem to be shy. Mr. Templer, you said something about the one thing he wouldn't be was fat. Why? Because he was called fats? Mm, not exactly. Louis, I'm worried. Mm -hmm. Hey. Hey, the door was open. Yes. Maybe that means our bird has flown? Maybe. Come on, let's go in. Okay. I ain't usually so poetical, but uh, the light's on. Yes. And the room looks funny. Looks like a, a hurricane came to stay for dinner. Hmm, and remained for six months. Somebody was looking for a, a jewel box? And someone obviously didn't find it. The extent of the search indicates that. Nothing was left untouched. It's a funny smell in this room, you know. A couple of funny smells. Yeah. One's perfume and the other... Gunpowder. Huh? Gunpowder. That's why I ain't been looking behind any pieces of furniture. It really wasn't very far to look, Louie. Huh? He's behind the day bed. Fats? Fats, Louie. He, uh, he ain't doing so good? He's dead. Uh, and Louie... Yeah? He wasn't fat. Mr. 
Mr. Templer? Yes, Louis? We're being followed. Since? Since uh... we got out of Boylan's place. Oh, that's interesting. Louis, stop the cab. That'll make it easier for whoever's following us. Exactly what I want. Even on Christmas Eve, this shouldn't happen. Now what? Uh, we get out. Don't look behind you. Start walking. Mm. So here is a nice, lonely street. Mm-hmm. Everybody else is home hanging up stockings. I wouldn't mind hanging up stockings myself. I, I, I... Who do you think it is? I think it's our friend Hudson. Oh, I just lost five pounds. You mean the guy that was chasing Sally who was all ready to shoot us until she made the explosion? Neat reminder. Oh, you think he wants our money or our life? Possibly. What kind of an answer is that? In here, you... quickly. Yeah. Mr. Temple, this here alley is full of garbage cans. It's also dark. You don't have to see garbage cans to know they're shh, around. Shh, shh, shh. Hudson? Yes. Good evening, Hudson. What? Huh? Don't turn around. I've got a gun on you. Hey, I don't like it. Louie, take Mr. Hudson's gun away from him. Okay. Got it, Mr. Templer. Good. Aim it at him. Hey, now, wait a minute. You can't shoot me with my own gun. Why not? That ain't tactful. Uh, what other gun could I shoot you with? Your own. Hey, you mean you ain't got a... Oh, mister, you were a liar. And on Christmas Eve, too. Hudson, who hired you to follow Sally and me? Uh, it was my own idea. Uh, Louie, hmm? Mr. Hudson isn't being friendly. He ain't, huh? Mm, he ain't. Therefore... Hey, hey no, don't, don't lose your heads, fellas. We've lost patience with him, Louie. We have? Mm, shoot him, Louie. He's beginning to bore me. He's beginning to... I, sh... I, I should shoot him? Yes. Fatal? Fatal. Okay. Except I don't know what my wife and six kids are going to say. You haven't about... got a wife and six kids. Oh, no, 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 wait a minute, please. Louie... We're being cruel, prolonging Mr. Hudson's agony. Put him out of it. Now, wait a minute. I, I, I'll t- Who hired you? Uh, Mrs. Worth. Mrs. Carla Worth. You quite sure? Strike me dead. If, uh, that is, don't strike me dead. Look, look, if she didn't, would I say, why, why would I say she did? Uh, you have a point there. But uh, why should she have wanted you to follow Sally? Well, she had an idea. Her husband and Sally were kind of, uh, you, you know... Uh, yeah, kind of uh, decorating their own little tree together. Hmm? I couldn't put it more tactfully. Oh, I see. So if you got enough divorce evidence, Mrs. Worth could hold up her husband for plenty of alimony. No. No. Oh, Mrs. Worth is the babe with the dough. Mr. Worth is a very well-educated bum. Indeed. Huh? It's interesting. Uh, Louis, let me have the gun. Yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, wait, I, I, thought, I told you the truth. I'm sure you did. No. Mr. Templer, that's gratitude? It's necessity. Oh. We need him out of the way for a little while. He's out of the way. Now, uh... Yeah? Now we're going to find out who else knew that Fats Boylan was thin. <laughs> If we visit it often enough, I might even get accustomed to this joint. Mm, you might also start confusing yourself with Grant. <clears throat> uh, good evening, Humphrey. I'm sorry the family have retired for the night. Well, it is late, I know. I wish to retire myself. Why, Humphrey, you don't look 65. Good night, sir. Aren't you going to ask us in? No. Why, Humphrey, I thought you and I were going to sing Christmas carols together. Let go of me. Shut the door, Louis. Okay. I shall complain. All uh, right, but not now. You... Mr. Templer, I'm going to wear that gun out hitting people over the head with it. And I couldn't have him warn anyone we're here. Why, we're going to burgle the joint? In a way. Huh? And a kinder description would be search the place, Louis. Oh, for what? Oddly enough, something that can't be seen or touched. Sounds like a ghost. Yes, and in a way it is. The ghost of a murderer. <laughs> Night before Christmas, all right, but a creature is stirring. A couple of creatures, boss. Yeah, we've covered all the rooms on the other landing. Therefore, the bedroom should be here. And therefore, this should be someone's bedroom. Let's go in. We're sleeping? Now, if I can open the door softly enough and look in. Mm-hmm. Move right through the window. Yes. The dressing room. Door beyond would be the bedroom proper. Proper is not a word we're in any position to throw around. Yeah, we'll have to go in to the dressing room. Come on, Louis. Okay. Wait a minute, Louis. Hmm? Inhale. Mr. Thumb. 
people, I don't usually take breathing exercises in the middle of the night. Na- Louis. All right. I'm inhaling. Well? I feel. Mm-hmm. Familiar? I could learn to love it, but no. Mm. Well, then out we go. You didn't care for that perfume. You didn't tell me anything. What do you want perfume should tell you? Who killed Fats Boiler? <laughs> Another bedroom. We go in? Naturally. <laughs> For a bachelor, that ain't the word you should have used. I'm beginning to get worried about this. Supposing somebody screams. Pull yourself together, Louis. Okay. After all, like the poet says, strong heart never won fair maiden. You mean faint heart. All right, so for dinner I'll eat dog food. Now. Mm-hmm. Another dressing room. Well. Hey, Mr. Templer. Yes. The same perfume we noticed. Oh, uh, Uh-oh, uh, don't be frightened. Why, Simon, what are you doing in here? Louis and I have been testing perfumes. It's the middle of the night. You're waking me. I'm sorry. I'm even sorrier about something else. What's that? The perfume you use is very distinctive, Sally. I supposed to say thanks? No. Because the last place Louis and I noticed it was in Fats Boylan's room. Minutes after he'd been killed. Oh. Not good, Sally. You're, you're making all this up. Or, no, uh, no. This bottle of perfume will be evidence. But I didn't kill Boylan. You must be joking about that. I don't think a jury would find it funny. You knew about Boylan stealing the jewels. You must have helped him. I, I didn't. But then you found yourself being trailed by Hudson, who'd been hired by Mrs. Worth. You were afraid he'd discover the connection between you and Boylan. That's why you came to my apartment. No. Oh, yes. You hoped I'd throw Hudson off, perhaps frighten him. In the meanwhile, you could get to Boylan, get the jewels from him. That isn't true. But when you got to Boylan's place, you found him already dead. And the jewels gone. I didn't. It would be much better for you that way. What do you mean? You wouldn't be liable to a first-degree murder charge. But... There were detectives here while the party was going on. Boylan couldn't have stolen the jewels. They saw him leave. He didn't have them. He did have them. He was playing Santa Claus, and he was a thin man. Santa Claus is, as Louis pointed out to me earlier tonight, are fat. Therefore, Boylan entered this house wearing padding underneath his costume. He left it with a large jewel box in place of the padding. That's how he did it, Sally. You're smart. Hmm. You found Boylan. You knew his address. Therefore, you'd hired him in the first place. And therefore, also, a jury would believe you'd killed him unless you tell us who did. Oh, all right. I'll tell There's you... There's really no need, my dear. Oh, oh Claude. Hey, Mr. Templer, tell him to point the gun someplace else. Mr. Worth, point that gun someplace else. I prefer this direction. You were saying, Mr. Templer, about the jewels. The jewels were insured. Therefore, you, Mr. Worth, arranged to have them stolen. Indeed. Indeed. In that way, you could retain the jewels, the insurance money as well, and not worry very much whether or not your wife divorced you. Clever. Boylan is dead. How true. You had to see to that, didn't you? Otherwise, he might have blackmailed you for the rest of your life or for whatever money you got out of the entire crooked deal. I can see two other deaths. Yours, your friend. And Sally? You going to kill her, too? That depends, I should think, on Sally. Claude, I never knew you intended to to kill anyone. There's no need to play the engine quite so strenuously, my dear. You were in on most of it. But not murder. Hmm. I'm afraid Mr. Templer's pessimism is justified. I shall have to include you. But however did you get on to her, Templer? Her perfume. To be precise, this perfume. Well, you got him in the eye. Yeah, I hope this gets him someplace more effective. <laughs> Mr. Templer, the trail of unconscious bodies you're leaving behind you tonight, if laid end to end, yes, Lillian. would look terrible. <laughs> Simon. Yes, Carla? You've been very sweet. Even without your whiskers, you've been sort of a, a Santa Claus to me. <laughs> May I? Oh, with pleasure. Well, <laughs> I never knew Santa Claus could kiss like that. Santa Claus is no saint. Yes? Oh. <laughs> um, uh, hello, Louis. Mr. Templer. 
You better put on your whiskers. You forgotten all about Mrs. Winterbottom? Mrs. Winterbottom. Oh, well, the hour is past midnight. The tots have undoubtedly totted off to bed by now. Louis, you may tell Mrs. Winterbottom... I know. <laughs> that the saint ain't no Santa Claus. <laughs> You have been listening to another transcribed adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. Now, here is our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, all of us who live in the United States are aware of the spiritual values of American life, our factories and machines and luxuries. But there is another side to American life, a side made up of spiritual values. Our country was founded upon faith in God. In the Declaration of Independence, it states that men were endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Thus, religious faith is part of the very foundation of American democracy. And one of our most precious national heritages is freedom of worship. By exercising this freedom... You and your families can enjoy the spiritual pleasures that come with church or synagogue attendance. Moreover, your religious leaders stand ready to give you their help, whether you need personal or family guidance. And if you suffer the loneliness natural to a newcomer to this country, the churches of your faith will welcome you. We all know that without spiritual values, the other advantages of American life have little meaning. Without faith, the family and the community become unstable. Without faith, the individual denies himself the peace and guidance of religion. The doors of your churches and synagogues are open to you. The freedom to worship as you please is yours. And so America's religious organizations invite you to find yourself through faith and to come to church this week. And may I wish you all a wonderful Christmas, and for the world, peace in all the years to come. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure of the saint. Good night. This adventure of The Saint was written by Louis Vitties. Our cast included Mary Shipp as Sally and Betty Lou Gerson as Carla. High Everback was Hudson. Ted Osborne, Claude. The Butler, Stanley Farrar. Louis is played by Larry Dotkin. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Helen Mack. Vincent Price is soon to be seen co-starring in RKO's production of His Kind of Woman. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer, Don Stanley. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. For your Christmas Eve listening pleasure, there's another broadcast of NBC's Sunday hour-and-a-half extravaganza, The Big Show. There's a whole Christmas stocking full of stars, including Tallulah, Jimmy Durante, Edwin, Charles Boyer, Robert Merrill, and many more. Tonight also means your weekly visit with the Harris family on the Phil Harris Alice Fay Show. Be sure to hear this special Christmas program later today on NBC. Happy holiday, happy listening. Happy holiday, happy listening. NBC wishes you a season of good cheer. A merry, merry Christmas. And a happy From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Welcome to Hollywood.
Hollywood, Mr. Dollar. This is Daryl. Daryl? Uh, Jim Daryl. Daryl and Clark Insurance. We wrote up the farm quiz policy. Oh, that Daryl. For a minute, I thought maybe... Yeah, yeah, everyone does. Uh, about the policy. Understand you're worried about it. National Underwriters is. They asked me to take a look. Come on over and help yourself. It's a simple enough policy. $100,000 coverage on both Dr. Carl Palmquist and his wife. It's that double indemnity clause I'm interested in. Becomes effective the end of this week, doesn't it? That's right. Why? What's wrong? An anonymous letter sent to underwriters. Kind of hints that somebody's going to try to collect. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to National Underwriters Association, 1180 River Road, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the long shot matter. Expense account item one, $174.90. Airfare and incidentals to Hollywood, California. A good night's sleep at the Beverly Hilton Hotel and in the morning sunshine, Hartford's slush was only a clammy memory. Nobody walks in California, so when in Rome... Item two, two dollars even. Cab fare to Daryl and Clark Insurance Brokers. Beverly Hills, where else? Come on in, Dollar. Won't be a minute. Grab a chair. One look at the furnishings and you knew a lot of insurance was sold here. It takes a flock of premiums to pay for the really good modern and the long, clean, functional stuff. Impressive. Jim Daryl was even more so, and I'd have bet that 90% of his policyholders were women. He seemed to be doing two things at once, shaving and keeping track of passers-by in the street outside. I watched him glance quickly out the window for the fifth time, smile happily, then make a check mark on a desk pad. Ah, huh? I give up. What is it? The electric shaver. I mean the bit outside the window. Oh, it's uh, this year's version of counting license plates. You playing alone? Uh-uh. With Clark, my partner. You see, he takes charcoal gray suits and I take Bermuda shorts, based on strictly how many pass the window. The other side of the street doesn't count. Loser buys lunch. Where's Clark? Seeing a prospect. We play on the honor system. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Darrell. Uh, there, that's funny. Yeah. Uh, palm quiz policy, huh? You uh, want to know about it? Well, you sound reluctant. It's delicate. So is this letter. Look into palm quiz policy. You may have to pay off soon. Nice corny touch there. Letters from a magazine pasted on to form the message. Well, the style's a little old hat, but the meaning's clear enough. You want to fill me in? The Palmquist, Mr. Dollar, the last of one of our oldest families out here. Name, social position, money. They've got it all. That's why I'm not too impressed with this little, uh, communique. You were telling me about the family. Palmquist's a doctor, an important one. Six-dish, to the manner born. Complete with iron-gray hair and distinguished bearing. A, uh, knows-what-he-wants type of man. Has a tremendous practice and still finds time to go hunting about two months out of every year. And his wife? Invalid, confined to the house. A huge house, by the way, out near the beach. And there's a son, Eric, 25, who lives with him. That's the family. About the policy, Darrell. Simple enough. 100,000 straight coverage on both Dr. Palmquist and his wife. And the beneficiaries? Only one, the son Eric. For both? For both. Hmm. That's a pretty pointed grunt. Why not? I was thinking of the double indemnity clause that'll be effective in a few days. That's what I thought you were thinking. Well, let me have a couple of addresses, will you? The house at the beach and Palmquist's office. Sure. The uh, office is only a few blocks from here. And, uh, Dollar, please be tactful, will you? Those premiums, they're so lovely. The way to make sure they keep coming is to keep people healthy. Yeah, I guess you have some... Hey, what do you know? Another one. What? Uh, Bermuda shorts. That puts me three up. Clark's going to scream like an eagle when he pays that lunch check. Today we eat at Romanoff's. I walked the four or five blocks to Dr. Carl Palmquist's office. It was easy to find. You just look for the most expensive building in the most expensive part of Beverly Hills, or as the natives sometimes call it, Lootville. As I turned into the entrance, a young executive type brushed past me on the street. Suit? Charcoal gray. I hoped he wouldn't pass Daryl's window. Dr. Palmquist's office was all it should be. Tasteful, quietly lush, the kind of place that made you wonder why he didn't live right there. The nurse who came forward did nothing to destroy the thought. Blonde, complete with doe eyes, retrousse nose, and a figure that floated. Great medicine for the sick. May I help you? I'd like to see the doctor. You have an appointment, Mr. Dollar, Johnny Dollar. No, I haven't. Dr. Palmquist isn't in right now. Oh, what time will he be back? Well, he has a 4.30 appointment. Suppose I show at 5, then, Miss... Lund. 
Steffi Lund. Miss Lund. Five? I can't promise anything, but you might try. Oh, I will. I'll try like mad. Expense account item three, thirty-eight dollars even. Deposit and first day's rental on a drive-it-yourself car. And driving it out along Sunset Boulevard was delightful. I had no trouble at all getting into the California spirit. I pretended that I was a movie producer going home to his starlet wife. I found the Palmquist house on a quiet dead-end street high on the Palisades overlooking the Pacific. Daryl was right. It was huge, a single-story farmhouse that seemed to ramble endlessly. It was a long way to come for nothing. I walked around the side of the house. Nobody tried to stop me. I moved through an open breezeway and wished that somebody had, because suddenly I felt like an intruder, because of the woman sitting in the wheelchair, staring vacantly down at the swimming pool that sparkled in the sunlight, because of the way she poured a drink from the bottle beside her without ever looking at it, because of the way she held the glass as though she wanted you to believe it was sarsaparilla tea, not whiskey. It's... Isn't really medicine, you know. I only pretend that it is. Yeah, sure. Look, I I didn't mean to barge in like this, uh, Mrs. Palmquist. Victor says it's disgusting. Calls it a sign of weakness. Do you feel that way, young man? Well, uh, <clears throat> nobody does anything without a reason. Uh, my name is Dollar, Mrs. Palmquist, and, well, I'd, I'd like to talk to you for a little while, if, if you feel up to it. Weakness. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's... Very sorry. Victor wouldn't like that, either. Would you mind wheeling me into the house, young man? I'm very tired. Oh, yeah, sure thing. You just relax. She leaned back in the chair and closed her eyes. She wasn't sleeping, just somewhere off in thoughts of her own. I pushed the chair toward the house as gently as I could. It wasn't until we almost reached it that I realized we had an audience, a good-looking kid in his mid-twenties watching us from a bedroom window. A kid who didn't want to be seen the way he jumped back from the window told me that. It was getting pretty weird out. Inside the house, I wheeled Mrs. Palmquist into a large living room. Gently, patiently, I tried to get her to answer a few questions, but I got nowhere. She wasn't rude, just secretive, smiling, and very far away. I was wondering how to get out gracefully when... I'm so very sorry. I'm afraid I haven't been very attentive, have I, Mr. Dollar? Suddenly, just as clear and lucid as that. I looked around to see what had made this almost magical change, and he was standing just inside the room, the kid I'd seen watching from the window. Eric, come here, dear. This is my son, Eric. I'm afraid I've forgotten where you told me you were from, Mr. Dollar. I... My mother's been ill, Mr. Dollar. She's not supposed to be disturbed. Oh, now, here... Oh, I am sorry. I was just leaving. Good. I'll show you the way out. Oh. Maybe that would be best. You'll come back again, Mr. Dollar, when I'm feeling better. Yes, yeah, sure, of course. Please make it soon. I don't seem to keep... Very good track of time. Another sign of weakness, I suppose. Well, I... uh... When you show Mr. Dollar out, please come back, Paul. Oh, yes, Mother. You're a good son, Paul. Uh, This way, Mr. Dollar. What do you want here? You can see she isn't well. Yeah, yeah. It didn't take you long to go from Eric to Paul, did it? She is not insane. You hear, Mr. Dollar? I didn't say she was. Now, why did she call you Paul? Paul was my older brother. He died three years ago. That's part of why she's like she is. A small part. Oh, I'm sorry. Nobody's asking you to be. Just don't come back here. I had plenty of time to kill before five o'clock, and a lot of things would have been pleasant. Sopping up the Malibu sun, watching the kids on the beach, you name it. But instead, I settled for a visit with an old friend, Lieutenant Barry, homicide. I wasn't just being social. Pretty sneaky, as a matter of fact. 
The anonymous note which underwriters had received intrigued Barry, and he promised to have it gone over by the police lab. At five on the dot, I was back in Dr. Palmquist's office. Hi. You're a punctual sort of patient, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I used to get gold stars for it at school. Well, I'm afraid Dr. Palmquist doesn't get one. He called just a little while after you left this morning. Oh? He said to cancel all appointments for today that he wouldn't be in. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so am I. I would have called you, but I didn't know where to reach you. Oh, sure, that's okay. What about tomorrow? I can give you an appointment at 10. How's that? I'll be here. Thanks. Oh, Mr. Dollar, would you like to give me some information now? Like what? Medical history, previous illnesses, complaints, the usual thing. Saves time in the morning. Well, why don't we wait till tomorrow, in case Dr. Palmquist decides to play hooky again. There's one nice thing about this job. You get around so much you learn to pick up local habits without even thinking about it. For instance, that evening, I had a leisurely dinner, then took in an endless double feature. All without ever once getting out of my car. Drive in, you know. It was well after midnight when I got back to my hotel, feeling a kinship for bus drivers everywhere. I headed across the lobby, ran smack into Jim Darrell as I rounded the cigar stand. Whoa! Oh, dollar. Where have you been? Well, hi, Darrell. Hey, who wound up paying for lunch? Listen, I've been trying to get hold of you all night. Where were you? Dinner, a movie, the wildlife, huh? Well, don't look that unhappy. I didn't do anything illegal. Somebody did. What? Hey, what is it, Daryl? What are you talking about? Mrs. Palmquist. Dead. Shot to death a couple of hours ago. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, variations on an old theme. You pays your money and you takes your choice. But no matter how you pick it, it comes out murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, Lieutenant Barry, homicide. Got messages from you three inches thick. Yeah, I've been trying to get hold of you all morning. Well, it hasn't exactly been a social tea around here, you know. What with the murder of Dr. Pomquist's wife. Can I come down there to headquarters? Come ahead, and if you're a good boy, I'll introduce you to the man who did the killing. What? Of course, he denies it completely. Who wouldn't? But will you hear his story? It's a wild one. Hold it. You're way ahead of me. You're saying you've got the killer there? That's what I'm saying. Well... 
Who is he? You wouldn't know him. Nobody seems to. Make a little sense, would you, Lieutenant? Look, you coming down or not? Right now. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California, to National Underwriters Association, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment... The Long Shot Matter. Los Angeles traffic being what it is, there was plenty of time to think on the way to Barry's office. But think about what? An unsigned warning that someone was going to collect on a $100,000 policy? A frail, defeated woman who wasn't going to have to worry about weakness anymore. There was an awful lot to find out before this whole thing could begin to make sense. That was pretty obvious. The man I was going to see was anything but obvious. Big and round, he was like a fat cubie doll with a gun. You always had the feeling his round little eyes were dreaming past you, seeing an island where there was no jail cells. A lot of cons had made that mistake, found out too late that Barry was as sharp as any homicide cop alive. Life is like that, huh, Johnny? Yesterday your visit was social, today it's business. Yeah, just one dead woman can make a lot of difference. Sit down. Like I said, I'm way behind you. How did it happen? When? Sit down. I can't talk when you're standing. Okay. Santa Monica substation got the call about nine last night from Dr. Palmquist. He was real excited, said he was holding a rifle on a prowler who'd come in and shot and killed his wife. So we got out there fast. Wait a minute. Did the doctor know? (laughs) Let me tell it my way, huh? Okay. We found Mrs. Palmquist dead on the living room floor, and the doctor's still holding this guy at rifle point. 38 Colt lay in a corner with nobody paying much attention to it. Ballistic says it's the murder weapon, all right. What's the doctor's story? Says he was out on a house call, got home a couple of minutes before nine. On the way to the front door, he glanced through the living room window, saw this prowler holding a gun on Mrs. Palmquist. The doctor got into the house quietly and was sneaking up from behind when the prowler heard him and got rattled. The prowler fired and killed the woman just as the doc brought a paperweight down on his head. Nice, huh? A little out of left field... Funny, I always thought prowlers and gunmen are two different things. Nothing says it can't happen, and the evidence says it did. What does that mean? That this is one prowler who's sewn up tight, because everything checks out. The thirty-eight is his, his prints are on it. Lab found the lock he forced to get in. What else you want, a moving picture? Oh, don't get mad, don't get mad. I'm just asking. Now, that house call the doctor was out on, I'm a stranger in town, but isn't that kind of a late hour to see a patient, unless it's a real emergency? Not when they look like this one. Oh? I checked with her this morning. She could make me go to medical school right now, even at this age. Nice, huh? Put it this way. Her first name ought to be Marilyn. Well, that's pretty clear. Who is she? A Mrs. Laura Considine. Thirty-five, widow, money, and everyone should look like that. She been Dr. Palmquist's patient long? Three or four years. And she backs up the story of the house call completely. You sold? I want to know about the prowler. Who is he? Ex-con, drifter, 57 years old, got a record that goes way back. What kind of record? I was afraid you'd ask, because that's the fly in the ointment. It's a long sheet and it's buried. Bunko, con game, badger, bad checks, pigeon drop, all small stuff. But not an ounce of violence anywhere. A killing's way out of pattern, isn't it? Yeah. This prowler, what does he claim? It's so wild I'm embarrassed to repeat it. How's chances of my seeing him? Maybe he'll tell me. Barry took me upstairs to what they call the hotshot section. A very exclusive floor, this one, because the cells hold only prisoners suspected of the big rap, murder. And you know something? I never heard a place like this, but what an old fallacy comes bouncing back into my mind. That bit about being able to tell a man's character by looking at him. What does a murderer look like? <laughs> Go ahead, put yourself out on that limb, but don't drag me out there with you. Because the man sitting quietly in cell 8A looked about as hard and dangerous as a Victorian antimacassar. Lonnie Miller, prowler and murder suspect. Lonnie Miller, gray-haired, tall and slim, a man with good straight bearing even while he sat. Yet, with a delicacy about him. Or maybe it was just the natural good manners of the born con man. I didn't know. Yell when you want out, Johnny. Yeah. I'm not going to change the story. I'll tell it again, but it'll be the same. 
Is that what you want, officer? I'm not the police, Miller. My name is Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. It's a little late for me to buy insurance, isn't it? Miller, you don't have to talk to me if you don't want to, but you'd be helping yourself if you told me the truth. They didn't believe me, not one word. Why would you? My jobs are different. My interest is in the insurance angle. Did you kill Mrs. Palmquist? I'm nearly 60, mister, and I've done everything in the book, almost everything. But I never killed. Never. I can't make them see that. Yeah, I know. Told them a hundred times, word for word, step by step. They just sit and look at me. What do I have to do to make them believe I didn't do it? From what I hear, they've got an awful lot of evidence that says you did. You too, huh? Go away, mister. You may be a little different kind of cop, but you're talking like all the others. You're thinking like them. Let me alone. You haven't got much chance, Miller, if that's your only answer to evidence. Evidence? I know all about that stuff. You can buy it and sell it, manufacture it, make it stand up and do tricks. The cops... Miller, you're talking through your hat. You've been the route. Do you know one case where the police ever manufactured evidence? And I don't mean con talk. I mean one you actually know of. What's the difference? Look, why don't you tell me about it? Think you could listen without sneering? Nobody else can. Try me, huh? Now, how did you get into this? I just finished doing time in San Diego. Been hitchhiking my way up from there. Four nights ago, a truck let me off on the Pacific Coast Highway, about 15 miles south of L.A. A few minutes later, a man in a big cab gave me a lift. Nice enough fella. A little nosy about where I was from, where I was going, things like that. But, but nice. Yeah, go on. After about five minutes, he decided we needed coffee. So we stopped at a little tacos joint. Ten minutes later, we were back on the road. After about two miles, he said it felt like we had a flat. So we stopped. It was a flat, all right, left rear. So? Well, he had given me the lift. The least I could do was to change his tire, so I did it. He was real friendly the rest of the way. Told me to stick around town and he'd see I got a job. He gave me a twenty. Told me where to get a room and said to wait for him to phone. He said his name was Carter. You do what he said? Last night he called me. Said to be at his house at nine sharp to meet a man who had a job for me. An address in the Palisades. Well, go on. The house was dark when I got there, so I rang the bell. Someone opened the door... I took one step inside and got hit on the head. Next thing I know, I'm coming to on the living room floor. There's a dead woman a few feet away. And my friend Carter is holding a rifle at my head, threatening to blow it off if I move. Only when the cops got there, they didn't call him Carter, but Dr. Palmquist. Palmquist? Miller, do you realize what you're saying? I know. And every word of it's the truth. Now tell me this, mister. How do I get anyone to believe it? Miller sat there quietly, looking first at his burning cigarette, then at me. It was as though he didn't expect either one of us to believe him. I was glad to get out of there. Well, I'll say this much for Miller, Johnny. He's got that story down pat. He didn't tell you one word that he hasn't been telling us. Lieutenant, does Dr. Palmquist know what Miller claims? We haven't discussed it. Didn't I tell you the doctor's resting at Blair Hospital for a day or so, shock of his wife's death? Do you intend to tell him? Look, I know you're a fellow who automatically roots for the underdog, but face it, boy, what have I got? An ex-con with a wild story against a respected citizen with a perfect alibi. I'd look kind of silly questioning Palmquist at the moment. At the moment? Does that mean you've got doubts about Palmquist? I doubt everybody till the last page, boy. That's how I got to be lieutenant. And that's where we left it. I had a long, thoughtful lunch, which included two very dry martinis aimed at helping solve a new problem. To which, how best to arrange a few words with a hospitalized Dr. Palmquist at such a delicate time. In the end, I did the only thing I could. Walked into room 913 at Blair Hospital and introduced myself. Dr. Palmquist didn't seem at all surprised by the visit. He seemed annoyed, if anything. But the annoyance was with himself. 
I'm not a very good advertisement for my own profession at the moment, am I, Mr. Dollar? I, uh, I'm sorry to intrude, Doctor. I probably could have picked a better time for a visit. You've been doing your best. What? Which do you prefer, Mr. Dollar, my office or my home? Would you like the names of a few friends? Perhaps they can tell you whatever it is you're trying to find out about me. It's my job, Doctor. And just what is your job, Mr. Dollar? Insurance investigator for the company that holds the policy on Mrs. Palmquist and yourself. I see. Then you can stop running around now, can't you? You can simply go to the police and they'll tell you anything you want to know. <sighs> Doctor, may Mr. I... Mr. Dollar, I don't usually prescribe without a thorough examination, Bob. Please do. Very well. I don't think California is your cup of tea. I suggest another climate entirely. The visit was over. Palmquist lay back against the pillows, no longer interested, and I turned to leave. Just as I was reaching for the door, it opened, and one of the most beautiful women I'd ever seen started into the room. I think you have the wrong room, madam. For a moment, she just stood there, startled. Then, without a word, she turned and hurried out. But not before I'd gotten a good look at the large block initials on the purse she carried, L.C. The two letters, plus the way she looked, made Laura Considine a pretty good bet. Nice twist, huh? The doctor is ill, and the patient comes to call. You can't trust anybody these days, can you? Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, beauty may be skin deep, but fear goes a lot further down than that. Sometimes as far as death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Lieutenant Barry here. Oh, hi, Lieutenant. You're stepping on toes, Johnny boy. Who's now? Dr. Victor Palmquist. Here you had a chat with him. Just how do you chat with a clan? Whatever it was, he was very unhappy about it. He called you? Yeah, very snide, too. Said if we had any more questions, to leave him alone and call his lawyers and to keep unauthorized people away from him. Meaning me? Meaning you. Well, what's he worried about? You've already got his wife's killer in jail, haven't you? Everybody buys that but you, Johnny. You said it before. I'm a hard sale. Meet me for lunch. I'll try to sell you. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, 
Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California, to National Underwriters Association, 1180 River Road, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the long shot matter. Expense account continued. Item three, one dollar even. Taxi to the Barclay for lunch with Lieutenant Berry. But let me backtrack for a minute. Coming down in the hotel elevator, I kept thinking over what the lieutenant had said. And I disagreed completely. I wasn't a hard sale. It's just that I wasn't an early sale. There were too many angles to the death of Mrs. Palmquist. Too many things I didn't know yet. I got proof of that the minute I stepped outside the hotel. The white cared sedan parked directly across the street contained a real interesting combination of people. Eric Palmquist, the doctor's son, and Steffi Lund, the doctor's nurse. The moment they saw me, they did what every amateur sleuth does. They drove away as fast as possible, thereby becoming just as conspicuous as a second nose. By the time I reached the Barclay, Lieutenant Berry had ordered for both of us. You don't like it, order something else, but it's the best they got. Matter of fact, it looks pretty good. Now, as I was saying... Yeah, yeah. So, Palmquist, nurse, and his kid are an item. You waiting for me to look impressed? You get up out of the wrong side this morning, Lieutenant. Look, I don't like the smell of this deal any more than you do, but what does it all add up to? You're sent out here to look into a possible killing. Which happens? Victim, Mrs. Palmquist. So, an ex-convict sits in a cell accused of the murder. The accuser and witness, the dead woman's husband. The con insists he's been framed, that the husband is a killer. But the husband is well alibied, bringing it down to the setup known as ex-con versus respected citizen. You know there's more to it than that. Don't give me lessons, Johnny. You think you've come up with one thing we don't already know about? I got checkouts going on the doctor, his nurse, his son, everybody within shooting distance of this thing. Don't get any ideas we're asleep down at the hall. All right, all right. Give me a little fill, huh? Who? Palmquist's nurse, Steffi Lund. Nice kid, never been in trouble. At least we couldn't find any. What about the boy, Eric Palmquist? Typical rich doctor's son. Kind of wild, sensitive, gambles, but Papa can afford it. Also hits the booze too much for a kid that young. What about the doctor's alibi, Laura Considine? Yeah. No, I should have skipped that one. Your eyes look like they're whistling. Isn't that awful? At my age, too. <clears throat> All right, Johnny, she's clean. By the way, where does she live? There's a big house in Long Beach. Why? No doctors there? It's still a free country. I know people whose doctors live in Patterson, New Jersey. Points. Oh, almost forgot. I got the lab report on that anonymous note that started this thing. Anything? Untraceable. No prints. Cheap paper that can be bought anywhere. And the letters were cut from a dozen different magazines. Didn't tell us a thing. What do you mean it didn't? What? It told us someone was going to try to collect on a policy. We knocked it around a little while longer, getting no place in particular. Then suddenly I was being paid for a telephone call. Barry's raised eyebrows were eloquent. They made me feel like one of those would-be movie stars who have themselves paged in the brown derby so that other would-be stars will know they're there. I had a funny notion about who might be calling, so I told the waiter I'd taken in the booth out front and left Lieutenant Barry by himself. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I'm so glad I found you. Oh? This is... This is Steffi Lund, Dr. Palmquist's nurse. Well, the day's picking up. I'm sorry. I hope I didn't interrupt your lunch. You see, I called your hotel and they told me where you'd gone. I'm sorry. Well, I... don't apologize, Steffi. A working girl who drives around in a beautiful white Cadillac doesn't have to, you know. I... I'll explain about that. Why should you owe me any explanation? Please, Mr. Dollar. I've got to see you right away. It's terribly important. Mr. Dollar. Where are you? I'm at Dr. Palmquist's office. Can you come here now, right away? Okay, I'll be right over. And please... Don't bring anyone along with you, will you? However you want it, you're calling the shots. Thank you. And hurry, please. Expense account item four. Citation for speeding, $25. The carbon copy reads 63 miles per hour in a 35 zone. You ever try to talk an L.A.-type cop out of a ticket? It's ridiculous. He's always a big, good-looking guy who listens seriously while you alibi, but never stops writing. Then he smiles, calls you sir, and hands you the ticket. I couldn't beef about it, though. Two reasons. One, I deserved it. 
And two, if I hadn't been stopped, I'd never have realized I was being tailed. Because the tail knew what he was doing. A heavy set, thuggy looking fellow in a black 51 sedan. He circled the block twice while I was getting the ticket. It was right back on me as I started out again. He was still there as I pulled up in front of Dr. Palmquist's office. But he was smart enough to ride on by without even looking at me. I waited to see if he'd come around the block again. He didn't. That's a switch. When you called me a few minutes ago, you no, said... No, you're mistaken. I, I didn't well, call no, you. Well, wait just a I minute. I didn't call you. Don't her you words were deliberate, emphatic, you. but her eyes were suddenly doing the real talking, signaling desperately into the room behind her, trying to tell me that she wasn't alone. But I wasn't the only one who caught the signal. Get away from the door, Stevie. Come in, you. Did you hear me? I said come in. Eric, please. Hello, Eric. What seems to be the trouble around here? That's far enough. Oh, now, come on. Why don't you put that thing down? Your family's had enough misery with 38s. He's dying. Do what he says. Why did you call him, Steffi? Why? Because somebody's got to help you because of what you're going through and what it's doing to you. Eric, I can't stand any more of it. You're half out of your mind with fear. Now, listen to him, Eric. Maybe he can you help. You think he can help? You think anybody can? One thing's sure. That gun's not going to help you any... Come on now, kid, put it down. No. No, because nobody tells me what to do. Not when I've got a gun. They're afraid to. (laughs) That's right. They're afraid to. You're both afraid, aren't you? (laughs) It's nice. It's nice for somebody else to be afraid. I like that. I I really like that. (laughs) He wasn't even looking at us anymore. Just somewhere off into space. Somehow, Steffi sensed that I was waiting for a chance to grab his gun and motion for me not to. And suddenly I remembered where I'd seen that lost, empty look before. Mrs. Palmquist, Eric's mother. She'd had her share of that look the day she died. (laughs) Mr. Dollar, help me with him, please. I picked him up, put him on the couch... He had that terrible whiteness that a deep faint brings, and Steffi didn't waste any time. She loosened his collar, shoved his head forward. In a few minutes, he shut it once, came to, took a deep breath. We made him comfortable on the couch, but you could see that it had been a rough trip for him. He was conscious, but he didn't have the strength to open his eyes. Steffi just stared at him. He'll be all right now. What's wrong with him, Steffi? Why that, that thing that just happened? He wants a technical name. Circulatory liability. Sound impressive. Talk layman, huh? A form of extreme hypertension. Nerves. Enough to make him faint like that from anger, from fear. It's a lovely thing for a man to go through, isn't it? Well, that that calls for a different kind of medicine, doesn't it? Analysis with a psychiatrist. He's in it now. Only with Eric, it's going to take a long time. Maybe a very long time. But a kid like that, how? Why? Fear. Overpowering, petrifying fear. Of what? His father. Of Dr. Palmquist? Yes. The nice Dr. Palmquist. The gentle, quiet healer. My employer. My father-in-law. You and Eric are married? Tijuana, six weeks ago. Eric is 25 years old, Mr. Dollar. And he's so afraid of his father we're still keeping the marriage a secret. Why, Steffi? Why is he so afraid of Palmquist? His analyst hasn't been able to get through to that. You expect me to? Well, somebody better. Why did you say that? Because he waved that gun around very convincingly for a scared kid. He never would have fired. Don't you understand? He's so frightened he couldn't have made himself do it. I hope you're right. I didn't think it was quite the time to mention one small fact. That if Eric Palmquist was incapable of pulling a trigger, it might turn out to be a very good thing for him. As the sole beneficiary of his mother's will, he would soon have $100,000 in a nice, tidy lump. And if he really was afraid of his father, a piece of money like that could take him a long, long way from the parental fold. 
In fact, no matter which way you turned, you couldn't get away from the logic that Eric Palmquist might be regarded by some parties as a first-class suspect in the death of his mother. <laughs> Steffi was still pretty much upset when I finally left her, and I must admit that my own mind wasn't exactly at ease. Hoping that the fresh air would help to clear my thoughts, I took my time driving back, and it must have been nearly an hour later when I pulled into the subterranean garage of my hotel. I guess I was thinking too hard about what had just happened. In any case, I wasn't quick enough. Just as I passed one of the garage's big concrete pillars, a figure stepped out from behind it, brought the business end of a coat banging down on my head. The ground climbed up and got me. But not before I had a look at him. My heavy set, thuggy looking friend who tailed me earlier in the day. He could talk, too. You're in the wrong town, punk. Take the hint. I took the hint. I passed out. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a study in reactions. Three of them. One by a man who should know, one by a man who doesn't, and another by a bullet. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Oh, this is Dr. Van Clauser returning your call, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, Doctor. Uh, May I ask who recommended me? I inquired about a good psychiatrist, and it came up you. Yes. Well, the first step is usually an office appointment for a preliminary check. That's what I had in mind. Today? My schedule is quite full. Would tomorrow be suitable? Today would be better. Oh, I see... But there should be ample time. There should be ample time, but there isn't. In fact, I'm running out of it fast. Very well. Eleven o'clock. Dust off your couch. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Brown.
from Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California. To National Underwriters Association, 1180 River Road, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the long shot matter. Johnny Dollar, hypochondriac, complete with assorted medical advisors. I needed one of them before I even got down to the lobby of my hotel. It was a house medic, that's item five, five dollars, who'd patched me up yesterday after a thug had worked me over in the hotel garage. Now came checkup time, and the doctor was a fusser, and he disapproved of me. Hold still now, hold still. Yeah, yeah, but that's my head you're digging into. I wouldn't have to if somebody else hadn't split it open. Oh, there. Hey. Well, it looks a little better. Yeah, well, don't sound so enthusiastic. Walking into a wall. It's the best <laughs> I could think of at the moment. Likely story. Hold still now. I want to redress that wound on the other side. Hold still. Temper, temper. Funny. He was working on the outside of my head, but it was the inside that ached most. There were reasons, lots of them. Like the murder of a sick old woman the same day I'd arrived. And the anonymous note that had warned of it. Like the victim's husband and an ex-convict accusing each other of committing the crime. It was a rough one, real rough, because the picture kept changing from minute to minute. And my company was on the hook for $100,000. At 11 o'clock, I sat across the desk from Dr. Hans van Clauser, psychiatrist in his Beverly Hills office. He was small, spectacled, and charmingly Viennese. More important, he was the analyst who was treating Eric Palmquist, the murdered woman's son. Uh, now, Mr. Dollar. Afraid I owe you an apology, Doctor. I deceived you a little bit. I'm not exactly here as a patient. Oh, everyone finds it difficult to begin, Mr. Dollar. Uh, suppose we hear some of the medical history first. Huh? I tell you, we're off on the wrong foot, Doctor, and it's my fault. Here, take a look at these, my credentials. I, I see that you're hardly here as a patient. About a patient, let's say. My dear Mr. Dollar, I think you know very well that I can reveal nothing which is told to me in this room. I know that. Then the purpose of this visit? I just want answers from a competent authority about a certain illness. I won't bring personalities into it. It's important, Doctor. And the particular illness? Something called circulatory lability. Uh, you know that it's a form of extremely provoked hypertension? Yeah, that much I do. Hypertension is the result of anxieties. The anxieties may be real or fancied, but the hypertension is very genuine indeed and very dangerous. Dangerous to the extent that a man could turn to violence, maybe kill? If sufficiently aroused, yes, it has happened. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Item 7, 10 cents, recklessly squandered on a phone call to my hotel to check for messages. There was one. Lieutenant Burry of the L.A. Police Department would like to see me at my convenience. Would I? I would. You get practically nowhere ignoring police lieutenants. He stared at the bandage on my head and my assorted cuts and bruises, and his opening line was quite inspired. Oh, what happened to you? Somebody was pretty fast with a gun barrel last night. Where did it happen? Garage, under my hotel. It seems he didn't like my being in town. You got a look at him? Enough. Want to go through the mug book? Uh, no, I'll catch up with him someday. Besides, whoever was paying him is the interesting one. Have it your own way. Well, now, you didn't call me all the way down here for laughs, Lieutenant. Anything special on your mind? Lonnie Miller, the guy we got sitting in cell number 8A, the prowler who shot Mrs. Palmquist. So Dr. Palmquist insists. He isn't the only one, Johnny, not anymore. What? Yeah. We finally traced the murder weapon. It was bought at a pawn shop in Burbank. The pawnbroker positively identified a mugshot of the buyer, Lonnie Miller. <laughs> Police identification evidence is a pretty tough thing to ignore. But I was still what the lieutenant called a hard sale. It wasn't stubbornness, simply the fact that I'm very large for motivation. It can be as wild, as woolly as they come, but it's got to be there somewhere. And somehow, with so many good ones around, the worn, faded man in cell 8A didn't raid in that company. I asked the lieutenant for a couple of minutes with Lonnie Miller. He shook his head as though he felt sorry for me, but okayed the visit anyway. Miller, you're angry about something, Mr. Dollar. I can tell it's in your face. Yeah, about a story you told me the other day. 
about Dr. Palmquist giving you a lift, keeping you around town, then using you as a patsy so he could kill his wife. You want to change any of it? You asking if I lied, mister? Is that it? That's it. It's figured to be like this sooner or later. Goodbye, mister. Come on, Miller. Talk to me. Lie? You think I'd lie to the only man who even looked like he believed me? You still have an answer. Mister. Mister, don't you think I know I haven't got a chance? That I'm dead? I don't even care anymore. But I didn't lie. Not one word. A Burbank pawnbroker says you did. Says you bought the murder gun from him. I've never even been in Burbank, I swear to you. How could I have bought the gun? He identified a picture of you. Says you showed your driver's license as identification. Where is your license, Miller? In my wallet, downstairs. They took everything when they booked me. Mr. Dollar? Tell it to me all over again, Miller, from the minute Dr. Palmquist gave you the lift, step by step, every single detail. Tell it to me. He began slowly, haltingly. The words just kind of fell out of his mouth in a tired, hopeless fashion. It was the same story he told so many times now. I had reason for making him go through it. Some small, hazy idea that was tugging at the back of my brain, jagged, undeveloped, but an idea. When I left the cell, I had Miller's permission to look in his wallet. The police custodian showed it to me five minutes after that. The license wasn't there. Expense account item eight, ten cents, an L.A. newspaper, three days old. One which played up the Palmquist killing big contained pictures of both Dr. Palmquist, grieving husband, and Lonnie Miller, suspected killer. Purpose? To be used in backtracking. The drive down to Long Beach could have been pleasant. Sun, ocean, a relaxing type day, but not for me. Not with what was going on inside my head. Even the soft breeze coming in off the Pacific couldn't sweep the pieces together for me. Sure, for a few seconds, everything would make sense. Then, a moment later, some small fact would make the whole theory collapse. I knew one thing, though. If this whole deal was a frame, it was a great one, a work of art, something to be admired. Provided your name was neither Lonnie Miller or National Underwriters. About six miles this side of Long Beach, I found what I was looking for. The little tacos joint where Miller claimed he and Dr. Palmquist had stopped for coffee. Hola, amigo. You you like some tacos? Sure. Uh, Sit down. It won't be a minute. Owner around? (laughs) You're looking at him, amigo. Irving Gonzalez, owner. Irving? Sure. I, I had it changed. Nobody could pronounce Plutarco Gonzalez. <laughs> uh, see your point. He <laughs> doesn't pay to make problems for your customers in business. Yeah. Uh, when are you going to work up to asking the questions, amigo? What? <laughs> I can make tacos blindfolded and I can tell a cop the same way. Well, you're not too far wrong. Want to take a look at this newspaper? Either of these men ever been in here? And Dr. Victor... Palm Quist, Lonnie Miller. Oh, I read about that killing. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, what about it, Irving? What about what? These men. Have they ever been in here, alone, together, any time? Yes, I mean, they look kind of familiar, but maybe it's only because I see them in the papers. Do you know? Is that the best you can do? Well, well, look, amigo, you stand behind a counter all day and everybody looks like everybody else. You wouldn't want me to make a guess, and that's all I'd be doing, guessing. No, I wouldn't want that. Here, nice and hot. Eat your tacos, amigo. Thanks, anyway. I'll skip them this time. Here. You know something? I don't blame you. Look at this. Pills. Pills? Pills. I eat them by the dozen. Do you know why, amigo? Tacos. There's this about the racket. You try, you strike out, you can't waste time thinking about it. You get on to the next step. The step, Laura Considine, Dr. Palmquist's lovely alibi the night of his wife's death. Her house was only a few miles out of Long Beach. It seemed logical to head for it. I reached it about 20 minutes later, a large, old-fashioned, and seemingly deserted house in a promontory that jutted out into the Pacific. Strike out number two, the hostile iron fence that circled it made its point. Keep out, so I did. Trespassing applies to everyone. 
Where I stood, I couldn't identify the car that suddenly roared away from the back of the house, but one thing was obvious. The driver was in a hurry, and I was getting nowhere. I decided to head back to town. It happened five minutes later as I rounded a curve on my way back to the Pacific Coast Highway. Choice, the Pacific on one side, granite cliffs on the other. I picked the cliffs. Funny what your mind does at moments like that. I remember looking at the mashed inside of the car and wondering which company carried the insurance policy. Then I thought of how good a marksman a man must be to pick off a tire from any of those cliffs. And then I remembered still another thing. Hadn't I been told about someone who was a great shot, who made it a rule to hunt two months out of the year no matter how busy he was? Sure. A highly respected citizen named Dr. Victor Palmquist. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final exciting episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, you want to hide something? Put it in plain view. Only don't go overboard on the system if you're hiding a murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Laura Considine, Mr. Dollar. You don't know me, but... Oh, but I do, Mrs. Considine. You're the best friend a doctor ever had. Dr. Palmquist, that is. Mr. Dollar, He paid you a professional call the night his wife was murdered. That was lucky. Alibis don't grow on trees. Just a minute, Mr. Dollar. Look, lady, I've been slugged, shot at. Matter of fact, someone tried to pick me off with a rifle a couple of hours ago, right near your house. Maybe Dr. Palmquist will alibi you this time. Return the courtesy. Will you please listen? I've got to see you. I've got to talk to you. All right, when? An hour. The bar at your hotel. The martinis will be waiting. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to National Underwriters Association, 1180 River Road, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the long shot matter. Expense account concluded.
There were still a lot of questions, like where I was getting, trying to find out who really had killed Mrs. Palmquist. Like, was it all a smoothly planned frame on the part of her doctor husband? Or had it been a prowler killing by another man now in jail? Or had the dead woman's son, Eric, a complex we didn't know about? Mrs. Considine was five minutes late, but I hoped she could answer some of them. Mr. Dollar? Oh, come now, Mrs. Considine, that reading. It implied we haven't met before, and you know that we have. Well, I don't remember. The day you visited Dr. Palmquist in the hospital and pretended you had the wrong room. Sit down. Oh, there was a reason for that. Sure, there's one for everything. Is there? You think Victor Palmquist had something to do with his wife's death. Well, you're wrong. Completely wrong. Correction. You don't know what I'm thinking, and being wrong is anybody's privilege. You don't know about Victor, Mr. Dollar. What his life's been like, what he had to put up with. Why don't you tell me, Mrs. Considine? That wife of his. A millstone around his neck. A woman in love with a bottle. Go on. And that son of his, that Eric. Insane. Completely insane. He hates his father. He always has. He gains a fortune by that woman's death. But do you suspect him? No, of course not. You badger a man like Victor Palmquist. Now, does that make sense? You're building a big thing on the fact that a lot of people hate Victor Palmquist. But you're overlooking something. Mr. Dollar. Where there's that much hate, there's always a good reason. I went to the hotel garage, rented a car, and pointed it toward Burbank. There was a man in a pawn shop there I wanted to see. The man who had identified Lonnie Miller as the buyer of the gun that had killed Mrs. Victor Palmquist. He turned out to be a mild, friendly little guy with thick glasses and a desire to please. He barely glanced at my identification, pushed it back over the counter to me, and smiled. What do you want to know? Everything you can remember about the man who bought the gun, Mr. Lerner. What's to remember? A kind of skinny, gray-haired fellow come in, said he wanted to buy a gun. I showed him one. He bought it. He showed you a driver's license for identification, didn't he? I copied the information right here in the book. Uh, right here. Lonnie Miller, 173, Fuller, San Diego, height 6 feet, weight 152, color white hair. Here, look yourself. Yeah. Look at this paper, Mr. Lerner. One of these, the fella? Hmm, uh, let me see. Lerner adjusted his glasses and leaned forward to peer at the newspaper I'd put on the counter. It was the way I was leaning on the paper that really started the whole thing. The two pictures were side by side, Dr. Palmquist in a business suit and Lonnie Miller in a cap, leather jacket, and work pants. My arm was covering everything but the faces. Lerner moved my arm before pointing out Miller as the buyer of the gun. Then he nodded emphatically. Sure, that's the fellow who bought the gun, that Miller. You had to move my arm before you'd say so, Mr. Lerner. You were covering up half the picture. Well, am I a mind reader? No, but I think you might have made the most normal mistake in the world. Oh, wait, wait. You trying to tell me this Miller didn't come in here and buy a gun from me? That's about it. So how come a fellow who wasn't here gave me a driver's license and said he was? That's a good question, Mr. Lerner. There were two people I wanted to see now, real bad. Lieutenant Barry at Homicide and Lonnie Miller, Cell 8A, City Jail. I streaked down to headquarters and guess what? The lieutenant was out on police business, should be back in a while. I knew Lonnie Miller wasn't out, so I settled for him. There were only two or three questions I wanted to ask him, but they were important. I spent about 15 minutes in the cell with Miller, got my answers, and they made sense now. Then I spent an hour waiting for the lieutenant. He finally showed this time, he was the hard sale, even after I discussed what I'd figured out at the pawn shop. Johnny, Johnny, I'm tired. Oh, sure, me too. Now, look, Lieutenant, you know what I'm pushing is possible. Dr. Palmquist and Lonnie Miller are approximately the same size, age, coloring. Even the bone structure is fairly similar. But they don't look alike. They don't have to, because it's the impression that counted here. Johnny! That's exactly what Palmquist was counting on. Now, look, Lieutenant, you've been around... You know what people go by when they're asked to identify someone? An all-over impression. So? And you know a big factor is clothes, particularly the type of clothes. All right, all right. What are you going for? This. If Dr. Palmquist walked into that pawn shop wearing a cap, leather jacket, and work pants, and then, six days later, you show the pawnbroker a picture of Lonnie Miller, dressed in the same kind of clothes, you know whom he'll identify every time. Especially when he'd already seen a driver's license made out to Lonnie Miller. A thousand ways to make a living. What did I pick? Lieutenant. This? Look, suppose I buy that. Where are you? Dr. Pompquist, for some reason or other, wants his wife dead. He needs a patsy. 
So he picks up Lonnie Miller, a hitchhiker on the Pacific Coast Highway. If you say so. At a coffee stop, the doctor remembers something he left in the car. He goes out for a minute, sticks a match or a toothpick in a tire valve, guaranteeing a flat a few miles further on. So when they stop, it's the doctor who looks at the flat, gets rid of the toothpick. Grateful for the lift, Miller changes the tire. You ever change a tire on a hot summer night? Well, sure. You took off your jacket, didn't you? How else? That's what Doc was counting on. He had a couple of minutes alone with Miller's jacket and lifted his driver's license. Then he keeps Miller in town on the promise of a job. He buys the gun at the Burbank pawn shop wearing work clothes and giving Miller's license as identification. Monday night, he killed his wife, called Miller to the house with a phony story about a job, struck him from behind and staged the scene the police found. Smooth, huh? Johnny, can you see me going to the D.A. with all that theory and no proof? Palmquist had laughed me out of town. Barry, look. Knock it off. You're no kid. You know I'm right. Ah. Well, don't go away mad. Sure, I know he was right. That's what was driving me crazy. Proof. One little piece of it, but where? Old Palmquist had used his head all right. But the smartest ones alive always leave one little hole somewhere along the line... But three hours later in my hotel room, I hadn't found it. Steffi, what are you doing here? Johnny. Eric's been drinking all day, brooding, working himself into a rage, saying terrible things about Mrs. Considine and his father, and about his father being a murderer. I don't know what he'll do. Help me, Johnny, please. Did he give you any idea of where he was headed? He, he mentioned going home to get a gun. And then going to Mrs. Considine's house. Johnny, I'm afraid. All right, come on. The drive to the Palmquist house on the Palisades was a long one, but educational. Because Steffi had nothing to hide now. She was just a kid worried to death about her husband. And her bitterness toward Dr. Palmquist came rolling out. He's an easy man to hate, my father-in-law. All charm on the outside. Petty little dictator inside. Man who's trying to prove something, who can't abide weakness, who tries to make everyone over into his own image. A horrible man. Tell me about Eric's brother. Paul? He was the favorite, the doctor's pride and joy. They hunted together all the time. Only one day, Paul had a cold, tried to get out of a hunting trip. This offended the doctor's weakness fetish. He made the boy feel like a coward, so Paul went hunting died of pneumonia. Mrs. Palmquist never got over it, as you saw before she was killed. Nice, Johnny. You like the family I married into? The house was dark when we got there. We hurried to Eric's bedroom, and Steffi leaned against the door, weak with relief. Eric lay sprawled on the bed, snoring fine alcoholic noises. The rifle he still clutched made very clear what he'd been thinking about before the liquor had taken over. We were just getting him comfortable when we heard it. A car pulling into the garage. Palmquist. I got Steffi down the back stairs and out of the house as soon as I was sure he was inside. And then I turned back. Because suddenly I was tired of a killer walking around free while everyone else stepped softly. And the anger was good. Because it suddenly drove into my mind the one thing Palmquist might have overlooked. I let myself into the garage with a small window. Moved to the doctor's big car. You ever try to force open a car trunk with a claw hammer? Don't. A, it's rough. And B, it takes your eyes off the door leading to the kitchen. Why don't you ask me for the key, Dollar? A gun, Doctor? No instrument of healing? Oh, that's nice. And it tells me something about the trunk. That there's a spare tire in there that's flat, but doesn't have a puncture. A service station might remember a thing like that, huh, Doctor? Quite right, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. He couldn't pick me off because of the car. But the car was working against me, too. You did better with a rifle yesterday, Doctor. I'll manage, Mr. A man my age through windows, no less. He had it? Nah. Nah, he'll look good in court. Small question, Lieutenant. Not that I'm ungrateful. Ask. Aren't you a long way from home? I didn't like the look in your eye when you stomped out. You know something, Johnny? You're easier to tail than a trolley car. 
Expense account item 12, $71. L.A. hotel bill. Item 13, $174.90. Return airfare to Hartford. Expense account total, $490.80. Details? Eric Palmquist admitted sending us the original warning note out of fear of his father. He never knew till the death of his mother that he himself was the beneficiary. Remarks about Hollywood. Let's call it the Easterner's Revenge. Quote, it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. Unquote. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, $3 million worth of a worthless gold mine. And there's blood on the desert sand. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Victor Perrin, Lillian Bayef, Russell Thorson, James McCallion, Edgar Barrier, Don Diamond, and Herb Butterfield. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino and Carl Fortina. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. What's puzzling you, Ethelbert? One of those quizzes. And it says here, uh, what are these men famous for? Sidney Porter, Samuel Clemens, Charles Dodgson. Well, they're all great authors. Well, how come I never heard of them? Well, you would if they printed their pen names. They're O. Henry, Mark Twain, and Lewis Carroll. Well, I'll be. Those names are famous. Everybody knows them. Mm -hmm. Like everybody knows Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole. Our adventure for tonight, The Serpent Goddess. Early 
early afternoon, around two o'clock, a sumptuous suite in one of our city's finest hotels. There's a knock at the door, and a big, weather-beaten man opens it. I guess you're the newspaper folks who found me. I'm Dan Sykes. Yeah, thanks for giving us this appointment, Mr. Sykes. This is Miss Williams. My name is Casey. Oh, I'm real pleased to meet you, Miss Williams. Thank you, Mr. Sykes. You're a swell-looking kid. Thanks again. Uh, come in. Make yourself at home. Thanks. Well, uh, what can I do for you? Well, through a mix-up, Mr. Sykes, our paper didn't have anyone at the airport this morning to cover your arrival with Mr. Johansson. And the Morning Express wants to rectify its blunder now with a special interview. Mm, pictures, too. And take all the pictures you want and ask all the questions you want. Well, we'd like to have your partner, Mr. Johansson, in on this. We phoned him, but he wasn't in. Oh, uh, Chris went out to look for a cheaper place to live. He ain't like me. I'm going to enjoy him, I do. Mm. According to our news service reports, you and Johansson have already sold part of the emeralds you found in South America for over a million dollars. That's right. I'm a nouveau rich. But uh, we didn't sell the best ones. We brought the eyes back here to the States with us. The eyes? Uh, well, that's what Chris and I call the two big emeralds we found. Reports on how you found all those emeralds have been rather conflicting, Mr. Sykes. What's the real lowdown? Well, Chris and I were flying an old crate out of Caracas on our way to Lima when a gas line broke and we had to bail out over the jungle. While we were trying to find our way out, we come onto some ruins of an old engine town and... Under a stone, we accidentally knocked over, we found them animals. And that's all there was to it. There wasn't another man with you and Mr. Johansson? No, we were alone. Well, the first story we got on you fellas was that two very sick men, one with a pocket full of emeralds, had staggered into a village at the edge of the jungle, raving about a third guy they'd seen crushed to death by a big snake. A huge boa constrictor or an anaconda with, of all things, a human face. Yeah. Naturally, a yarn like that made news. One of them South American reporters dreamed up that crazy stuff. Whoever saw a snake with a human face? Excuse me, someone at the door. Oh, hello, Chris. I think I find me a place to live, Sykes. But such high prices. Uh, oh, you got company. Oh, they're newspaper folks. Uh, this is Chris Johansson, Miss Winton. How do you do, Mr. Johansson? Well, how... Uh, Oh, you are a pretty lady, Miss Williams. And uh, this is uh, Casey. Hello, Mr. Casey. How are you? They've been interviewing me about our emeralds, Chris. I've just been telling them that snake story was a lot of bunk. Uh, yo, uh, Sykes and me was alone in that jungle. Also, we are not afraid of no drums. Drums? Uh, one of the goofy stories they told about us was that when we come out of that jungle, we raved about hearing drum beats all the time. Oh, uh, we was... Uh, Sick with fever, Sykes. We didn't know what we were saying. We never said anything about drums. No, we never said nothing because we had no reason to. That's right. Hey, oh, I, uh, I would like a drink, Sykes. I see you got the bottle there. Hey, help yourself. Um, well, what other questions you want to ask, Miss Williams? Well, I'd, I'd like to know Sykes, who you saw. A drum. It can't be here. No, not in the city. It can't be here. What's the matter with you fellas? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, there's music now, Chris. Huh? Look out of this window. There's only some Salvation Army folks down there with a, a bass drum and a couple of horns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just Salvation Army people with uh, an ordinary old bass drum. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Mrs. Wheelbrecker. Uh, now, Casey, what was I saying? Saying good night to Mrs. Wheelbrecker. Oh, I don't know, Pat. You hadn't started to say anything yet. Hadn't I? No. Oh, I remember. You know that fella Sykes, who you and Miss Williams told me about interviewing a couple of weeks ago? Mm-hmm. Well, he come into this bar today, and I served him a couple of drinks. I recognized him immediately from the pictures you took for your paper. After the little blonde he had with him called him Dan Sykes. No, afterward. You're a little blonde along, huh? Uh-huh. A few days ago, we saw him with a big brunette. Well, he told us he was going to enjoy his dough, Annie. He's an awfully nervous acting guy, Casey. Walter happened to hit the bottom of an empty wooden ice tub he was taking down cellar, and when it went boom like a drum, 
I thought Sykes was going to faint that away. Yeah, he and Johansson are certainly allergic to drum beats, aren't they? They didn't give you no idea why? No. Yeah. Their only explanation was an obvious phony. The original news report was... Hey, you really think there was another fellow with him in that jungle who was squeezed to death by a big snake with a human face? Well, good reason to believe that a third man may have parachuted into the jungle with Sykes and Johansson. Yeah? According to Inside Dope, our paper can't print without risking a libel suit, Sykes and Johansson used their plane for smuggling jobs. And it's thought they specialized in smuggling people from one South American country into another. Like wanted criminals, uh, Red Hots. Huh? Yeah, and political troublemakers. It's mm. suspected that Sykes and Johansson were taking an exiled revolutionist back to a country he'd been kicked out of when their plane went bad. And that he's the other man they talked about when they came out of the jungle. They were both delirious from fever then, but when they recovered and knew what they were saying, they quickly changed their story. You figure they told the truth while they were delirious. Well, they couldn't help it. Then it must have been true about the third guy getting crushed by a big snake. But a snake with a human face. Yeah. Oh, we can't worry about it here any longer. Casey, we've got to get back to the office. Yeah, yeah, before city desk starts paging us. What do I owe you, pal? Uh, it's only, uh, 60 cents. Oh, only 60 cents. Too bad. I guess I got that much. Oh, excuse me. There's the bar phone. <laughs> Hello? Uh, just a second. Your city desk is paging you, Casey. Huh? Oh, give me. Oh, this is Casey. 301 Hawthorne Street, apartment 3A. Okay, I got it, Burke. Well, what goes there? Who? Say that again, Burke. In a city apartment? Whew. Hey, that's a story, all right. Look it right up there. Hey, what is it, Casey? You look funny. Chris Johansson has been found dead in his apartment. Sykes' partner? Yeah. But Annie, he was crushed to death. Crushed? Squeezed. As though a big snake had coiled itself around him. Our story will continue in just a moment. To you who enjoy good, wholesome American beer and ale, here's the easiest, most convenient, and most satisfactory way to buy it. Ask for your favorite brand in the new Anchor Glass One-Way No-Deposit Bottle. Now here's a bottle made just for you. No one has ever used it before. No one will ever use it again. And it costs so little that it can be thrown away when empty, just like any other food container. You pay no deposit, never have empties cluttering up your kitchen, or bother about returning them to the store. And though it holds exactly as much as the regular beer bottle, the one-way bottle is so compact that it takes up a minimum of precious refrigerator space. It's light and easy to carry. It chills beer more quickly and holds the chill longer. It looks well on any table. But most important of all, it's made of glass. And because it's made of glass... It brings you beer and ale of perfect clarity, untouched by any foreign flavor. The Anchor Glass One-Way No-Deposit Bottle is a product of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. Captain Logan, uh, did the medical examiner say that a, a, a big snake... He didn't say a snake did it, Miss Williams. He merely said that, well, that a python or boa constrictor were the only things he knew of that would kill in such a way. Johansson was literally squeezed to death by something big and, and smooth that coiled around his entire body. In this apartment? Yes, Casey. Uh, well, what do you think, Captain? Uh, only that a snake big enough to do the killing didn't do the killing. That's too crazy, Miss Williams. I... Oh, nuts, Casey. I just can't figure this one out at all. You know about the first news story we had on Johansson and Sykes, huh? Yes, I think you told me about it. But, well, that fantastic yard can't have any bearing on... Naturally, any... you're going to question Sykes. Uh, my men have orders to bring him here as soon as they can find him. Now, here's your sergeant now, Logan. 
Well, maybe now we'll get the lowdown. You found Sykes at his apartment, Sergeant? Yes, Captain. I gave it to him cold about uh, Johansson's death. I thought he was going to pass out on me. Especially when I told him it looked like the job of a big snake. He kind of whispered to himself, she followed us. She followed us? Yes, sir. Well, were you uh, able to find out where he was last night when Johansson was killed? Oh, well, Sykes was throwing a big party in his place. His alibi is perfect. Uh, now, bring him in. Yes, sir. She followed us. Uh, that's a screwy one, Casey. Yeah. Another screwy one, like his fear of drums. Mr. Sykes, sir. Oh, uh, I'm Captain Logan, Homicide Bureau, Mr. Sykes. You already know Miss Williams and Mr. Casey. Let me see, Chris. Now, the body's still in the next room where it was found. Now, step in. Take a look. So that's what she does to a man. Who is this she? Let me out of here, Captain. I can't look anymore. Now, let's go back into the other room. Sit down, Mr. Sykes, and tell us what you know about this thing. I may as well tell you. I know now there's no way of getting away from her. Vasco said we couldn't. Vasco? She got Vasco first. Now it's Chris. Soon it'll be me. Will you explain what you're talking about? Okay. There were three of us who bailed out of the plane over the jungle. Casey, he said... Quiet, quiet. Vasco had caused a lot of political trouble in his own country, and he'd been told to stay out of it, or else. He paid Chris Johansson and me a thousand bucks to fly him back there without anyone getting wise. We'd have done it if our plane had gone wrong. But it did, and we had to jump. We were in luck, we thought, because all of us landed safe in the clearing. Then, all of a sudden... Sykes, what was that? Sounded like a drum, Chris. It is a drum. Oh, that's nuts, Vasca. There's nothing but animals in this part of the jungle. You saw it from the air. We're deep in the bush. Ah, look there. Yeah. Guys with spears and clubs. Indians. They are all around this clearing. You got the only gun, Sykes. Shoot. No, no, don't. The biggest man have laid down his spear... I lift his hand in a sign of peace. Sai. They're all laying down their weapons. It looked like they are coming as friends. They were friendly Indians. They took us to their village and treated us swell. Seems we were the first white men they'd ever run into. Isolated tribe. The Vasca called them a lost tribe, Casey. They had houses built of stone and they acted civilized. That is, outside of their religion. Their religion? They... They worship snake. Now, go on. Those boar constrictors were sacred to them. And they made human sacrifices to the boar. How? When anyone broke a law, they tied them up and beat drums. After a while, a big snake would slide out of the jungle and... Well, I saw it done, but it didn't warn me. Have the rest, though. The top medicine man, the head priest of the tribe, had a good-looking daughter who fell for me hard. She had a bracelet of emerald. Huh? Oh. Wait. After I picked up a little of her language, she told me where there were bigger, finer emeralds. I told Chris and Vasco what she'd said, so... One night, the uh, three of us started out. We uh, must be getting close to the place she told you about, Sykes. Yeah, as I get it from her, Chris, we'll find a long stone building completely hidden by jungle growth. Uh, hold your torch high, Alaska. All right. I do not like this business, Sykes. You gonna start that again? If they catch us before we can escape, well, you have seen what happened to men who break their law. They're not gonna get me squeezed by any big snake, not while I have a gun. Listen, those drums. I hear. 
They are calling the big snake for the sacrifice tonight. Yeah, that's why I picked tonight to come here. The whole village will be attending the ceremony. You are sure nobody guards that temple where we go to? The girl says it's guarded only by the spirits. <laughs> they won't bother us. Or we shall be robbing their temple. Oh, look. There is the long stone building. That's the place. We can walk right in. Sure, and take what we want. Come on. It is so dark in there. And these torches give so little light. They'll give it up. The emeralds are in back. On a statue, you said. Yeah. Come on. Sykes, I see. Hold me. A snake. A big snake. Run, get out. Oh, Chris, you fool. The statue. The, the statue? Yes, Chris. Carved of stone with a human face. No. I see now. It has a woman's face. Its eyes are emeralds. The biggest I've ever seen. And that emerald necklace. We'll be millionaires, Chris. No, millionaires. I'll climb up and get them. What's that? The drum. It started when you touched the snake statue. Maybe it's a warning. Buck, hand me a knife, Chris. Here. And be quick, Sykes. You are going to do what I came to do, Vasca. Cut off this necklace and pry out them emerald eyes. After I pried the emerald eyes out, the three of us beat it fast. But when we slept, we dreamed of drums and that big statue of the serpent goddess, the snake with the woman's face. And sometimes deep in the jungle, we'd hear drums or think we heard them. Vasca kept saying we'd never get away with what we'd done. But he wanted his cut just like the rest of us. We kept on chopping our way through the tangled bush, hoping we'd finally get out of that jungle. One day, when we laid down the road... There is no reason, Sykes, why you do not divide those emeralds now instead of waiting. I told you. Chris and I have ordered no. We're two to one. Yes, two to one. And every day we get closer to the edge of the Will jungle. you cut it out, Vasco? We ain't going to do nothing to you. Not a thing. It's your turn to scare up some grubs. Suppose you get at it. Why will you never lend me your pistol, Sykes? Use your knife. I told you. I'm a good shot, and I don't waste bullets, and I'm saving the few I've got left. For what? For emergencies, of course. I see. I'll get going. I'm hungry. I go. Listen. To what? I don't hear nothing but birds. I hear drums. I don't hear any drums. You don't hear them now? No. There are no drum sounds. Maybe, maybe I hear them because I will be the first of us to pay for robbing the serpent goddess. I go to hunt for food. Guy's driving me nuts, Chris. Me too. It's like you... You didn't hear no drum. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sure. Did you? I do not think so. I'm not always sure. I said maybe he heard him because he'll be the first of us to... Ah! Ah, it's like... It's Vasco. Hey! Hey! Snake, help me! Snake? Ah! Come away, Sykes. Run. Away, Chris. Away! Try to help him. We knew it'd be no use. We were afraid. Just left the guy to die, huh? Yes, Casey. All we did was run until we dropped and couldn't run anymore. And then the fever got us. I woke up in a village where, where the news reporters came and, well, Chris and I denied the true things we'd said while the fever was in our heads because... I can guess why you denied this story. Now she's followed us. She's paid off Chris. And I'm next. I didn't see nothing in the paper today about uh, Joe Hansen killing Casey. Oh, 
Ain't Captain Logan going to arrest Sykes? What for? His alibi was 100%. Yeah, but he confessed to stealing them emeralds. In another country, pal, from jungle Indians. Oh. There is one thing, Ethelbert, but it doesn't look very promising. What is it, Miss Williams? Well, Logan's turned up a witness who says he saw Johansson let a woman into his apartment about a half hour before he was killed. A woman? Yeah, described as a small brunette and carrying a small leather traveling case. Oh, a little skinny girl couldn't squeeze a big guy to death? No. Do you think Sykes will be bumped off like Johansson was and, and that Vasca? Well, he seems to think so. It's funny. That guy's trying to pack a month of life into every hour because he figures every hour will be his last. Say, Annie, what do you say? Let's, uh, let's drop off at his new apartment on our way home. Maybe we can cheer him up a little. Okay, Scout, if you must do a good deed. Well, it's a selfish good deed. I'd like to hear Sykes talk some more about that guy, Vasca. Oh, there's a parking spot, Casey, in back of that old Ford Coupe. That's for us. All right, somebody put a bad dent in the fender of that jalopy. Huh, I'll say. Oh, Sykes certainly got himself a swanky place to live when he moved out of that hotel. Hmm? Whole first floor of these new garden apartments. Yep. Come on, I'll get you out of the car. Okay. There's a light behind those Venetian blinds, so the guy's at home anyway. Let's go in. Oh! I am sorry. Excuse me. Okay, sister, but what's your hurry? Boy, she is in a hurry. Almost knocked you over and gets into that old Ford and Suitcase off she goes. of hers almost cracked my shin. She came out of Sykes' door. See, Annie... She was a small, pretty brunette. So? With a traveling case. Casey! She and her Ford are out of sight. Hey, look. Hmm? Let's get into Sykes' apartment quick. Okay. Yeah, hey, hey, she didn't close the door tight. Nuts with ceremony in the bell. I'll open it myself. <gasps> Sykes is lying on the floor. Just like Johansson. Hey, is he dead? He's dead, all right. Oh, Casey. I think he's been squeezed to death. <gasps> Just like Johansson. The serpent goddess. But that little brunette, she couldn't have crushed him. Don't see how. When gal's answering the same description, is he? Huh. What'd you just pick up? A valve cap off a tire. I wonder how that got here. A tire cap? Huh? Well, that won't help any. Hey, it's plenty help. Annie, pick up that phone and get your story into the paper. Yeah? I'm getting Logan at headquarters to tell him to locate an old Ford coupe with a dented rear fender. <laughs> That's the car, Logan. I'm sure of it. Well, the garage guy here says that Ford belongs to a Miss Isabella Vasca. Miss Isabella Vasca? Yes. I'm Captain Logan, Homicide Bureau. Where? Remember me, Miss Vasca? It wasn't smart to use that dented car for a getaway after you murdered Sykes. I did not try to be careful or smart after my work was accomplished. I, I'm very tired. Please, take me to jail. You admit the killing of Sykes? I proudly admit it, for I am Pedro Vasca's sister. So that's the connection. Where is your brother, Miss Vasca? We never really believed he was killed by any human-faced boa constrictor. He wasn't. He got out of the jungle. And he wrote me a letter. Tell me about it. My brother was sure those men, Sykes and Johansson, intended to kill him. So when he called to them that the serpent goddess had him in her coils, it was a trick. He knew they would run away quick and leave him as they did. Then alone... He made his way to a village at the edge of the jungle, where he write to me of everything that has happened and ask me to avenge him. How did you do the job in such a fancy way, Miss Vasca? How did you crush those men to death? I know how she did that, Logan. You know, Casey? I think so. Oh. First, I want to know why she did it. Why didn't your brother do his own avenging, Miss Vasca? Because when he wrote me that letter, he was dying. Just before he reached that village at the edge of the jungle, his body was broken in the coils of a big snake. We'll join.
join the crowd of the Blue Note in just a moment. Very seldom do you hear a commercial announcement as important as the one we have for you tonight. It's about a brand new kind of dinnerware, a product of Anchor Glass. Its name is Jadeite. J-A-D-E-I-T-E. Jadeite. It looks and feels like rare Chinese porcelain. And it's as sturdy and heat-proof as the Fire King oven glass you use in your oven. And its cost is unbelievably low. Now, for instance, a beautiful jadeite cup and saucer cost only 15 cents. In fact, this revolutionary new jadeite costs less than half as much as the very cheapest dinnerware on the market. Now, you can buy jadeite items separately or a complete dinner service for six for less than five dollars. Now, the demand for jadeite is enormous. To avoid disappointment, go to the nearest chain store, department store, or other store selling chinaware or glass tomorrow and ask for jadeite by name. Jadeite, J-A-D-E-I-T-E, is the newest triumph of anchor hawking. The most famous name in glass. how a little woman like that Miss Vasca was able to kill them two big guys like she did, Casey. And how did you know? Well, that valve cap I found was a tip-off, Ethelbert. That and the suitcase she carried. And that suitcase contained a long, thick rubber tube and a portable electric air compressor pump. And Isabella Vasca's a pretty woman, Ethelbert. Both Sykes and Johansson were wolves. She let them pick her up and take her to their apartments, and then she... Tapped them on the head with a well-padded blackjack that left no mark and wrapped the big tube around them and inflated it with the electric pump. You know, if a doctor ever used one of those blood pressure gadgets on your arm, pal, you know how air can squeeze. Of course, a doctor only uses a small bulb to pump it in a small tube. Gee, it was as simple as all that. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, all this certainly wrecks the notion that that serpent goddess was paying off them three for stealing her emeralds. Uh, does it, pal? Hmm? Think about it, Ethelbert. Gee. Gee. Crime Photographer, starring Stotts Cotsworth as Casey, is brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass. Anchor glass containers, anchor caps and closures, all products of Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Photographer is directed by John Dietz. The original music is by Archie Blyer, and the program features Miss Jan Minor as Anne and John Gibson as Ethelbert. Herman Chittison is the Blue Note pianist. Help save lives by buying Christmas seals. These seals support the fight against tuberculosis. Buy and use Christmas seals, and be sure to mail your packages early. This is Tony Marvin saying good night for the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio with offices in all principal cities of the United States and Canada. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The makers of Kix, tasty, crispy corn puffs, food for action, and the makers of Chlorettes, the new chlorophyll chewing gum that makes your breath kissing sweet, present Defense Attorney. Ladies and gentlemen... To depend upon your judgment and to fulfill my known obligation, I submit the facts, fully aware of my responsibility to my client and to you as defense attorney. And now we proudly present Miss Mercedes McCambridge as defense attorney.
When Martha Ellis Bryant chose law as a career, she accepted the challenge of defending the defenseless. Joshua Masters was one of the defenseless. Suspected of murder, he couldn't defend himself. Your father told me his will left his estate to his three sons. But there won't be three sons to share it. That's all right. We can divide it between the two of us. I don't think so. Why? Because I talked to your father yesterday. He was afraid he'd be accused of killing David, and I told him if he was charged with murder, I would defend him. And I'm going to. Yes, Joshua Masters was one of the defenseless. And we'll bring you his story right after this important message. But first, let's listen to a man who sings the blues because he doesn't take time to eat breakfast. It's a shame to be a Nixie like me. I suffer from a lack of energy. Won't somebody tell me why I fail in everything I try? It's a shame to be a Nixie like me. People who are always weary, always dreary, are Nixies. So different from active, cheery Kixies. Kixies are men of action who eat kicks, food for action. Lively boys, girls, and grown-ups who always eat breakfast built around a bowl of kicks. How fine everyone feels, because kicks is an 83% energy food. Are kicks good? You bet. Crispy corn puffs so tender and tasty. Eat kicks. Food for action. Oh, it's grand to be a Kixie like me. Always feeling full of pep and energy. Every morning I eat kicks, so I'm never in a fix. Oh, it's grand to be a Kixie like me. And now the curtain rises on Act One of tonight's defense attorney story. Wealthy Joshua Masters is in the law office of Martha Ellis Bryant. Conducting an investigation is decidedly out of my line, Mr. Masters. I'm an attorney, not a private detective. I understand that, Miss Bryant, but this is something I believe you could handle better than a private detective. Well, I'm very flattered, but I'm afraid I don't quite understand. Well, your reputation for integrity is common knowledge, so I know I can trust you. You're always famous for proving people innocent. Now, uh, one of my three sons is trying to kill me. And you want me to find out which one is guilty? Well, in a manner of speaking, yes, but what's more important, I want to know which two are innocent. You see, there's a lot of money involved. Yes, well, how old are you, Mr. Masters? Sixty-eight. And your sons? The oldest, thirty-eight. The youngest, thirty-three. Are they married? No. All three like to consider themselves eligible bachelors. Yes, I believe I've read about them in the newspapers. I'm not proud of my sons, Miss Bryant. The parasites, waiting for my money, waiting for me to die, and one's trying to hurry it. And you are a widower, aren't you, Mr. Masters? Yes. My wife died in 1939. And will your sons inherit your money? As my will is now, the estate is to be divided equally among the three boys. Well, specifically, what is it that makes you think that one of the boys is trying to murder you? Well, I... I've got a weakness for speed, I like to go fast. In a car, boat, anything. I've got a foreign car. It's very fast. Are you uh, interested in foreign cars, Miss Bryant? Oh, well, not right now, Mr. Matthews. Yes, well, I like to get out on the freeway and open my car up once in a while. I started out the other day and got a flat tire. I drove into a service station to get it fixed. One lug bolt was holding the wheel on. The other four had been unscrewed. Holding by one thread. Well, of course, that is dangerous, but it could have been accidental. Maybe. But I've got a speedboat down at the bay. I started to take it out one day when I noticed that the bilge was full of gasoline and one spark plug wire was disconnected and hanging about a quarter of an inch above the bilge. Now, if I'd touched the starter, it would have all blown up over the harbor. Yes, of course it would. And uh, you believe that these potential accidents were planned? Yes, I do. There are other things, little things, but they all add up. When well, you know my sons. And you think that one of your sons is responsible for these occurrences? Yes, there isn't anyone else. No, that isn't what I mean. I mean, has it ever entered your mind that maybe more than one of your sons is involved? Oh, I see. Oh, well, no, I, I never thought of that. Well, I hope it isn't true. Oh, well, maybe it isn't true about any of them, Mr. Masters. It's true, Miss Bryant. 
David, Ralph, or Gordon, any one of them is capable of killing me for my money. Tell me, do you support them? Yes, but I don't give them as much money as they think I should. I believe that wealth carries a responsibility, Miss Bryant. A responsibility to use it wisely. They just want to use it. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mr. Masters, there may be cause for your suspicions, all right? But I'm not going to hazard an opinion, nor am I going to attempt an investigation. Oh, I see. However, there is a private detective I can heartily recommend to you. His name is Ted Ruby, and he's in the Hartley building. I've used him on several occasions myself, and I know that he's very reliable and that he's well qualified for this sort of thing. And I advise you to go to see him. You can tell him that Martha Ellis Bryant sent you. When did all this happen, Marty? Just yesterday, John. So I sent him to Ted Ruby. Well, Ruby will know how to handle him. At least he'll make some money on the deal. I'm glad you didn't take it. Well, it wasn't in my line, darling. But I was sorry I couldn't help him. He's, he's kind of sweet. Uh, he's kind of a screwball. Why? Do you know him? No, no, but I know quite a bit about him and his family. The boys are always mixed up in some scandal, always expensive to get out of, and the old man pays the fare. Well, then the boys are worthless, huh? You bet they are. But the story got out about how every time one of the boys had been in trouble, someone had given an anonymous contribution to some charity, a big contribution. I chased down the story for the dispatch. It was old man Masters. Whatever the current scandal payoff cost, he'd give an equal amount to charity. Some screwy idea of, of dollar for dollar, good for evil. We could use more screwy ideas like that, Judd. Yeah? He gets tickets for speeding and goes through the same routine. He's just a screwball. Yeah, Martin. but you haven't talked to him. No. I have. I like him. I'm sorry I couldn't help him. Oh, excuse me. Sure. Martha Ellis Bryant's office. Oh, yes, he is. Just a minute, please. For you, Judd, sir. Hmm? The dispatch. Oh, okay. Hello. Yeah, Steve. All right. Yeah, 1802 Sandalwood Drive. Yeah, I got it. Well, whose place is it? It is. Yeah, all right. I'll, uh, I'll get right over there. Get right over there. There goes our luncheon date, I bet you. Yeah, Marty, there's been a killing at 1802 Sandalwood Drive. Got to get over there. You uh, want to go along? No, not particularly. Anyhow, i got a lot of work to do here. Well, maybe you ought to go, Counselor. Do you know who lives at 1802 Sandalwood Drive? No. Should I? Yeah, you should. That's the home of Joshua Masters. <laughs> This is a real beautiful home, huh, Judd? Yeah, it is. I wonder if Josh Masters donated to charity an amount equal to the cost of maintaining this place. Why should he? Well, I just think it's a sin to live in a house this big. Oh, oh such a sickness. <laughs> uh, it's all right, Sergeant Press. Okay. Yeah, all right, get over there, those pictures. Yeah, right on. All right. All right. Yeah. Ah, hello, Judd. Hi. Uh, well, 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 Miss Bryant, this is a surprise. <laughs> was Masters a client of yours? Well, he was sort of a near client. What? No, I'm I'm just here with Judd, Lieutenant Leader. Oh, I see. What's the story, Ed? Ah, uh, one of those messy family affairs inside, Judd. You got any leads? Oh, you know, Judd. Arrest within 24 hours. One of the boys, huh? Yeah. Which one? You know yet? <laughs> sure we know. It was David. Can I print that? Well, sure. Why not? Well, then you're going to arrest him right away. Arrest who? David. Arrest him? How can we arrest him? He's dead. Dead? I thought... Th Wait a minute, Ed. You mean that Josh Masters wasn't killed? The old man? Well, no, no. It's David. Then Josh Masters isn't dead? Well, no. Should he be? Well, according to percentage, yeah. What? Oh, nothing. You take it, Judd. It's your story. Well, what happened, Ed? Well, about all I'm sure of right now is that when Gordon Masters came into the library this morning, he found his brother David lying on the floor, dead. He'd been shot sometime last night with a forty-four caliber gun. You've uh, found the weapon? No, no. Medical examiner says it was a forty-four. 
And the old man's gun, a forty-four, is missing from the desk drawer. He says he can't account for it. What do you think about it, Ed? Well, like I said, we expect an arrest within 24 hours. Do you know who it'll be? Oh, come on. You know I can't answer that, Judd. All right. Unofficially, Ed, not for publication. Well, I think that Josh Masters knows where that gun is. Has he got a motive? Well, he had a quarrel with David Masters yesterday. That could be a motive. The only fly in that ointment is the fact that he was always quarreling with one or the other of the boys. Yeah, so I've heard. Where's Josh Masters now? He's in the library. At least he was just a minute or so before you come in. I wonder if he'd care to make a statement to the press. I don't know. You can ask him. He's a free citizen so far. Thanks, Ed. I think I will. Yeah. Look around if you want it, Judd. I got work to do. See you later. Bye, Martha. See you, Ed. Well, what do you think of this development, Marty? Darling, Joshua Masters isn't the kind of person who kills anybody. He's just Well, married. Miss Bryant, I'm surprised to see you here. I was going to come down to your office. Good morning, Mr. Masters. I came with Mr. Barnes. He's a friend. Uh, Judd, this is Mr. Masters. Glad to meet you, Mr. Do. Masters. I'm so very sorry about your son, Mr. Masters. Well, thank you. I'm sorry I can't feel more grief than I do. My sons have been a great disappointment to me, Miss Bryant. Well, do you have any idea who, who may be responsible for this thing? No, I... I haven't. I... I wish I knew. That detective lead us. He suspects me. Did he say that to you? No, he didn't need to. I know. Miss Bryant, if he should charge me with... with this, I'd like to have you as my attorney. Oh, well, it's a little early, Mr. Masters. However, if you are charged with the murder, and if I believe that you're innocent, I'll defend you. Lieutenant Ledis' 24 hours are just about up. I wonder if he's made his arrest yet. If he has, Josh Masters is here in the jail, and you've got a client. Hello, Lieutenant. Well, good morning, Martha. Judd. Hello, Ed. Anything new in the Masters case? Yep. We found the gun. Hey, when? Oh, about ten minutes ago. Well, who had it? Josh Masters had it. Are you sure, Lieutenant? (laughs) Yeah. It was lying beside him. It was what? Yeah. Josh Masters committed suicide with it at 8 o'clock this morning. In just a moment, we'll continue with Act Two of tonight's defense attorney story. Don't breathe. Don't breathe a word until you chew Clorette. Because Clorets makes your breath kissing sweet. That's right, kissing sweet. Clorets is the delicious new chewing gum that contains chlorophyll. Aha, that magical green chlorophyll you've read so much about. Clorets with chlorophyll banishes most odors that make breath unpleasing. Clorets makes breath sweet and wholesome in seconds. Chew Clorets and your breath becomes kissing sweet. Even after eating onions or garlicky salads even after heavy smoking or telltale beverages. It's the chlorophyll in Clorets that does the trick. And Clorets is such a delicious gum, you'll chew it for pure enjoyment. Everyone who breathes should chew Clorets to keep breath always kissing sweet. So carry a package in pocket or purse. Get Clorets today. C-L-O-R-E-T-S. Only 15 cents a box wherever chewing gum is sold. Chew Clorets, the gum delicious. It makes your breath kissing sweet. And now we continue with Act Two of tonight's defense attorney story. (laughs) Mr. Masters didn't think they were accidents, Lieutenant. He was afraid one of the boys was trying to murder him. He wanted me to help him find out which one it was. Well, things sound more like accidents than plans as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, me too, Marty. Old people are always figuring that someone is trying to get him out of the way. Joshua Masters was not suffering from a persecution complex, if that's what you mean. That's what I mean. Not only that, I couldn't get one direct answer from him yesterday. You didn't catch him in a lie. No, no, but I didn't catch him in a truth either. Lieutenant, please remember he didn't know where his gun was. He might have thought one of the boys had it. Maybe he was unwilling to incriminate any of them. He said he didn't know where the gun was. Uh, Look, Martha, I like it this way. 
Joshua Masters thought one of his sons was trying to get him out of the way. For some reason, he figured it was David, and he jumps him about it. They argue, and Josh shoots him. Then, in remorse over having killed his son, he takes the gun and kills himself. Now, is that logic? Makes sense to me. If you didn't know Joshua Masters. Oh, come on. You didn't know him till two days ago. That's right. I talked to him for 15 minutes, and I got to know him real well, Lieutenant. Oh, Martha, how could you? All right. Do you grant that I am at least a fair judge of character? Well, you always have been so far. Joshua Masters might have committed suicide, but he never would have committed murder. Oh, look, Martha, it was his gun. We couldn't find it yesterday. This morning, it's lying beside him. His fingerprints on the handle, the presence of powder burns on his head, and the angle of the bullet's path all point to a suicide with the same gun that killed David. That's strong evidence, Martha. I know all that, darling, but it's too perfect. And now your story about those so-called attempts on his life gives a motive for murder and suicide by Joshua Masters. Wait a minute, Lieutenant. Have you found out anything about his will, about his insurance policies and things like that? What about who inherits the money? Well, no, no, not yet. But that's standard procedure, Martha. I'm going to question the two boys about it now. Ed, that isn't going to make any difference in the story, is it? I want to call the dispatch. I don't think we'll find out anything new. Chances are the boys will inherit everything. Then they should. There isn't any doubt about what'll happen to the money now. Those two will know how to spend it. They always have. Are you going to question them, Ralph and Gordon, separately, Lieutenant? No, no. no. Call them in here together. You uh, want to hear? Yeah, I'd like to. May I? You sure. Ed, what about the noise of the gunshots? Didn't anybody hear it? No. Nope. Both shots were in the library, and Josh Masters had it soundproof. He liked music, and he liked it loud. Collected records, you know. Nobody else could stand it, so Josh had his library soundproof and played his records in there. That's the motive for killing him right there. Uh, not if the place was soundproof. Oh, uh, Sergeant, you sent Gordon and Ralph Masters in here, please. Right. Believe me, Lieutenant, the last thing Joshua Masters had on his mind when he was in my office was committing suicide. You want me, Lieutenant? Yeah. Yeah, I got a few questions I want to ask as soon as your brother gets here. Uh, sit down. Look, let's get one thing straight. Just because my father killed David and then shot himself is no reason for you to start tossing orders around here. You're in my home, and when I'm ready, I'll ask you to sit down. Oh, a little touchy, huh? Why shouldn't I be? Just lost one brother and my father. Take it easy, Ralph. Sensitivity isn't a characteristic of the police department, you know. What do you want now, Lieutenant? This isn't a suicide until the coroner says so. And he won't say so until I finish my investigation. And I won't finish my investigation until you answer a few more questions. That's all we've done for the past few days. Now, well, we can wind this up today. Right now, I want to know who stands to inherit the most from the estate. Why do you ask that? Because I want to know. Now, look, don't get out of line, Lieutenant. You uh, might... I can answer that, Lieutenant. The money was to be divided equally among the family. The three of us. How do you know that? Well, Dad told me a long time ago. The will hasn't been changed? Well, not that I know of. Did your father ever feel he was being picked on, abused? He certainly did. Huh? When did you notice it? Every time we asked for a dime. That's right. He's pretty tight with his dough. From what I hear, you were pretty loose with it. What have you got to do with it? I'm Martha Ellis Bryant. I'm an attorney. Your father was a client of mine. Did you know that he had thought of changing his will? Any change he made wouldn't hold up after killing David and committing suicide. Losing his mind, not capable of handling his affairs. We can break any kind of a will now if we need to. Oh, come on, Judd. They'll be dividing his clothes next. Yeah, I could use some fresh air. See you later, Ed. Yeah, so long, Judd. Miss Bryant. Bye, Lieutenant. Any court will overrule a will made by a man that killed his son and put his suit. Oh. Gordon Masters is really plugging that murder and suicide, isn't he? Yeah, but I think he's right, Marty. I don't know. He sounds to me like a man with something to sell. Or a man that's convinced of something. Yeah, well, maybe. Can you take me back to my office, sweetie? I wish to ponder. About this case? Yeah. Look, Marty, the police say it's suicide. Why don't you let it go at that? They've got powder burns, bullet angle. You just gave them a motive. Yeah. And you've got fingerprints on the gun to back up a suicide theory. Anyway, what are you doing in this case? You're a lawyer, not a detective. You're right, darling. I am a lawyer. And yesterday I told Joshua Masters that if he was charged with murder and if I thought he was innocent, I'd defend him. And that was a promise. Sure, but he's dead. Yeah, but he's still charged with murder, the murder of his son, and he can hardly defend himself. How far can you go with noblesse oblige? My darling Judson, there are people whose goodness is apparent even in a short conversation. And I think Joshua Masters was one of those people. And I don't think he killed his son. And I don't think he committed suicide. That's what I gathered. Anyway, the fact that he's dead doesn't cancel my promise to defend him. I just wish I knew how to begin. <laughs> And 
Neither one of those fine, upstanding boys was concerned beyond the question of who inherited the money. Their father lying in the next room dead. And they're planning on how to break his will. Yes, Marty, but that still doesn't make either one of them a murderer. Either one of them could have killed David to get a bigger share of the estate and then killed Joshua to get the money sooner. It's a good theory, Marty, but the police have a better one with evidence to back it up. Joshua Masters' fingerprints on the handle of that gun. Somebody could have put his hand around that gun after he was dead. All you've got to do is prove that, and the rest of your theory will hold up. Yeah, well, there must be some way to prove it. I never heard of a way short of a confession. A little late for that. Marty, don't start wringing your hands over this case. It isn't that important. I'm not wringing my hands, darling. I'm just trying to think of a way. Hey, Judd, there is a way. Hmm? Pull over to the curb. Marty, Marty, for Pete's sake, let go of the wheel. I'm sorry, darling, but listen. If I were going to put your fingerprints on this steering wheel... Now, give me your hand. Right. Here, okay. I'd put your fingers around the wheel and I'd press, huh? Like that. Yeah. All right, now see what happens. Look there. Hey, do you suppose it'd show? I don't know. But I'll never be able to sleep if we don't find out. Let's go back. Fast. Let's do. Burn them up barns, they call me. Well, this is sure going to start something new in the checking of suicides, Martha. I just wouldn't have thought of it, but there they are, and they match. Pretty obvious that Joshua Masters did not commit suicide, isn't it, Lieutenant? Yeah, no doubt about it. You know, we came pretty close to making a bad mistake. If you and Judd had been two minutes late of getting here, it would have been too late. Why, was it that close? Well, the coroner and I were agreed on murder and suicide. We were ready to turn the body over to an undertaker. Thanks. Well, I'll get the sergeant and bring Masters in here. Just a minute, Lieutenant. Suppose they were both in this thing together. Yeah, that's something to think about, Ed. It could be. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it could. Well, you got any suggestions, Martha? Uh-huh. Why don't we get them both in? Then we can watch their reaction, maybe find out more than we know. That's the way to do it, Ed. And the star reporter of the dispatch will be in on the arrest. Yeah, I think you're right, Martha. Now, the sergeant, bring him in. Sergeant! Yes, sir. Have Gordon and Ralph Masters come in here, will you? Right. Look, Martha, you, uh, you want to handle this? It's your play, you know. I can be watching the trouble. There could be trouble, too. Sure. He's killed twice. All right, I'll talk to him. Say, how much more of this pointless questioning do we have to put up with? Maybe they've decided it was suicide. Have you, Lieutenant? Not yet. Uh, Miss Bryant here has something to say. What's an attorney got to do with this? Is this something to do with the old man's will? Yes, in a way. That is, it will certainly affect the terms of the will. What do you mean? Well, your father's will left everything to his three sons, but there won't be three sons to share it. Well, that's all right. We can divide it between Ralph and me. No, I don't think so. What? I talked to your father two days ago, and he told me that he suspected one of his sons of trying to kill him. He did? Yes. Well, that was probably why he killed David. He found out that he was the one. Is that what you think, Ralph? Well, what else is there to think? Well, there are other things. I talked to your father again yesterday. He was afraid he'd be accused of killing David, and I told him that if he was charged with the murder, I would defend him. What's this got to do with us? He has been charged with the murder. He has been charged with killing David and committing suicide, and I am defending him. Because he didn't kill David and he didn't commit suicide, your father was murdered. Who says he was murdered? I say he was murdered. You can't prove that he was. His fingerprints are on that gun handle. Yes, they are. And you, Ralph Masters, put them there. You can't prove that either. Oh, yes, I can. When you pressed your father's hand around that gun to leave his fingerprints on it, you left your own. My fingerprints aren't on that gun. That's right, Ralph. They're not on the gun, but they are on your father's hands. What? On his fingernails. You lie. No, no, Ralph. She isn't lying. We checked him. Is that true, Lieutenant? Yeah, real true. Ralph... You killed David and Dad. Yeah. Yeah, I killed him, and you would have, too, if you'd had enough nerve. Now, don't move anybody. Look out, Marty. He's got a gun. Right. I said, don't anybody move. I'm leaving. I'm getting out of here. And I'll kill anybody that tries to stop me. I think I'll kill you anyway, Martha Bryant, if it hadn't been for you. What about the sergeant behind you, Masters? What? Oh, uh, I got him. Jim. Good shooting, Ed. Oh, thanks for turning him, Judd. Lieutenant, is he... Is he dead? Yeah. Yeah, he's dead. First David and then Dad. Now Ralph. I, I'm the only one left. Oh, all alone in the world with a million dollars. All right, let's get him out of here. Have a couple of patrolmen come in here, will you? <clears throat> what is it, sir? When yeah. Judd Barnes chose a lawyer as a girlfriend, he accepted the challenge of defending the defenseless girlfriend. Yeah, it looked kind of grim there for a minute. You probably saved my life, Judd. Thanks. Marty, you shouldn't put yourself in a position where you're exposed to danger like that, likely to get killed. Yes, Judd. 
Your business is defending, not apprehending. Yeah, I guess it isn't very nice to put your friends in a position where they have to rescue well, you all the time. Well, it isn't that. I, I was glad to do it. I know Lita's was, too. No, I was kind of foolish. I shouldn't have done it. No, it wasn't foolish. Yes, it, was... it was. I didn't owe Joshua Masters anything. Yes, you did. A promise made is, is a debt unpaid. I know, but after all, you I... You didn't do things like that. He wouldn't be my Marty. Now, which side are you on, darling? Uh, I've been trapped again, so help me. Judson, don't you know you can't win an argument with a woman? And when the woman is a defense attorney, hoo-ha! have just heard Defense Attorney, starring Mercedes McCambridge, with Howard Culver as Judd. Tonight you heard Tony Barrett as Ed Letus, Dallas McKinnon as Josh and Gordon Masters, and Harry Bartell as Ralph Masters. Music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. <laughs> Defense Attorney was written by Jack Spears. The program is directed by Dwight Hauser. Ladies and gentlemen, we are happy to turn over the last few minutes of this program to Miss Betty Mills of the Radio TV Mirror magazine. Each year, Radio TV Mirror conducts a poll of readers asking them to vote for their favorite actors and actresses. It is truly the choice of the people, you fans who listen to and enjoy the radio performances of the many distinguished artists who come into your homes each week. Any award is an important honor, but we feel that the awards of Radio TV Mirror, determined by the votes of the listeners themselves, is a very special honor. Here now to make the presentation of this year's award, Miss Betty Mills. Betty? Thank you, Orville. We are extremely happy to have the opportunity to tell you on this program that in the annual awards poll conducted by Radio TV Mirror magazine, American radio listeners have chosen as their favorite dramatic actress, Miss Mercedes McCambridge. Thank you, Betty Mills. Thank you very much indeed. Mercedes, has most of your recent radio work been as Martha Bryant, defense attorney? Yes, Betty, it has, and I love doing the show. Then I suppose we could assume that the decision of the radio listeners naming you their favorite dramatic actress this year would be due to your work on defense attorney. I'm afraid it's the work of many people, Betty. It's Dwight Hauser and Howard Culver and Tony Barrett and all the ABC crowd. And I want to thank them and through you, the editors of Radio TV Mirror, and particularly all of the people who voted for me. Thank you. The management of ABC, the cast and crew of defense attorney would like to join Radio TV Mirror in congratulations to a fine actress for a fine job. Congratulations, Mercy, and incidentally, it certainly is a lot of fun, as all the cast will say, to work with Miss McCambridge. Incidentally, there's a delightful story on Mercedes McCambridge in the current issue of Radio TV Mirror. I suggest that you get it and read it. Next week, another exciting adventure with Mercedes McCambridge, Defense Attorney. Be sure to listen. Defense Attorney is presented by the makers of Kicks, Tasty Crispy Corn Puffs, Food for Action, and by Chlorettes, the new chlorophyll chewing gum that makes breath kissing sweet. This is Mercedes McCambridge reminding you to stay tuned to your ABC station for that entertaining program, The Original Amateur Hour, emceed by that great showman and grand person, Ted Mack. This program came to you from Hollywood. America is sold on the American Broadcasting Company. The Adventures of the Saints, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as... 
the sink. Coming. Mr. Templer. Yes? Let me in quickly. All right. My name is Claire Gordon. Well, I can recommend that chair. I don't have time, Mr. Templer. I want to confess. Confess what? Murder. Huh. Well, maybe I'd better take the chair. You're, you're quite serious? Well, of course I am. Will anyone confess to murder merely as a joke? It might depend on their sense of humor. Uh, however, whom did you murder? My husband. I see. You... You don't believe me. I have no reason to believe or disbelieve. But I did kill him. All right. You, you ought to do something about it. Mrs. Gordon, I can think of many reasons why a woman might want to kill her husband. In some instances, she actually does. But I can think of no reason why she should come to me and tell me about well, it. Well, I had to confess to somebody. Well, you could have chosen the police. Oh, they're so vulgar. Murder is not a monopoly of the upper classes, nor is it in itself an especially refined activity. You don't understand. Before I married Jim, I was Claire Wheelock. Of the something or other Wheelocks, no doubt. Still, I... I absolutely refuse to go to some pokey, dirty little police station. Well, some of them are quite large, and I understand clean from time to time. Tell some grubby little man all about my personal affairs. Murder, according to the statutes, is a public affair. I think you're nasty. I'm only trying to be reasonable, after I've all. I've heard I... you weren't always reasonable when... when beautiful women were concerned. Oh, that's true only on Shrove Tuesday. Oh, I... I despise you. Hey, wait, maybe today is Shrove... Oh, no, it's Sunday. Hey, she could be coming back to make an appointment for Shrove Tuesday. <laughs> No. You're Simon Templer? I'm afraid I am. You seem to object. Why was my wife here? Your what? Wife. And don't try telling me you didn't know she was married, you low I individual. I think you'd better tell me about myself inside, huh? Now then, uh, you are... James Gordon. And my wife was just here. How do you know? I saw her leave. Are you going to try denying it? Well, not if you saw her just leave. Oh, that's good. Now, if uh, you don't mind, I'll take my coat off. You're and, warm? Uh, I'm about to beat your brains out, you know. Watch your language. And why do you think your wife was here? <laughs> Pretty obvious, isn't it? I don't know. After all, I never met your wife before. You... Furthermore, Mr. Gordon, you're dead. <laughs> Are you being whimsical? I'm only trying not to make a liar out of your wife. She told you she was a widow. More or less. Actually, she came here to confess. Are you trying to pull my leg... I've always thought that a highly overrated indoor sport, except, of course, in the right company. <laughs> she came here to confess to what? To murdering you. To... what? Apparently her confession was premature. If, that is, you really are James Gordon. Well, thanks for the premature. And, of course, I'm James Gordon. Who else would I be? Shall I guess? Uh, no. No, you can take a look at my wallet. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Driver's license... Blue Shield medical plan card dated, <laughs> oddly enough, only a week ago. Well, what's odd about that? And apparently you don't expect to die. Hmm. Hmm. You are James Gordon. Well, thank you. Now, would you like to tell me why my wife was here? She came to confess to your murder. You know, Mr. Templer, I think I'm beginning to believe you. Fine. Keep working at it. Claire is a eccentric. If you say she told you she'd murder me, well, she must have told you. She did? But why? I'm not dead. Therefore, she didn't murder you. Then why did she make such an idiotic confession? Wishful thinking, perhaps. No, just some or minute. Or perhaps it was only anticipation. Oh, oh, excuse me. Hello? Mr. Templer. Louis. Louis. A half an hour ago, you called for a cab. A half an hour ago, I arrived. A half an hour ago, I was still warm. I am now under studying an icicle. Oh, Louis, I'm sorry. Come upstairs and thaw out. I've had company. A blonde? To start with. What are you up to now? Her husband. I'll come up. I'll bring a large wrench. To... Oh, that won't be necessary, Louis. Bye. Mr. Templer, what you said just before, you mean perhaps she intends to murder me. But why should she want to? She came to confess, not to confide in me. I, uh... I'd better run along. Get hold of Claire and I... Well, I'm sorry I bothered you, Mr. Templer. Oh, it's all right. Thanks for your patience. Forget it. Goodbye. Bye. Well, so much... That's right, Sergeant. Man named Gordon shot to death on my doorstep. 
No, Sergeant, I never shoot anyone on my doorstep. It's untidy. I don't know. I... Look, Sergeant, I have an idea. Why not drop in and see for yourself, hmm? Sergeant was quick. <laughs> uh, come in. Hi, Mr. Templer. Oh, Louie. I forgot you were coming up. You warmer? Yeah, a little bit, thanks. Uh, friend of yours? Who? The gentleman is laying down dead outside your door. No, we barely met. Oh, well, that's nice. You ready to leave now? I'm afraid not. I have to wait for the police. That's too bad. You know, the guy might be a conservative dresser, but I don't think he does credit to your doorstep. Oh, I wouldn't say that. His name is James Gordon of the, um, Gordon Gordon. Oh, well, that's different, yeah. Did he kill himself, or uh, did somebody help him? I don't think he killed himself, Louis. Why? Well, he'd just taken out a Blue Shield card. Oh, planning for the future, huh? Yes, it also means he expected to have a future. Louis, while we're waiting, will you look up James Gordon in the phone book? Okay. But I could tell you now he won't answer the phone. I want his address. But he's moving. It's going to be the morgue. But his wife will still be there. Oh. Well, here it is. Twelve Seven Oaks Drive. Yeah, it's a very high-class neighborhood. A very high-class wife. Maybe I uh, ought to run home and put on my white tie. <laughs> Don't be silly, Louie. Under the circumstances, the ties should very definitely be black. You know, those cops were very nice. So they were. In spite of what you asked them? What do you mean? You asked them if somebody confessed to murdering James Gordon. So I did. Yes, yeah, so don't you think it's a little early for a confession? Louie, you don't understand. You see, in this particular case, the confession was made before the murder. Oh, well, that explains it. That explains nothing. Louie, Mrs. What? Gordon visited me just before Mr. Gordon did. Uh-huh. No. No? No. What she did do was confess to murdering her husband. Yeah, but he was still alive. That's right. Maybe she's got clairvoyance or something. Oh, whoop. Twelve Seven Oaks Drive, Mr. Pump. Good. Yeah. Uh, should I wait? Uh, you'd better come with me. Okay. Except, but why? Well, I have a feeling I'll need a witness. Oh, so you really don't know Mrs. Gordon very well. Well, if her confession was true, I, I don't want to know her at all. But it couldn't have been, huh? Except maybe it was, huh? Yeah, that's one way of putting it. Sure. And that's a way nobody understands, too. Me included. <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. Boy, is he half wrong. Uh, good evening. Uh, we should like to see Mrs. Gordon. Uh, come in, please. Uh, whom shall I say is calling? Who? I beg your pardon. Who shall I say is calling? Better grammar. Uh, listen, bud, for what I dragged down here, whom is good enough? Oh? Oh, <laughs> the Gordons don't pay well? If you are referring to recent history, the Gordons don't pay, period. Oh, they're having financial difficulties, huh? No, they ain't having no difficulties on account they ain't got no finances. Hmm, explains the hospital plan, and uh, you'd better slip your English accent on and announce us. I'm Simon Temper, this is Louis. Yeah, hi. Very good. Since when has Brooklyn grown butlers? Louis, the Gordons have been in trouble. Mr. Gordon ain't not anymore. About Mrs. Gordon... Uh, Mrs. Gordon, we'll see you. Uh, this way. Oh, thank you. Not only will she see you, but you'll see her. Looking at it objective, you're getting the break. She is quite a dish. Sir, you are speaking of the woman Mr. Gordon loves. Who says? That's the door. She's on the other side. Hey, 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 hey. You might open it for us. What's the matter? You broke an arm or something? If he ain't careful, they're going to send him back to Brooklyn. Uh, Mrs. Gordon? Yes? Of course, it's been a little while since we last met, but... Since we what? Met. Oh, we haven't met. We haven't... If we had, surely I'd remember, Mr. Uh, uh, Templer, I believe, my butler said. Uh, we met at my home within the last hour. Oh, well, I'm sure you have a very charming home, but I was never in it. Uh, well, I may be able to refresh your memory if you'll be patient with me. You came in order to confess. Confess? What? The murder of your husband. Mr. Templer, if this is some kind of joke... I'm not joking. Then it's not in the best of taste. Aside from everything else, my husband happens to be alive and in splendid health. So, you see, I couldn't very well have confessed to any such silly thing. Mrs. Gordon. Yes? Your husband's health is no longer what it used to be. He's dead. Dead? 
Jim? Yes, Mrs. Gordon. Oh, no. No. Mr. Temple, she's going to faint. Let her. She did faint. Mr. Templer, King Arthur would never have let you sit down at his round table. I couldn't afford to be chivalrous, Louis. I had to make sure her faint was genuine. Oh, you thought she might be putting on an act? Yes. However, from the way she fell... There was no act, huh? No. Could that mean that the rest of her story about never being in your apartment or confessing that that's also true? Hardly. Well, then maybe she's a twin. No. Oh, why not? Too easy. Come on, help me put her on the couch. Yeah. You think maybe she's she's just plain nuts? Perhaps. Or perhaps, and I quote a playwright of some insight, there's a method in her madness. Yeah, she's coming, too. The butler can look after her. Come on, Long. Louis. Okay. Think you guys can uh, find the front door? Oh, yes. We brought our compass. Uh, how was Mrs. Gordon? She was fine. I don't think she's doing quite so well now. You might look in on her. It will be a pleasure. Good night. Good night. Well, that was a nice visit. Of course, our hostess happened to faint, but... Where are we going now? Maybe we could make somebody else faint. No, your cab, first of all. And then... Yeah? We wait. For what, Santa Claus? Mr. Templer, he was here recently. Not Santa Claus, Louis. We're waiting for Mrs. Gordon to recover. Oh, that's considerate of us. Not really. It's nasty of us. Oh, it is, huh? We're going to hate ourselves in the morning? Well, that will depend on where Mrs. Gordon leads us tonight. Well, she ain't in no hurry. We've been waiting ten minutes already. Now, give her time, Louie. She had to recover from a faint, make a phone call, dress for the street. Yeah, maybe, but I get nervous. Now, you probably need a tonic. Had a call. Mm. <laughs> that reminds me. I had a call up in the Bronx once. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> a redhead comes out of the house 15 minutes after I start honking the horn. Has me drive at a Grand Central. I ask her why the delay. She says she was very busy murdering her husband, and I laugh like anything. But you know what? She had murdered her husband. That's the last time I'll tell you a story. I was supposed to say that. I'm sorry. Hey, Louie. Hmm? Oh, yeah, yeah, down the block. Mrs. Gordon, huh? Mrs. Gordon. Mm -hmm. It's a nice car she got. Yeah, give her a chance to get into it. Oh, yeah, I always forget. Well, she's in now. Yeah, wait a minute. Give her time, Louie. She has to straighten her hat, do her lips, put on her gloves, signal for a right turn, and then... Yeah, and then pull away from the curb and then turn left. <laughs> right. Come on, let's go, Louie. All right. Hey, Mr. Templer, you think maybe she's leaving for parts unknown like that redhead? I doubt it. It would amount to a second confession and one that would be believed. Yeah. For a woman who just fainted, she's driving plenty fast. True. You see, Louie, no one dawdles in the shadow of the gallows. <laughs> Hey, she's pulling up in front of that park entrance. Yeah, we'd better stop here. Oh. Out, huh? Out. She's, uh, she's heading into the park. We follow her, huh? Yes. <laughs> Strange. Maybe she's just a nature lover, Mr. Templer. At this hour of the night? Well, as the law says you gotta love nature only in the daytime. Yeah, it isn't love which brings her here. Careful, Louis, she's stopping. Yeah. Be the lake. Hey... There was a guy waiting for her. There's no way we can get any closer. She might spot us on the path. How about getting in amongst the trees? That's an idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, except how good is it? They ran out of trees just here. <laughs> Not close enough to see him, but at least we've just met another figure in the case. I'll stick to Mrs. Gordon's. That is, uh, we can't see him. We haven't been introduced to him. We have to do something about that. Hey, Mrs. Gordon is scrambling. Coming back along the path. We stay where we are. Look, she's almost running. Yes, probably on very good advice. Huh? She has to be on time for her appointment with the police. They might not approve of her having gone for a midnight stroll in the park on the night her husband died. Uh, yeah, she's gone. Yeah, but the guy is still there. Mm -hmm. We're uh, interested in him now? Mm hmm. Very much interested. He'll have to come back this way. We can cut him off. 
got to find out who he is. Hey, Louis. Hmm? Got a handkerchief. Boy, you want to blow my nose? No. No. Do as I'm doing. Hmm? Oh, make like a masked bandit or something. Well, that's yeah. the general idea. Hurry, Louis. Yeah. Okay. I do. I'm now a masked bandit, but I ain't happy. Shh, shh, shh. I don't have a gun, but well, perhaps it'll work anyway. Want the gun you don't have? Yes, I'll double up my right hand in my coat pocket. Here he comes. Okay, stop right there, bud. What? Get behind him, Lefty. I ain't left hand. Oh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm behind him, uh, Mixie. What is this? Uh, stick up. What do you think it is? You can't do this. Sure we can. Or maybe you like to argue so much you would prefer being ventilated. Being what? Shot. Look, you don't have to shoot me. More of your lip and I'll enjoy it. Shut up. Hand over your poker. Hand over my what? Boy, are you ignorant. The money bag, mister, the wallet. Oh, here, here. Thanks. Now, keep walking the way you were, see? And don't try looking around. I ain't got no objections at all to shooting a guy in the back. I won't look around. I won't. Well, he's gone. Mm -hmm. So he is. Now, we ought to scram too, Mr. Templer. If he yells for cops... I don't think he will. He might have to explain what he was doing in the park at this time of night. He'd have an easier job than we would. Let's see. His name is Timothy Kerrigan. Papers in his wallet. Member of the Bar Association. A lawyer, Louis. Oh, fine. He'll probably sue us for nothing. A lawyer? <laughs> Most probably the lawyer for the Gordons. Well, that would explain why Mrs. Gordon yelled for him, but w w why would they have to meet in the park? I don't know, Louis, except that anywhere else they might have been seen together and overheard. And that would be bad? It might be murder. <laughs> Here's your house, Mr. Templer. Yes, Louis. Yeah. Gonna go to sleep? Yeah, I imagine so. Nothing to be done tonight, so far as I know. Yeah. Well, anyways, now we got three suspects instead of two. Three? Yeah, Mrs. Gordon, Kerrigan, and the butler. Ah, oh, the butler is never guilty, Louis. Hey, how about coming up for a drink? What was that you said? <laughs> Come on, well, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh... Mr. Templer. Hmm? About butlers. Maybe this one ain't guilty, but sometimes one could be, you huh? know? Well, that's true, but the one we met tonight is too charming a character. Yeah, well, don't look now, Mr. Templer. Keep walking. But your charming character is carrying around a young cannon. Huh. Good evening. How's butling these nights, huh? Go on. Inside the apartment. Oh, with pleasure. Now, hold it. Nobody move till I put the light on. Okay. All the way in. Now, sit down, both of you. Courtesy? No, you can't jump me easy sitting down. Intelligence. We, uh, sit. As for you, you're either an idiot or, um, in love. It's the same thing. I didn't come here to make conversation with you, Templar. Why did you come? To make sure you forgot about Cle about Mrs. Gordon's confession. An idiot in love. That's got nothing to do with you. Suppose I refuse to forget Mrs. Gordon's confession. You'll forget it, either by agreeing to or by being dead. You want me to promise to say nothing of the confession to the police? That's right. Well, suppose I do promise, and then you leave, and then suppose I don't keep that promise. No, no, why do you have to bring that up? I, 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 I come back. And kill me then? Huh. What good would that do, Mrs. Gordon? All right, if what you're getting is it that the only way I can be sure is by killing you, then I'll... How much was uh, Mr. Gordon's life insured for? A hundred grand. Boy, how did you know? There had to be a motive for his death. A motive that would place Mrs. Gordon in danger of being considered likely to have murdered her husband. The Gordons had no money. Insurance was the most probable motive in existence. Kerrigan handled the uh, Gordons' finances? Yeah. Mrs. Gordon is in love with Kerrigan, isn't she? No. I think yes. Who cares what you think? All right. Let's find out how innocent Mrs. Gordon is. Look, um... Pull the window shade down, hmm? The front window. Pull an armchair over to the window and sit in it. Why? You'll then be silhouetted prettily for the benefit of anyone outside in the street. The drawn shade will make it impossible for you to be identified exactly. Your build is much the same as mine. You will therefore appear to be me to anyone outside. You will also provide a perfect target. To who? To the only one who would have any reason for wishing me dead. The murderer of James Gordon. 
You love Mrs. Gordon. You're convinced she's innocent. She's been here before and she'll be able to find her way back. Well, will you sit in that chair? this time, the police would long have reached Mrs. Gordon. They're probably finished with their preliminary questioning. She could plead sleepiness. They'll have left the Gordon home, allowing 15 minutes to get here. She should be arriving at almost any moment. Shut up. Well, naturally, you're not worried. Perfect target, though, you make. Yeah, and besides, Mr. Templer, even if she does shoot him, he'll be killed by the woman he loves. What more could a guy want? I told you to... Sh- Yes, you were saying? That car. Yes, I heard it. It doesn't have to be her. But I'm sure it is. High heels. Well, Mr. Butler? I'm getting out of here. (laughs) He dives very nice. And in time. I wonder, with no ready-made target for her, what will Mrs. Gordon do? You better get in the next room, huh? Yeah. Okay. Oh, Louis, hmm? will you open the door? Oh, I don't mind if uh, if you do. I, I wouldn't like to get shot on your doorstep. It's no way to appreciate your hospitality. <laughs> I'll get it. Hello, Mrs. Gordon. I... Oh, uh, you're not alone. No, no, that's Louis. remember? Yeah, but uh, better remember inside, hmm? All right. Send him away. Oh, I promised him a drink. He hasn't had it yet. I can't send him away. But what I have to tell you is confidential. Louis is in my confidence. Well, all right. It might turn out more convenient if you're difficult. About what? Forgetting that I was ever here before. Forgetting I came to you with a confession of murder. Sorry, but I have a remarkably retentive memory. For example, I remember a girl I used to go to school with. You'd better forget her for the moment. Oh, I couldn't. I loved her very deeply. How would you feel about... $25,000. $25,000. Oh, I love them very deeply, too. They're being offered to me for a promise to forget? Yes. And if I don't keep it? You'll sign a paper admitting your promise and acceptance of the money. That would make you an accessory. You wouldn't dare change your mind. Hey, she's smarter than me. She's still doing. Mrs. Gordon, you're young, you're beautiful, and $25,000 is very attractive. Nevertheless, I, I shall refuse all of you. Even Ah, if... Ah, yes, I wondered how long it would be before you produced that. The revolver you killed your husband with? I didn't. (laughs) You could convince me in a lot better way. Can I convince you? Oh, yes, your confession helps. It does? Of course. Your husband's death makes you richer by a hundred thousand dollars, doesn't it? Yes. Otherwise, you had nothing. Well, our investments, they were unfortunate. Mr. Uh, Kerrigan handled them? Yes, he's our lawyer. So your husband handed over his money to Kerrigan... Did he also know he was, uh, handing over his wife as well? What did you say? I meant his life, of course, a natural slip of the tongue, you know. You still haven't told me how my confession was going to help me. I didn't say it would help you. I said it would help convince me you hadn't killed your husband. Well, that's the same thing. Not quite. (gasps) Mr. Templer, that was the back door. Yeah, I know. I was saying, uh, oh, yes... The fact that you didn't kill your husband is actually of minor importance in view of... Ah! Now would be a good time to borrow your gun. Louis, will you keep Mrs. Gordon company while I see what the boys in the back room are doing? You're all right, Mr. Temple. It was Kerrigan. Uh Uh-huh. I thought it would be. He didn't see me. Came into the room, headed for the door to the living room. He sneaked it open a bit when I... Is he alive? Yeah, I just got him on the shoulder. He was working in the back while she was... Yeah, that's right. Hey, Louie. What, Mr. Temple? Will you phone the police? They've one wounded murderer to collect, one beautiful accessory before and after the fact. Oh, no, no. But of the highest class. Her butler will help her wait. <laughs> Good 
More soda, Louie? No, no, no. What are you trying to do? Drown me? <laughs> Here you are, Louie. Oh, thanks a lot. Oh. Hey, Mr. Templer, look. I know Kerrigan shot Mr. Gordon, and I kind of hear Mrs. Gordon were like that. <laughs> this is a new phrase. It'll catch on, Louis, believe yeah, me. Yeah, also because they needed the insurance, though, to live happy ever after on being the high-class types. But why did Mrs. Gordon confess to you before her husband got killed? Oh, it was an attempt to establish an alibi for herself, Louis. She expected that I'd immediately phone the police or else take her back to her home to view the corpse. In the meanwhile, Kerrigan would murder Gordon. And that would have left Mrs. Gordon in the clear. Yeah, but you didn't do either of those things. Why? I didn't believe her. Oh. She had really killed her husband and was willing to take whatever consequences there might be. Why come to me? Uh-huh. So that loused up her alibi. Especially because her husband, instead of staying home and getting shot, had become suspicious of her and he trailed her here. Huh? And was in turn trailed by Kerrigan, oh. who saw a natty opportunity for double-crossing Mrs. Gordon and keeping the money for himself. He handled the Gordon's affairs and had the power of attorney. Yeah, yeah, but look, Mrs. Gordon's faint when you told her about her husband's death, you know, that was real. You pointed that out yourself. Of course it was, Louie. But she didn't faint at the news of her husband's death as such. The reason she fainted was because she realized that she'd confessed to me and that her husband had been shot at a time for which she had no alibi. Uh-huh. Well, now I'm almost smart. Now I can enjoy my drink. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. Hey, you know that lovesick butler tells me he's going back to Brooklyn and a kind of life in the upper classes is too low for his tastes. Oh, poor fellow. He loved not wisely, but too well. On the other hand, what's wrong with Brooklyn? You have been listening to another transcribed adventure of the saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. Now, here is our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, in our cast, you heard Joan Banks as Claire and Peter Leeds as her husband. High Averback was the butler and Jim Nusser, Kerrigan. Larry Dobkin plays Louie. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure of the saint. Good night. This adventure of The Saint was written by Louis Vitties. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charters, is a James L. Safir production and is directed by Helen Mack. Vincent Price is soon to be seen co-starring in RKO's production of His Kind of Woman. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer, Don Stanley. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Well, it's Sunday again. That means another gala broadcast of NBC's Big Show. This evening, hostess Tallulah Bankhead has a whole flock of guest stars, including Marlena Dietrich. And when the two glamour gals, Tallulah and Marlena, get together, look out for flying sparks. For drama this Sunday evening, Theater Guild on the Air presents the tense story, The Third Man, starring Joseph Cotton and Singney Hasso. Join Tallulah and her big show with Marlena Dietrich later on NBC. NBC.